Welcome to the Kingdom of Bahrain, to the Bahrain International Circuit for the season finale of the 2023 FIA World Endurance Championship. Round seven is the Bapco Energy's eight hours of Bahrain. And a big crowd on hand as ever, watching stunt driver Terry Grant performing for the crowd and ready to watch a big field of international sports cars going at it for the final time this season. Lots of titles up for grabs in LMP2 and in hypercar. The GTE team and manufacturers and drivers' titles already tied up. Toyota have won the constructors' title. Valentino Rossi will be taking part in the test day on Sunday. He'll be with WRT, the team for whom he already is a GT3 racer. A lot of interest will be surrounding the doctor and where he goes next year. But that's next year. There's a few months respite before then. But first, we have the hectic, chaotic, potentially carnage-ridden eight hours of Bahrain. This track, uh, the series has been coming here since its very first year, a dozen years ago. And Bahrain has never failed to produce anything other than exciting racing. Graham Goodwin alongside me, Martin Haven in the booth here. And the great and the good on the grid, trying to get a little bit of shade, Graham, because after the rainstorms a couple of days ago, it is back to Bahrain's best. It is going to be very hot work. Yeah, good afternoon from Bahrain. Good morning, good evening, wherever else you are in the world. Harry Grant uh, just pulling off to the car park there. A uh, bit of a drive through. But. Is uh, that our rental? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, the tyres are much better on that. Uh, the, you're right, temperatures climbing to levels we're more used to seeing here in Bahrain or feeling here in Bahrain and certainly not what we've had for most of the earlier part of the weekend. Ben Keating there and you're telling me it's a little uh, off camera. Just bought his 29th car dealership. Yes. Uh, the Keating check is that he is now up to 29 car dealerships, a Texan car dealer. And he, along with a number of faces, making their final appearance, at least for now, in the World Endurance Championship. There are wholesale changes afoot heading into 2024. Predominantly, not because of this man, but because of the type of car that he is driving and the type of car that Jev is driving, Hypercar. It was born to unite sports car racing in the ACO rules and IMSA regulations, and it has grown like topsy. His Royal Highness, Prince Salman Al Khalifa, and uh, the great and the good of the FIA, the ACO, World Endurance Championship Council, and uh, the group CEO of BAPCO, Mr. Mark Thomas, all uh, taking a little look through the paddock during the lunch break. And they too, I'm sure, looking forward to what should be a mouth-watering race. Well, this at Bahrain International Circuit, six left-hand corners, nine right-hand corners, is a tire killer. If you can imagine a cheese grater heated up on a gas ring, that's what it does to rubber. Turn one, long straight, hard braking, tightening right-hander leads into two and three. First major overtaking opportunity is turn four, whether you're in an F1 car or a world endurance car. Then you climb out of four through five, down, plunging through six, seven. Corner eight has been a surprise overtaking opportunity for GT cars. Turn 10, downhill corkscrewing, tightening hairpin, brutal on brakes and tires as most of the track is. Leads onto the back pit straight. And the final section climbing up to 14, down, up to 13, down through 14 and 15 again, working the tires so hard here. Last year's race winners, car number seven from Toyota. They need to do that again if they're to win the title. WRT's 31 car, one hand on the title. They won here last year. GTE Am, well, that, like LMP2, disappearing at the end of the weekend from the World Endurance Championship, though LMP2 will be back at Le Mans. And for Corvette Racing, well, 25 years of factory racing ends here because the GT3 Corvette that comes next year will not be a Corvette Racing run factory ending, so, en entry. So Ben Keating, Nick Veroni and Nicky Katzberg, they are ending a chapter here for Corvette Racing. And again at midday for the final time, for a while maybe, 
the Corvette train klaxon went off in the pit lane, as has become their habit. And thank you as well to the Corvette racing crew. They've always been awesome. Jacques Lacan there, by the way, part of the Corvette racing story from the very start here yeah. in the World Endurance Championship. And still yeah. And way before helping, uh, FIA yeah, GT. And indeed, beyond, helping with yeah. the logistics here. But the Corvette racing crew, what fun they've had and we've had with them. Remember Rojas there with uh, Alpine. They'll be back next year in a new hypercar. We was just talking to Memo. He was yawning his head off in a driver autograph session. I said, how far out of it? 13 hours is the timeline. <laughs> uh, you just saw uh, Sheikh Salman Al Khalifa there on the right hand side of the shot. Uh, the CEO of the Bahrain International Circuit and the warm welcome that is extended by everybody here. That definitely goes right to the top and all the way through the organization. So GTE is done. GTE Pro finished last year. GTE Am is done this year. The cars will be replaced by the GT3 category next year, the global GT category, bringing in the opportunity for far more brands. There are around a dozen brands who have GT3 machinery, many of whom will be here next year. James Gallardo, brief shot there. The first British uh, former, uh, sorry, Le Mans winner in the Ferrari series, Lord Selsden, uh, this year. And very much in the running in the Autosport Awards as the International Racing Driver of the Year. Very frequently that's a Formula One driver for obvious reasons, but it would be great to see World Endurance, and particularly a historic win at Le Mans, recognized by that. Aston Martin, well, the GTE Vantage disappears, but they have a GT3 car. We will see that here next year on the grid as well. Dorian Pan, there, uh, active on the grid. We wait for news of exactly what Dorian is going to be up to next year. I can tell you in the background there's some really very interesting plans for a number of the drivers on this grid. And the, the new, I have to say, the news pages will be full of news about some of the personalities on this grid, whether or not they're staying here or going elsewhere. Cracking stuff coming forward, and the WC is a real engine for change for that. It was nearly a lockout of the front row for Aston Martin, who qualified on a softer tyre than all their rivals. They told me that's the harder tyre that they have available to them. They've got a soft and a medium here, the others have a medium and a hard option. But Aston Martin were beaten in the end, and actually comprehensively beaten in the end by the Iron Dames Porsche. Another stunning qualifying session from their bronze rated Sara Bovi. It's a very competitive driver lineup. When all the bronze drivers go out and qualify, traditionally for the last two seasons, first in Ferrari, now in the Porsche, it's been Sara Bovi versus Ben Keating more often than not. But today, Yesterday, rather, Sarah Bovey was all on her own. Well, it is the final run for the Pink Pig, the Pink Porsche, but it won't be the end of the story for the Iron Dames. Let's catch up with Sarah Bovey. It is one last dance for GTE Am here in WEC. Sarah Bovey, you put it on pole and starting this eight hour race at the front of the pack. Still sounds so good, and <laughs> no, it's really cool. Uh, super happy, uh, you know, th these cars are amazing. For me, it's the best GTs we have ever produced and um, uh, it's going to be tough to say goodbye to the GTs, but uh, we're going to make sure that we make it in style. Uh, I think we're going to have a great race here. Competition is really tight. Of course, putting it on pole was nice. Also for the championship to keep our second position, it was important. Uh, but the hardest part of the job is today, and for that I'm very lucky to have Rael and Michel with me and the whole crew behind having our back. So we're going to push like hell. Uh, we want to finish on the high, and um, yeah, we hope we can have a good race. You've got a hot job on your hands. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Michel Gassing, Rahal Frey join Sara Bovey in the car. They have done for the last couple of seasons, and Sara and her teammates have won in GT in the European Le Mans series, but they have yet to win in the World Endurance Championship. They've had very close misses, been very, very close, a slew of podium finishes, but the top step has eluded them. Now, the Iron Lynx organization will be running Lamborghini's hypercar and GT3 programs next Correct. year, so it's not like they disappear but it would be a great story for them to round out their tail in GTE with a win. And for this man on the left there, Christian Reed, who started every single GTE race and won the very first one among others, what a great way to end it would be for him if he could claim the final 
GTE win as well as the first. Yeah, but Bug ending uh, the GTE career. I'm sure we'll get to speak to Christian later in the race when he's finished uh, his stint. He'll be starting the number 77 car as he has so, so many times. Lots of goodbyes, lots of things to look forward to when we get back to broadcasting next year, Martin, at Qatar, which is the additional race next season, there is going to be a whole lot of you to be talking about. Well, it's going to make focusing on the race battles, I was going to say easier, maybe slightly less complicated, because we'll be down from three categories to two, but there'll still be 36, 37, 38, whatever cars on the grid, which means at least 19 different battles going on. We were just chatting to some new colleagues from Czech Republic who've come here for only their second race. They said, you know, what's it like? I'm used to ice hockey. What, what's this? I said, well, imagine well, ice hockey or football. Where, <laughs> ice hockey where everybody's got a puck or football Excellent. where everybody's got a ball. Which one do you look at? Well, the there answer you is you have to watch all of them all the time. But with only one set of eyes, it's pretty hard. LMP2 is the other class we are sunsetting from the FI World Endurance Championship, with the exception of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, of course, these cars will carry on in the European Le Mans series. We've still got the Asian Le Mans series to come this season and in IMSA racing, and we'll have a substantial number of those cars at Le Mans. But they have been fantastic servants in this championship, uh, the Gibson engined LMP2 cars. Well, you look at some of the teams that started in LMP2 and are now running hypercars. Alpine are, are, are a great example, Jota a great example, Proton didn't even do LMP2, they just went straight from GT into hypercar, courtesy of their Porsche Lynx, but it's been a great learning tool. You can come up the series from LMP3 in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, LMP2 in European Le Mans, there's Terry Grant, uh, Terry, Terry the car mate, oh, yeah. up to LMP2 in ELMS and then graduate to the World Championship. So it's been part of a great ladder up the order. GTs will be able to do that as well. But for Alpine, again, a second era of LMP2 racing for them comes to an end because they quit LMP2 to go into LMP1 well, before. Bizarrely, it's a third era for them because they came back after what that couple of seasons of hypercar with the yeah. old LMP1 car. Great success with the old Open Top 03. Great success with the 05 under their Alpine moniker, and then into the 2017 era of the Gibson engines, and then back for this filler year before we see the fabulous looking A424 next year. United Autosports, though, on pole position again. Tom Blomquist with a stellar lap in qualifying yesterday. Squeezed out a second blinding lap at pace where others could not and that was something to behold it's interesting actually all three class pole sitters were a surprisingly large amount clear of their nearest rivals well for peugeot it's the end of the road for the 9x8 for the 9x8 because in peugeot nomenclature when we see the car next year it will have had a number of key detail changes possibly have grown a rear wing Will it be the 9x8 bis? Who knows? Because that's what they did with 905. It's 905, 905B became the 905 bis. But this brave program basically generating all its downforce from the underbody, a full ground effect car, rather than from the rear wing. I mean, look at the back of the, the Peugeot and then look at the Ferrari. If you want to see how different hypercars can look, the rear wing treatment of those two cars is all you need. What I'd say is last year here in Bahrain, the car was very competitive. It wasn't reliable, but it was fast. Well, we saw in very limited traction conditions in Le Mans, it's very good and where grip is at a premium, maybe it'll work here. Antonio Felix da Costa, it'll be his last race again, potentially for a while. Porsche have decided that he will focus 100% on Formula E. John Eric Van will probably try and combine Formula E and his Peugeot program. And I know that chatting to Paul DeResta yesterday in the press conference, he's very keen and very eager to see this program really step up to where they believe it can get to. I'm hearing that Peugeot have a slightly unusual plan for uh, merging those programs next year. We'll come to that uh, at some point in the future. Here, though, Hertz Team Jota, a bit of a fan favourite, the 38 car. This we'll see. 
the final race for now, at least in the uh, DFI World Endurance Championship for Antonio Felix da Costa, who somewhat controversially has been drafted by Porsche to do um, the Formula E Championship only next well, year. Well, it, the, the problem with that is that they clash with each other, not all the way through, but there are significant clashes, which means you prejudice one or the other, and actually they'd rather not. Yep. They'd rather not prejudice either uh, Antonio's chances of becoming Formula E champion again, or the or the, the Jota team's chances of becoming hypercar champions. And there's no uh, no earthly reason why a privateer team like Jota or Proton can't do it, because by rule. The cars must be identical to their homologation. So if Porsche homologate a set series of parts, they must be available to the customers as well as to Penske, as you're seeing here, who is a more factory aligned rather than factory paid team. But one thing that is clear here is the number five car, the seventh on the grid and uh, just ahead of the number 99 Proton car. The cars are identical. This is part of this era, homologated cars. Mm. If Porsche update this car, not grade this car in the off season, which they're going to do, you will see a very same kit of parts supplied to all of the customer cars uh, that, uh, that's isn't, done. This though has been the story the of the season, really. For the national anthem, Bahrain, and we'll pause the national anthem as Bob Constituris announces it to the assembled crowd. Yeah, legend that is Bob Constantius, uh on the microphone here for the fans in the grandstand. Was chatting to a few fans during the pit lane walkabout and the driver's autograph session. Uh, young bunch of Brits. I said, "You working here? You living here? Yeah, yeah. We're all teachers. They came over two or three months ago in the middle of the summer, and this is the first time they have been to the circuit to see racing. So, all right, you're going to see a lot of cars. <laughs> so, uh, lots and lots of fans from across the region, lots of expats, lots of local fans as well. Uh, it's very easy to get to uh, the Bahrain International Circuit. So, looking forward to, again, another thrilling race. And these guys, Kevin Escher and his crew in the Porsche, this time last year, of course, battling for the GTE Pro title, as they have done pretty much since time immemorial in the final race of the season here in Bahrain. I think it's the first time we've come here that a GT title has been already decided. Wow. I mean, it has been a great servant in terms of the racing for the FI World Endurance Championship. It did look at one point, see El Bamba here on the second row of the grid in yep. the Cadillac. Great Starts there third. That's their best qualifying position. Well, of course, that's a thought. And we're going to go down for one of El Bamba's teammates, Alex Lynn. Uh, he's going to be in the number two car later, but for right now he's on the grid and he's with Louise Beckett. Starting P3 on the grid is the number two Cadillac, Alex Lynn. Uh, you've got to be pleased with how this season has gone for you guys uh, through all of 2023 in WEC. Yeah, I think it's been a strong start to the life of the uh, Cadillac V-Series R. Uh, you know, the highlight so far has been that podium at Le Mans, um, but I think we'd like to pick up another trophy today. That's, that's the goal. And you've been running fantastic here in Bahrain. Yeah, no, we have. I mean, the car's been running really, really well. Um, of course, this is now the time that matters. Um, but honestly, I'm so proud of how this team's reacted after a, a tough Fuji. Uh, but I think we're looking looking OK. All right, thank you. Thank you. Here in the Gulf, they do love a big uh, V8. Boy, does that thing uh, have its own. <laughs> it doesn't so much clear its throat as bellow, does it? And it's going to be a big crowd favorite here, as it has been everywhere. Drivers getting aboard the cars. It's not going to be very much longer before we get this thing moving and we can farewell with eight hours, we hope, of fantastic racing uh, to complete what's been a stellar season, a breakthrough season, Martin, for yeah, the World of Jones. Absolutely, Jones. and next year is just going to pile petrol on the blaze that is the exciting hypercar series. Just seeing Mike Conway getting aboard the... Uh, Toyota that starts in second place. Toyota Gazoo Racing definitely loading the deck. They stacked the deck yesterday in qualifying. Both cars went out and qualified on the softer option tyre, the medium tyre, which they will need to use in the race at some stage. That will probably be in darkness in the later stages. They will try and, instead of using all four mediums, maybe use them as right-hand side pairs. So there could be some very interesting tyre changes going on. Now, it looks like 
the pole sitting car was on hards, and so is the second car. In the pit lane and on the grid, Louise Beckett. Louise, apart from the temperature, what else can you tell us? Well, I'm just doing one final run down the grid and I can tell you that everybody is on hard tyres at the moment. Yeah. Gone uh, through the whole of the hypercar grid and yeah, they all are. Well, the problem here is the abrasive nature of the circuit combined with the heat. I was chatting to uh, some of the guys and they were saying basically, well, Steve said, basically it's just like driving on a wet weather tyre on a dry track, it just squirms and slimes around under you so much. And that's when the tyres are new. And because of the tyre restrictions, they need to be double stinted all the way through the race as well. So that's uh, it's going to be very hard work. Gabriel Aubrey in his car. Nice to see Van Merkstein back again. Absolutely. Of course, the the Van, Mer series, Van Merkstein in the LMP2 uh, Porsche Spider is. Well, here's our grid. It will be Sebastian Buemi, who starts from pole in the points, Ladies leading number eight Toyota from Mike Conway, his teammate Earl Bamba, and Lawrence Van Tour on row two. Bamba saying, I'm on the same row as Lawrence. I need to watch my side mirrors. Miguel Molina and yeah. Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the pair of Ferraris on row three. The 51 car, of course, are Le Mans winner. Then the first, the Penske Porsches. Michael Christensen ahead of Proton's Neil Jani. Hertz Team Jota's Will Stevens and Jean-Eric Van Jeff in the better of the two Peugeots, the 93 car. 94 lines up behind. Tristan Vautier starts the Floyd Van Wall in 12th place. Then we get to our pole sitter and dominant pole sitter. Tom Blanco starts the United 23 car from Alpine's Mathieu Vaxivier. Sean Galel in the 31 WRT car Ladies ahead of Gabby Aubrey in the Vector Sport Sergeant car. Vector James. will bring Isotta to the party next year in Hypercar. Phil Hansen looking to move up and take the lead of the championship. He will start in eight, uh, 17th place. Jakub Schmichowski in uh, 19th place, also looking to hold on to second place. Team 41, WRT, they are in 10th in LMP2, trying desperately to guarantee their title win. Sarah Bovey starts alone on the first row of GTM with a pair of Aston side by side behind her. Then Kessel Racing's Takeshi Kimura, so a pair of yellow cars, because Ben Keating's Corvette starts alongside. Northwest AMR's Ian James and Thomas Floor, the oldest race winner in the series, alongside him. Christian Reed, the first and potentially the last winner in GTM. He starts in the 77 Porsche, and at the tail of the field, Matteo Cressoni, Mr. Iron Lynx, and Frank Dazotto in the 21 Air Corsa Ferrari. Mark James, who is the CEO. group CEO of Bapco Energies, waves the green flag and gets our field rolling. Now, they will do two formation laps, as has become the standard this year, because we do not have tyre warmers. And although the track temperature might be 60, it's still nowhere near enough to warm the tyres. So the drivers will have work to do. We are heading off for the formation laps here in Bahrain. Well, we can ask uh, just how warm it is on the grid because uh, now joining us, third member of this team, and Davidson, uh, back from uh, the pre-grid uh, for our broadcast partners. It felt to me, coming to the booth, uh, that this is warm, warmer than we've had all week. Yeah, I haven't actually seen the official temperatures um, or humidity level, but it does feel hot out there. And the, half the grid is actually in the shade. So, uh, yeah, hence uh, the, uh, the beads of sweat. I've got on the forehead. Sorry about that. <laughs> a man as con conditioned as you are. I, mean, I, I, well, I did run back, to be fair. It's, it's quite a long way from the grid to the commentary box, but uh, yeah, maybe not quite as fit as I was when I was sitting in one of these cars. First world problems. Absolutely. There is, there is freezing, isn't it? Says the man in an air con, <laughs> con booth. Um, one thing to explain that we should see at the end of these formation laps, you will see, I believe, one of the cars peel off for a drive-through penalty at some point very early. Correct. That will be the number four car. Uh, the Van Wall after a 
infringement in free practice three, I think he was, uh, was from yeah. Esteban Guerreri. I spoke to Esteban this morning. I didn't want to talk to him after after practice. And he said, yeah, we got a drive through. And I said, I know, I know, man, he can't. And he said, why is the camera always on me when I'm swearing or doing something I shouldn't be? I said, well, don't do something you shouldn't be and don't swear. And he, oh, okay, that's, okay. That's, that's very parenting. Of I know, I know. But <laughs> yeah, he was loosening the belts prior to coming into the pit lane because the door on the car had sprung open. But you can't do that on track. So, yeah. unfortunately, a drive through penalty. Well, I mean, what didn't help, I'm afraid, is that's not the story he told the stewards. So, very clearly, he told me he had a cramp in the car. Yeah. Uh, so, that will not have gone down well. They will be getting there for a drive through penalty, uh, I believe, when this race goes green. Uh, and at that point, they're going to drop right to the back of this field. Yep. Well, their, their entire race on Detcher here is to finish. Laura Ronchok plows ahead of GM's racing programmes, which is Cadillac and Corvette. And interestingly, I bumped into uh, Richard Westbrook, who shares the number two Cadillac on the way here to the Coxbox. And he said, I think we could be all right today. The tyre deck looks good, Ooh. and that is a key message. So hopefully they can take a bit of a fight to the Toyota today, who obviously, I don't know if you already mentioned, qualified on the medium tyre compared to the Caddy, which qualified on the hard tyre, along with most other hypercar runners. They're all starting on hearts, and the other change, by the way, a little bit of a weight break for the Caddy and for the Porsches here, seven kilos. Uh, uh, lifted out of those cars and that will just again help with some of those issues they've been having with it all sorts of unknowns one of which is it's baking hot we're going into nighttime here under the lights it's eight hours not six hours it's a deeper field than we've had here before can't wait for this so seven kilos in a hypercar today they're quite heavy cars so it's going to equate to round about a tenth a lap just under a tenth a lap but Anthony, explain why Toyota qualified on mediums, which they must use at some stage in the race, rather than the hard tyres, which will survive better. They have deliberately given themselves a set of tyres that they know won't last as well as one of the sets that their rivals are using. Well, we, we bumped into James Collado on the grid and he said that uh, the reason they're just sticking with the hards the whole way through the race today, not even putting the mediums on, is because their car is a little bit harder on the tyres than the Toyota. It's as simple as that. So Toyota feel like they can run a medium relatively comfortably. Let's see how that unfolds. But it certainly worked in qualifying for them. Well, I think the deal was they decided after following and well, basically being stuck behind the Porsche for four hours in Fuji and unable to pass that they had to start at the front. They want to win the race. They want to win the championship, all the titles, everything, your hard glory. And so they have committed to that medium tire to have the qualifying pace. I wondered whether they'd start on it, block the first turn. You're on a slower tire, which you're going to have to use at some stage. Everybody else is still trying to warm their hearts for the first couple of laps. You just hold them up and hold them up and hold them up. Well, the thing that works against them as well is that you know, conversely, the Toyota struggles to warm its tires. Because it's so kind on its tires, it yeah. struggles to warm them up more than others around them. So, so they do starting leave Starting on the medium yeah. might have been better. It, but then again, in the hottest conditions, on the greenest of track conditions at the start of the race, halfway through the first in, that would have become very difficult for them to, to fight right. against the hard runners. At some stage, they're going to have to use Yeah, them. down the hill under control of the safety car and under instruction from Eduardo Freitas in race control. Field is collecting as per order and we're about to get it underway, Martin. Sara Bovi almost running into the back of Andre Negrau's LMP2 car because they've been told not to have enormous gaps between the categories. We are ready to go racing in Bahrain. Eight hours will begin as the safety car peels off into the pit lane. And it will be the number eight Toyota of Sebastian Buemi who paces them to the front first corner. I asked Earl Bamba, who's going to be the Bruno Senna? He said, Lawrence Fanto, I've got him alongside me. I'm going to have to watch out for the Porsche. So will the Toyotas. Ferrari have got between the Toyotas before. So too are the Porsches. Here we go. The eight hours of Bahrain is underway. Sebastian Buemi hogs the inside line. 50 Ferrari goes deep on the inside. Miguel Molina lock up from Bamba. Tags the number seven into a spin. And through go the Ferraris. They're second and third. Fourth place is one of the Porsches. Number seven must win the race with their teammates down in fourth the to win the there. title. That's the Van Wall. And it's a, that is a one of the Uniteds. And 23. One of the, so 23 and the Alpine that was with them, that will have been 
uh, Vaxivier. Yeah, the van wall spun around as well. I didn't see what happened further on through turn two, but a huge, huge lockup for Earl Bamba. We talked about the importance of turn one and how they were going to take the fight to Toyota. Well, they ended up running into the back of one of them. Well, that is not going to help Toyota's number seven crew. They have to somehow claw more than 16 points or 16 points back against the number eight team. And that was always going to be a tough ask. However, Ferrari second and third, it's the number five Porsche that survived in fourth place. Michael Christens ahead of John Eric Venn in the Peugeot in fifth place. Vector lead in LMP2. Oh, and the Jota car looking for a move on the inside. That's Will Stevens getting very racy on Jeff and he's going through up the hill. No, he's not. Jeff has the door shut there as they come out of turn 11. Bit of a struggle to start there for the Proton car as well in that melee, and that put briefly behind Gabby Aubrey in the lead now of LMP2 in the Vector Sport car, but all sorts of cars out of all sorts of positions. Michael Christensen looking very racy there behind the Ferrari number 51 of Pierre Guidi. What can he do through this final corner and get into the slipstream, hopefully down the main straight, but it's a difficult one breaking into turn one, but Earl Bamba, oh, what a disastrous start for him. Obviously more disastrous for the number seven Toyota, who got tagged, and I do feel like there's going to be probably, a, well, they are looking into that turn one incident. Yeah, you always will do. Number 10 Vector Sport car leading the LMP2 field behind the Proton Porsche a few seconds back. Ferraris with the number five car, really aggressive Michael Christensen. He does like racing this track, but he's probably only got two or three laps before they're on the radio going, OK, Michael, we need to be looking at saving the tyres now. So it, it's hurry up and get on with it time. Mike Conway, by the way, recovered back up into the top 20, now trying to get to grips with the LMP2 cars between him and the hypercar train. Yeah, he's got ahead of Sara Bovi, who leads in GTE Am from the D station Aston of Liam Talbot. But the other Aston that was on the row behind, uh, Ian James, he got dropped way down the order. The Van Wall is in for his drive through. There you see Dario no, Franchitti. Not. It's not, it's stopping. Oh, it is stopping for damage, maybe. Well, they also have a drive through to serve. Uh, Dario Franchitti, Marino's here as well. Dario is Alex Lynn's driver manager. And Alex has gone from third in turn one down to seventh. Here comes Will Stevens. Yeah, he's clearly faster, isn't he? He's just got to try and find a way past. But maybe patience is the key. You're not going to do it there, as we saw the previous lap. It's just a difference of lines. But yeah, the uh, Hertz Team Jota, Porsche car looking a bit more comfortable at this stage in the race. And Will is putting Jeb under an immense pressure. But Jeb's able to soak it up. Well, again, it does look as though the Peugeot is gentler on its tyre. When the conditions were minimum grip at Le Mans. So watch this, the Ferrari puts the Cadillac under pressure there yeah. and locks up, is that, oh, yeah, it's both That's fronts Bamba. up at the same yeah. time. Spins round the, the Toyota, and everybody else behind has to take avoiding action off the circuit. Now what happened there, so there's basically, there's a chain reaction as the cars are rejoining the circuit in turn two. That's where you saw the LMP2s coming together with the van wall. So there's Ferrari down the inside. He, he thinks about, it. yeah, that outside front, just locking on the nothing that Bamba could do and round we go on board with Mike Conway there. How much damage has been done to the back of that Toyota? That's the big question. There were bits bouncing yeah. up in the air as we went backwards onto the hard standing. Notice as well, by the way, the fan wall was hooked up in that incident that happened on the exit from turn one before being turned around at turn two. So multiple incidents involving that number four. And we heard uh, just off mic from Lou Beckett that there's a new nose section for the number four that has rejoined, but will have to come back in again to serve the drive-through. On board with Jean-Eric Van, he's been passed now by Will Stevens. So there is the Hertz team Jota car up to one, two, three, four, fifth place. And uh, down to six has gone Jeff. Earl Bamber still in seventh. There's the LMP2. Um, uh, which of the LMP2 cars is that? That's in the middle of it. That's the Alpine and Maggio Vaxim, yeah. That's the recovering Alpine yeah. from There's the... It's top How, one. It's how's Claudio Schiavone gone from the last row of the grid into second in GTE? Uh, my guess is that's all to do with the mess that we saw. It's Matteo Cressoni. Right, it's Matteo Cressoni. But, but even why. so, that car was on the last row of the grid. Because everybody else oh, is a box driver. Finally overtaken. Jeff down into yeah. the car number 93 into turn one. A great move there by Will Stevens. That's why we were seeing a replay of the previous incident. So Earl Bamba shutting the door pretty firmly there as well on the second Peugeot of Loic Duval. Meanwhile, head down and charging Sebastian Buemi. 
fastest race lap, three tenths quicker than the closest Ferrari of Miguel Molina. I think it's going to be two drive-throughs to this fan wall. It's got a drive-through penalty for breach of Appendix L, Chapter 3, we'll get to that later. I don't think it's served, it's drive-through in time, which means it's going, you can see on the left of the picture there, running down through pit lane now, already lost the lap, and I think it's going to have to come in again. It will have to serve its drive-through, but they will, I'm sure they'll claim force majeure. Somebody hits us in turn one, you can't expect us to do a drive-through and then continue with an unsafe car. They didn't pit at the end of lap one, they pit at the end of lap two. Oh, was it their lap two? We'll have to see. Mike Conway has got one more LMP2 car to get by the Vector Sport of Gabby Aubrey, who leads the way in P2, and, uh, and then he can join the back, can Mike Conway, of the hypercars. That's not where he thought he would be after four laps in this race today. Well, Anthony, you've been in situations like this, I'm sure, where it all goes absolutely pear-shaped at the first corner. You go, OK, right, eight hours, exactly. plan B, Oh, I mean, it had to be all out anyway. It always is because it's motor racing, but now it's even more jeopardy. Now there's there's nothing left to risk. You've just got to give it everything. Exactly. No, I know it's a cliche, but the race is long today, longer than most endurance races that we have on the calendar at eight hours. And, you know, there's so much that can happen in that time. And you have to be patient now. You're on the back foot, sure, but something else always, well, it usually always happens in an endurance race. It's happened to you now but now you have to regroup and focus on what you can do for the rest of the race. Keep it clean and just do your job. Don't get flustered by it as much as you can. Let's hear from Pierre Guidi in car 51. Guys, uh, Miguel is too slow. Copy that, man. Miguel is too slow. Well, don't forget, you've got a, a big game going on here with, and you can see that, you know, the Toyota out in front could probably go quite comfortably faster than that as the doctor watches on <laughs> there. Hello, Valentino. You'll be uh, joining this pack soon, and we can't wait uh, next year. Can't wait for that one. But yeah, so this is car 51 uh, with uh, Pierre Guidi saying, yeah, look, my teammate's a bit too slow here, but the big game going on of tyre preservation. Double stinting these tyres is going to be tough at the start of the race, and you don't want to unnecessarily damage them too early. A couple of quick points in this pack of uh, the hypercars. As Sebastian Berry, we now 3.2 seconds clear, but looking behind, fastest lap of the race now to Mike Conway, who has cleared the LMP2 traffic, is back to 11th place, under 20 seconds back. Also keep an eye on Will Stevens, who is catching Michael Christensen for fourth position. The real problem, as far as Alessandro Pierguini sees it, is that Buemi is going away at very nearly a second a lap, and you can't give Toyota that advantage. You just can't. You must do something to try and limit that damage. There is the Peugeot of Jean-Éric Verne, Earl Bamber, the dark blue caddy, the 94 Peugeot behind him, Loic Duval, then Lawrence Van Tour in the second, or now the first of the uh, second of Penske Porsches, and he's got the 99 Proton competition car, the white car with red and blue, uh, and WeatherTech livery. Back into our GTE pack. Iron Dames Sarbovi leads the yellow Porsche Matteo Cressoni second, then Liam Tornbutt's Aston in third. There it is. Fourth place, Kessel Racing's Ferrari, Takeshi Kimura. We ride on board with the Corvette. And that is a long way back, Ben Keating chasing Ian James in the Northwest AMR Heart of Racing Aston. There they are. And Heart of Racing, it was announced just a week or two ago, will return with Aston Martin and the Valkyrie Hypercar program in 2025. So from, yeah, we're definitely in, no, we're definitely not in, to, oh, we're back in again, Aston Martin's Valkyrie hopefully will make its appearance. Here are the two Iron Lynx run cars, the Iron Dames, Sarabovi, ahead of Matteo Crisoni in the uh, yellow Iron Lynx car. And actually, Sarabovi would do well here to allow Matteo to go by, sit in his slipstream, let him pull her along, save her fuel, save her tyres, save her brakes. Where we are right now, it's advantage to the pink car. They're going to do exactly that, by the way. Why? Because they're together on track, but it's the bronze driver in the pink car, and it's the silver driver in the yellow car. And they've still got an advantage of a silver and a gold driver to come for the, uh, the Iron Dames, whereas in the yellow car, they're going to have to burn some bronze time. Yeah. 
traditionally, most of the front-running GTM cars start their bronze drivers and give them a good double stint to get their teeth into it. So they get to qualify and they get to start the race. The two most high-pressure situations in the entire thing, but that's what they've come for. They've come to race. 31 WRT, 9 Premen. This is the battle for second in LMP2. And the uh, Oman racing Aston Martin looking down the inside the 21 Ferrari 77. Is that Christian Reed who started that? It is. Little bit of a big slide from that car. Half spin almost from Christian Reed. And behind him, the Ferrari, the Richemille racing team, Luis Perez compact. We're coming down the inside into turn four again, Anthony, He's with the Aston. It, trying it, but not quite going to make his stick that time around. Need to be a little bit more decisive and get at least half a car's width alongside, or at least side by side into that one if you get to do it on the inside, but clearly has the speed here. Lining up into turn eight, do you go down the inside now? Yeah, another little think about it, but I want to see a little bit more decisiveness. In the Carrera Cup races, corner eight became a big passing place. Now, it's been a long while since I was here with touring cars. Down the inside now, sorry, eight. Martin. Oh, yeah. He keeps looking. Oh, he is oh. backing out of it just in <laughs> the last minute. And this is Ahmed Al Harty, the Amani driver, so he's kind of near home turf, but he loves this stuff. Ahmed Al Harty, very aggressive racer. Here Got he comes down the Got inside. Got in this time. Takeshi Kimura, but Kimura on the outside line is going to sweep the long way around the outside, keep the throttle open, keep that momentum up. Yeah, Kimura is being uh, a lot more aggressive in this side-by-side -side battle around the outside. It's going to be brave stuff, though, and I think he might just get this done before turn 13. Yeah. Yes, he does. Well, look, look, behind the Corvette and Ian James, so Ben Keating in the Corvette, Ian James in the blue Aston. The Aston wants to get by the Ferrari, the Corvette wants to get by the Aston by the Ferrari. A mobile oh. roadblock going on here. Well, listen, GC3, this is where the bar is, OK? <laughs> GC3 manufacturers, this is the bar. And this, by the way, is as pro-am as GC3 is going to be. That was good racing as well, side yes. by side through the final corner. I don't think the pros would have been uh, that kind to one another. <laughs> and now you've got the 33 Corvette getting involved as well in the mix. This is Ben Keating. And Thomas Floor coming steaming up the outside. Pretty that wide. car's been really quick all weekend. He's going to do the both of them. He's going to get both of them done here. But he's oh, done. look out in wow. front. He <laughs> takes two, nearly took three. I can't believe he got that one turned. We all saw what happened to El Bamba. Keating's done it back, though. He's come around the outside of Thomas Floor. Cracking stuff. For, but let's not forget, these are the non-professional drivers. These, these cars are still relevant. The one in green might be a bit of a dinosaur. Sorry, joke there on the Rexy Very livery front. Uh, that car, by the way, is going to get drive-through penalty for crossing the white line at pit entry. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's 56, because they were investigating 50. No, no, 56 was called before the race start for that. Uh, that's just the decision against okay. the investigation. 50 also being investigated, which is Miguel Molina's Ferraris. We clearly saw four wheels inside the white lines. That's before the start. That was uh, Molina's oh. at the start. So th these are two separate incidents. It is this car, Rexy, from uh, Project 1 AO Racing, and it's PJ Hyatt uh, loving the start of this race. Look at Will Stevens caught Cracking right up to this. the back of the works <laughs> Penske Porsche. Now he's flying in this race so far. But the only difference between the cars is literally the colour scheme and the driver lineup. Not that the, the factory car, quote, does not have anything that the Joe car does not have. And some of the electronics as well. Well, Joe electronics Joe, but, can be different. And so, you know, Porsche have been doing a lot of testing recently. And you can do that as a newcomer in the World Endurance Championship. You have, you're allocated more testing miles than the regulars, say Toyota, for example. And Porsche have been using that wisely. They've got the budget to do it as well. So they've been pounding around, really understanding their car, something that obviously the privateer teams haven't got that luxury of. No, they don't, but they have had the electronics upgrade this weekend. So they've got to figure out how to use it. But the, again, the rules are, look here at the van wall. I was talking to Nicky Katzberg, said the real problem here is the LMP2 cars are slower than us and the hypercars are slower than us, even on warm tyres, the low speed of the GTEs is higher in the corners than of LMP2 and of hypercar. So he said, 
We run into them in 14 and 15. We run into them in turn one, in turn 10, in turn eight. Here comes Al Harty again, lurking down the inside of turn four. And that's quite a clever move to cross over and reappear on the inside of the exit of the corner. But he's not quite close enough. I see T's two, LMP2 is the Prema and the WRT of car 31 and nine. Eight goes second. 12. Yeah. Kaviopi, by the way, eight seconds up the road from this battle. I'm not surprised. Have you seen what they're up to? <laughs> so, Philip Ogran, the Hungarian uh, uh, Romanian driver, gets in front, and here comes Mike Conway. Dives by 99. Who started that? Neil Jarni. Yeah. yeah. So, Conway making headway here. He's got the uh, number six works Porsche in front of him now, driven by Lauren Fantor. He's next up on the, uh, on the list. Do you think Mike's radio will have calmed down yet? He'll be okay. Mike's pretty calm. He's he's a you know the good thing is clearly the car's not damaged because he wouldn't have this level of performance if it was. And he, you know he's uh, he's long in the tooth now is Mike in, in the, the game of world endurance racing and uh, or endurance racing in general. And uh, I'm sure he's going to be you know he, he's into a rhythm now. It's going to be a one minute stop and go penalty for the Cadillac number two for causing that collision with Mike Conway at Turn 1. That's the bad news. The good news from the team is that Earl Bamba is reporting there's no problem with the car after that huge lockup. Not even any vibration. Yeah, that is not. quite incredible, because uh, usually you're, you're suffering pretty badly from inside the car having locked up at high speed like that. But yeah, that's good news. We still haven't seen an onboard of, of that car yet, actually. And that would be uh, the, the final bit of convincing <laughs> that I need. As uh, Robert Kubica watches on with uh, his teammates and the doctor there getting involved, and <laughs> Louis Delacroix in the middle of it. Yeah, oh, he's, well, look, he's, he's, still a, he's still an absolute racer through, he, through he, oh, two or four wheels. No question at all. I mean, spends every weekend on his ranch racing dirt bikes against the MotoGP riders and his GP2, his uh, Moto2 and Moto3 crews. So yeah, he's in the saddle or in the in a racing car every weekend of every year. That's two cars now passed on this yeah. lap from Mohamed Al Harty. He's gone by the 83 car, now past Christian Reed. He's going very well indeed here, up into fourth place now, and chasing down Liam Talbot. Rexy in the pit lane, so PJ Hyatt has been in and out. That's that drive-through penalty serve for crossing the pit lane entry white line before the start. Yeah, there is a joke, isn't there? A bit of a dad joke that has the punchline, do you think he saw us? And they clearly did. <laughs> Very good. There's Ian James right ahead of our champion, Ben Keating. Keating will return to the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Series next year. Oh, dives down the inside. And that's the sort of racing that he's been doing in LMP2 over the last two years. Champion last year in IMSA's LMP2 category. Runner-up this year. And Ian James comes back at him. Yeah, the Corvette seems to be lacking just a little bit of speed in the straight line. How brave is Ben Keating going to be around the outside here? The two of them give each other room. And I think the Aston's just about got the punch up the oh. hill. And Keating sticks his nose back in there. Really aggressive stuff from oh. Keating and uh, made that move stick finally after that dive down the inside into turn 10 using the speed of his car where he needs to he knew he was vulnerable in the straight line before turn 11 he was trying to edge over to the inside of the circuit but just wasn't quite far enough ahead wow that was brilliant stuff this is before we get the pro drivers in these things <laughs> we are going to miss these cars quite often you get the better racing oh, by the bronzes it's, and the silvers it's just great well look GT3 when it comes next year, there's been more variety, a whole bunch of different chassis and engines that we've not seen and heard before in World Endurance. And it's Pro-Am, so the, so the bronze drivers will still be have at it, boys, at the beginning of the race, and rightly so. Let's hear again from Alessandro Pierre Guidi at Ferrari 51. I think he's basically saying he could get he could go quicker than this. Yeah, he's identified with his team. Yeah, he's identified with his teammate. He's struggling. Oh, oh 21. that's 21. Frank Desoto. Oh. Turn one, and that's as the traffic was coming for the 21 car. I think there might have been a bit of contact there, actually. The Peugeot could have been involved. I think it, it, that car was the one closest to car 21. I think we might see a re No, he just oh. lost it all by himself. OK. Yeah. That's good. In, in a way, that's good news. I didn't yes. want anyone to have been, you know, the cause of that one. As Conway gets very close now to Van Tor into turn six. This is for uh, eighth position. So he's already gone by uh, the Proton car and the caddy. 
Let's hear from the 50 Ferrari. Is he in a fishbowl as well? You see, I can go faster, but I'm controlling the tire. So don't ask me again. Yeah, we liked it better this way, and uh, the rear left is under control at the moment. Oh, they're worse than Luis's was in free practice. The important thing there is that he's saying, like I suspected at the start, I'm just looking after the tyres. You want me to do double stint on these tyres? Like, I'm doing a double stint. All right, stop we'll, it. You'll watch me in the second stint. Here's the stop and go for the number two caddy. There's the damage on the front after biffing. It was a two minute stop and go penalty. Uh, so uh, that's uh, one minute, sorry, that's the, the damage there. Now, if, if you're managing your tyres, let the other guy go. I, I can't believe it's actually taken them that long to come to the conclusion that I came to as soon as we heard from Alessandro. If he's faster anyway, let him go. As we, as we see them clear that traffic, by the way, you can see Ben Keating has now passed and pulled away from yeah, okay. James and is off in pursuit of the 83 car ahead. Had pursuit. <laughs> Uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi moves up to second place ahead of Miguel Molina. Molina may yet serve a penalty because they will look at him running off oh, track. Yes, sorry, Conway Martin. has gone by the number six Porsche, so Conway's now up to eighth. He's on a mission. Uh, he's never not on a mission, Mike, is he? Come on. The, o the only time Mike is quieter and calmer than when he's in the car is when he's in the commentary booth. <laughs> He's honestly, I, you know, that I, I genuinely you could set fire to his turn ups, and I don't think he, 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 anybody would know on air. Excellent stuff. So, good stuff from Mike Conway moving up the order. They know they must, well, they don't have to win the race, but they have to. Oh! 50 on the grass, and uh, on the, well, there isn't any grass, but on Sad. the runoff area, that's Miguel Molina. That was a big moment for the 50 car. Look how close to Porsche is right now because they were trying to get by that GTE battle. That's Christian Reed in 77 and Luis Perez compact in the red 83 Ferrari. And that's allowed Ben Keating to catch that pair as well. And Conway pa passing the uh, the other Peugeot there, the car 94 yep. for turn 11. Yeah, bottled him in, didn't he, there behind the GT car. What on earth happened on the exit of turn eight for Molina? He was completely off the circuit. Did he try? Did he get squeezed off the track? I trying to overtake a GT around the outside. Hopefully, again, hope. see here, here. So there's the second Ferrari we're watching. What happens there? Well, there? it's the unsafe rejoin of Lewis Perez Compang. Suddenly, there's nowhere to go, and right. Molina fight. The, the Porsche moves over on him. Let's see. Right. So he. Oh, oh, so yeah, oh, he, he had to take the avoiding action of the Porsche that came in, and then. Just went to the outside yes. off the track to overtake. So if he wasn't going to get a penalty for what he did at the start, he will get a penalty for that. He it was very lucky not to clip the, it was very lucky not to clip the barrier there. The barrier. I know he took avoiding action. Some people said, yeah, so it's fair enough that he overtook it, but you have to play by the rules as well. It, yeah. it was yeah. a mistake by the other car yeah. that he, had, he did took brilliant avoiding action from, but you can't just throw the car off the track to overtake even a lapping car. A lap Kevin Estra with a big smile on yeah. his face there. But yeah, Miguel Molina is having a bit of a Sebastian Buemi stint, isn't he? Yeah, Hasn't yeah. actually hit anything yet. But a range of emotions on display there for Kevin Estra, and sympathy wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> to spin down there at turn one at the top of the screen. Ooh. GT car. What colour was it? I think. Oh, it's number 86. Oh, OK. It's the GR racing car. All right. That is uh, Mike Wainwright, uh, the car for wearing a farewell livery this weekend. Porsche is starting to slip back here, isn't he? Now, now he's got the Porsche of car number six catch in, and the Proton's not too far behind as well. Let's let's back up to that Ferrari instance. How did the Proton Porsche end up hitting the Ferrari? Remember what Nicky Katzberg was t I said Nicky Katzberg was saying? The hypercars and the LMP2 cars are slower in the slow corners <laughs> than the GT cars. They get in the way, and so Christian Reed was trying to take his line, and the Ferrari sort of stops in front of him. Well, it was Ben Keating's excuse there. Well, that same <laughs> yeah, I've got much more mechanical grip than that uh, number 77 Porsche. Wow, that's uh, yeah, some great racing going on, but a little bit frantic at times, I'd have to say, on in terms of the braking zones. This is a circuit where you make a lot of lap time up on the brakes, but they're getting a little bit. Last race of the season, this is gloves off, you can see. Back in the day, gentlemen would have jousted on horses with poles. <laughs> now, <laughs> in kinder fashion than that. Yeah. yeah, this is still very much gloves up, sleeves rolled up, gloves off, have at it. Marquis of Queensbury yeah, rules. Fantastic. It is fantastic, actually, and, and still, you know, Christian Reed having a moment there. Look at the Jota car now. Is that a change of place? No, that's Will no, Stevens still battling. Still battling. Still right behind. But look at the Ferrari. 
the, the Porsche uh, was right behind the Ferrari, number five car, Michael Christensen, and now the Ferrari's pulled out a couple of seconds look in a Will lap Steve and a bit. Look at Will Stevens here, putting the pressure on the works Porsche. Um, yeah. This is a really impressive stint so far for Will. Has he saved enough tyres, though, for that second stint? We'll, we'll find out in due course, but this will be interesting, catching slower cars through oh. turn six. And this is where the hypercars are considerably faster than the GTs. Now, Will has him in his sights before turn eight. Not even going to think about it. He's going to follow him through on the inside. Good driving by Liam Talbot there in the D-Station car. Saw the danger out of the way. Yep. Because you don't want your race ruined by some doofus in a hypercar running into you. But, uh, by the way, uh, great stuff from Liam Talbot. First race in quite a while in the GTE spec car. Got a little bit of a fine uh, yesterday. The pants. Well, I'm never going to believe a word that Will Stevens says to me again. I bumped into him before the, the start of this race. And how's it looking? You know, it's qualifying it didn't look so good, but what happened? You got the speed in the, ra in the race today. He said, well, well, you saw qualifying. You said it yourself. So we got no chance. <laughs> <laughs> what does he know? Well, throw a dog a bone, you know, <laughs> and here's the opportunity. Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Just looking at LMP2, and if you can see Tom, Tom Blomquist, who started on pole, is at the back of the pack in LMP2. But I can see the team are out, ready for the rear wing. I did ask Ollie Jarvis, and he said, oh, we just got caught up at everything happening at the start. But it looks like that car's coming in. Yeah, it won't be long before we're due LMP2 pit stops either. We're 14 laps in. Uh, it will probably be the better part of an hour before we see Hypercar and more than just about an hour before the GTE AM cars fuel. There's the race leader still in GTE AM, still. Uh, oh no, it's Matteo Crisoni ahead of Sarvo, of course, and the gap there between them is now eight seconds. That's the difference of pace between Crisoni, the pro, and uh, Bronze driver Sara Bovi. That's really good pace from Sara Bovi, dropping just eight seconds in what's close to half an hour between a bronze and a silver. Yep. Well, so, yeah. Sorry, we're expecting the hypercars to do 31 laps in per stint. Obviously, it'd be reduced slightly because of the uh, the double warm up lap. 22 for um, LMP2. It's 22 for LMP2 and for GTs. It's similar to the hypercar, actually, 30 to 31. Yep. So P2's are two-thirds of the way through there, Stim. Hypercar about halfway in. Here comes Conway on Jeb. And John eric Van with the inside line. But Conway using the grip and sweeping around the outside. Nice. That's hard downhill into turn oh, 10. Very hard. And, uh, you know, that, that, and a round of applause for, for good measure as well. And, you know, that is no mean feat to go around the outside into turn 9 and 10. Conway, as you'd expect, absolutely flying. Sixth place now for the recovery number seven. And joining us late, uh, this recovery drive from Mike Conway as a result of contact to the rear at turn one from the number two Cadillac with left El Bamba serving a one minute stop and hold. If you're joining us after the second corner of the race, Mike Conway is at the back of the field and working his way forwards because he was nerfed round in the first corner of the race. Yeah, ironically, Earl Bam was saying, I'm going to have to really watch out for Lawrence Van Tor alongside me as the unguided uh, uh, you know, cannon rolling round the deck in the first corner. And it was Earl himself who locked up on the inside as the track drops away a little and skated off, unfortunately, without missing everybody. As a mark, by the way, of just how close this is at the moment, we're talking about gaps, but we're half an hour into this race. We've got two cars with delays in the hypercar class. The Cadillac after serving that penalty, the fan wall after the replacement nose of the contact, it suffered on uh, lap one and a drive through. The remaining 10 cars, 25 seconds apart between the 10. Let's hear now from the number eight Toyota, our race leader is Sebastian Buemi. It's the most understeer I've had this whole weekend now. Copy, Seb. Foxtrot 1.44 at the moment. I guess we're losing a bit behind the Cadillac as well. Okay, Seb, you're doing a really good job. Obviously, Mike is fighting his way through the field, so you're saving a lot of tire on entries compared to him. And that is where the advantage lies of having a 12 second advantage after 14 laps for Sebastian Webby. He's going to meet the same amount of traffic as Mike Conway, but he is able to pick and choose a little bit more. And Anthony means he can be just a fraction kinder on his tyres and on his brakes and on himself. And 
What difference does a fraction make? Well, this is a fraction of sport. Well, this is a circuit where some understeer, even sometimes quite a lot of understeer, can pay off as car number six now, Van Tor, yeah, fights his way past uh, 94. Uh, that is uh, Jean-Éric Verne, at the, no, sorry, not Jean-Éric Verne, Loic Duval at the wheel, that one. And uh, yeah, so the Peugeot's just continuing to slip back in this race today. But going back to Buemi, yeah, okay, he's identified there's a lot of understeer in that car, but it's not necessarily such a bad thing when you're trying to take these tyres long into the race. As we said, 30 to 31 laps per stint, and you're looking to double stint them perhaps. So uh, you don't want, this is a track that usually degrades the rear tyres more than the fronts. Hence, you want that balance to be that way in a car. New rear clip for the Tom Longquist pedal 23 car, so clearly he's feeling something from that uh, lap one uh, issue. Yeah, through turn two, he got turned around, but I believe it wasn't uh, due to his own fault. It, it was that, that chaos going on in, in the middle of the, that corner. Because he joined the track, he gets going again, but clearly he wasn't able to make his way through the field. Now, I wonder, I wonder how long they've made him hold on before he fueled, because most race distances don't divide up neatly into a full tank of fuel. So it may be that there's a sort of half stint done or two thirds stint done right. Come in now and then we're going to be on a different fuel strategy from all the others, but you've got clear track in front. We've not seen a replay of that incident. Uh, by the way, one quick thing to, to add in. One, one of the things that uh, Seb Wayne was complaining about losing pace was he's just lapped the, the, uh, the Cadillac. Uh, he was stuck behind the Cadillac for a couple of laps. We saw the nose section being replaced on the van wall. We've now seen the tail section being replaced on the United car. Is that cause and effect? Well, I think there were three or four different cars involved in two or three incidents. Louise Beckett? I would say there was there was um, signs of damage on the front and the back of that 23, but more so on the rear right. Yeah, the bit that we could see, the outside, the left-hand side, looked fairly straight, but then yeah, it doesn't take a lot, knocked off there were multiple below sidelines. Yeah, without exactly. a show of doubt, Kuba Shimoski is in the pit lane now in the 34 car, our Le Mans 24 hours LMP2 winners from into Europe. Yeah, they're very fragile cars, those LMP2s. You've got to keep your nose clean through the whole race. This is a team that is battling for second in the LMP2 category. It is a one-point battle, and Will Stevens down the inside of Michael Christensen, who has a big lock-up in the battle for fourth. So watch this, Christensen's going to get the run here on the exit of turn two and three. This is quite a common sight through turn one and two, so Stevens got to hang on to this one. Now on the inside, the drag down towards turn four. He does hold on to it. Christensen's going to try and cross the line once again to appear on the inside of turn four job is done for will stevens meanwhile conway catching that fighting duo the whole time well he's catching them hand over fist at the moment isn't he? he's absolutely torn up behind them as they battle for each other down into eight there's conway behind so the pressure is not off for christensen he wants to get the place back from will stevens but he's not in a position where he's going to be able to hold off mike conway for long yeah the battle with stevens compromised him in trying to fend off or trying to keep the gap to the toto that's uh, close to uh, nothing and it is a fully fired up mike conway now battling away for fifth position great stuff by will stevens i said it before but to do that in the customer team you know, great stint by him. It shows that the team are really on the song as well with that car, and probably the reason why they weren't quite as fast yesterday. I mentioned the balance that you need around this circuit. They might have gone for a car that had a bit more understeer, perhaps, throughout the whole week, looking for this very moment in the race today where you have to start thinking about, very much so, tyre preservation, and, and that can go against you in qualifying. We see it so many times in the past that, you know, I've always said, never got to the end of an endurance race and wished I had a better qualifying position because <laughs> it's such a long race and you spend much more of your time hating the balance of your car if you focus too much on qualifying. Ben Keating just ahead of us there as we're right in the thick of the battle for eighth place in GTM. Thomas Floor looking back at him, riding on board in Thomas's passenger seat. Uh, the oldest winning race driver in GTEM history. He was the oldest 
to take a first win, and he is currently, since Fuji, the oldest current winner as well. Ben Keating due to come in for fuel and tyres shortly to get himself out of traffic, passing, oh, <laughs> in the uh, understated words of uh, the team, it has become difficult. Yes. <laughs> this was nice from Conway, took a really nice line through six, Got seven, yeah. lined himself up for turn eight. Nicely done there by Mike. Quite a big lock up down the inside from the rear tyre, though. Left a lot of rubber on the road. And he hangs on. I mean, the Toyota does, should look more balanced here. Porsche haven't raced the 963 here. Peugeot have raced the 9X8. But it is Toyota that have all the knowledge advantage of this hypercar here and of these tyres here and of generally racing in Bahrain here. So they should have that advantage in the locker. Halfway through the first of eight hours in Bahrain, then Keating in the pits for fuel and tyres. Let's hear from the 38 Jota car of Will Stevens. Good, Will, very good. Thanks and for Bolina, gap to Bolina, 3.6. Yeah. Uh, no worries, we keep going. All right, that is a half lap old because the gap is now down to 2.4, not 3.6 to Miguel Molina. Yeah, baby, I think Will Stevens might be having fun. Whenever you hear a driver conversing with their engineer like that, you know they're in such a happy place. And that's where performance comes from. And it is, it's, it's self-perpetuating, you know, the more, the better you feel, the better you drive. And uh, yeah, it just, it just pushes us here. He's loving this. He's found his way past that car there on screen, car number five. Yes, car number seven, Conway's catching him. But his focus today is trying to be best of the rest after the Toyotas. And here's why Conway is catching, because he was on the outside of the front row in the number seven Toyota. Miguel Molina goes down the inside, lock up from Brent, um, from Bamba. Oh, Bamba kind of in defense and catches the back of Mike Conway. Bits of Toyota fly out of the wheel arch. Oi vey. Yeah, baddie caddy, I'm afraid there. Yeah, well, again, watch on Molina, board with watch Molina. Molina crosses that line. He just about gets it stopped, doesn't he? Unlike Bamber in front, and yeah. the doors open wide for Molina after turn one. This is what it looked like from car 51. And again, taking the inside, loses out to his teammate, but uh, yeah, that was. Um, a nod of the head of approval by the teammates washing on back in the garage. Yeah. Car number six. Yeah, just has to go around the outside of that spinning Toyota. Nothing that Conway could do about that. And then you, the problem is, you see there how you had cars rejoining the circuit midway through turn two. This is the shot I want to see. This is on board the van wall. What happens on the exit? Well, he got clumped there by somebody. It's, it's another, around here. It's, it's around, around here. here. There yeah. we are. So he gets hit on these. He gets hit on the inside 23. by the 23. 23, I think, have been hit by somebody else. 22's been, I oh know that's the Alpine has been hit. So here's the United come back. Ah, so it's, see what I mean? Rejoining the circuit. So both it was 22 and 23. Four. It's both United. How often is it both United cars? It happened because of uh, the rejoin of the circuit of cars off track, coming onto, and it's just a closing door. That was Conway looking left to the right, to the left again. When can I get going? Waiting for the game. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't want to add unsafe rejoin and a drive through to the injury. So here we go with the Peugeot 93. This is the battle for eighth place. Neil Jani in the 99 Proton Porsche piling the pressure on Jean Eric Van. The Toyotas have, uh, the Peugeot's run, have gone backwards since qualifying. And uh, that incident, Phil Hansen and Tristan Vautier, who was in the number four van wall, being examined by the stewards. Through goes Neil Jani. Peugeot nice is struggling. There. Now then, they're struggling now. If they are more kind to their tyres, will they gain performance or lose less performance, let's say, in a second stint on them? That's going to be an interesting little metric to try and keep an eye on. Well, the gap uh, at this stage between, we have to say, about second place is about 20 seconds, a little less than that. So it could come back. It's not a minute. What are we seeing here? This is the uh, Peugeot, Van under Tor. pressure. Yeah, Van Tor found his way past. Those Peugeots are slipping back. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced they've got better tyre degradation than the rest of them around them. I fear it might be actually the opposite. That's why they're slipping back. I know they're 
out of position because they didn't get affected so much in that turn one incident, turn one and turn two. Uh, so they, they got out of position there and the faster cars naturally are finding their way by, but are not convinced that, they're, that they've got better tyre deg as well. Gabby Audrey leading LMP2 is in the pits. So is Sean Galeo for WRT from second. So is Phil Hansen from third in the 22 United car. So is Rui Andrade in the series leading 41 WRT car. That's in the background there, stacked up behind the 31 car. So smaller fuel cell in these cars. They don't go as far as the hypercars or the GTE cars, all using Total's 100% renewable fuel, all made from the waste products of the wine industry. So they are as green as they can possibly be. Here comes Ian James looking to go the long way around the outside and Christian Reed, two team bosses. That's a good move. Again, brave around the outside and Christian Reed gave him a little bit of room to survive. Yes, um, that was good stuff there. Very precise driving with fine margins that you're looking at. It's not a, a common move, but we have even seen that move from the likes of Mike Conway earlier on in this race, pro versus pro, of course, in the, in the difference of category rated drivers. It's more often that you see moves like that occur as they, you know, you've, you've got discrepancies between talent levels with the silvers, the bronzes and the pros. Uh, the, the platinums, of course, and the gold. So, yeah, but it, oh, look at this now. Conway closing down and Will Stevens. As fast as Stevens is, no match for the pace, the sheer pace of that Toyota at this point. Well, we just saw Buemi in the middle of that GTEM group. Buemi's now at turn 14 as Conway comes out through turn 12. But most of the real estate between him and Sebastian Buemi, you can see in front, it's a queue of hypercars. Now then, two things happen here. He gets a slipstream from them, which is more beneficial than off a P2 or an AM car, which helps him close up. The problem is, Will Stevens isn't going to roll over and have his tummy tickled. So they're all going to be hard to pass compared to being slightly easier to catch. The good news for Conway here is, though, that they're both catching, him and Will Stevens, they're both catching uh, Molina right there on screen. Look, Molina's in a bit of trouble here. Conway is 21 seconds behind the leader. I guarantee when he rejoined the track in turn one, he was a lot more than 21 seconds behind the leader. So Buemi's doing what the number 18 do so often, trying to save a lap in fuel, trying to baby the tires. I think I'm right. At the end of lap one, he was 26 seconds back. So he's cleared that traffic and gained five seconds. Yeah. And he's, you know, you look at Conway's lap times, the last lap he did was a 1 minute 53.8. Last lap Buemi did, 54.4. Yep. I know that's just a snapshot yeah, because you've got traffic out there, etc., etc. but it just goes to show that Conway's got that speed to maybe start to chip away at the car number eight through the race. But car number eight, they'll be thinking about the championship right now. Yep. And so far, the only thing that's going to stand in their way is reliability or incidents like we saw down into turn one on that one because they've got the speed to cruise to second place if they wanted to. Absolutely right. They don't have to win. They don't even have to finish second or third, in fairness, if the number seven car wins. What's interesting, though, is how much Buemi is reining it in. 14.8 seconds up last lap, 15.1 this lap. Basically, in the first 14 laps, they got 12 of those seconds advantage. Now he's just reining it in. Gentle on the tyres, babying it, fiddling with bits in the cockpit to try and make the setup as beneficial as possible. And Conway's got to do the hard work. Look at the uh, energy graphics there on the left-hand side of the screen. You see they're running at 26, 27%. Conway's used a little bit more, so 25%. That's what would naturally occur in traffic. But uh, yeah, and they might be offsetting those two, two Toyotas as well. You don't really want them stopping on the same lap, don't forget. Best in to be in James's season comfortably, I think, at the moment. He's just gone straight by Lewis Perez Compact. Now, the Aston guys were saying that because there was no pro GTE Aston last year, their tyre development, because all the Michelin tyres are kind of customer tyre related to the car, their tyre development is about a year behind. And so they're saying, they have got a soft and a medium. Everybody else has got a medium and hard. So the Aston's got pace, but 
It's on a softer tire as well. Doesn't matter, they can change them at each stint here, but Ian James has just torn up the order now. There was some debris on track, bit of metal reported on track. So a brief yellow flag, that's being cleared. I wondered so if that far. was going to result in a, in a full yeah, course yellow from when he goes, that would have required somebody going on circuit to clear that piece away. He said it was a pit exit road, so it may be that they've got at least some visual yeah. protection. Yeah, uh, so they're waiting for it. But well done, the Marshall team here who are superb here in Bahrain. Right, what can Mike Conway do with this traffic? This is Thomas Floor. I think that they're working their way by through turn yeah. 11, 12. And actually, it's him. They, that's the car behind us there is uh, Stevens and Conway was blocked actually behind, so that worked against him, if anything, at that point. But it sometimes goes in your favor. Watching this battle developing, these three cars in hypercar, just one quick interjection on behalf of the LMP2 party. Uh, that is that uh, with all those pit stops, first pit stops complete, great run from Gabby Orbert at the start of this race. He's 20 seconds ahead. Yeah, he's driven brilliantly and uh, he put in a fine qualifying performance as well yesterday. Clung on to pole position for quite some time. I thought he was going to get finally get his pole that I still feel he deserved in uh, pulled him yeah. out of it when against him there. But uh, yeah, he, uh, he he's, he's driving brilliantly, I'd say, today and uh, a circuit that he usually goes well at. Conway now right behind the goal car of Will Stevens. Number six, Car Lawrence Bantor under pressure from Neil Jarney. Proton 99 Porsche still harassing the number six Penske car in front. So could we end up with a situation today with both customer Porsches beating the works cars? Because they certainly look to have the pace at this stage in the race. It, it's easily possible. They're basically kind of the same thing. So it just depends, yeah, on the luck of the draw. Matteo Cressoni still leads comfortably in the Iron Lynx Porsche. Still force to have it, I almost say Ferrari every time. That's the GTE AM leader with D stations, Liam, no, in, uh, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Iron Dames, uh, Sarah Bovey in second, D stations, Liam Talbot in third in the Aston. Lawrence Vantor, Neil Jarney, seventh and eighth. Don't forget that the, the Porsches were both kind of forced to avoid some of the drama early on, the, the Penske cars. Uh, all of them on a hard set of tyres. Charlie looking pacey here. A little fancy a bit of a go at this. It's not going to work out into turn 11. Although slightly better on the brakes, it's not quite enough of a hard stop into that particular corner. He's going to have to get a bit of traffic working in his favour, I fear. Um, because otherwise it's, it's not really going to happen. You saw how long it took Will Stevens to overtake and he had better performance than the 99. Proton, what's going on here in LMP2? You've got the car number 31. Yeah, battle for fourth. This is Sean Galel. And uh, in fact, battle for third Heinemar now because uh, he was behind David Heinemar Hansen. He's just jumped the Dane. Danish drivers have got a very good winning rep, particularly That's in GT. Yeah, Heinemar Hansen running a little wide at the top of the hill. No further investigation, by the way, about the start of the race. So that means that whatever went on with uh, Miguel Molina has been deemed all above board. That was nice from, uh, yeah. from Sean Galeo there. In fact, you know, the classic move into turn four where you start on the outside, cross the line of the car in front of you. And, uh, yeah, that was close, wasn't it? So oh, turn two, yeah. just yeah. chop yeah. your nose off, off I go. Yeah. But that's the kind of, that's the kind of precise margins that you're looking at from a pro driver like Neil Janney you know you he knows where the back of that car is and he knows how the speed that the GT will carry through turn two you, you're assessing all this stuff constantly from inside the car and that's the level of detail that I love looking at with the pro drivers let's see what's going on with uh, Pierre Greedy hey Ale, what do you think about tires do we stick to the plan yeah I would stick to the plan I'm worried that uh, I'm going to finish the car. Copy. So I was speaking to James Collado on the grid, and he said, we, we've just tried something, not drastic with the car for the race, but we haven't been entirely happy with it so far this weekend. And uh, you know, we, we've, we've tried something that we hope will work. And that's Pierre Guidi reporting that he's going through the front tyres a, a little bit more aggressively than he would have liked. But let's stick to the plan. It's, Let's see what happens. This, by the way, is the first period of this race thus far that Mike Conway is beginning to lose time to the leader uh, with this battle. You'd expect that as he gets further up towards the sharp end of the battle in hypercar, 
And so Will Stevens getting to grips with Miguel Molina. Mike Conway has got a fight in his hands here. Well, he's got seven hours and ten minutes to overtake four cars. How hard can it be? There you go. <laughs> it's our bumper bonus at the end of the season. Two hours longer than a regular uh, WC race for this season finale, and with 50% more points on offer. It reminds me of Antonio Felix de Costa at Le Mans. What was it, two years ago, starting fourth on the grid? I've got 24 hours to pass three cars. No, you were second. It's not. Yeah, second. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, sorry, Antonio, yeah. I've, I've definitely stolen that line from you. I loved that one at the time, <laughs> interviewed him on the grid. Yeah. So what do you got to do in this? What do you reckon this race, Antonio? Well, I'm in second place. We've got 24 hours to even take one car. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Yeah. Well. The gap continues to grow at the front of the field. Sebastian Buemi looking comfortable in the number eight Toyota. Mike Conway all over the back of Will Stevens in the gold Toyota Hertz Toyota uh, Peugeot. Oh, Porsche. Uh, but but uh, it's one of those still unable cars, to get yeah. by. Uh, it's the problem best, with the growing best. championship, isn't it? Too many cars now. You've got to yeah. Well, it, particularly, if you're, up. particularly if you're too close to my God. Penske Porsche Proton Peugeot paddle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody at home. Uh, yeah, Louise Beckett's in the pit lane. Uh, just as we heard that message from uh, Pierre Guidi, the team brought out three tyres. So the three tyres and the team are ready, racing in the pit lane. OK, now then, the only three tyre combos we've seen have been hard left front, hard left rear, hard right rear, medium right front because that's the tire that does least work but if they started on hards which they did that's not going to happen nope. so are they going to go hard front and medium 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 that seems really unlikely or are they i don't know i'm not quite sure what you're going to do with three tires rather than a pair or four well we're expecting to see hard tires throughout the race today for Ferrari yeah. and Cadillac. And, you know, they may right at the end of the race when the track's at its coolest and it, when, it's, when we're running under the floodlights, we obviously we end this race today in the darkness. You might venture onto the medium tire, but that certainly didn't seem to be the plan before the start of this race for them today. Well, Louise, what have they got ready? They've got rear right, rear left, and um, front left. The, and that's the only one I can see the compound on, which was hard. All right, thank you very much. Just as you were talking to us, up to fourth place has gone Mike Conway. He's got ahead of the 50 Ferrari and the Hertz Team Jota car. Will Stevens in third is right in front. So Stevens got gone by. Oh, and he's gone straight for it. Big effort from Conway. He's not taking any prisoners, is he? Turn eight strikes again. That has surprised everyone, us included. Mike Conway sent it down the inside super late. And uh, well done for Will Stevens as well. Seeing that one coming is very hard to see from inside these closed cockpit cars. You've got a lot of furniture around there as well, with the big wheel arch covers. It's hard to see. Let's have another look at this if it comes up. So this is how Stevens overtook. Miguel Molina, the car 50 Ferrari, breaks deep on the outside into turn one. This is going to be a fantastic move here from Stevens. He gets pushed out wide, keeps it within track limits and nicely on the inside of turn two. And then Conway, running on board now, Ooh. pinches the car in tight. He can see what's happening here and watch the run he's going to get through turn two on a more open line right round the outside and almost got Stevens into turn four as well as a result. That was some cracking racing. Well done. Great stuff in hypercar. Great stuff in all three classes at the moment in the still the first two hours or the first hour, sorry, of the eight hours of Bahrain complete well, this season. We're still in the first stint of hypercar. Only LMP2 have stopped and Ben Keating, who's been a little out of uh, out of kill. Uh, to try and get him out. Thomas Floor has stopped as well to try and get him out of traffic or possibly to give him a bit of a drink. But, yeah, we're still in the first in the hypercar. I tell you what, though, full access after this race in about 10 days' time is going to be apt. I don't know how they're going to cram it in. It's going to have to be a mammoth Christmas special, which there accidentally, uh, incidentally, will be coming as well. There will be another full access Christmas special, more behind the mask, behind the scenes uh, stuff coming up on the uh, WC YouTube channel. So look out for full access probably in about 10 days. So a week on Wednesday or so, it should be out and about. Our crews with their fly on the wall view of what's going on. Begin to get some more of the GTE pit stops as we're on board now with the 22 United Autosports uh, involved in that clash on the first lap with the sister car and the van wall. 
Uh, Thomas Fleur in and out of the pits, and also on pit lane now, Lewis Perez Compank. That's the 83 Ferrari and the 54. So, Pierre Guidi, who's running in second place in the number 51 Ferrari, would have had the call, I'm sure, from his engineer saying, watch your mirrors in about 10 or 15 laps because uh, Conway is now the car behind you. Andre and he's seven and a half seconds behind. Sorry, Andre Negrau under pressure from Phil Hansen. Hansen sends it down the inside, moves up a spot. There's Philippe Signot watching the final LMP2 race for his Alpine team. Phil Hansen, the latest driver to announce that he will be part of this new Converge top class, in his case, uh, so far in the IMSA WeatherTech Championship in the JDC Miller Privateer Porsche next year for their joint races. So a growing crop of talented drivers making their way up the greasy pole. Louise Beckett, we're standing by for pit stops in Hypercar. Who's ready to go? Well, what I can tell you is ready in the number two Cadillac garage is a nose and a full set of tyres. So they're going to change that nose when Earl comes in. Yeah, that's what we've just been told by the team. So they do not lie. Uh, that, that's good news. They will need a new nose. And uh, going through there, the 33 car Van Keating. That was him slipping by Franck de Zotto. 10th place. Don't forget the GTE AM title already won. And look, 6%. So this lap plus one more maybe for the number eight and number seven Toyota. Could Mike Conway even have thought about being in the top three by the end of the stint as he was waiting for the traffic to clear to rejoin in turn one? Well, if, my, if my recollection is correct from the, that one, he's dropped maybe a second in passing well over 30 cars. Yeah. And look, the difference in energy, almost no energy saving. 5% left for Sebastian Buemi, 4% left for Mike Conway, but it was 6% left for the Ferrari. So actually the Ferrari has saved a fraction more than the Toyota. Oh dear, Thomas Floor. Is it still Thomas in that car? It is. It is uh, fresh out of the pits, getting a bit of a side swipe there. Not from, sure. Uh, was it Van Tor? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he did well to avoid that one, uh, did uh, Thomas Floor. Well, looked for well avoided, surprise, yeah. Face. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, he. he you know, you're aware, you can see cars coming in the mirrors, and, and particularly, I'm sure, when you're in a GT car, you're very aware that you are potentially vulnerable. Conway in, follows in our GTE AM leader. So that is Matteo Cressoni hitting pit road. And Conway in immediately drops to fourth as Will Stevens goes through for third. 13 seconds, by the way, the gap uh, first to second in GTM as the 60 car comes down pit lane. That's a cracking stint from Cressoni. It's a cracking stint, too, from Sorobovi. Fuel stops underway then for about half of the hypercar field. Number seven, Toyota is in. The race leader continues, as does the 51 Ferrari and the 38 Hertz Team Jota. Number five, Porsche. What have they got? That red label on the car there, on the tyre there, that's a hard tyre. And hards still on the number seven, but you don't change the tyres until you have finished with the fuel. So let's wait and see what goes on. Fuel guns at the ready. Now, uh, fuel guns. Wheel, wheel guns. And the air hoses. <laughs> uh, so there you go, the, the tyre change going on. It may be left sides only. That's the side that does the hard work. And so double stinting right sides mean you're only using half a new set of tyres every way, uh, every pit stop. And that's probably how most of the cars are going to do it, apart from GTE AM. 21 seconds on pit lane for the Toyota. See just how quickly everybody else has managed to clear this round of pit stops. 123 for the Ferrari, the Cadillac of Earl Bamba, 131, but that had a nose change as well. And another GT um, LMP2 battle. That's the 23, uh, 22 United car. Is that going back past 28? Yeah, it's uh, Phil Hansen making his way up the field. Uh, he passed Andre de Grau and now getting on to terms with David Heimer Hansen. Heimer Hansen, yes, that's right. Also a move, by the way, Tom Blomquist has passed. Dorian Pan is making his way now through that field. Leaders are in, so Toyota to number eight, Ferrari 51, and the 38 Hertz Team Jota Porsche all on pit road. So Toyota Gazoo Racing, will they do anything different here? 
Normally, Anthony Davidson, the Toyotas will avoid stopping on the same lap. There will normally be the opportunity to bring one in a lap earlier so they're not stacked together, slowing each other in and out of the pit yeah, lane. Yeah, exactly. It just, it just stops things getting too busy down there in pit lane. You always try to stagger your cars. You see now that's why the 51's in, the, the 50 was in the lap before. It's going to be just that side of tyres going on for Sebastian Buemi as well. And, uh, yeah, another important thing coming up for him. He's got to try and at least keep that margin. He's got a healthy lead over the sister car uh, with Mike Conway still at the wheel. And Conway's going to be going at it as hard as he can to try and reduce that gap now, and this didn't coming. Car number six in as well with Lauren Van Tor. So they're staggering down at Porsche. It's quite a common seat. Just gives everyone around the car more time to work. And the, the Hertz team, Jota. And there's the 51 just peeling out the pit lane now. That's the next car in sight for Will Stevens. So first round of stops completed for Hypercar. Number seven, Mike Conway sweeps around the nose of the cars coming out of the pit lane. Will Stevens in the Gold Hurst Team Jota car, and just behind him, Lawrence Vantor in the number six machine should come out, but Miguel Molina in the 50 car remains in front. So Conway in third. And at the moment, well, we'll wait for Sebastian Buemi and Mike Conway to complete the next lap. It was around 23 seconds, the gap from first to third before. As we see... Uh, There's some loose bodywork there on the car number 36, the Alpine. Yeah. I just saw the, the right-hand uh, wheel arch just flapping up that and was, down. That was, that was the car that had yeah. the, was turned around at the on lap one. That's some big damage there. PJ Hyatt just went by Mike Wainwright in their GTE and Battle of the Porsches. Hyatt in the green, Rexy. T-Rex livery car and Vaxivier, yeah, running a little bit halt and lame. They're going to need to put new bodywork on the car, otherwise bits are going to start getting pulled off by the speeds that we're reaching here. Oh, way too risky there. That was, Vaxivier down yeah. the inside of turn seven. That was never going to work out and actually ended up losing a position because Maybe of that. Maybe two. Oh. Nearly contact. That's Dorian Pan yeah. in the car number 63. This is getting very racy here it's between the Alpine. And now the Peugeot oh. joins us and picks as well. The hypercar trying to work its way through. Still low to Val in that 94 Peugeot. Really busy out there. One quick thing to point out from that last sequence of uh, hypercar stops. Great work from the Hertz Team Chota crew. They're in fourth place, but amongst the quickest on pit lane. Took two, three seconds out of Ferrari and a second out of the number seven Toyota Gazoo Racing Team on pit lane. Yeah, three cars managed a one minute 20 stop. That's the number eight car, the Toyota Gazoo Racing Team leader. The number 38 Hertz Team Chota. And the other 120 was Neil Charney in, uh, no, it was a Penske number five car. So, uh, Two Porsches and one Toyota having three quickest stops. And away goes Sara Bovi in the pink Iron Dames Porsche. Super busy everywhere you look. Hypercar, first round of pit stops done. LMP2, first round of pit stops done. And some of our GTE cars have been and gone as well. Ian James now leading the race in the Northwest MR. Aston Martin as Sara Bovi comes out of the pit lane. Not too far ahead of the Project One car in of uh, PJ Hart that's yet to stop. Ooh, oh, that's a big hit. That's a big bit. Brings you all the way back to Sebring when the Ferrari got clattered by a GT car right towards the end of the race. It's Long completely memory. unseen there, wasn't it? Uh, nothing that the, the Peugeot did wrong, just completely unseen. And uh, I, mean, I don't think you're going to see a lot of damage from that, but it was a big hit, nevertheless as Buemi works his way through the final corner. And look at the tyre deal. They've both gone left sides only, and that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Oh, no. Well, brand new tyre. Can't be brand new if the others have done one lap, so it'll be a one lap tyre. So they did a three tyre change potentially then on the Ferrari. And look at Conway reeling in hand over fist. Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the number 51 Ferrari. Is it too late to get a fiver on the number seven car winning the championship? If they go anywhere like the way they're going for the rest of the race, then uh, they're just going to be unstoppable. Ian James in the pit lane in the Northwest AMR Heart of Racing Aston. So that's our current GTM leader in the pits. Which leaves uh, leading the race now the 77 car. Christian Reed stays out, but they're the last two of the lead group two. 
uh, bring the cars down pit lane. Matteo Cressoni uh, will inherit that lead once the 77 car comes uh, down pit lane. Again, at this period of the race, by the way, not only is Mike Conway catching the 51, he's catching the leader. He's taken a couple of se uh, seconds out of Seb Boemi since that last set of pit stops. Yeah. Boemi's last lap was uh, six, seven tenths quicker. The gap to Conway, 24.3, 24.4 seconds. It is a lot of time to make up, but as soon as he clears, and he will, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, then the gloves are really coming off. Cracking run here from Mike Conway. Adversity at turn one, none of his own making. And since then, it's been all action from him. Has passed all the field, bar the car, the, the car ahead of him and the leader. Just saw the understeer creeping in there through uh, the, the very tight turn 11, uh, turn 10. And it's weird when you get in the car after you've just sided the tyres, like one set of new tyres going on just the left-hand side. So therefore, right-hand corners have quite a lot of grip because you're leaning on that outside tyre like you will be through here in turn 13. And you get used to the way the car feels with that extra grip because you're leaning on that outside tyre. When you come to a corner like turn 10, however, that left hand, suddenly the thing feels horribly, horribly undergripped and the understeer creeps in, so you've got to work it into your head the whole time. This corner here into the final corner, that's going to be good grip. Braking, the car might even pull to one side and you'll run the risk of locking up more on the right front than you will do the left front. That's where your newer tyre is. So you're, you're balancing this in your mind the whole time. Uh, I never really liked having that sided tyre effect going on in these things. Conway half a second quicker than the Ferrari on the last lap. In the inset, you saw Rexy having tyres. Here's the number four car from Floyd Van Wall. Looks like Tristan Vautier stays in, but Conway now ready to pounce. Now he's going to have to work out where he's getting by Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And as we know from GTE years of the past, he's a three-time champion. And this year in hypercar, Pierre Guidi likes giving away places as much as he likes handing the car over to a teammate, <laughs> which is not very much. By the way, the 56 car on pit road, you were just commenting on, Martin, that is the final routine pit stop uh, in this first cycle. The, he had seen Rexy down pit lane, but that was for a penalty. Yeah, so Conway right up behind Pierre Guidi. And so often, Anthony, it's if you're in a, a GT car, it's the presence of faster cars that are off the, the opportunity. But for these guys, it'll be slower cars holding up your target that might give you the chance. Exactly. And, you know, like I said before, sometimes it works in your favour, sometimes it's against you, depending on where you get that traffic. And uh, you're always weighing up the, the opportunity as well from inside the car. There's not much you can really do about it, where you catch that car, but you're looking at your competitor as well, thinking, right, where are you? What's likely to happen? Where are you going to catch that car? And how can I hopefully benefit from it to overtake you into the next corner? And a good place around here, for example, is catching a slower GT car into turn 12. So as you go through turn 11, you go up the hill where we saw the contact with the Peugeot and the, uh, no, this car here, we're looking at screen now, the Ferrari, the GT car. And it's that area of the track where you're hoping that your competitor gets held up directly behind the GT car and you might be able to pounce into turn 13. Anthony, your eyes are absolutely right. It was the 83 car of Lewis Perez Compank because the stewards have just said they're going to look at that incident. Indeed, as you would uh, expect. It's a race, a racing incident. Yeah, it it's just was. Racing, nothing he could have done. He, he didn't know he was there. It was a bit of a, a strange place to be. I, mean, I understand exactly what uh, Jeb was it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I understand exactly why he was placing the car there because uh, he was focusing on the car in front. And uh, yeah, I've been in that situation many times before. You can't have, when you're the, the GT car, you can't have your eyes everywhere. And you're expecting a lot of them as well to be seeing this very low down prototype on the left hand side where you're not expecting them. It, that, for me, complete racing incident. Conway losing time to lead a Buemi here in the Battle of the Toyotas. Don't forget, number eight leads the point. Number seven is chasing. They need to finish at least three points uh, places in front. And if they're not in podium positions, several more places in front. They're adrift by 16 points after number eight took what might be a crucial single point for pole position. So the number eight Toyota is quicker than the Ferrari, which is dictating the pace the number seven Toyota right now. The quicker Conway gets by, the 
more his teammates will start to believe again. In LMP2, as we're watching this uh, this battle, by the way, uh, quickest man on track, quickest driver, I should apologise to Donald of course, is uh, Gabby Obri. gets a slap quite rightly from Davidson for that one, uh, is the leader, Gabby Obri. He's now nearly 40 seconds clear of this field. Second quickest and making progress up the order is Tom Blomquist now. Uh, into the 157s for the number 23 car. Now it's had that rear clip replaced. It just goes to show that pace was there for the 23. Well, I mean, he was, what, six tenths? It was five, it, five tenths faster than anyone in qualifying yeah. for quite some time. An outstanding LMP2 qualifying performance for Tom Blomquist. Yeah, really, well, yeah, I mean, and he did it on the second lap as well with such high tire degradation to go even faster on that second lap was mightily impressive until Charles Malesi right at the end in the Alpine uh, stuck in that lap and uh, to, to get within three tenths of his time but until that point it was five tenths plus on the whole field which everyone's in the same car with the same engine on the same tires that was pure driving talent from Blomkis so I'm not surprised to see that since changing the bodywork he's starting now yeah he, he's He's fighting his way through the field. So Pierre Guidi did keep the right front on and change the other three corners, but it was left sides only, as we saw for the two Toyotas. So Mike Conway in those left-hand corners is just going to have a little bit less grip, a little bit, well, perhaps about the same in the right-handers. And that's why Conway was able to gain so much when, he, when Pierre Guidi came back out onto the track. I wondered how on earth Conway had managed to claw up so much of that deficit that he had, claw back so much of that deficit he had, it was because one extra tyre got changed on the, on the Ferrari. They, they were two seconds quicker in the pit lane, yeah. the number seven Toyota, than the 51 Ferrari, but all of that time gained on the Ferrari is currently being lost against the number eight car. Gaps now out to 28 seconds, first to third. Slightly odd question here. You've got the, this, the tactic here of changing two tyres, changing three tyres. What that means, of course, is you've got one more tyre up to temperature when you're leaving the pits. How big a difference can that make? Well, quite often now what we see, Graham, is the, the overcut works in yep. sports car racing because of the, the tyre warm-up process. They don't have the blankets anymore. You can't preheat your tyres. So you see the overcut work in leaving your car out there for longer if you can, like Will Stevens did compared to uh, Mike Conway, for example. Uh, Conway pitted before them. So the undercut doesn't really work anymore in, in, in sports cars. It's more the overcut. Um, and yeah, of course, you know that you you get more performance in many ways by running one extra lap on hotter, but they're, but older tires than you do on necessarily on a brand new set of tires that are, that are stone cold or ambient temperature. Strange little anomaly has just cropped up. Into Europol have been in and out of the pit lane. Albert Costa now at the wheel of the 34 car. Now, I was talking to the team beforehand and they said, don't be surprised if you see some slightly odd strategy calls. They are in second in the points, one point above third. They have got a massive battle on their hands, so they're going to try and start doing things slightly differently. So they put in Albert Costa. Don't forget, it's the car that won Le Mans. So they've got very little left to prove, but they would just love to keep their runner-up spot in the title race. You remember the minimum driving time different because it's an eight-hour race. One hour and 40 minutes for a silver or bronze in the Olympics. Sorry, guys, this could be quite interesting here. So uh, this is exactly the kind of scenario I was talking about with uh, the car getting held up in front through turn 13, but he's cleared him now before that final corner. So it's kind of like a scenario pretty much like we just saw there. If that had happened slightly earlier, it would have really compromised Pierre Guidi's exit out of turn 13 a bit more. But I think because of that even, Conway is slightly closer this lap. And Pierre Guidi would have had to pick up more marbles in his tyres, don't forget, by going on the inside down the straight. Is Conway thinking about it? No, he's lifting coasting off the throttle into turn one, but that that's the closest he's been, and I think it's because of that moment in 13. Look at Conway's turn progress, one. second, last, chung, 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 up to seventh place, and now up to third place. So all the way through the field, he's just carved his way through. It's been really
really electrifying to watch. The, the places he's chosen to make passes, he's shaping up down here. This is the beginning of a run down into turn eight, is it? Is he going to get close enough? He's not going to get close enough down the hill. No, you get the separation of the turbulent air, the faster speed you go, the further back you see the car go when you're going through corners. It's your friend in a straight line, the slipstream. If the car in front pushes a or punches a hole through the air and you can slipstream up to them, but in a higher speed corner like this part here in turn six and seven, it's your absolute enemy. You're in the turbulence, you lose the downforce through the, the flow of the car. They can follow each other closer, say, than an F1 car can, but it's still not close enough to make a, a serious challenge down into turn eight. Porsche, time, Porsche time, was here. Yeah, time to pop some peas. The Porsche Penske uh, of Michael Christensen, ahead of the Proton competition car. The Porsche of Neil Jani and Lawrence Vantor in the third of those Porsches. This That's is, the battle for fifth, uh, sixth place now. That this is actually Vantor catching Neil Jani, who is with Michael Christensen. So this is a real world battle between the three 963s on the screen here. There's four of them on track with the 38 car up in fourth for Hertz Team Jota. But these are battling away for, uh, for sixth place. Just hoping to hear from the Toyota number seven team. Mike Conway, pretty busy at the moment. I imagine that they were trying to suggest to him a little way of finding something in advantage over the Ferrari. He is all over the back of it. And Davidson, this is where years of racecraft have to come to play, not just when you're attacking, but when you're defending as well. Yeah, like a high speed game of chess going on here for Conway. He's sussing out where the car's faster but uh, he's in this turbulent air pretty much all the time. And just as I was saying, this, they're working their way past the uh, interior of Vault through turn one, this uh, trio of Porsches with the, uh, the customer team, the Proton in the middle of them. He's the sandwich, he's the, uh, the jam in the sandwich. But yeah, Conway really trying to work out where he can get this move done. And now Jani under pressure here, a flash of the lights from car number six, uh, Laurent Van Tour, just letting the Itzira pole car know that he was there. Didn't want to get the, uh, the nose chopped off into that one. He's got uh, bigger battles going on himself with the car in front, as you can see there. Yeah, so too is Albert Costa in that yellow and green Itzira pole car. They're playing a very different strategy battle. Let's see if we can catch up with the seven car. OK, Mike, we need to protect a bit the rear, watch out the rear locking end of braking. We can pass them on third management. Oh! That was a touch, wasn't it? That was a touch from behind. Lawrence Van Tor just snagging the back of Neil Jani. And it makes such a difference. The car's right on the limit of adhesion there. Tiniest of touch. You could lean on it with your hand and it would skid. That was smart from Jani, though. He completely boxed him in using the GT car for good effect. And uh, said, OK, you're going to tag the back of me into turn 10. Watch this. Neil Jarni not to be trifled with on no. any other desserts for that matter. It wasn't it's malicious, of course. No, no, it was no, just no. a mistake into turn 10 uh, from Van Tor, but it uh, just goes to show the margins that we're looking at. Conway now looking at uh, him having to protect those rear tyres we just heard from his engineer, and that's not the message you want when you're inside the car. You've got your eyes full of the back end of that Ferrari in front of you wishing for a mistake, but Pierre Guidi so far been absolutely faultless. We've got some traffic coming up here though, exiting turn four. How's this gonna play out through turn six and seven? And suddenly that turbulence that I talked about decreases because right here, there's nothing that Pierre Guidi can do about it. Conway can catch up through that part of the corner and Pierre Guidi's gonna go down the inside and cover the inside from Conway as well at the same time. It's moments like that where you think, you know, the balls get thrown up in the air and you see how they land sometimes. Absolutely. They're coming through battles in GTE as well. Just looking in the background there, the ORT by TF car getting by Ben Keating. That silver driver, Michael Dynan, against bronze driver, Ben Keating. Ben Keating seems to be in a bit of a fuel saving mode as well. Liam Talbot in the D station racing car. We saw him pulling clear out of the way of hypercars before to not get tagged. He's still third in GTE Am. So the D station car having a really strong start to the race after qualifying second but Conway not quite close enough to take advantage there to get by Alessandro Pierre Guidi but it's his engineer had the right information and, and I think you know Mike's driving a very 
level-headed race considering what happened to him at the start here today and I think he's approaching it in the way his engineer was describing let the tire deg from the Ferrari come to us don't do anything heroic and I don't think Mike would but just in case he's planting that seed it will come to us they've put one extra new tire on than us but even still I believe our tire deg will be better than theirs and maybe we'll have to set ourselves in the pits as well uh, Antonella Coletta watching on with the rest of the Brains Trust at Ferrari. And of course, Toyota have more experience of this hypercar. They will know better how to manage the tyres here than the Ferraris or the Porsches. Peugeot, not much of an element here. One hour done in the eight hours of Bahrain season finale, round seven of the FIA World Endurance Championship at our traditional end of season venue. Bahrain International Circuit always producing great racing and thrilling championship fights. And more than half the titles in the field still very much up for grabs from the front to the back. Toyota locked out the front row in qualifying using medium tyres rather than the hearts of everyone else to give themselves the start advantage. Buemi on pole, lock up from Earl Bamba though, contact with the back of Mike Conway's number seven car, chasing in the championship, and he would rejoin towards the tail of the field after there was further contact at the back of Hypercar and in LMP2. It's the 36 Alpine getting tagged in the front. Andre Negrao having to rejoin the two United Autosport cars also going off and making contact after having made contact with the number four Van Wall. Cars off everywhere. A very wild first turn in Bahrain. The long and the short of which was Sebastian Buemi in the pole seating number eight Toyota out front. Teammate Mike Conway at the very back of the field fired up Will Stevens, carving his way through the order in Mighty 38, Hertz Team Jota's Porsche, and then moving ahead of Polsa to Sara Bovi, her teammate in the Iron Lynx Ferrari, Matteo Cassoni starting the race, Silver Driver pulling away at the front of GTE Am. Battles all the way up and down the order in LMP2, a penalty for that first lap contact for the number two Cadillac of Earl Bamba, and the Ferrari swapping position. Miguel Molina allowing Alessandro Pierguidi through into second place to try and chase down the leader. Conway was on the fight back. By a dozen laps in, he was into the tail of the hypercar field, having come back from almost stone last and challenging before the first pit stops came for the top three. The Peugeots, the Cadillac, which had had its problem, and the other Porsches producing defence, but not enough to hold back Mike Conway. The Porsches, which hadn't qualified as strongly as they might have hoped, and then both got sent off track. The uh, Penske cars in that first corner, Farago, trying to make up for lost time as Conway fought his way past first one, then the other. Wemi was still comfortably out front and able to build a big cushion over any rivals. Which brings us down to the first round of pit stops. 51 Ferrari, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, just ahead of Mike Conway in the battle for second place, but nearly half a minute behind Sebastian Buemi, the race leader. Further back down the order, 99, the Proton Porsche, Neil Jani, in a battle with both of the Penske cars, Michael Christensen and Lawrence Vantor. Vantor catching him from behind as he in turn caught Christensen. And Gianni feeling the pressure as Vantor leaned on him in the final corners. If you can lean, I can lean too. So back with live pictures, Lawrence Van Tor, Neil Jani.
Drive through penalty being assessed for the 83 Ferrari. Lewis Perez Compank for contact with the 93 Peugeot. We've seen that. Yeah. Perez Compank just being in the pit lane, so I think he may just have served he, that. He did. Uh, feisty stuff there from Neil Yarney. Also a penalty, by the way, going the way for Phil Hansen. There will be a one minute stop and go for that car. That is for the contact with the van wall on the first lap as we've got the lead group in LMP2 making their second stops now. Now, on video, we saw that within 60 seconds. It's taken them 85 minutes to come to that decision in the stewards' room. Clearly, lunch was good. <laughs> Fastest first sector of the race in LMP2, Juan Manuel Correa, who's taken over the number nine at Prema Racing Car. He's on an absolute tear, trying to close up behind Albert Costa in the inter-Europol machine. Lead four in LMP2 back in the pit lane, and Neil Jani and Lawrence Van Tour uh, seconds out, round two. Oh, yes, uh, this is uh, World Championship Boxing. Porsche 963 <laughs> style. I might have just looked up a little bit late there. I think there was potentially contact through the exit of turn 11. Jani now defending on the inside once again. You sound final surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's not GTEM, but go. it is just as entertaining. Jani a little bit late. And here comes Lawrence Van Tor. And he's going to be boxed in behind oh, the yeah. Aston Martin. Lean on him, lean on him. You see, Neil Jarney used a different Aston Martin to box in Van Tor before. He's repaying the compliment. Jarney managed to find a way to squeeze through, though. He saw the danger early. Back off the line. He's, he might get a decent run here yeah. to, to potentially repass towards turn four. But I think Van Tor is going to be just about OK. He got, he got the car turned enough as well. Yeah, so Janny's going to have to sit behind him for this one. But uh, interesting, Janny had the speed in the first half of that, of yes. that, uh, of that stint, or, well, the first stint. In the second stint, it's the other way around. So I don't know whether they've got exactly like for like in terms of tyre offsets. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, it's, it's the works portion out that seems to have the advantage back in their favour. You're absolutely right. The nine, uh, the 99 car uh, caught right up to the back of the number five, which is running in sixth. Uh, with Vantor then catching the 99, now passing, and now 99 dropping off. So, time management strategy is rather different here. And uh, Conway just not quite as close as he has been uh, earlier on in this uh, second stint to the back of the number 51 Ferrari. Are those right-hand tyres on the Toyota just, and we heard from his engineer saying the rear tyres, the one you've really got to look after, are they just starting to... Uh, fall off a bit of a cliff here, who knows, or is Conway just taking a bit of a breather, understood he can't do it on track, and, uh, or, or at, this, at this moment in time, and then later on try and uh, push again. Trouble for into Europol, come to a grinding halt on the back stretch. <sighs> and now they were in second place after their slightly out of sync stop. Watch the lights go off and on, control all delete, and here comes the Prema versus WRT battle. Juan Manuel Carrera and Ferdi Habsburg, fresh out of the pits, Habsburg. And Albert Costa gets the car rolling again. But giddy up, come on, baby. It's not really convincing. Here we go, now it's on song, it's come up on cam. So the Gibson engine is running once more, but uh, that's... The only weakness in, in almost any modern race car is sometimes the electronics just go on the fritz and boom, you, you lose all that time. Vector Sport still lead in LMP2. Prema now second. WRT's 31 car now up to third. That's Ferdy Habsburg with the best beard in the paddock. Sorry, Will Stevens, you've been completely overhauled there. But the 41 car from WRT, Robert Kubica, they have just left the pits. That car still very much in the points lead in the LMP2 category. Yeah, critical time here in LMP2, not least for the 34 crew there. Matthias Kaiser now at the, the wheel of the Vector Sport car. 38 seconds is the gap one to watch with the bronze driver now at the wheel of the leading car. He'll have to do an hour and 40 minutes of this race. Yeah. He may not do it all in one go. That's it's quite brutal to do a triple stint, or it might have to be a quad stint to get an hour and 40 minutes out of the driver. So it might do it as two doubles. Meanwhile, we talked about the Porsche with the Proton being fast at, in the, during the first stint and then losing ground to the works Porsche in the second stint. Exactly the same thing is going on here with Hertz Team Jota versus Molina 
in the number 50 Ferrari. Having worked his way past the Ferrari, Stevens now looks like he might be under pressure in a couple of laps from the Ferrari coming back at him. Well, not so much a so couple of laps. The tires, yeah, and that's why all new, all around for the car 50 and 46 lap hold tires on the right hand side of the Jota. That makes complete sense. Oh, right. That's a very different strategy on the 50 car to 51 then. So, I mean, and that's the deal. As we said at the beginning, Toyota know the car. They've even raced it here before. None of their hypercar rivals, barring Peugeot, have. So they're all still learning their new machines. And don't forget, it wasn't until Spa that Jota even had the 963, the first two races of the year, they, they had two LMP2 cars, drivers in LMP2 waiting for the new, well, for their birthday present to arrive, not their Christmas present to arrive. So, yeah, it's, they're still learning, Ferrari is still learning, Sebring was their very first race with a brand new car in a wholly unknown category. Ninety minutes done, six hours and 30 minutes to go of the eight hours of Bahrain to take us to the end of what's been a spectacular season for the FI World Endurance Championship. Truly the, the launch, proper launch of Hypercar. We've of course had seasons before with a Toyota, with Glickenhaus, and uh, we'll miss them. Jim and Jesse, if you're listening and, and watching, we do wish you were here, and we wish you were coming back, but uh, they've been a firm part of the early part of the history of Hypercar, but boy, oh boy, has it blossomed, and it will only get better and deeper. I've got to put a pound in the swear jar. Apparently, when we were looking at the highlights, I said Iron Links Ferrari. I told you, habit of a lifetime. Uh, Iron Links Porsche. Next year, we're going to have to say Iron Links Lamborghini as well, so that's going to be even harder. One quick uh, detail, by the way, that we did miss, and with thanks to Stephen uh, Gilby in the press room, is Iron Links did ask for dispensation to change starting driver. Claudio Schiavone not feeling very well and unable to take the start of the race. Let's hope he's OK to get in that car. Well, I wonder, yeah, can you do a race without a bronze driver no. if, if there's force majeure? No, you can't. Why not? Because it's GTM, you have to have a bronze driver. But if he's ill and can't drive... Then they won't be able to... Then they, they won't they be able be, to complete the race. They playing that trick every no, single race. Absolutely. The, 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 the rules are pretty uh, straightforward. If you've named your driver squad, and you have to have a bronze driver and for that matter a silver driver in GTM. If you've named your driver squad and one of those drivers does not take part in the race, you are disqualified. Fair and enough. Well, him. let's that's hope that he's getting the treatment he needs. And that's why they'll be waiting until the temperatures fall and fall through this race as we go into darkness. Maybe they'll be ending their race with their lowest freight driver yeah. and the bronze driver instead of starting like so many of them do. Should be here, yeah. Here, let's listen from Mike Conway now. Okay, Mike, Alpha 93, Alpha 93. We increase the target, try to overtake 51. I increased the target, I should have actually increased the fuel target. Yeah, and that's going to give him a little bit more to play with on the end of the braking zone into turn one. It's coming up at the end of this main straight here. Now it's just got to get closer. Increase the target is, is counter logical. You think, oh, the increase the target, we're going to make the target harder to meet. What they actually mean is we're going to lower the target, so we're going to give you more fuel to play with or more energy to play with per lap. As we just saw on the onboard shot there, next time we go back to the onboard of the Toyota, watch for the top end of the dashboard. Some of you at home, wherever you're watching this today, might have spotted already that there are lights. So here, see the top lights on the top of the dashboard there? That's his liftoff points. So whenever the top lights disappear, you'll, it coincides with the point when he lifts off. So he's coming up to turn six. Uh, so every time they go up to the, you see them creep up, creep up, and then they all go off. That's his point to lift off and lift and coast into the corner. So making that change that they've, that they've made there at Toyota, it allows those lights to come on just a little bit later before that liftoff point. Frank, we're on board there with Francesco Castellacci looking at this car, Ben Keating's Corvette, but on the driver indicator, blue flags are being shown to them, faster cars coming up behind. He's new into the car, newer tyres, Ben Keating 
on a long stint here, trying to get through his major driving time and also to try and draw the car as far into the race before they need to stop for fuel again as he can. Two hours and 20 minutes required for a bronze driver here. And this is bronze driver Ben Keating versus silver ranked driver Francesco Castellacci, remember. So again, this ebb and flow in, pro in the Pro-Am classes in LMP2 and in GTE Am will come back to the teams that are burning the bronze time. Think back to Fuji, Ben Keating seemed to be running on fumes for about 45 minutes. It was just, I don't know whether they had some sort of magic full dust in the car or something it just just kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going and that's clearly where they're looking at here again if you can't beat them on speed beat them on stealth so it's in Castellacci's uh, interest right now to try and get past Ben Keating he's a lower grade driver than himself as you rightly pointed out there Graham and Ben Keating will be and Corvette as well in the car 33 looking to try and keep him behind as much as possible for when their higher grade drivers get in with Nico Veroni and uh, Nicky Katzberg. So all this time they're holding up that car behind. It's perfect for the car 33 strategy. Every single tenth, every single half a second, every second. Oh, it's got wide, oh. see that? Sorry to butt in there, just as we were saying, Ben Keating's made a mistake. So trouble for the five? Swap oh, just swapping. Yeah, yeah because uh, Van Tour, number six the last time around it was the fastest car on track as there is that move from Castellacci <laughs> as a result of Ben Keaton running wide in uh, turn 10. Well it's all going mental because uh, Cadillac Racing's Laura Wontrop Klaus has just walked into the back of it. it's exactly what we talked about she said sure I'll come and chat to you but you know we never get a, talk to, a chance to talk because it all goes crazy in the well it hasn't settled down yet has it we're only an hour and 35 minutes in Ben Keating on board staying in the Corvette and of course Corvette Racing's program continues in the IMSA WeatherTech Series and the GT3 Corvette will make its debut, its World Championship debut in 2024. So that's something again that is very much in Laura's remit. So again, you know, we talked about this right from the start of the season. Lots going on, you know, GT4 programs, the GT3 Corvette, that, that arrives next year. Again, exciting times because back with customer racing. Absolutely, no, we're really excited. Um, it's gonna be uh, eight Corvettes racing around the world in 2024, and we're growing from there beyond for 2025. So uh, that's pretty exciting and daunting at the same time. We wanna make sure that anyone who has a Corvette has an opportunity to have the best possible machine at their fingertips and can win. Monster lock up there from somebody. I think that was the idle 35 Alpine, or is it a 41 WRT? No, they're too far apart. So 34 or 35 had a lock up. So Corvette are coming, and I mean, it, it's GT3 is going to change the playing field for the GT cars. Instead of three or four brands, which we've had recently in Pro and Am, uh, or two or three in Pro, then suddenly we're going to have potential for there. There are about a dozen different brands who have a GT3 car that would be eligible. So it's going to bring on a whole new load of competition. I remember very early days of Corvette racing in American Le Mans series, 99-2000. On the side of the car, it used to have competition wanted because you were plowing a lone furrow, or well, they were then in those days. And, and now it's, you know, GT racing globally is just such an enormous market. Yeah, I think the opportunity for the GT3 platform really opened that up. You know, the manufacturers, we can build one car that we can then take to all these different series all over the world. And it's exciting to know what doors have been opened up for races that, for us, we'd never been able to think about because our car wasn't legal to run there. So I think it's great. And the more competition, the better. Because then, you know, when you stand at the top step of the podium having beat 12 different manufacturers, you feel that even more than two or three. I mean, it's great to win no matter what, but it's even more fun when you really had a bunch of uh, people that you're competing against out there. And we think back to the glory days of GTE with six or seven manufacturers at Lamar, with Corvette, with Ford, with, with Aston Martin and, and BMW and, and so on. And, and you know, that, that, that depth of difference and talent, that's what everybody gets excited about in sports car racing. Yeah, I, I mean, that and you come in, these cars look familiar. They look like something similar to what you could own. Uh, the Corvette looks like a Corvette. Yeah. Um, and even our Cadillac looks like that it belongs in the Cadillac family. It could sit right along our black wings and, and match, and you can tell that they're cousins. Um, so that's what I love about sports car racing is you can identify and really connect with the cars. Well, plus when the caddy goes by, nobody thinks, oh, that sounds quite French to me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> if you're going to do it, you got to do it all in, right? Hell yeah. I mean, and actually, you know, it's not that oh, well, that's the only car with the V8. It's certainly not the only car with the V8, but it's the only car with fat V8. Yes. No, it's uh, one of the things that was super important to us was brand identity. And in this case, not only is it the look, but it is the sound. It, re it reminds you it's a V8 at, at all points. Laura, I'm keen to kind of ask this question. It, we've got the C8R on track. It's the final race uh, for that car. The new Z06 GT3R is coming. It's another Corvette. And there will be people out there thinking, well, that's not that big a difference. It's another Corvette. How different are those two cars? How big an engineering task has it been for your team to develop this new GT3 car? It's a brand new car. Um, I mean, we basically, we used a lot of inspiration and, and our lessons from the GTE platform. It was really unique and exciting to have the opportunity to do two versions of the race car with the C8 platform versus we usually just have one race car per production platform. So, you know, everything that we had done with GTE, they were like, we wish we would have done that maybe a little differently or, or something. We were able to address that with the GT3, uh, but it is a brand new car and, and it's a clean sheet because you not only are you trying to, you know, make sure that the race car is best possible in the rule set, but it also uh, needs to be customer friendly since it's a customer car. When you have just, you know, one, one a team running the car as a factory, they can deal with maybe things that aren't quite right because they understand it. But if you've got cars everywhere, you need to make it user friendly and that the customers can easily understand it, get it up and running, and then be able to take it in, in any track across the world. I'll just mention there's a full course yellow coming. That's debris, I think, at turn one. I was going to ask this question. It's pretty late pretty in bad. the day full that we've got the, uh, the C8R program in GTR. How useful has it been for the development of that program to have? one of your GTE cars okay. in the hands of a non-professional customer driver. It's been Nine, great. In fact, eight, one of the things that was seven, important to us for six, this year for racing five, at WEC with the Corvette four, was, of course, three, to continue to race two, at WEC and continue building one, relationships full and, course yellow, and uh, full have course fans yellow. across the world as we we're started last year. The but then start, also to have that opportunity left. to work with Ben All cars as a bronze. To he really as opened our eyes to things to right, that we never really T1. thought about, being All fully factory and only working with a platinum drivers. There were things that were important to him, not only with the way the car was set up, but also in what he just expected with dealing with the manufacturer dealing with the team. So it's things that we were able to think about and go, you know what, if we design stuff just a little bit differently, it'll make it easier for us down the road with the customer program with GT3. Because they've got a big chunk of time to cover off in these races. Two hours, 20 minutes for Ben Keating in this race. And if he can squeeze that little bit of time out, he's going to make bigger strides than perhaps some of your pro drivers. Absolutely. The pros are all very close to each other. The big difference is in the bronze and the silvers. And I mean, I'd say we, we chose well this year um, <laughs> for our lineup. We're very proud of, of all of the three drivers, but Ben and Nico, really, they just did a heck of a job. Yellow in less than 20 stuff. seconds. Right, well, Eduardo, we just saw one of the uh, marshals down at turn one galloping across the road and whipping a piece of debris out of the way. In 10, and we are nine, preparing eight, for full seven, field pit stop, six, I think. Five, Pretty much everybody four, ready. You can see James three, Collado there. Two, Antonio one, Fuoco getting helmets on. Removed, full and I gather removed, that bear, the uh, number two car is just about to come in as well. So Earl Bamba should be on his way in. Now, there's a slew of cars shown a stop. That's just because they've gone very, very slowly through the timing beacons. They're back up to speed. So Laura always brings a little bit of entertainment. But you might actually get to, to call a, a caddy pit stop as well while you're here. So, well, can I speak? It's been great having a uh, Cadillac in the World Championship this year. I believe you're coming back next year with a single car. There was talk that there might be a second car, but we know there's a lot of GM programs at the moment. What else can you tell us about next year and what we can expect? Obviously, back to the Ipswich Weathers X Sports Car Championship. Are we going to see what we've seen previously? Maybe an additional car for an individual race or two? We are using next year as a great opportunity to finally have something that isn't changing. We had a lot of new this year, a lot of new, um, which, which was great. It was such an opportunity and to see what we were able to achieve in both series, knowing that a lot of things were brand new. Um, really, for me, I'm just so proud of the team and everything they've accomplished, looking at that especially. But we're going to have a little status quo get ourselves more situated. I'm pretty sure I have found the limit of humans with the program this year and what they're capable of doing. Um, it, we need to figure out how to staff up a little bit, make sure that people have a minute to breathe, 
Um, so we're super excited about that. But in terms of where cars are going to be, we'll evaluate it you know, race by race, what we want to do. Anytime we have an opportunity to learn, we take it. We just want to make sure that it's going to be learning and not busyness for the sake of being busy. So it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to really get a, a feel around this car, you know, get the team set up and then be ready for uh, 25 too as well. And we're going to watch this Corvette pit stop on the way as Laura finishes that answer. Corvette racing crew go to work. Well, One thing you'll notice here is the door does not open. Ben Keating comes from Texas, so he's used to he's hot weather. He's <laughs> locked it. He's locked the door. <laughs> I think they super glue him in, a bit like Alessandro Pierre Guidi does on the inside of the Ferrari. He gaffer tapes the handle so it won't move. Ben Keating, yeah, Aaron 43 in, he'll go for another stint and yeah. I want to ask you a question, Laura. I mean, you've known Ben Keating throughout this year and there's obviously met Ben previously. He is one of the characters in this field, and it's great to see that a, that a gentleman driver, a non-professional driver, with the kind of profile that he's got, just give our listeners, our viewers, an impression of what it is like working with the human dynamo that is Ben Keating. Working with Ben Keating is an absolute pleasure. I am going to miss him a lot next year. Uh, not only is he great behind the wheel, that goes without saying, you know, probably one of the best bronzes in the world. Um, he is just a good person. He's very easy to work with. He clicked in with the team immediately. He's got the same drive and passion that the entire Corvette racing team has. So it was very easy for them to understand each other, push him when he needed to be pushed, and he pushed them when they needed to be pushed, uh, which was great to see that happen. And then he just, you know, I enjoyed every opportunity I had to sit down and talk to Ben. He always had something interesting to say, whether it was about racing or, you know, what he's doing with his dealerships or just the world in general. I think mean, Martin and I, we had an astonishing <laughs> lunch with Ben earlier in the year. The van Wall goes way wide there in the Battle of Two P2s. Uh, astonishing lunch with Ben earlier this year where he was giving us a lesson in optioning road cars, if I remember rightly. <laughs> Absolutely gold dust. Absolutely fantastic. Laura, it's been such a delight uh, with the massive efforts that GM have been making in the World Endurance Championship this year. Having the caddy on board has been hourly a massive pleasure. The, the performance is clearly coming. It wasn't the start of the race you guys I know we're looking for. Great to know that you're going to be back uh, next year and that we can have two of these new, new Corvettes. Uh, we can't wait. You're going to be back with the team, I hope? Oh, of course. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm very excited. It'll be nice to maybe uh, catch breath for just a second here before we're back to Daytona in January. Um, but yeah, this has been this has been a dream to be able to do all of this and love being in this paddock. Great stuff, and we're going to finish that one with the Corvette there, closing on two of its greatest rivals, the, uh, the two Porsches, the pink one, and the dinosaur one. You get the big yellow one. Let's see what comes out on top. For now, Laura on top, Clouser, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Laura for coming in. Always a delight to chat. There's the Van Wall team. Ryan Briscoe in there, chatting to him about the differences between the Van Wall and the uh, Glickenhaus hypercar that he previously drove. He was one of their first drivers, of course. He said the, the Van Wall is, is much more compressed. His knees are much closer to his chest. Pedals aren't so much higher, just much closer. So he can't right foot brake like he would like to. Uh, he's looking forward. He said it's got a good stable platform, the uh, the Van Wall. Here's uh, this ongoing battle. This is the 23 United car and the 28 Jota car. Oliver Rasmussen in the gold machine ahead of 23 Josh Pearson, the uh, young American driver. He's always just seems to be about half an inch off the ground, Josh Pearson. He's so excited to be around racing cars. And again, there's Ben Keating straight up the inside. The two Porsches both ran wide. Sara Bovi ran completely off the track and PJ Hyatt followed her off. So they're, they're a lap behind Sara Bovi. So she doesn't lose a position. She is still second in GTM, but just washed right out there at turn 11. Uh, queue of cars coming by, there's Rasmussen going by. Take a look again, Ann Davidson. Was there contact here? I don't think there was contact, it's just Bovey on the inside, and then I think that, I think Rexy just sort of got a bit waylaid by Bovey going a bit wide. Yeah, no contact between any of those cars, even the van wall working its way past as well. And Keating just sees the door open in front of him, and goes, well, thank you very much. So he's offset, of course, with the, uh, with the pit stops but uh, just goes to show how 
as the cars continue to circulate here, more and more marbles start coming. You can see the, the bits of rubber that get flicked to the, to the outsides off of the racing line. If you venture onto those, as Bovey did, then suddenly you can just slip out wide and offline. You can see here the uh, car 63. Running midfield, that's Danny Fiat now at the wheel of the Prema car with Robert Kubica, the championship leaders by quite some margin, 33 points. They lead the LMP2 championship by coming into this round, but they still want to go out on a high. Had a pretty uh, dismal qualifying by their standards anyway yesterday. Um, second to last in class. And uh, Kubica will be uh, enjoying this battle. He will. Just look at uh, the lead of uh, LMP2, and I was expecting to see Juan Manuel Correa, uh, who's the silver driver in the Premier Racing number nine, expected to see him closing in on Matias Kaiser. It's not happened. In fact, Kaiser is pulling away. He's now 43 seconds to the good. It was 38. So it's been a very good start to the driving time of Vector Sports bronze driver. That bodes very well indeed. I should imagine in the LMP2s there, the strategy is a little bit more straightforward in terms of the tyres. Yes. I think the, the hypercar, they can eke out a bit more uh, performance from their tyres. And um, yeah, with the, the customer tyre in, in LMP2, the good years that they're on, they seem, you know, it's a narrower tyre as well, so they, they, they go off, it seems, a little bit quicker uh, on those cars. And therefore, every time you come into the pits, pretty much you're looking at you're going to do a driver change at least, you're looking for all four tyres getting changed. Keep an eye on the, the bronze time in particular uh, in the GTM class as we watch LMP2 and GTM traffic together. Let's uh, great. Talk you really need to keep your nose clean in traffic you like do. that. Well, talking about LMP2, the man who led the race from the start and led it very well indeed is with Louise Beckett now, Gabby Aubrey, Vector Sport. Gabby Aubrey, number 10 Vector, you did such a great job out there. You've had time to cool down and uh, just look at what you've done. Yeah, I had time to cool down. I just took a shower, feeling great. Uh, the number 10 Vector has been just amazing. I think we've been practicing a certain type of driving and this comes from a long time ago, actually. AD, if you listen to me, I owe you one. <laughs> I really owe you a beer on Sunday because that driving side, I think, is what makes us go on the long run on double stints and keeping the tire fresh for long runs is actually our strength right now. And uh, it seems to me here in the pit lane that conditions are starting to ease up a bit. Is that the case on track? Uh, hopefully, I guess. I'll ask my teammate later if you want. Um, to be honest, I don't try to look forward. I just get into the car, drive to the grip, drive to whatever the car gives me, and it seems to work pretty fine. So that's a strategy until the end. Right. Look forward to seeing you back in the car. Thank you. Thank you. Which, I was indeed listening, Gabby Aubrey, and uh, give which, away my secrets. Which AD was that? Drive to the tyre. I mean, that's a rule for life, isn't it, for racing drivers? Don't try and do things that the car can't do. It's a particular circuit where if you overslip the tyre, then it's going to remember that and punish you later on. And so many drivers want to hustle the car a bit too much. And this is a circuit where you, you just can't do that. You, well, you can for a certain amount of time, and then you're going to hit the cliff of the tyre. And uh, yeah, you know, hung around Formula One for a long time now, and they've got pretty delicate tyres as well, and they have to do a lot of babysitting with their tyres. And, and I could apply some of that knowledge of how they approach. They've got so much understanding, so many senses on their cars, uh, that I was able to adopt some of that and apply it here in LMP2, which is kind of raw category. Yep. And, you know, you, you don't have the, the luxury of all those sensors on the cars that F1 cars do. And I could just pick the corners where I know the F1 drivers manage their tyres on this circuit, and it really paid off. So that's Gabby saying, yeah, you know, I, he was teammates with me at, uh, at Jota during that time. And, uh, yeah, like I said, giving away secrets that filters down from, from the world of Formula 1, and that's how the whole racing world works these days. See, you're teaching him. He's now teaching Matthias Kaiser, yep. his own teammate. So that's, and that's all part of Aubrey's job as a pro driver in a pro-am lineup is to make sure that the pro 
is as quick as he can be, but also that the arm is as quick as he can be. And what Matthias Kaiser is doing now, not losing ground to any of the cars behind him, is, is a major feather in his cap. I mean, he's just staying out front and driving away. We well, might have cursed him. Yeah, desperate, de yeah. desperate timing, I'm afraid. Commentators cursed. 90 second stop and go penalty for car 10 for a technical infringement. No idea if that's to do with tyre management. Anthony Davidson's in massive trouble. Uh, no, of course, yeah, we need to find out from uh, the team what's gone on there because it has been a great start to his stint from Matthias Kaiser and a fantastic start to race from. Um, this is in the inside the garage in Vector Sport for, from Gabby Obrey. So something's gone wrong there. That's a big penalty. What could that possibly be? That looked like a, a walk out to go and see uh, have a bit of a chat with race director, perhaps. Down in Vector Sport. What on earth has gone on there? And that's a, a huge, I mean, that's a, a race ending penalty. 90 well, seconds. 90 seconds will drop them. Uh, all the way to the back of the LMP2 field from a dominant 42-second lead. Uh, so, yeah, that does need an explanation. Remember we saw, well, what we do know is that it's not the drivers. What, remember we saw uh, Albert Costa grinding to halt in a 43 into Europol car. They are also being looked at for a pit stop anomaly, so not quite sure what was going on with that. Now, the full course yellow that I said, oh, we're going to get a full full field stop, everybody took the helmets back off because yes. the full course yellow was so short, but uh, James Collado is now getting his helmet on. He'll take over the 51 Ferrari from Alessandro Pierre Guidi. There that car is in second place, not for three laps, maybe. Uh, again, still in third place and trying to well, trying to buy a bit more energy back, Anthony well, Davidson in the number seven Toyota. Well, it wasn't that long ago that we were looking at a battle, and effectively we were sort of waiting for Mike Conway to make the move for second place. Conway back now four seconds back to the second place Ferrari, so we get to a different phase of this ebb and flow with fuel and tyre management. Uh, we're not yet, by the way, we're four, almost five minutes away from what would be a regular WC race distance. Two hours. <laughs> the problem for Conway and his teammates, and we're talking about the championship here, started here as Earl Bamba locked up and knocked him into a spin. Uh, and so one side of the gar garage went, oh no, the other side of the garage sat on their hands pretending not to cheer. But the number seven car then cut, cut its way back through the field. He got as far as third, and that's where progress has stopped. And the biggest problem for them is not that they're only in third behind the Ferrari and they need more points, but that the gap to the leader is continuing to grow. They're now over 40 seconds behind the number eight car. And so that's more than they were when they rejoined at the beginning of the race and much, much more than they were at the end of the first round of pit stops. So they need to do something to get by the Ferrari. And Anthony, that something is going to have to be an overcut somehow in the pit lane. But they, they, they've got to stop after the 51 Ferrari to do that. Well, at some point, don't forget in the race, they'll have the offset now of the tyres. So at some point in the race, they're going to have the advantage of a fresher set of tyres on one side of the car because they've got the new extra tyre on the Ferrari at the moment. That will come around at some point in the race, and when it does, you'll see the, the Toyota easily surpass the Ferrari. The flip side of which is they've got four medium tyres that they need to use, and nobody else needs to use the medium, which has a much shorter life. We're now, by the way, getting into an intersection between uh, one of the strategies for some of the LMP2 teams, the earlier stoppers, United Autosports 23, the 34 that was in trouble a little earlier on, uh, for into Europol and the first of the hypercars, the 99 car proto competition on pit lane now for Neil Gianni. Uh, also in and out, the 23 car, and Ollie Jarvis joins the race for the first time. Albert Costa stays aboard that 34 car, which did get back up to speed, but I think I'm right, it's still under investigation for a pit stop issue. Uh, but those two cars way down the field left earlier problems. So then, so then ninth and tenth, and don't forget the 23 car that Ollie Jarvis is now in, that started on par. Yeah. So, yeah, seven is in Conway, so he has not outrun the number eight car. He has not outlasted the 51 Ferrari either. They're not going to get the overcut on this stop. Rolls down pit lane towards the welcoming arms of the Toyota Kazoo racing crew. 
as he does so. And welcoming arms of uh, being able to get out of the car and hand over to his teammate. Miguel Molina in the pits as well in the 50 Ferrari. He'll hand over uh, as well, and there will be a driver change in pretty much everything. Double stinting for all these drivers. Michael Christensen brings in the number five, Penske Porsche, and uh, just gone out. Harry Tinknell's taken over the 99 car from Neil Jarney. Driver change here, Kamui Kobayashi is in the, the number seven car. And they're cycling through their drivers the way they normally do. Meanwhile, 41 makes a pass on 63, or stays in front of 63. Didn't see Kubica get by Danny Kvyat, did we? Two XF1 drivers of different generations. Did you race against either of them? I, I, I did some Friday testing alongside Kubica. That I do know. Uh, yeah, Kubica would have been in the races, a thing that I competed in in, the BMW? in uh, 2007. BMW Williams, yeah. As well. yeah. Not Danny Fiat though. He's a he's a younger generation. So this is how it happened on the run up towards Turn Four. Kubica's already got him in his sights and in a healthy position on the inside. Gets the job done. Nice move by this. Kvyat tries to. Uh, do the old switch back and arrive on the inside, and that was the drag race down towards turn six where we picked it up, but Kubica had him covered. And now we see the number 50 exit the pit lane with the driver change. This is okay, Sarah, so no worries. This is okay. Bobby, it's also next driver. You put something on the visor because the sun is quite low now. Uh, yeah, the dreaded yeah. sun starts to set here, and just as you go down the back straight, it's just piercing coming straight through the uh, the windscreen you see a swap of positions here in gtm yeah this is still amado harty no it's mike dynan in yeah. the ort by tf car moves up to third ahead of liam talbot who started the race in that uh t station racing car interesting period of the race here because we're at the the uh that we're at the point at which they've got to fuel the cars but still 20 minutes of driver time for the bronzes left so what do you do short fuel it or do you Go long. James Collade takes over from Alessandro Pierre Guidi. This 51 Ferrari using a special brand new seat insert. So inside the carbon tub, there's normally a carbon bucket, and into that goes the molded seat that the driver uses. They're using a brand new seat made by a company called ASP, which has got a cooling system built in. Now, that happens a lot in road cars, but those are big and heavy. This is a brand new system from a brand new company that Ferrari are debuting here in Bahrain, the hottest race on the calendar. So 51 Ferrari heads out to pit lane, and there's the number seven Toyota, so the gap has grown, but don't forget the Toyota is on slightly warmer tires, so will be quicker on the next lap than the Ferrari is, having lost the time, and in comes the leader. So number eight stopped one lap before number seven last time, two laps before number seven this, or pretty much two laps before number seven this time. So they're looking to try and build that buffer towards the end of the race. Right now, everything is coming up roses for the crew of number eight. Yeah, your uh, pole position man, Brendan Hartley, gets in behind the wheel after Pretty, uh, it's never easy, but uh, an easier stint for Sebastian Buemi, watching your, your main competition in the sister car get nerfed around at the start and uh, pretty much just kept that gap growing throughout the uh, entire double stint there over the Ferrari number 51. Uh, you've had a little bit of information about the Vector Sport car that I, uh, I just WhatsApped Eduardo, the race director, say, what was the technical infringement? You've got an answer back quicker though, haven't you? It seems to be something to do with potentially with the tyre pressures. Minimum tyre pressure yeah. is, is uh, mandated, I think, for safety reasons. So it may just be that it was a fraction too late. They're in now, aren't they, serving a penalty? Well, are they in serving or a penalty? Are they in for a stop? Uh, they are. It's a long stop. So it could well be they're taking that uh, that now. That was, uh, we could briefly see Alex Lynn as well. Yep. Limbering up before getting into the Cadillac number two. See what he did there, limbering up. Uh, his driver manager is here. Dario Franchitti is in the garage there somewhere, or upstairs, or hanging around in the sunshine. Brother Marino here as well. I wonder if they're looking at a, a Franchitti crew. Holly races occasionally, Nick Mason's daughter, uh, Marino's uh, wife. Could, uh, they could put a, a trio together, an all-family trio. It's also Frank Kitty. 
Oh, hi! Oh, you, <laughs> you hum them, son, I'll play them. There's the number 10 vector car back out of the pits, and it is WRT's number 31 car that has the lead with 30 Habsburg, Jota's 28, Oliver Rasmussen second, and 41, Robert Kubica up to third now. So, two different drivers in the Ferrari in front of this car here, car number seven, and the battle continues, this time with Kobayashi at the wheel. What can he do? James Collado driving now at the car 51. And uh, always a good, a really interesting part of the race when you get that driver swap and you've seen the battle going on like we've seen it and you, you, you're there before you get in the car thinking, I've got to keep that going, put that pressure on. So new fastest lap of the race, Kimui Kobayashi, 150.498 is now the high bar or the low bar, depending on which way you look at it. And uh, Kobayashi getting onto terms with uh, James Collado. Two other cars have just set their fastest race laps on this lap as well. So fresh tyres, but maybe slightly kinder track. Let's hear what Alessandro Pierguidi thinks. Alessandro Pierguidi, yeah, what a run from you, um, but it seems to be a lot about tyres. Yeah, actually, I had a good start. And then it was everything about tyres, so the deck is too high here, so at the end you have to manage it very well. Um, even with uh, the, the Toyota very close to myself, I had to keep my pace. I tried to, to make the, his, live, his, his, his uh, life, easy life, but I cannot destroy the tyre and push so much, so at the end there was a compromise. Actually it was quite good, at the end uh, it was still uh, a good pace, a decent pace, so yeah, it's everything about tyres here. So are the team just trying all different tricks they can to try and help those tyres or help you with that? Yeah, we try the setup, we try the strategy in the tyres, changing the tyres. We know that we have a fixed amount of tyres, so we change three. In the hottest period, then we hope in the coolest period of the race will be easier with the tyres. So we start to change in three, then we will start to change in just two. OK, thank you. Thank you. So uh, while that chat was going on, Pierre Guidi is now going to look back up the screens at some point and see what we've seen happen with the car 51 losing that position. Finally to car seven, Kobayashi found his way by. Now you've had that reset of all four tyres being changed. It was uh, a much easier overtake for Kobayashi than it was ever, ever was going to be for, Co for Conway with that uh, one extra new tyre going on. The look here, car. 21 Ferrari, what happened here at turn 10? Oh, he spun on his own, OK, so the hypercar down the inside, I was just worried that there might have been the tiniest of touches from the 51 car. That's all they need now is a penalty. They need to ban Louise Beckett from interviewing them in the garage, though, because the moment she went in, that position changed. It, as you said, the, the Toyota on warm earth tyres after its earlier pit stop had to capitalise then, and it did. Uh, it's just spotted there, Sarah Bovey pitting from what has been the lead of the last couple of laps for the 85 car. She's still not quite at her two hours and 20 minutes, seven minutes short of that. Uh, yet, seven, uh, sorry, 17 minutes short of that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll wait and see just exactly how they plan to do this, but it is a driver change for the Iron Dames. ORT by TF in the hands of Michael Dynan, that has to Martin, number 25, also on pit lane. Uh, led, by the way, because of an earlier pit stop, uh, just a little bit earlier for the sister car, or the brother car in this case, the Iron uh, Lynx car, still have not seen Claudia Schiavone aboard that car. No. Liam Talbot has just left the pits in the D station Aston, so he's going into a third stint. He has got, uh, what is it, 18 minutes to... Uh, to, to 30. 12 and a half now, if right. it's 2 minutes 20, uh, we're two, minutes, 2 hours 7 in, if it's 2 hours 20, if it's 2 hours 7 in. So, so they're very, very close, but you're right, they will all have to do a smidge somewhere. Uh, they're, sort of, they're sort of counting on there being some kind of intervention that allows them to split the strategy, but well, it's well, not happened. No, but they can't, because 2 hours 20 is very uncomfortable when you're only doing an hour 5. 
and, and our five is really pretty much as far as we ever see a GTEM car go. So unless you're Ben Keating and, and you, again, run it on Oofle Dust, then and somehow magic up an extra five minutes per stint, you know, another two full laps, nearly three laps, then it's very, very hard to do. And so all of the teams will have known it's the bronze minimum driving time that's the real killer. That's the one you absolutely can't ignore. So you've got to make sure you do that. And so actually, single stint out for a bit, single stint out for a bit, single stint is possibly the easiest way to slice it. And for a driver like Thomas Floor, I think that's exactly what they've done. There's a number of cars that have done that. 83, the Richard Mill Racing Team car, Lila Wadu is in now, so they've done single, 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 and you su suggest that that's going to be how it goes through the race. 36 on pit lane for what was third place. That leaves Team WRT at the moment uh, the only team having pitted twice for both their cars. They are first and second place at the moment in what we're saying at the start of the race is likely to be quite a conservative run looking to get to this uh, across the bar for the title here. As Julian Canal it was that brought in the 36. Shah Malaisi it is who is now aboard the car. And WRT running 1-2. 31 is in the pit lane. And if 41 doesn't come in this time round, they will lead the race for the very first time. Christian Reed getting ready to get back into the 77 Dempsey Proton at Porsche, which is currently being driven by Mikkel Pedersen. So Chris started it out for one stint back in again. Well, let's catch up with Toyota Gazoo Racing and hear from starting driver Mike Conway. Well, Mike Conway, your job was made very difficult today. Yeah, turn one. Um, yeah, the Cadillac Old Bamber, I think, just rear-ended me. Uh, they did a similar thing in, uh, in Fuji to Seb, so... Yeah, I think everyone trying to win it in the first corner is not, not working well, so... But after that, it made it difficult because you've really got to manage the tyres here through the stint. Obviously, I had to push to, uh, to get by a lot of cars, so... Happy that we got in the top three. I was hoping for a top two at that point, but... The Ferrari just, I think they've had an easier time on their tyre and for the last 10 laps for me it was really difficult, so. But uh, Kamui jumped in and he's in P2 now, so we'll continue to push and try and manage things to the end. All right, thank you. Thank you. Excellent stint from Mike Conway. Uh, you know, you'd expect it from the man who's won at Le Mans and won World Championships, uh, but uh, kept it under control and drove through the field, did battle where we had to, kept out of the battles where he could, and made up the ground. Yeah, he had a, a bit of a dead end, didn't he, when he came to uh, the, the Ferrari and realised, you know, that's, he played, played the long game there, he realised pretty quickly that he was going to find it difficult getting past. And he might not even know, even during that interview there with Lou, that uh, he was fighting a car that had one extra new tyre on it compared to his car and probably a little bit perplexed as to why the 51 started to pull away from him, so we were armed with that information at the time. Maybe he wasn't, and uh, yeah, well, you know, he's starting to think, well, oh, maybe the Ferrari's got a bit better tyre degradation than us, but I don't think that's the case. It's just simply he was running out of tyres and also pushing his way through the field, car after car, driving offline, all of that makes its impact on the tyre, and you know, as, as Pierre Greedy was saying, there's a lot going on in this race today with tyre management, always is in Bahrain. Such an old surface on this track, it's very porous, it's very abrasive, and uh, I think that's, a, it's interesting. It's a kind of a unique quality about this circuit, the same original surface since 2004, and uh, you have to bide your time. That's exactly what Conway did. Uh, by the way, we have got one driver in this uh, this race that uh, was here at the very first watch GT race back in 2004. Um, Dodge Viper, that's Fred Mako. GT Festival, uh, the very first year of this track's existence. Collection of cars from around the globe. And he's in the uh, number five Porsche these days. Yeah. Now what's going on here? It's turn one. Oh, it's a bit of a traffic jam. We've got the uh, Aston coming out of the pits. Tiptoes his way around the inside. And this is going to be a swap of positions on the run up towards turn four with the number 33, Ben Keating versus Davide Regon now. Well, Regon got by, then Ben yeah. got a chance to catch him back then. I mean, he's been trying to get by Ben for the last couple of laps. 
But yeah, Davide Rigon, ex factory GTE Pro driver for AF Corsa Ferrari, and still just as quick as he ever he was. Ben Keesey doing a good job. Notice when you're on board with the Corvette driver, by the way, left hand side of the dashboard, they've got a little sticker that says, Thank you, Corvette fans. Corvette racing won't disappear, but as uh, a world championship team, we will not see Corvette racing back next year, even though GT3 Corvettes will be racing. With CF Sports uh, next season, uh, worth saying at this point, uh, we've got five hours, 46 minutes left to run in this race. Looking down the order at GTM, and we're on board still with Ben Keating, still aboard the car, of course. Alessia Beccariello uh, is aboard the number 60 car leading the race. Iron Dames have just switched to Michelle Gatting, their silver ranked driver, who is one minute back uh, from Beccariello. Ahmed Al Harty, I think, is the first of the drivers still aboard the car, who was the first bronze that stayed aboard from the start. F oh, no, uh, he didn't Ma start. Michael Dynan. Michael Dynan's been in, so Ahmad started, sorry, then Michael Dynan, then Ahmad is back in. So it's Liam Talbot. Yeah, Liam Talbot, Ben Keating, and Rexy, as we see the 50 Ferrari go by the Jota yeah, Porsche. Everything goes according to plan at the minute. Virtually, we are P3, because lots of cars have to do the next last stop, and 31 is an investigation for overspeeding on the full course yellow. So everything, everything groovy at the moment. Fuel, 20 seconds. Everything groovy at the moment. Best radio message of the year so far. Careful. Jota Jota versus Ferrari still. This is good stuff, isn't it? 38, Yippee Yee and Antonio Fuoco. They both took over in the last round of pit stops. Ben, so Ben Keating is still in, hasn't made his second stop yet. This is brilliant stuff. Sorry, Mark. It's brilliant yeah, between oh. these two. You see, yeah, really getting stuck in and you know not allowing this fight just to go one way. It's neck and neck into turn six, and oh. he still hangs around the outside. Oh. That is ballsy stuff, considering he got a tag off the Prema car that knocked him offline. Traffic coming for this pair as well, still ahead. Who's going to get the, the drag by the traffic here? That was very cleverly done by Yifei. He pinched it on the exit there. And uh, the number 50, Fuoco, wasn't expecting that. Yeah. He thought he was going to go for the inside on the exit, but Yifei just stopped the car, exiting the corner, and pinched it a bit tighter than what Fuoco would have really wanted, and uh, stays ahead. Yeah, parked it on the corner, didn't he? The LM M LMP2 car behind. The Toyota car very nearly ran into the back of the Ferrari. There's Antonio Felix da Costa. Last race in the World Championship for him, at least for another season, as he will be required by Porsche to focus exclusively on his Formula E career in the Porsche factory team. Yes, indeed. Well, that, was, that, that was brilliant. I really enjoyed yeah, watching that. Brilliant some, stuff. Some, that's some of the best sports car racing I've seen in a long time. Ife around the outside of turn one. The two of them so close before that final corner. I'd like to see a replay of that one. I'm a Hansen under pressure here from Ollie Jarvis yep. in the recovering 23 car. Um, you were talking about that GTM, but uh, uh, the leading bronze who's been in from the start it is um, Captain Underpants, uh, Liam Talbot. The D Station racing car running yep. in fifth. There's a dive so down the inside there into the final corner. With car 23, who's there? So Oliver Jarvis, good move there, but he gets he's going to get repassed potentially. That's quite an often uh, case in that final corner. He's tempted to make the move down the inside, but then you get such a bad exit from it that now it's that drag race towards turn one. He's on the slightly better line, the cleaner line is Jarvis around the outside. And should just have a bit of contact there. Yeah. Uh, Making the ground is over. Typical LMP2 stuff. He's <laughs> not giving it up. We're going to miss this. this up. This we is are going to miss stuff. this category next season. We, we will have them, of course, in Le Mans, and many of these teams will be involved in Hypercar and, and GT3, of course, and the same drivers, but these cars just offer such good racing. So, again, this is a pro-am battle. Oli Jarvis, IMSA champion, and trouble for the oh, no. number That's four car. Is that Ryan Briscoe? It is. On the way into the pits, he might just make it. Might just make it, but we might be full course yellow. Was that the that was the line? That was, is that the That's line? That's not the working line, I don't think. Let me find Looks my very early. Let me find my briefing thing. No, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and that's why we've got a yellow that's flag. Safe, that's safety car line one. That's not the pit lane line. 
Well, let's catch up with the 38 Hertz Team Jota crew. Louise Beckett is down with Antonio Felix da Costa as Ryan Briscoe gets the car fired up and brings the van wall into the pit lane. Antonio Felix da Costa, this is exciting racing to watch. It's awesome. Um, we, I think the previous years doing this race in LMP2 with, with a huge tire degradation, um, especially Will, he's, he's a master at that. And uh, we could see he took it easy at the start and then he was able to climb positions as the, as the double scene went on. So he did an amazing job. I think the team was able to give us a great car overnight. We were struggling a little bit yesterday, but uh, these guys are incredible at what they do. And uh, it's only over when it's over. So it's a long, long race ahead of us. I think we can fight the Ferraris. The Toyotas are way too fast for everyone at the moment. Um, but let's see, if in the car now for the next two hours and then I'll jump in and Will again at the end. I loved hearing Will on one of the radio um, messages. I don't know if you heard it. It's like, yeah, this is cool. It's just so relaxed. There's two versions of Will. And, and there's that one. So uh, I'm happy to see a happy Will today. And, uh, you know, it, it's always nicer when we're able to enjoy ourselves in the car. And like I said, the team clearly gave us a good race car and when you're able to make positions and open gaps as a driver is a great feeling and yeah you can see there there's a smile on Will's face which is very rare. Thanks very much. Well if the Portuguese government is looking for a future ambassador you found him right there. <laughs> <laughs> obviously only one mode uh, what is Antonio <laughs> Felix de Costa and we all know what mode that is. Yes uh, great stuff from Antonio Felix de life, Costa. Indeed. He'll be back. I absolutely <laughs> see He was just on the radio chatting to Will and Will laughed. He's obviously just relayed that story. I just roasted you with Louise. Oh, mate, of course you did. Um, one final quick point about this GTM battle with the bronzes, uh, because we are now at the 2 hours and 20 minutes point. So at any point from this, uh, this point forward, we've got one, two, three, four cars, five cars, I think, Ian James, Liam Talbot, Ben Keating, well, who we go are seven, six, and fifth. Who else? Before you go any further, those three are separated by less than two seconds. PJ Hyatt. Correct. Takeshi Kimura. Correct. Yeah, so all five, two hours, 20. Now, Liam Talbot is into his third stint. None of the others are. Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben, ben pitted out a sequence, remember? Yes. Ah, uh, that's why, yeah. to give himself the fuel to get to the end of two hours 20. And PJ Hyatt had a uh, drive-through penalty. Yeah. So that uh, is a false reading in terms of the number of pit stops for PJ aboard Rexy. Yeah. So this this is really shaping up to be something potentially quite special in this race. Yeah, and the 60 iron Lynx car that's in the lead you would imagine that they are going to wait as long as humanly possible before they put Claudio Schiavone in the car. If he wasn't feeling well enough to start the race, six hours is not a lot of time to recover from very much. He's, so He's got two hours and 20 to do, yeah. and obviously the deeper you go into the race, the fewer the options are as to how long a split between those stents you can have. I, I, yeah, yeah. They're gonna, they're gonna have to try and get him in, so there's at least one single between his stints and they're going to have to put him in for a, a, a bit and a half and then a single stint and then a, 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 another one for him at the end, I think. Make no mistake, the headline class in the World of Jones Championship is hypercar, but if you're missing the racing and the strategy, as David has been describing in LMP2 throughout and in GTM, you're missing out because this is where there's a huge amount going on and there's an awful lot at stake. Yeah. All three classes in one shot there. And, and with, with multi-class racing like this, there are so many little threads running through that are going to hopefully all come together at the end. And with a bit of luck and a following win, one of us might spot what's going on. Won't be me. It's just in. <laughs> Look how low the sun's getting. 4.54, by the way, is sunset officially. It's 4.22 now here, local time in Bahrain. It's exactly what Sarah Bovey was saying, wasn't it? For whoever the next driver is getting in, make sure you run some kind of filter on the visor so that you know, there's nothing you can do with the actual screen itself. You put a, you're stuck with what you start the race with, but with the, with the helmet visor, obviously you can change that, put a darker one on. You run, you generally run these cars with the visor right open because it gets so hot inside and you have the protection of the screen, of course, in these closed cars to do that job. 
Um, so you don't need the, the visor down for protection, but what you do put the visor down for is moments like this in an endurance race where the sun starts setting. And you can even see there from riding on board here before turn six, the sun, you could go through the corner and there it is, it's glaring and it really does put you off way more than it would do driving your road car as that was very close into turn eight. This is these two. for third, Davide Regan in the silver Ferrari chasing Amad Al Harty and behind them in the back of shot, Aston on Aston action as well. Ian James and Liam Talbot going at it for fifth. Remember every single corner that Amad Al Harty can hold off the platinum driver Davide Regan is absolute platinum dust for them. <laughs> nice. Let's see what he can do into turn 11, no, because that Ferrari looks like it's just losing a bit of speed on the straight compared to the Aston. So uh, he's going to have to do Got it somewhere start. else, and I think that somewhere else might be around the outside of turn 12. Yes, he gets that job done nicely and used the speed of that Ferrari wisely as well. Al Harty now, he's done his job. He kept him behind for those uh, couple of laps and those, those corners where he was very close. And uh, that fate will be returned later on when it's uh, maybe a bronze versus another platinum or silver driver later on in the race. Ian James ahead of Liam Talbot. Talbot now in his third stint in that Aston Martin. Kimura, Kimura lips, lips away. Oh. I'm not surprised. Talk Heroic. about cramp in the car. Takeshi Kimura has done two hours 24. His job is done. Etienne Masson and Daniel Serra will be the remaining driving force in the car. Great stuff from these non-professional drivers, professional standards of driving, maybe not the ultimate speed, but it's been a great battle uh, between these ladies and gentlemen in this championship. Got it right this time. Now that is a third stop for Kessel Racing, so they've done two full stints and a bit. I didn't rem don't remember when they did their bit. We did see Ben Keating do a short stint, and now he's still in the car, so he's in a two and a, and a quite a, a substantial He amount. should be next in. Well, what about Ian James? I don't think Ian James has had a partial stint either. No, They've pitted twice, so he's in a third stint. Liam Torbert in a third stint. I mean, this is brutal. You know, it's 36 degrees of air temperatures, probably 60 degrees in the car. You're wrestling these things every single inch. It's not just driving around comfortably in air-conditioned splendor. You're wrestling an octopus well, the just, whole time. Just reflect this. You know, we were pulling Anthony's leg a little bit, that a couple of beads of sweat from coming from the grid. You know, this is a young man in significantly better condition than you and certainly than I am. And then you've got these drivers, non-professional drivers, at the wheel of these cars, in these conditions, mobile greenhouses, effectively, with a heat generator either at the front or the back of the car. And they've been in this car, right, uh, driving at speed and in traffic, Traffic at the same speed as they are, much faster traffic to deal with, and they've been in there for two hours, 20 minutes. There is Kimura San, he should be rightly delighted with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well done, that's, uh, you know, I, I know firsthand how, how tough that is. It's like He's having to stand up now because he's cramping yeah. up again, isn't he? You're fixed in that position for two hours plus, and, you know, you, you, your body goes tense every time you go through a corner. It's a bit like being in a kayak or a canoe in many ways, how you go so tense when you're not quite comfortable with that machine, how it's feeling, or in a, in a canoe, of course, if it's a little bit choppy out there, and you just, you want to go forwards, make progression, but at the same time, your body is completely tense because you've got to become part of that machine. Uh, so and excuse me. you do in the car as well. I've got to interrupt you. A very rare shot there of Vincent Voss without a flat cap. Well, no, he, he's <laughs> very often without a flat cap, but uh, quite a rare shot of Thierry Tassin going, oh. You don't often see that now, and, and you don't normally see him in the pit wall. He's got shades on because uh, in the pit lane, in the garage, he's normally on the pit wall. He's got shades on because he's come in from the pit wall to talk something through with Van Zandt Bosch. Now, they lead WRT, that's the team we were looking at, with Ferdy Habsburg. They're third with Robert Kubitzer. Prema Racing's Juan Manuel Correa in their nine car has inveigled his way between them. He's in second place, but WRT looking very strong here in LMP2 right now. Now, whether they were wondering about how they're going to strategize their way through it, the problem in LMP2 is it's very hard to outrun anybody on fuel unless you've got 
you know, feather boots like Will Stevens or, or, or uh, you know, what's the most you're going to get? One lap? You can't use a different tyre. You can't turn the engine up. It's hard to make a break. Okay, mate, that Porsche is catching pretty quickly. Gap is 16 seconds. Let's see if we can up the pace just a little bit. Wow. As if a yay, we've seen he's been pressing on, but uh, that's now clearly uh, piqued the attention of the race engineer for the 50 World Cup, uh, Justin Taylor. Yeah, so there was a time when I mentioned that the Jota was falling back, and that's because it was it was going around a much older tyre. So they've offset themselves, have Jota in the race, compared to Ferrari, and that will come into fruition for them hopefully later on when they'll have the fresher tyres versus Ferrari's older. So this is Ferrari looking at that strategy tool. It, it plots a profile from where you are now towards the end of the race. Some, some really interesting software that the, that the teams use in that regard. And they're seeing that if you carry on like this, that Jota are going to beat us. And that's exactly what, when interviewed, De Costa pretty much admitted. So that's what Jota are working towards. And Yifeye at the moment continuing to close that gap is now 15 and a half seconds. Yeah, brilliant stuff from, from Jota so far today. After a, a bit of a lackluster qualifying, they really have turned things around for today's race. They've looked pacey, haven't they, throughout, and fighty as well, which you like to see at this level. And that's before we get a absolutely no doubt fired up finish to Costa for the car. Yeah, exactly, and uh, we, we didn't hear, we didn't hear uh, the reply from, from Collado. Maybe he can go faster, and he's just nursing the tyres. almost another half an hour sun getting much lower in the sky when it gets lower in the sky it gets dark here very quickly it is of course going to be lit you can see the uh, light poles and they are legion around here beginning to spring into life it will not be at full laser level formula one levels of flood lighting but plenty of light to be able to uh, see this track and you will see these cars looking spectacular uh, under the lights and uh, for those people that are here at the track it is an absolutely beautiful sight and sound at night here uh, the Bahrain circuit and it's really when uh, the car starts to work a bit better for you as well as a driver it's you feel the grip starting to come up the air density increases the cooler temperature as the, as the temperatures cool down so your power goes up, the downforce goes up with that denser, fresher air. And uh, it's quite autumnal by any stretch of the imagination here in Bahrain, but it's uh, it's certainly cooler than it was at the start of the race. Fabio Scherer yeah. getting ready to go. Uh, we'll chat with Fabio at uh, testing in Portimao. Got his first laps ever in a GT car, not because he's looking at GT next season, because he fancied to go. Go with Porsche, was doing some driver coaching for some drivers we will likely see next year in LMP2. And it's quite good for a driver to, you know, especially a prototype driver, to drive a GT car, to understand that when you go sending your prototype down the inside into a corner or a series of corners where your car's got a bit more agility and flexibility than a GT car, it gets it gives you it makes you a more rounded driver basically. Um, and you can respect then therefore where and how the GT drivers have to place their car uh, and what you expect from them as well. So, uh, oh, and Danny Kvyat, just, just as I say that, locks up as he's surprised by the D station car in towards turn eight. That might give the Inter Europol car a chance to uh, mount an attack into turn 10. No, there's both blocked behind the D station once again, that 777 car through turn 10. So far, this race not going the way that it's Europol might have liked it to go. Here's the replay. Yeah, that was uh, nose up the inside. Just got caught out by And that's the thing, you know, you come up against lower graded drivers sometimes in a GT car and it, it surprises you and uh, you can easily trip over them. So it's all part and parcel of being a well-rounded endurance racing driver. Uh, we'll say this just briefly for somebody to keep an eye on. The lead gap overall is coming down without a shadow of a doubt, uh, was high 30s, now 31.9 seconds between Hartley and Kobayashi. Really interesting to follow the trace there of how the battle between the number nine Prima car and the 34 into Europol car has progressed. Into Europol as high as the top five early on. Now they're nose to tail, sixth and seventh 
Track temperature at the start of the race, 41 and a half degrees, is now down to 34.1. So that's a significant drop. And the, as the sun, the heat of the sun stopping heating up the track uh, continues to fade away, it will shed temperature and that will make it, well, I was going to say kinder to tyres, slightly less brutal to tyres. Exactly. Tires. Yeah, it's still quite punishing, but it's surprising by the end of the race how you start, can start leaning on everything a little bit more. And when you're the next driver about to get in, uh, you're watching the lap times, you get into the car and, and you're and suddenly you, you can not only match those lap times you're watching, but quite easily beat them. And you're thinking, yeah, this is all going really well. When you jump out of your car, the next driver jumps in after you and does what you did to the driver previously. Yeah, Lock, that. Locked it up. Oh dear. That's that's not a driver oh. error either, is it? No, he locked it locked up those sort of lights are off. It's stopped it's dead. Yeah, it's locked up under him. That's what happened, it's just jammed itself in gear and stopped. It's going going again. gets it going yeah. again. This is not the end of the season that Inter Europol wanted. Whatever happens when they finish second or third, if they finish third in the championship, it's still a fantastic result for a tiny team. And that's before you take into account the fact that they won Le Mans. <laughs> well, won Le Mans, and uh, that car, I believe, has been retired, goes into the collection for the uh, owners of Inter Europol. It's clearly something fragile on that car electronics in, in terms of the electronics though and uh, we believe he might have hit a curb on the way into that corner and that was just enough to trip the, the electronics and, and suddenly have to do a power cycle which is what we saw him doing there. What's, what's the, what's the one the thing that electronics lies, like least of all other than water? That's heat. And vibration. Super Mario. Who's Super Mario? Team WRT, first and third in LMP2. And this is the number 35 United Auto uh, Alpine machine. Uh, Ollie Caldwell at the wheel of that car, trying to chase down Ryan Cullen. He's a second and a bit behind. That's the battle for ninth and tenth. This is 30 Habsburg in the 31 WRT car leading the race. His teammate Sean Galeal is with Louise Beckett. John Galeo, we've still got five hours and 24 minutes of this race, but the 31 WRT is leading in LMP2. You're going to get ready to get into the car. This is a great place for you to be taking over. Yeah, I mean, it's fun, but, uh, you know, I think how this year is going, let's just keep our fingers crossed because uh, we were leading a couple of races ago as well and things didn't go our way. So, uh, you know, let's just hope that we can keep it where we are and then uh, try to finish it. Of course, you're looking at your own race, but ob obviously the 41 right now is leading the championship. So has anything been said between the teams about how you'll work together for that? Through yeah. Depending on the race. They just said if we win, then they win the championship. So it's a win-win solution. <laughs> OK, good. All right. You've got your target. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they'll aim for a one-two result if they can. By the way, we saw Valentino Rossi on the grid and in the garage earlier in the race. He'll be in the rookie test on Sunday with Team WRT, uh, and he will be running in one of their LMP2 cars. He's already got GT3 experience with the team. He was a winner in the Road to Le Mans at Le Mans. He's won in the SRO um, uh, GT World Challenge Series as well with his teammate Maxime Martin. And he's here with another teammate, Charles Vert. Now, he's a young Belgian driver. And the name Vert is intimately associated with WRT because the W racing team, the W stands for Vert. It's his dad that started out as a sponsor and then became the team owner. And although we often see a lot of Van Sant Vaast and Thierry Tassin, Kurt Mollikens and all the other Belgian racing talent that is associated with the team, the next generation, young Charles Vert, will be in the rookie test as well. So he's here in the garage watching the team in action. It'll be very interesting to see where he goes next year and where the doctor ends up. Whether he comes here in GT3 to learn the tracks, learn the championship, or whether he goes absolutely both feet in and uh, ends up in a hypercar. Only time, I think, and a, a lot more testing will tell. I think Valentino Rossi would be careful about overextending himself. He's had a good time, but in the Porsche Mobile and Super Cup, another 
fellow motorcycle champion Jorge Lorenzo has discovered that equal machinery and pro drivers who know what they're doing are very, very hard to match. But Valentino is nothing if not fun and ambitious. As you look at the, uh, the French flag, uh, tree calori on the front uh, of Dorian Pan's uh, helmet there, helmet design. We think of another French driver, Sebastian Loeb, who tried his hand at uh, LMP2 and found that very difficult as well. Ogier. Sorry, not Loeb. Yeah, well, no. Loeb as well, yeah. yeah the, the Loeb other, had his time, but Ogier as well, the other Seb. We had that uh, conversation a couple of days ago because Sebastian Loeb came and raced for Pescarolo yeah. in LMP900 or LMP1 in the early days. Very fast, very competitive. Where's he in all this? Where? Who's not picked up the phone to Sebastian Loeb and gone, Oh, do you fancy well, a drive in a oh, French hypercar? Well, he got very close in the Peugeot 908 days. Yeah. And uh, decided at the last minute to not focus or sp spread himself too thinly by doing a dual program. And I'm so glad that he decided to just do WRC <laughs> that year. Thank you, if you're listening, Sebastian Lowe, because that gave me the chance to take your drive at Peugeot. <laughs> Well, you know, you're making life hard for a lot of the other hypercar potential drivers by wandering around a Formula One paddock, telling F1 drivers how much fun, how much more fun sports car racing is. I've retired to give them way. <laughs> <laughs> to, Such to, a selfless man. Exactly, but but spreading the word, and you know, there, there have been some fascinating names being bandied about, and I'm sure more will be bandied about as as hypercar explodes and continues to grow. So, yeah, potentially yeah. A, a Jensen Button, the Mick Schumacher, the Sebastian Vettel's name's been mentioned. You know, there's all sorts of different names, but, but going nobody back to our first point, associated Loeb with anything. Now going back to our first point, though, you cannot underestimate how niche some of these categories are, like LMP2, how hard it is. Even for a driver like Danny Fiat to come in, I was chatting to him just this morning here, saying, yeah, you know, I've had a lot to learn come into uh, endurance racing it's it's hard yeah and uh, you know that just because we see them on TV in Formula One it it doesn't automatically mean they're the best drivers in the world they're the best single seater drivers in the world and that's a big difference <laughs> it can a be a big very, difference very big difference yeah I mean Fernando Alonso came in and and really made his choice as well didn't he went with the best team at the time Toyota and got maximum mileage out of it you know, and, and actually, the, the way that it worked for him, he was very fortunate to come in in super season that had two Le Mans 24-hour races in it and ended up winning them both. I mean, you, you can't win one by accident without any talent. You definitely don't win two by accident without any talent. He'd certainly proved that he had everything it took to be at the very top of his game. And has gone back again. It, sort of like he had a, a rejuvenation, regained, like you said, regained his love for, for racing by coming into endurance racing. And then he's gone back into Formula One. He's twice the driver almost that he ever was again. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very different discipline. It should be a different sport. You know, it, it's like a, a T20 cricket match versus a five day test match. It's so different. It's barely even recognizable as the same thing. But you know, it has as much merit and is just as difficult as any other racing you want to find. Just saw Albert Costa in the pit lane for Inti Europol, the LMP2 car that was looking strong very early on. Uh, that has not gone well for them. Drive through penalty just been announced as well for 93 Peugeot, Mikkel Jensen for uh, not respecting full course yellow, which will mean not coming down to 80 kilometers an hour quite quickly enough when the full course yellow count came down to zero. Yeah, they're pretty hot on that. Uh, and, and the race director, they, they have the GPS, of course, of every car, so they can see the timeline of when the full course yellow appeared and then therefore the speed of the cars. And they're building a, a, a small tolerance to give the drivers allowance. Slow right yes, front, yeah. yeah. And that, it looked like the other mechanic was running around with a second gun, so that was not the stop they needed. Here is the 93 Peugeot that uh, just seen pop up on, our, on the screen. 
not respecting that Paul Corsello procedure. So it was either, well, I should imagine it's not slowing down, like you say, Martin, not slowing down soon enough, but it can also be the other way around. You might be a little bit too keen on to releasing that full course yellow button from inside the car that holds the car to that uh, 60 kph, the 80 kph, sorry. And uh, you can be a bit too eager in, in getting going again. And, and, but they're, they're pretty hot on seeing if you've oversped in that scenario because it's a safety concern, first and foremost. Uh, speaking of hypercar, the Jota Porsche is really starting to catch. Thick and fast, the Ferrari of James Collado now has halved the gap from that message we heard when we heard it earlier on. So nothing that Collado seems to be able to do to respond to the threat. That challenge of UPA, who is now only 6.8 seconds behind. Yeah, you feel closing in fast. Don't forget they're using the same hard tyre compound as their rivals. So that is showing that the Porsche seems to be just treating its tyres, certainly in the first stint on them, a little better than the Ferrari. Whether that continues through the second stint or not remains to be seen. On board with Mikkel Jensen down into turn one. Yeah, it's a good shot there. And they seem to have calmed the ride height or the ride of the car in general down over the, uh, the, those bumps on the main straight. It was really crashing into them during the free practice sessions. And it's been a bit of an Achilles heel, I'd have to say, of this car since its birth, really. And they haven't been able to eradicate that. I feel like because of the lack of rear wing, they have to run the car lower. It's more of a ground effect for Lions to get its grip than other cars, perhaps. And in running the car low, as we all know from Formula One, when they went more to a ground effects car, the concept, it starts to porpoise and crash into the ground more. And that's what I've been seeing all week. We used to see that a lot in the Audi R8 days, lots of bouncing at the front. Driver said, what bouncing? Car feels fine. Premise number nine car in the pits, one Mel, one. Manuel Correa has just jumped out. Is, is that uh, Philip Wolgram got back in, I think. David Heinemeyer Hansen then moves up to third for Jota as WRT a 1-2 and then all Porsche battle here. That is GR Racing's Ben Barker going by Christian Reed. So Christian Reed back in the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche for his second stint. He did a stint, got out, has got back in. And that may well be the case. This may be a single. He may get out again and do another single stint later on. We've just seen, by the way, uh, Ian James get out of the 98 car. That means uh, Ian has completed his time with something like uh, two hours and 40 minutes at the, uh, the wheel of the 98 car. So yeah. now they will switch to their silver and bronze, or silver and uh, gold drivers. From the Angeles to come, Daniel Mancinelli is aboard the car now. Too many consonants, it's always a, a, a take a run at that off a, a fairly yep. long run up. Um, ben Keating still at the wheel. Now, don't forget, we saw earlier on he did a two thirds ish yes. first stint, and it looks like he's going to do a double after that. Try through for the Peugeot just happened, and you saw that he was being cautious because the man with the speed gun is always watching. Absolutely right. Uh, so that car will retain 10th place because two minute gap between them and the recovering Alex Lynn or the recovering Cadillac, and now in the hands of Alex Lynn. Rexy on Reed. Matteo Cairoli is coming up behind Christian Reed to gobble him up, but they are a lap behind the 77 car, so this is purely to unlap itself. Now, don't forget. Uh, PJ Hyatt started the race in that car and stayed in it all the way through. So they have used all their bronze driver time, but the 77 car has not. They've had a higher rated driver in for hour two of the race effectively. And now Christian Reed, the bronze driver, is back in, but still has more time to do than this stint will give him. So advantage coming back now to the green Porsche having had their bronze driver in for the first part of uh, or for the race so far, effectively. Try Connor just going through there, trying to recover some of the ground loss of that long 90 uh, second. This is uh, Nico Veroni. Yeah, hugs and kisses for the boys. Okay. This is the end of a chapter, not the end of an era, just the end of a chapter for Corvette Racing. The team will continue but not in the World Endurance Championship. He's been awesome this year. Nick young Argentine. He will be racing next year in IMSA in GTD in a 
new Corvette. We heard that from Laura Lord Truck Clowns, a completely different car uh, this time along. And we are joined by someone who's brought food. It's, it's cheesecake. Oh, now that. <laughs> last year from Jota, we got a book. This year, we've got the cheesecake. And there's only, and you know what, Louise Beckett, there's only Me three three. Portions. Oh, dear. What we'll do, uh, Ant's just, uh, oh, he's just come back. <laughs> Ant's just come back to steal Louise's cheesecake. So it turns out that all three of them are for Ant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. One of the one of the advantages of uh, being at the racetrack is that you get a lot of time to talk to teams and drivers. That obviously is very difficult when you're trying to do things remotely. And the the door to our commentary is always open. If you've got cheesecake. If you've got the door to our commentary box, would you please bring it back? <laughs> but but uh, yeah, we we have spent a lot of time over the last few years ribbing Jota over various different things, and they have taken it all in the nature in which it was intended. Of all the places to work, this is one of the friendliest paddocks, and uh, Anthony Davidson giving it the approval of a seal. Yeah, absolutely, clapping his hands. There you go. Josh Pearson and Philip Bergen. I think Louise Beckett's got more from the pit lane. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Certainly no more cheesecake. No, no more cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, no, Louise is just saying, don't choke on that, Anthony. <laughs> um, it's a bit warm in here. Do you want to turn the air con up as well? Oh. Break out the ice cream. Uh, into the pits, let's get back to the action. 28, Joe Takar, David Heinemar Hansen. Little bit of contact there, and I mean, any car that comes away without any contact is, has had a really good time. It, it's, it's, that was kind of black and yellow. It could almost have been a banana cheesecake that's been rubbed on there. <laughs> could almost have been. Heinemar Hansen's got an interesting background, hasn't he? He's a, an IT. I Guru. think geek, and I think geek Guru. is the word. Uh, hang on um, a minute, 33 in. This yeah. is the end of Ben Keating's. Uh, World Endurance Championship career well, for yeah. now. How do he get to looking yeah. like he's able to skip back? I damn him, honestly. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, this this man spends Super probably fit. as many hours on a bike in a week as any other racing driver does. He is a super fit, super efficient businessman. But boy, oh boy, I, he's been such a great addition to the paddock over the years that he's raced with. Yeah, every single conceivable car. I can't believe he's not coming back in GT3. There's the option for him to race 11 different cars in 11 <laughs> different seasons. He could he could end up having raced more GT cars in World Endurance than he's got car dealerships. What a fantastic ambassador he's been for sports car racing through his already long career, which will continue in LMP2 uh, into the North American Championship and into the Championship next year. But fabulous, fabulous stuff from Ben Keating. Amazing drive drive through the season champions already and that is fa fabulous watching us watching you that's the crew from full access so don't forget 10 days after the race so probably next wednesday actually because of the way we are and where we are um, we will have full access from behind the scenes this race there will be a bigger and unseen, largely unseen, full access program. Christmas special. I don't think it involves Santa Claus or sleighs or Florida, but I don't know. It does involve Florida because we started the season there. And there will also be not only the review of this race online two weeks after, but the season review as well will be uh, launched for the Christmas break. So a lot of opportunity to catch up with stuff that you missed, that I missed, and that I was busy talking about when Graham and Anthony saw it and didn't get a chance to talk that about. That could be a very long show. It's a very long okay. show. A uh, couple of three penalties to catch up on. Next pit stops for the number five Porsche Penske Motorsports 963. We'll see that extended by five seconds full course yellow infringement. The same for the current leading car in LMP2. 31 car will get five seconds added to their next pit stop, and it's a drive-through penalty for the car 21, Summer Man, abusing track limits after his warning flag. Hope we we're going to get there quickly. Louise has hopped down there, and she's in the garage now with Ben Keating from the 33 Corvette. Ben Keating, that was a great run from you as always. Some amazing battles on track. Were you enjoying it? Uh, I'll say yes and no. Uh, it's so busy and it's so hard <laughs> with the tire degradation. You, you have so much going on. I almost forgot to remind myself to enjoy it. 
you know, this is the, the last three stints I'll ever do in GTE. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think we have the pace to, uh, uh, to do well today. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, we decided earlier that uh, it's not looking good, but we could be good looking. Uh, oh, well, you do that. <laughs> you definitely do that. Um, I mean, you sealed the championship, when was it, in Monza, I think. Um, so, so you've got that bit already done. So you can enjoy this one. You can take it a bit easier and, and take the rough with the smooth. But um, how has this all been for you in GTE? Because you've put in, you, you know, I don't even know, put into words what you've done in GTE. I mean, it's really, really special. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful to have run the last four full seasons in WEC in the GTE cars. Uh, I'm grateful to have driven all of them except one. Uh, I've gotten the full GTE experience, and it's, it's really special. I, I, I think having the confidential Michelins that are designed for each specific car is a really special thing. Uh, and having these cars that are designed specifically for this series uh, is a special thing. So it's definitely the end of an era, and uh, I've definitely squeezed as much juice out of the lemon as I can squeeze. We've loved having you with us. Thank you. I can add this, by the way. Uh, I guarantee you that in about 20 minutes, we'll hear from Louis Beckett that he's tried to sell out one of his excellent new Chevy Silverados. Uh, we are going to miss Ben Keating. There's no doubt about it. One of the characters of sports car racing worldwide. It's been a delight for those that knew Ben uh, in his North American racing career to see him arrive uh, in the FI World Endurance Championship and bring a fan base along with him for the fun and excellent stuff. Thank you very much indeed, Ben Keating. And uh, creative for... fan base here as well. Absolutely. For people who never knew him before. It's been uh, an exceptional ride. And somebody, by the way, get him in the test on Sunday in a 4A GTE. I'm not going to fight. Don't make it easy. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not going to let him go by. Let's see if Yiffy Yee is of the same opinion, because the Jota car is now right with James Collada. This is the battle for third place. Well, I think if I didn't hear that correctly, I think he, James was saying so I'm, I'm not, not going to fight. I'm not going to fight him. Yeah. But his engineer wants him to fight him. Yeah, don't make it easy for him. Yeah. But uh, James is thinking, well, I haven't got the pace here. He's caught me fair and square. Thank and we're on the same age of tyres. Yeah. So there's no more that I can do here. You know, I, I'm thinking of my own race. Um, and that's force of habit. He and Alessandro Pierre Guidi have been here, what, five, six consecutive years battling for the GTE Pro title in a Ferrari. And it's been all about tyre management. Every single corner of every single lap has been about tyre management. And he, he doesn't want to give that up. He wants to have tyres to fight in another three and a half hours, five yeah. hours. The car might come good later on in, in, compa in comparison to the Jota. Uh, so Habsburg there down at WRT having a good chat with his team. Uh, car 31 with Sean Galeel at the wheel at the moment, his teammate. They're still in the lead, but they have a penalty coming They've just there. Right? Yeah. They've just, oh, they've just okay, yeah. so they've, they've hung on to the lead, but um, yeah, I wonder what uh, what that chat was all about. Ferdy was looking quite aerated, and yeah. Thierry Tassan was guiding him to the other pit box. He obviously went to Tassan to say, wah, 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 wah. He said, no, no, go, go talk to your own guy. I've got enough of my own troubles going on. 50 in the pit lane, and this is Antonio Fuoco, end of his first stint, so should see, ooh. Should see no tyres going on the car. Are they left side only? They're uh, ready for tyres on one side at least, and there appears only to be left, left rear side. only, maybe. Uh, would point out, by the way, if a yay will want to get by James Gallardo uh, now, he's not that far back from Camus Kobayashi. It's only seven and a half seconds further up the road for his second place. That gap for the lead, by the way, hovering around the 30 to 32 second mark. Left sides only for Antonio Fuoco. So they're obviously learning from what the 51 car is finding, as 51 is learning from what they're finding. Trying to make sure they've got enough. Ben Keating walking back across the pit lane, having been to the wall to thank all the guys on the Pratt perch, as he's thanked all the guys in the garage. He has had a you know, remarkable career. Uh, first met him when he was racing in the uh, 
in a Dodge Viper. He came in from SRT with, with Vipers at Le Mans, and he's raced Dodge, he's raced the Corvette, he's raced Aston Martin, he's raced the Ford. Ford. Porsche. At the Porsche, that's the one I always forget to remember. Well, I mean, in fact, it, it, Ben's a remarkable run at Le Mans. Uh, only saw him duplicate the car he'd run uh, very recently. He had two years with the Aston Martin before coming back with the Corvette this year. Viper in 2015, Monorica in 16, the Riley LMP2 the year after. That's right. Ferrari 488, he raced in 2018. Ford GT, the 911 RSR, two years with Aston Martin and then the Corvette to finish. So hang on a minute, He's, he has raced a Ferrari, he so has. which one has he not raced? I've I'm raced all of the GT cars bar one. That was a bad BMW. move. Sorry, that was a Bimble. bad move from, yeah. uh, for, for Colado there, trying to go around the outside of the Porsche. Oh, now no. he just backs out of that one because... Uh, Got squeezed well, by the Dempsey Proton Porsche, ironically. Finally gets through in the mid phase of turn nine into 10. He had to back out of the apex of nine because the Porsche was coming in. And rightly so, they've got to take their line at some point. But uh, that was a bit of a, a clumsy situation for both of those cars there, both for Colado and Yves as they can continue to battle. Uh, meanwhile, the sister car of car 51 for Cuoco, they put on, for those of you looking at the graphics, we didn't comment on the time, you would have seen that they changed three of those tires on car 50, one of them being the qualifying tire that goes on the right rear. So that's got three laps on it. But we, we watched the stop and they didn't. So that's not quite, did they? Well, it was oh. the unseen side of the car. Yeah. Uh, I think we left it actually before their pit stop was completely finished, before uh, yeah, they, they, had, they had finished their work down there. There's the 94 Peugeot now with uh, Gustavo Menezes. This is his last race in that car. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of a, a, a turning of a chapter for him. He leaves the Peugeot team that he's been with since the start and will undoubtedly find another berth in hypercar. And Peugeot will update, upgrade the car. Won't be a brand new car, but it will be a significant enough change to the car to hopefully make it a more competitive proposition. Kamui Kobayashi in from second place. And again, probably expect to see number eight car in two laps. I should say, by the way, I think we will see that new Peugeot fairly soon. Um, I think there will be pictures available of that car in weeks, not months. I think uh, I think homologation has to be before end of December for them to be Toasty. remotely able to get it going. Yeah, that's a rubber pickup just catching light on the red hot brake discs. Well, it might even be the disc itself. And if it is, they've got to get going ASAP. This will be a hot stop for them quite literally isn't it yeah it is the brake disc itself just on fire i mean the, the temperatures you see in these brakes uh, up to 700 degrees which car and ceramic brakes can withstand but yeah you've got to get that going because the heat soak is uh, is really taking hold yeah, a change of nose while that was all going on as well so efficiently done there That'll help uh, warming up his front tyres. Maybe yeah. that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder if he could you just, uh, when, when the guy goes around, could you just squirt a bit of light if yeah, you want to say. It's just Who said light. no tyre warmers? <laughs> Hold my beer. Yeah. Back with James Collado in the 51 AF Corsa Ferrari. Into the pits he comes. And that moves. Uh, Jota Car has left the pits already, so he survived a lap. So can they overcut Jota and regain second? James Collado hits his marks. Fuel goes in. Door is open. Look we'll for tyres. There's a tyre on the apron there. Yep. Cleaning the screen, trying to get rid of the debris. Two tyres are weight, so it should be left sides only. Now, they came in a lap after the 38 Jota car, so they are going to look to try and get back out in front of it and take what is second place, or will be, until Brendan Hartley comes in from the lead. Off goes Cadillac's Alex Lynn. Wait Don't think there was a driver change in the number two car. Starting to get that nighttime feel, isn't it? It most certainly is. 93 Peugeot also on pit lane. They've had a very quiet race. Yeah. 
Uh, Son of man who bought the 21 car, by the way, is going to be in some trouble here under investigation for the second time for abusing track limits. It's already had a drive through. They can, they'll keep giving you drive-throughs as long as you keep no, missing uh, gets, the limits. It's it start getting stop and, stop and holds, yeah. yeah. There's a couple of shots around the circuit that I thought, this could easily be Austin. Why don't we race into the darkness in Austin? That would be a great race, wouldn't it? Lone Star Le Mans, start at lunchtime, finish in the dark. Yeah, so that phase of the race again where we saw a few stints ago where the number 50 starts coming back at the number 38 Jota. So they're clearly offset here. And did Jota once again in that pit stop not put any fresh tires on their car? Uh, let's I look can't at the remember time. seeing their pit minute, stop. 1 minute 23 against a 1.20 for Ferrari. I don't think that's possible. Louise Beckett? Uh, just looking at uh, conditions getting better and cooler, uh, Thomas Floor is about to get back into the 54 because obviously he didn't do all of his driver time in the heat of the day, so he's going to make up that time now. Yeah, I think that's a, a good option for him as well. Uh, did he do start out second stint? Is this his third? I think this will be his third stint. Uh, I think it is his third stint because I think he did two stints and then was replaced by... Uh, Francesco Castellacci yeah. uh, would say, by the way, Alessio Piccariello has just rejoined the race after his latest pit stop. Still no, Claudio Schiavone. Well, again, we've got four hours, 55 minutes for him to do two hours, 20. So he's got to do half remaining race. The point, I'm, 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 the wider point I'm making is that it's reducing again the options from to split those stints. I think, I think their sole concern is making sure he's fit enough to drive the car for two minutes, never mind two hours, 20 minutes, when they put him in it. Yeah. Not, not allow him to go, yeah, put me in, coach, and then be unwell in the car. Confirmed, by the way, stop and go penalty for car 21. So we'll put a hashtag wait and see then for Iron Lynx. 85 takes lead with Michelle Gatting. So 85 now lead the race as the pit stop cycle moves around another notch. Alessio Picciariello, by the way, before that stop, something like a minute to the good. There he is on clearly new rubber. Um, but no bronze time taken by that car. Riding on board with Antonio Fuoco in the 50 Ferrari there, just siding his way through traffic. There are sometimes these races put me in mind of the Daytona 24 where the fast cars are up and down the banking, lane one, lane three, lane one, lane three, constantly carving their way through traffic. There's the number seven ahead of 51. So Kabu Kobayashi remains ahead of the 51 Ferrari, but the key is there's the Jota Porsche behind. So the 51 Ferrari has actually opened up a gap having overcut the 51 and the 50, uh, the, the 38, and there 38 is just ahead of 50 now. Yeah, but 50 could be in trouble here under investigation for not respecting full course yellow procedures uh, some little while ago. There have been some penalties coming for that. Yeah. Um, for, for other cars. 26 minutes ago that was, so it's taken a while to go through the data. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is guaranteed to be a penalty, but it is quite likely. However, the more pressure he can put on Yippie now, especially if the team fear there will be a penalty, then they can throw him on his own sword to try and buy James Collado a little bit more time. Yeah, I've dealt with the amphibian uh, myosophagus and we'll move on. Still trying to work out why the, uh, the car number 38 fell back so far. Car 51 and into the, uh, the clutches of car 50. It doesn't look like yeah. that attack's coming any harder now. Well, a 1 minute 20 stop for the 51 Ferrari, 1.23 for Jota, which isn't the end of the world, but three seconds yep. lost in one lap it, it isn't great. 1 minute 17. So it took six seconds Woco out on pit lane. On pit lane alone. Yeah. So, and had stopped already. Um, 38 car when 50 came in. So 51 had the slight advantage that the 38 car was on cold tyres when it came out. And so it sort of did that overcut that we've talked about before. Number nine car, Sean, uh, number 
one, a 31 car of Sean Gunnell, WRT leading the race, nine laps in from the pit stops, fresher rubber than Josh Pearson, but Pearson coming up with a real head of steam here, just half a second in it. Pearson's had a good race. He has, uh, he has been putting in some really good times. He's getting to grips with the challenge of the car in WEC spec, uh, I think pretty rapidly. There was a, a bit of an offset clearly going on between himself and Albuquerque, his teammate in car 22, but he caught and passed him and dropped him before Albuquerque came into the pit. So it goes to show that you know, the speed that this young silver driver, silver rated driver of Josh Pearson has as he continues his progression through the race. Obviously that car was in a bit of trouble itself as well, wasn't it? Early on in the race, it got caught up in that turn two incident with the van wall and the sister car of 22. So uh, yeah, they changed the bodywork and they are absolutely flying. United Old Sports have got the form at the moment. Delivered it well in the European Le Mans series, taking both race wins at Portimao. They've had good form here, but sometimes have not been able to deliver the ultimate results. Not going to take the title this year, but they'd love this race win. So this is, of course, with Sean Galeo at the wheel of uh, Team WRT number 31. This is like for like. This is silver versus silver. They're both silver rated drivers. So Team WRT leading, they we know are back next season with the BMW hypercars and uh, also in LMGT3 with the M4 GT3s. United Autosport's current plan awaiting confirmation when the selection is determined later this month is to come back with two brand new LMGT3 McLarens. We saw the first of those cars testing uh, just a couple of weekends ago. Long, long time since we've had a McLaren racing in the current uh, Le Mans 24-hour field. So that'll be very entertaining to see. And the connection between McLaren and United Autosports is Mr. Goodwin. It's the co-owner, which is Zach Brown, of course, who is team principal of McLaren Racer, McLaren F1. Uh, but all sorts of potential links there for moving forward. When, if, might, we see McLaren in hypercar. That would be fun, you know, Aston Martin finally biting the bullet and coming in and supporting a Formula One programme at the same time. So, you know, it's not like McLaren don't have the nous to do it or the clout to run a car. How did they carry so much fun? Uh, we believe they put less energy in the car than us because they're saving more energy than us. We believe they put less energy in because they're saving more than the others. So less time stationary in the pit lane. Wow. Where did that gap come from, if he is asked? And that's why. So that's where that six seconds has come from. Or is he talking about the three seconds to the car in front? I think he must be talking about why 50 is suddenly off his exhaust pipe. So when we see that NRG graphic that comes up occasionally on the screen, uh, usually on an onboard, that is it's a combination of electrical energy and fuel energy. So what Ferrari might be doing is just putting less fuel in their car, the pit stops, and i.e. A, a faster pit stop, uh, and using more electronic energy, more battery per lap, and uh, harvesting more energy, therefore, than the Porsche is. So that's a really interesting bit of information there uh, from the team radio, because Yife is obviously as confused by that gap coming down or extending to the car 51 as much as we are. It's the, the outlier is that is that pit stop for the number 50 car, the one minute and 17. Sara Bovey steps in to the then leading 85 iron Davis car, Martin. Having done a double stint and coming have to come out for fuel, 14 minutes shy of her max minimum driving time. So Michelle Gatting's done a single stint. Now she needs to do a quarter of an hour. There's no point in doing a quarter of an hour. She's going to do another full fuel stint. Uh, Michelle Gatting's stint, I think, was possibly a little short. Maybe, maybe there. Let, let's wait and see when some of the others go. Oh, GR Racing's Ben Barker's in. All right, maybe not. Maybe that was a full stint. Michelle is not under the minimum constriction that Sarah Bovey has. So she'll get back in. Ralph Frey is sitting somewhere nice and cool, waiting to have her go and just getting herself in the right place as we get back to the lead battle now. Sean Galel, Josh Pearson. This is WRT United Autosports. I was going to say, a couple of the heavy hitting teams in LMP3. There are no lightweight teams in LMP3, they're all heavy hitters. Even teams that you would have said were sort of a minnow, 
Vector have had a pole position. They led the race comfortably here and were going away. And, and uh, into Europol have won them on. So there are no minnows here. This is a, it's a sharp time. This is a correction in the interface, LMP2. Uh, what did I say, LMP3? Yes, oh, oh, yeah. altogether smaller and gruntier. Here is that energy graphic that I was talking about before. So you've got the Toyota's, uh, the lead car on 85%. Kobayashi just 80 percent, and uh, oh, and it's gone away before I got to the it was, it was, <laughs> it, it, was the it was 79 percent for Jota and 74 oh, percent well for the 50. Uh, but as I say, the outlier for me is the 50, having pitted and taken six seconds shorter than Jota, three seconds shorter than its team car. I think he's right. I think they've short filled it. And of course, on top of the using more electrical energy you can lift and coast a lot more as well, which you can do in all the other categories. It doesn't, that's not something that's unique to hypercar. You know, you can do the same thing in GT, GTM, as we're seeing a, a great scrap here with the D station down the inside of the Corvette for turn four, the crossover beautifully Beautiful. done Nico on Veroni. the exit there by Veroni. Yeah, that's how you do it. Casper Stevenson and Nico Veroni having a great battle, the brands here. We saw this year after year after year in the GT1 class uh, with the Corvette racing and the Aston Martin racing crews. It carried on into the GTE era uh, with factory talent and now in GTE and with D-Station racing and the Aston Martin, the factory Corvette team with their silver rank driver this year, uh, Nico Veroni. And now finally, is this the end of Almodel Harty's drive time? It must be, surely. I can't believe he was still I think four hours 45 to go in the race now. It, 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 yeah, that must have been a, a, a driver swap in full service down there. I think they're looking very good. He didn't start, uh, he did start the race, but he hasn't been in all the way no. through. Michael Dynan did the stint. Now he's on board with Nico Veroni. Whoa, goes right in across the bow. Way too hot there, Casper Sim But Steve, he had to go in hot like that because he was so squeezed of room on the inside. And uh, yeah, Veroni made, made absolutely sure that he was going to break as late as he could more towards the racing line and force Casper Stevens into a into a kind of mistake there but uh, now that LMP2 battle for the lead is getting in, in amongst it as well and uh, Galeo finds himself now clear of the Corvette and uh, Pearson's going to get that slipstream down towards turn one. A uh, little further back, Thomas Floor is back ab aboard the uh, Silver 54 Air Corsa Ferrari. I think that'll be his final stint. It will, yeah. Um, uh, Mike Wainwright back in the GR racing car. It seems to see, but say, that Amada Harty has stayed in the ORT by TF Aston Martin. He's paying for it, he's enjoying it, why wouldn't he? <laughs> well, there you go. And he's I not slow. Einlink's lead, and lead by what looks like a minute and 12 seconds, but uh, that is over Christian Reed, who should be on his final stint, but the Einlink's car has not burned any bronze time. We have four hours and 44 minutes, and two hours and 20 of those have to be with Claudio Schiavone at the wheel. What we know is Claudio was not well enough to start the car and the worst case scenario right now for that car is a full course yellow or safety car, yep. particularly safety car. Because it's burning uh, platinum time yes. under, uh, under it, it, control gap, conditions. That Absolutely. Gap, if it's a safety car, would completely be eradicated. Absolutely. And then you're asking your bronze driver to get in and get their elbows out in the, in the lead of the race with a whole load of silvers and platinums behind you. And meantime, the camera would then switch to the garages watching a whole load of platinum and gold drivers having a party, no one is coming, because we've had fantastic racing with the bronze drivers. Another shot there of Antino Rossi, who will see aboard one of the GT3, uh, the uh, LMP2 cars, my apologies, uh, tomorrow. Slightly surprised not to see his full-time teammate Maxime Martin here for the weekend, just because he's yeah. been a part of the paddock for such a long time. So I thought he might have just, you know, popped along. over. Yeah, he's a good fight as well. We've got uh, Dorian Pan in the uh, number 63 Prima car with uh, Rui Andrade in the 41 WRT. So uh, that's the championship leading car, the number 41. It's all about getting home here for these guys. We're not even at halfway point yet. Lots of racing to come here. The sky painting all sorts of colour pictures. This night has fallen here in the kingdom of, uh, the kingdom of Bahrain. And the two silver drivers in those cars as well. Not to, not to mention, so uh, it's a, a full-way silver fight, isn't it, at the moment in, in uh, LMP2 with car 31, Sean Galeo, Josh Pearson fighting here, we talked about before. 
And, uh, and then, yeah, oh no, he's not. He's not. Philippe Grand is in the front. Sorry, and number nine. Third, yeah. Number nine is in the, yeah, in, the, in the third position. So yeah, this isn't. Uh, this is lower down. This is yeah. So the number nine's in the third. And again, Rui Andrade here, the first World Championship race driver from Angola, and Dorian Pan, the first female World Championship race winner. No, in no. LMP2. Lila Wadu. Uh, Lila Wadu, right? No, no, Dorian hasn't won. No, she's she hasn't been, won yet. She's, That's been, right. she's been sparkling well, uh, this year, uh, yeah. but uh, she had one of the. Uh, quintet of talented female racers we've had in the FI World Endurance Championship this year. And you know she must be good, Dorian, because at any given opportunity, Danny Kvyat uh, and uh, and her other teammates, Portolotti. Uh, Portolotti, they'll mention absolutely that, oh, it, it, because she's so light. Yes. It's because she's, that's why she's so fun. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, okay, she is quite light, but it proves that, yeah, you know, yeah, I would yeah. take that if I was Dorian as definitely a backhanded now, compliment. Yeah, yeah. Here's absolutely. a moment. Is this. Does someone like a, that's Christian Reed getting out of the car? Uh, I'm not sure he's done enough time yet. He's only done a full stint and a second stint. I think he needs more time in the car. Okay. okay. Is it the end of his drive time? If it is, it will be the end of his driving career, at least as far as we're aware in the World Endurance Championship. Well, we're, are we going to wait for Lou to get him to confirm yeah. that? I, I know where we stand with it, and, um, but well, it, I think we've got a little longer to go in this race. It'll but be like Ant Davison flipping retiring all the time, won't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Tom Jones of sports car racing. <laughs> here we go. Can, uh, Dorian do on the exit of this corner here. She was flashing the lights uh, down towards that corner. There's the Rid future, that badge in the Iron Lynx Prema Garage. Yep. Indeed. And this is another exciting addition to the World Endurance Championship when we get into 2024. The Ligier chassis, but it is a Lamborghini, the SC63, coming to Hypercar next season. And uh, Kvyat, who has been testing that car, was saying it's, it's a real joy to drive. It, Even now, it, so, it sounds uh, the business as well. Phil Kitt sent me a, a little clip of, of it testing at Monza uh, a few weeks ago, and it definitely is a V8 twin turbo. Definitely sounds like a Lamborghini. Well, all sorts of talent being attached to all sorts of hypercar programs. Because Veroni going by Christian Reed, that was for Bush's position for seventh, and right in front is Casper Stevenson in sixth. So Veroni within a second of the top six at the moment. And again, Ben Keating has done all his time in that car, so it's now about silver and the gold rated drivers. On board with the Corvette down the back straight into turn 11, starting the climb up the hill. This is a long, long corner. There are a lot of long tyre wearing corners here. Yeah, you got six and seven uh, after the, the the tight right hander of turn four. So that's one area when you really need to uh, conserve the tyres and then, like you say, through turn 11 exit, through turn 12 into the winding part of turn 13. And that's pretty much your, your medium speed corners done. I wouldn't class this track having any high-speed corners, uh, but uh, yeah, certainly higher than the most that you have here. Well, we saw the Corvette going by Christian Reed, who had just left the pits. This is the 99 Proton Porsche dive bombing the number six car again. I think that was a, a late move. Harry Tingle catching Dane Cameron, no, number five catching Dane Cameron by surprise as he. Uh, dived inside him or leaving him with no option but to surrender but turn eight's been uh, an entertaining overtaking opportunity that i don't think we saw exploited very much in the years speaking of opportunity look this is dorian pan she's had a great run there on uh, Rui Andrade, you got caught up in traffic. She's on the inside for turn four, and I think this is her moment. If she doesn't get the line crossed over on the exit, which I don't think she will, I think she might just have this done before turn six. <laughs> yes, hangs on to it. Brilliant stuff there by these two silver drivers. We've talked a couple of times this year. Spa sticks in my head, whether that's right or not, about Dorian Pan just producing some really, really exceptional stints. And she has been more than pulling her weight in that team. It's, it, it's not really relevant that she's a female driver compared to her teammates. She's just quick. Oh, that, was, uh, that was good. That was the moment she was waiting for. And it's not easy to overtake on this track at LMP2. It can be done. 
but uh, you really need to be a bit forceful to, to get that job done. But that's the kind of moment you're looking for. Use the traffic wisely. She read it well, and uh, there was really nothing that uh, Rui Ontrad could have done in that situation. And now we're looking at that 38 team Jota car catching once again James Collado. So uh, he's he's got the speed, but Ferrari seem to be making their time in the pit stops with that energy saving. So a real interesting game of cat and mouse here between these two. And of course, it's worth pointing out that in the pit stop, you only top up fuel for the internal combustion engine. You don't have to recharge a battery or anything. That is done like a hybrid road car as you drive. Okay, mate, your pace is good considering we are on a lower energy target than 51. This is because of the small fuel fuck up the previous strat. So we do 32 laps, they do 31 laps. Uh, for uh, a, a small faux pas in the fuel strategy, obviously, was the words you heard. Uh, <laughs> they need to battle. Anglo Saxon English tends to be a fairly universal language, so yeah, so. They've had a little snafu with the fuel. So it's so. not a strategy unless that's misdirection. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can be driver as well, deciding to save a bit of extra fuel. And, uh, we've seen that quite often in, in the likes of the GTM category and particularly LMP2, where there's not much scope for playing around with the energy. You can do it via just lifting off and coasting towards the corner. You can actually try and sometimes save yourself a splash of fuel if you need that by the end of the race, if you consistently do it through the whole race. What the radio message was telling us, though, is that all the fuel... In the old days, you had a churn and you had a, a venting bottle, and when it went up into the vent bottle, that was full. Now you don't. You have a meter that preci precisely measures exactly how much fuel is going into the tank, and you pull it off when it gets to the preordained number, not when it just can't put any more in. So clearly, there was a miscommunication or misreading of the readout by the fueler who's taken the hose off a couple of litres or five litres or maybe a little bit more too early because that's the only way you can have a fuel faux pas in a pit stop is not putting enough in. You can't put too much in. Yeah, it could well have been. Um, so there's clearly, there, there has been a problem in the pits there for Ferrari at some point, and they've had to, on the car 50, go into a bit of fuel save mode. Yep. And uh, in conjunction with the driver doing their job. And what they've said is, you're actually doing really well considering we've had to fuel save. You're, five, you're yeah. still keeping hold with the car 51. So, so very good. So hopefully, you know, after this, round is done this this pit stop he'll be much faster the next time around with the proper fuel load in the car as Mirko Bortolotti takes over from Dorian Pan we are four and a half hours in three and a half hours to go in the eight hours of Bahrain and with the great and the good of the motorsporting fraternity in the region on the grid a chance to say goodbye to gte am and lmp2 both of which leave the series for next year to be replaced by loads more hypercars and gt3 at the start toyota one two on the grid sebastian Buemi on the inside line down to the first corner by Conway trying to defy, defend the outside, but a lock up from Earl Bamba under pressure from Antonio Fuoco, clattering into the back of Conway, scattering the pack, turning the Toyota around, and more contact as the LMP2 field arrived with hypercars coming back on. United Autosports 22 car hitting the van wall and the 23 car hitting both of them. A big spin there for one of the Alpines as well. Indeed, Josh Pearson, quite an ombrolio at the first turn. Hertz Team Jota didn't qualify strongly, but started the race well, pulling their way up the order. And so too did the number 60 car from Iron Link, scheduled to be started by Claudio Schiavoni. He was not well enough to start, and so the team were allowed to put in one of his co-drivers. He took the lead from sister car, the Iron Dames, a penalty for the number two caddy for that incident. That dropped them to the tail of Hypercar. Mike Conway coming back from last in the field.
to get to the first round of pit stops in third place. And to do so, he had had to pass almost every single other car in the race, including all but one of the hypercars. That was the 51 Ferrari, which stayed in front of him and held him off to the first round of stops. Behind the Proton Competition, Porsche was in a tussle with both Penske cars. All three of the 4963s swapping paint and trading places on track. Drama for 34, Le Mans winning into Europol car just after an out of schedule stop, stopping on the circuit. 51 Ferrari being passed for second place by the number seven Toyota. Kobayashi, Mike Conway and Jose Maria Lopez in seven need to win the race if they can. 60 Iron Licks leads in GTE, 31. LMP2 leader is WRT and the race as from the first turn being led by the number eight Toyota. Gap at the lead of the race between the number eight and the number seven Toyota who run first and second. 33.9 seconds has barely been under half a minute since the end of the first hour. And we are at the three and a half hour to go mark. Ferrari in third, just ahead of Hertz team Jota. The 50 Ferrari after a short fuel fill, struggling a little bit to make it all the way through to the next stop uninterrupted. Then the Porsches, Penske and Proton battling ahead of the Peugeots, plenty of P's there. LMP2 leading WRT just behind the Cadillac, well, a couple of laps behind the Caddy, but the Caddy has not recovered from that first corner penalty. So it's WRT, Joe to WRT in LMP2. Iron Lynx number 60, still with zero seconds driven by their bronze driver ahead of the Iron Dames car. Sarah Bovey back at the wheel of that to complete her minimum drive time. The Iron Dames look like they may be in a position to close out the GTE era with a win. But back to the third place battle. Louise Beckett is in the garage with Valentino Rossi, the nine-time motorcycle world champion. He'll be testing here tomorrow. We're very pleased to have Valentino Rossi with us. You're here with Team WRT. Of course, you've been racing with them in the GT World Challenge already, but uh, you're supporting the 41 and 31 today. Yes, uh, I race with this team from, uh, from two years, and uh, it's a very good team and very happy. So I come here to, to see the race because maybe next year I will race uh, in, the, in the WEC, so we will see. And especially tomorrow I will try the, the LMP2 for, uh, for the first time uh, because I always ask to Vincent to, to try the car and uh, tomorrow can be a good option. So I'm very curious to understand uh, how is the car. I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on you tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> Well, we hope to see you in WEC. Thanks very much. Yeah, this is the target for next year. Uh, we will try. Great. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Valentino already a winner at Le Mans in the road to Le Mans in GT3. Correct. Singly. Valentino, I speak for everybody here. Don't try to come to the Do it. <laughs> you, you, you can make it happen. Do it. I think the real question is whether he feels he can do himself justice in a hypercar or whether he's going to stay he's with good. what he knows and venture into somewhere different. In the same way that in his motorcycle career, he raced 125s in the Spanish CV Championship when he was 15 and kept with the 125s to move into 125 Grand Prix. Stay with what you know when you're venturing to, into different territory, and then when you've learned that, then you can start to expand. I would see him in a BMW M4 GT3, yep. and I would be bloody happy to do so as well. Oh, well I apologize for that language as well. <laughs> right, uh, jolly what happy. What I'd, what I'd say is this, um, whenever a young journalist joins my team, I always say to them, when you meet get him, out. Yes, get out. <laughs> get out. You're not going to. No, no. Type faster. Um, what I would say to them is when you're meeting someone who's got a career behind them, don't be boring. Tomorrow, lots of people are going to be boring because they're going to be asking him whether or not this is a prelude to buy the car run. It's going to be GT3, I'm sure, yeah. for next season. But the interesting part about it, the more interesting question, is whether or not this is part of. I think that was. 
57 come on Kessel Racing can we get this to that last one uh, yeah. uh, it's whether or not uh, this is a prelude to perhaps a testing program that might see whether or not he can assess whether or not he's going to be capable of a hydro yeah. car. I, I would think that's actually where he's going. We're looking at the battle here, number 10 Vector Sport, Orion Cullen, Ben Fiscal all over the back of him in the uh, Prema car, number nine Prema car. And Ryan Cullen loses the spot there. Through goes Viscal and queuing up behind is Freddie close. Lubin. He's got it back. A young driver in 22. This is going to be an interesting battle. Why does it look like he's only on daylight running lights, Ryan Cullen? The others look much brighter. Have they just got a main beam on? He, he, I think he can be. As long as he's got lights front and rear, I think yeah. he's OK. Yeah. A bit like the highway code. Yeah. It looks like he's on, uh, forget the lights, it looks like he's on uh, some older tyres here, it, though. It he's, does, he's actually. Got, he's got, it, yeah. he's offset, isn't he, compared to the cars around him. And uh, the number 22 as well of uh, Lubin is up next. And uh, he's going to be mounting the challenge with the Proton behind all of those. He's going to breeze past before turn 11, at least one of them. Yes, he's on the brakes, he gets both of them by the looks of it before he went to uh, the garage shot and the car 28 in the pits there now down at Jota who is at the wheel of that one at the moment it's uh, Pietro Fittipaldi yep. should have known with that day glow orange helmet well we didn't really see the helmet did we <laughs> so too much we at all they were in good form this morning those boys in the autograph session and the uh, and the, the pit walk and just go. really relaxed here we go Lubin on the attack and has a think about it into the last corner and it's often better not to do it, even if you see you have got a realistic chance, because this is the better chance. And, and if you overtake into turn one, it's gonna it's gonna be more beneficial, and, and you run the risk of getting repassed a lot less. Just saw the 99 Porsche go back past Ben Fiscal in the Prema car, who had to pass him in the final corner. He went round the outside of the Porsche because the Porsche was too slow. Is that uh, on that lap? No. Second lap? No, I don't know. Probably just uh, again, just you know, the running out of tires. On older tires, yeah. And it makes such Whoa. a difference. No, he didn't expect that. Neither of them expected that. And a trip through the gravel, a rarity here at the uh, Bahrain International Circuit. That was a close one, but it wasn't intentional. There's was nothing that the Ferrari driver could have done there. Who yeah. was driving? Esteban that? Masson, uh, yeah. fresh out of the pits. That's uh, on his, uh, in his second strip on an outlap. This is the end of Ahmed Al Harty's drive time, I'm pretty certain of that. So RT by TF from this point forward. We'll press the fast forward button. <laughs> not, to, not to say that Ahmed has not done a stellar job here. Emma Rojas out of the 35 car for Alpine. And again, Alpine ending their LMP2 association. Um, not sure. I was saying, you know, you don't need the cars anymore. You can do whatever you like with them. He said, oh, no, 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 they'll be racing in there next year. OK, right. Interesting. Yeah. You might have to go and have a bit of a, a fertile and a ferret there. That was uh, Oddie Colwell aboard that car. It was indeed. So we're getting to the end of most of the bronze driver's time in this phase of the race. One or two still to serve their current stents of the wheel. To give you an idea here, by the way, of the, the difference, uh, let's hear Picariello still at the wheel of the number 60 car. Matteo Grisoli started that car, the silver driver. One minute and 26 seconds is the gap to Sara Bovi still at the wheel of the 85 car. That's the difference between effectively a pro lineup starting those cars and a bronze light driver doing two hours, 20 minutes plus. Bovi, of course, sorry, Martin, but Bovi, of course, had Started had the race, silver. Yeah. jumped out, and now he's back Correct. in again. Freddie Lubin out, and Philip Albuquerque in at 22. It doesn't seem that long ago that uh, Albuquerque was driving that 22 yeah. car. So there's I a... don't think he's been in, has he? I yeah. don't think he, yeah. no, I don't think he has. Oh, yeah, you're no, right, Phil he did, Hansen. because he had the battle with uh, Josh Pearson. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right, OK. So they, so they've done a single, single, single then? Seems to be the case. Uh, this is looking back at Charles Melesi, yep. back into the Alpine number 36 as well. Julian Canal just jumped out. So again, they're single stinting. Um, and you know, in the in the, the heat and the fatigue, that makes sense. 
keep everybody as fresh as they humanly can be. You talked a little earlier about this this cycle of uh, the pace that was coming between the Ferraris and the Hertz Team Jota car. We're getting back to the point where the Hertz Team Jota car is back into a sweet spot, under a second again, uh, but with Antonio Fuoco, he dropped off that battle now uh, by about four and a half seconds. Well, Fuoco's on that fuel save, isn't he, as we heard them say about the snafu, so yeah, lots of lots of work going on on the pit wall as well as behind the wheel. It's a great phase of the race, this one, as the uh, the sun sets and you rely on the uh, more towards the floodlights and you can you can even afford to, like we saw with the uh, the Vector Sport car, run the lights at a lower a lower beam setting. And I think it's a good combination. They don't this track obviously can run much brighter if it wants to, but we're on half brightness from all the uh, the floodlights. Otherwise, if you turned all the lights off, you, you know, these cars are more than capable of running, like at Le Mans, for example, in the in the full darkness. You don't actually see very well on, from the TV shots because the, the lights are so bright on these cars, it blinds the TV cameras. Well, you were likely part of the race. I think it was during qualifying here where we had a full floodlight system failure uh, about 10 seconds into qualifying, which did lead to a delay. Uh, so I think that's all to do with what you're expecting. It did happen here. Uh, I some, that one. some years ago. I think it, I've got a feeling it might have been Audi's last race here. So, there's the Ferrari, there's the Jota. Now, what can you figure? You've closed the gap, Ife. What can you do to get past that car in front? And it, he's in the, the boundaries now of the turbulence coming off the back of that Ferrari. And uh, when you're so even on pace, just even a little bit of turbulence coming off the back is enough just to halt your progress. So it's a bit frustrating for us to watch as well. He's hovering around nine tenths to 1.2 seconds as the gap is as they cross the line at, at this point. LMP2 leader in the pits, Sean Galeo bails out. Robin Frines jumps in. So Sean will do. Again, looks like they're. Uh, looked like Ferdy did a double. And then, was that a double then as well for. I think it might be. 41 is in as well. Andrade out of the car. 41. As they start to count back here. So that is Louis Delatraz getting aboard the car, I believe. Yeah, and Louis was the driver that qualified that number 41 car as well. So uh, clearly has the speed around here. He's, he's a good, solid driver. It's, uh, it's Louis Delatraz, but it didn't quite come together for, for him. For whatever reason, in qualifying yesterday, qualified near the back, uh, I think second to last. And maybe he had a track excursion, uh, you know, there were hot track limits yesterday. I didn't quite see whether he had at that time deleted. There's a lot of action going on in LMP2 at that time, but uh, he's back out there and keen to ca carry on making progress as they have been all afternoon here in Bahrain. And well, we heard, heard from Sean Galeal in the garage before he got into the car that their deal with the 41 car was that uh, 31 would win, 41 would win the title. Of course, they'd like Fair to do enough. it by being 1-2, wouldn't they? And I mean, you know, that's that's not just being silly, that's WRT's level of ambition. They want to leave LMP2 with everything they can take out of it. Toyota Gazoo Racing leading here as we approach the halfway mark. Nearly four hours in and four hours and 19 minutes to go in the eight hours of Bahrain season finale of the FIA World Endurance Championship. The red car in your shot is in third place. That's the AF Corsa Ferrari of James Collado and his closest rival. That's the gold car right behind Hurst and Jota's Yiffy Yi. Again, just showing the breadth of driving talent uh, from across the globe, North and South America, every continent represented in the field, apart from Australia and Antarctica. Haven't got anybody from Antarctica, have we? Uh, no, no, you've got, no. You've got, you've got Ryan Briscoe from Australia. Ah, there we go, so apart from Antarctica. So I'd forgotten <laughs> Ryan Briscoe was back in again. Yes, you're right, because he wasn't in the last race because he hasn't been here since... Got um, plenty of people have plenty of people. house pulled out, yeah. No, I, not, we have had, just not today. I missed the question, sorry. I was processing some other information I'd heard. Antarctica, unless there's, uh, <laughs> unless there's some kind of polar bear. A, a, a penguin. 
Polar bears of Northern Hemisphere. Right, apologies, got that one wrong again. It's been getting it wrong now. I'm good on flora and fauna, a bit loose on drivers. <laughs> James Clardo really, look, he's flashing the lights all the time. <laughs> the van wall in front of him, literally, he's constantly on them. All the, even through high speed corners like turn 12, just flashing the lights, flashing the lights because he's starting to pick up turbulence from a car he's about to lap. Look, there he goes again, starting to weave around. Oh, Look, yeah. I'm here, I am here. I know I know you've got your eyes facing forward at this, but so I'm gonna try and grab your attention because you will have blue flags and I've got this pesky Jota behind me putting pressure on me, thank you very much. It's Get like out the, of my way. It's like there are blue lights. White man van behind you. Come on, guys, clear out, clear out. Let's, What's some loony behind me who wants to get by? Well, he's, what, six laps down. This is Tristan Vautier in the the Van Wall, the number four car, but six yeah. laps down as this battle for third position approaches. And then you're absolutely right, just to yeah. slightly here. Ife can, he can snip a chance here because oh, yeah. the, this Van Wall, if he doesn't get out of the way, it's going to really start to affect Collado. He's really unhappy here. Well, the Van Wall team, Finally. you know, admitting that they are down on power to everybody else, but it's still taken the Ferrari, you know, lap and a half to get by him. Yep. And a severe chop across as well. I just saw that with the body language of the, uh, the Ferrari. Really, really not happy. That's the, And it's not cool. When you know a driver's so far down and you're not in the fight at all, they're midway through the LMP2 field at the moment. It's the Van Wall, and you've got this, this fight going on. Now Yifei's getting involved. You just think... Come on, this is a FIA World Championship. You've got blue flags. Let's let's play fair. LMP2 battle with the 28 Jota car, Pietro Filipaldi at the wheel, Mirko Bortolotti chasing him down. Mirko's last race in LMP2. Former um, that long time factory Lamborghini driver after he won the FIA Formula 2 championship moved into the arms of Lamborghini in GT racing and has barely left the uh, Lamborghini squadron since and uh, pretty much imagine him licking his lips with delight at the prospect of racing the brand new Lamborghini hypercar from the start of next season. Maybe, comes yeah. steaming up between them, doesn't he? And, and unfortunately puts the kibosh on any potential pass there that Bortolotti was thinking about. Maybe thinking, uh, yeah, you know, you might be just easily breezing past me now, but give it a year and I'm in my Lambo. I'll be fighting you. Well, yeah, I, I won't be worrying about a Jota. I might be worrying about a Jota, but it'll be a Jota Porsche. Exactly. And it'll be, yeah, a, an upgraded Peugeot. So he's getting a look at some of the opposition here. And that's why when we say, as sad as it is to be waving goodbye to LMP2 cars in this championship, of course they will be at Le Mans when we return there next year. But many of those drivers that we're looking at, like Borsalotti right now in the 63 Prema, uh, they will still be very much involved in this championship, just in different cars, in different classes. There's a few teams we will say farewell to, not all of which we can yet confirm because we don't know the final decisions uh, for all of the LMGT3 teams. But uh, into Europol competition, we know, uh, will leave the, will, the FI World Endurance Championship at the end of this season. We wait to see whether or not the McLaren plans of United Autosports uh, gain an entry. And then down through the GTE Amers, we're watching this battle still. Uh, Northwest AMR, that team name will disappear. That's uh, Paul Delano's team name, but uh, we expect that to be likely two different team names. Preston Martin, Heart of Racing, have confirmed that they are very likely for one of them, and they've been out testing. Corvette Racing will go uh, to be replaced with the new Corvettes uh, in the hands of TF Sport. And, uh, oh, big lock up there. Oh, yeah, to the apex. Yeah. yeah, that's the bumps into turn one. You've got to be so careful, especially when the tyres start getting old. But all it takes is a slight lapse of concentration. You know, we're coming up to uh, halfway through this race now. Slight lapse of concentration, and you can easily have a, a, a lock-up that causes a significant vibration, significant enough that you need to come in and even change the tyres. So just goes to show how on the edge they are the whole time. A little bit of good or less bad news for Ferrari popping up on our screen at the moment. 
a message from race control saying there's no further investigation into the potential full course yellow infringement by the number 50 car, so nothing to serve there. Uh, Antonio Fuoco still with less fuel for the stint than he was hoping for, though, uh, as into the pits comes Dane Cameron in the number five Penske Porsche. But that's good news for us that, it, that there, there's no uh, full course yellow uh, any further action on that one because car 50, Fuoco is pulling himself into this fight sooner or later. He's only 3.3 seconds behind now, Ife Ye. It's going to be a three-way fight there between uh, two Ferraris with the, uh, the jam in the middle of Yifei 8. It's interesting, isn't it, that the 50 car started in front of 51 and very quickly, in the first hour, 51 was waved by and has not been troubled by on pace by the 50 car since. And now, because James Collado is doing so much to try and protect his tyres, uh, he's not only being caught by Yiffy Yi, but his teammate will be right there as well in a few laps. So Collado's doing what he needs to do for the long, long distance run of the car. Filippaldi under pressure from Bortolotti again. Bortolotti within DRS range, wishing he had DRS. Exactly, this is uh, the fight for fourth place in LMP2, and Bortolotti is just wearing him down, he's wearing him down, but uh, he, he sensed uh, a bit of a chance, didn't he, last time around with that lock-up from Fittipaldi, but that's, that hasn't uh, reoccurred this time, but he is still mounting that pressure. Fittipaldi squirming yeah. over the curbs in turn two, wasn't it? I mean, you can see how touch and go these cars are in terms of power. We're talking about them being underpowered compared to where they might be. And in fact, in ELMS next year, they will have more of their power back. They've been reined in a bit in World Endurance Championship because the hypercars are not as quick on a lap as their predecessors in LMP1, and they're still getting in way of LMP2 in the slow corners. James Collado, Yiffy Yi, where's the third car? There it is, you just saw the Ferrari in the background. Hold the shot, hold the shot, there he is. That's Antonio Fuoco, and they are a long way clear of the next car, which is the number six Porsche of Kevin Est. But at this point, Yiffy Yi is drawing closer to the Ferrari ahead of him again. Let's have a listen to what's going on aboard with Yiffy Yi. You can use more energy if you can pass him. You can use more energy if you can pass him. If not, you save energy. If not, you save. Yeah, and you can see there on the uh, on the energy, the virtual energy tank that uh, Jota does indeed have less energy to play with than the Ferrari. So, so that's you really can go interesting. for track position by using a bit more fuel, but only if you know you can do it. Now, I don't think he quite has the speed to get the job done, even if he were to use quite a significant amount more fuel, so therefore less lift and coast into each braking zone. I, I still don't think that would be enough, so it would be wasted energy at this stage in the race. So Collado is not only holding off the Hertz team Jota Porsche, he's extending his own fuel window in comparison to the Jota car, so he's doing a, a doubly good job, exactly what he said. We've been warned, we're told that uh, there's going to be an investigation into contact between Brendan Hartley and Mike Wainwright at 5.35, so 10, 25 10, 10, 10, minutes ago, yeah. uh, 15 minutes ago. I don't think we saw that in screen. We did. There was an investigation into another incident between two cars that we also had not seen on screen. I don't think anything uh, ended up being... Uh, uh, handed out as a penalty there. Northwest AMR coming out of the pit lane. Alex Uberas at the wheel, the Spanish driver. Again, those boys are in very good form. It's a, a real sort of end of season feel in the in the pit lane walkabout and the autograph session today. Everybody, the sun's out, it's shining, it's lovely and warm. Lots of eager fans, everybody was ready to go. Getting ready for, well, maybe not his final stints yet. Uh, even if he doubles now, I think Antonio was going to get back in for the end. Is that what Will said? I think that's what he said. I think but that's what he said. This will be his first stint in yep. this race. So, so what's going on for so Brendan Hartley? Set light to the blue touch paper. Oops, I think I got pushed from behind. But I don't think I came back in front, honestly. Check the rear of the car. I wonder if... I think I left some space, but he, he pushed me. So that was the 86 car. Yeah, that's the no turn 11 moment. In wasn't the it? back end of the you know, the leading car, that's Mike Wainwright aboard the 86 well, moment. 
what we need is Brendan's on board to see how late he jumped in front of Mike Wainwright, stood on the brake, stopped dead, and then drove around turn 11. So yep. if he's been hit from behind by the slowest class in the field, it's not because they were attacking him from behind, it's because he caught them out under braking. The interesting very part of that phrase was, I think I was hit from behind. Yeah. And I don't think I hit him when I went back past. Right. So it, it, it has all the hallmarks of getting to the end of the back straight, dropping back in front of the Aston. The Aston then has not got room to stop before Brendan gets out of the way, collects him from behind. Brendan runs off wide, comes back on, possibly has collected the Aston again. I, I don't know. I think. It's here anyway, turn yeah, 11. Yeah, so I, what I think might have happened is that Brendan might have overtaken on the racing line, turned in thinking he had cleared him. Yeah. And maybe then got the contact. Uh, but like we've been saying, all race long, the LMP won't be. <laughs> the hypercars are actually, actually not that quick in the slower speed corners when you're having to stop the car and it catches out the GT car. So maybe it's just a bit of a. Oh, I didn't realise you were actually going to go that slow, but if it is a case of Brendan turning in and slowing down too much, not real, and basically pinching the car, the GT car, into submission, then the stewards could be looking at that and uh, it might not go, might not fall in a nice way. For, for, but I, I need to see the footage. I'm just trying, trying to imagine what happened. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just decide what happened with that. Unless, that, he, that, that radio unless maybe he went around the outside of the Aston as opposed to up the inside of it. Yeah. I'm saying Aston, I don't know why I keep saying Aston. I was just about to say I don't mean Aston because Mike Wainwright drives the GR Racing Porsche. He does. But again, I came back and immediately said Aston again. So uh, it's Porsche anyway. So if anybody was there, answers on a postcard. Otherwise, we'll wait for the steward's decision. There's the number two caddy. Uh, still chasing Fred Makabiki, but a long way back. They have made literally almost no progress in the entire race to Cadillac through uh, since that, that first corner penalty, the drive through. Yeah, it, it's just been absolutely relentless attrition for them. There's yeah, that's from going going on. Which one? The Cadillac. Oh, yes, it, it was. Big one, yeah. Because they, they, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, <laughs> And actually, it's robbed us of a really good race between the two Toyotas today Absolutely. because the gap is hovering. It's around 40 seconds it now. It was 60 seconds, wasn't it, for the Cadillac, and 90 seconds vector for time pressures. Yeah. And, it, and, and yeah. it's not only the battle between the Toyotas, because by now we'd have Hertz Team Jota, the Cadillac, and probably both Ferraris in a fight for third place as well. And that's, you know, it's all adding grist to the mill. And don't forget that behind Toyota, all those other cars are brand new to the series this year, so brand new to this circuit this year. And, you know, talking about this uh, to some of the Ferrari group, Bugello, uh, last weekend for Ferrari's finale Bagnali, and talking about the prospect of these gaps coming down as they understand the package more, as they can squeeze more out of the kit of parts that they have underneath them. And whilst they were traditionally political about that, the reality is that's what's going to happen. Well, this could be a situation around here, through turn 12, the 28, yeah. Fittipaldi cars had to back out of it, goes for the inside of 13, but also letting can't throw it through, but focuses on the exit of that corner now. Nailed Fully it. in the stri slipstream, this will be tight down towards the last corner. Fittipaldi knows it, he thinks about defending but doesn't, and he's got to let through here and cross the line on the exit. That's the only thing he can do. Has Bortolotti done enough on the exit here to stop that challenge now, which is probably going to come. Great stuff between those two. Fittipaldi could read it. Wasn't his fault that he's been overtaken into that final corner. Here they and come. now he's on the attack, the re-attack down into one. And he's not going to do it. Bortolotti very good on the brakes into there. So that is a great move. and. Uh, yeah, decisive move, well thought out by Bortolotti, using the traffic to good effect. Fourth place, and uh, next target, Robin Fryens, who's 13 seconds up the road from that battle. In third place is United Autosports 23 that leads. Oli Jarvis aboard that car from Bentfist Carl, 11 and a half seconds ahead in LMP2, the final full season LMP2 race of this current era. 
with Robin Freinzer for the five seconds back. Freins has taken a second out of Ben Miskal in the last lap in that battle for second place. WRT still looking for a one-two result. Don't forget Robin Freins' team in that 31 car winning Le Mans a couple of years ago in the most dramatic finish where WRT was going for a one-two and Yippie East car died on the way to the S's, through the S's, on the very last lap. Because we know how cruel the mom can be. <laughs> have, we, have, we managed to, have we managed to crowbar well, around mention of 2016? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> and, Every and, single race. And, and don't forget that the second WRT car had lost its onboard air jacks. They were having yes. to jack it up with a balloon, basically, at the back and the front, changing one set of tyres or the other. They couldn't do four at a time. And so it was on, it had a misfire. It was on ropey, ropey tyres, being caught by Tom Blomqvist, hand over fist, in the last few minutes. He was like nine seconds a lap quicker. And Robin Frines got to the line, bounced off one of the two Toyotas that there, were there for the photo and a couple of Porsches and nearly ran over a man in the track waving the flag as he took victory by about a second, I think, from Blomqvist. It was a, a hugely dramatic end. If that had been the top class, nobody would have felt shortchanged in any way, shape or form. One of the closest of all finishes in years uh, since Johnny Adam bounced over the kerbs in the Aston to keep the Corvette behind. And what change did that last lap cause to the way in which Le Mans finishes? Well, nobody's allowed to be standing in the middle of the Correct. track, on the edge of the track, or anywhere on the track with a flag on the last lap. OK, so fuel stops going in again underway. Leader is in before the number seven car. No, it's not. And do they put enough? energy into this number yeah, 50 yeah. this time watching 45 percent 50 percent coming last time clearly it wouldn't have been at 100 percent because they had that fuel issue so i'm watching that like a hawk now and i'm sure all of the ferrari yeah. crew are down there in the pits as uh well, i'm not getting a reading from the number seven toyota as well there. Louise really Beckett in the background. Change. Louise will be glad to know that the, the uh, Jota delivered cheesecake was about as exceptionally good as you can imagine. Oh, a slow stop there as well on the left front. Away he goes. Didn't look that slick there. No. It, it was, I mean, a lot of sparks coming off that left front tyre wheel that could have been a lot faster. That's just the gun not quite going onto the nut straight, isn't it? And just bouncing off yeah. in fraction. A wait to see what ticks over here. Change the driver, of course. Froco getting up. Nick Nielsen is that's in. It's one minute 26. It is a slower stop. Pachito Lopez. That's the nickname that Jose Maria Lopez has had since he was a very young boy, and by which he is universally known in Argentina. They don't even say Lopez. They just say Pachito. Isn't it because his father? That it, it translated Pachito means little chest. Little something. chest. Yeah. Little, little chest. Breast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they, his dad was the big chest. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a cute little nickname, really. It's like Stephen Johansson, Little Leaf. Where do, I mean, yeah. you know, that it's a it's an odd nickname to give your kid, but you know, whatever. Uh, Pichito is in. Kamui Kobayashi out. is out. Thought he did a great stint there, boss. Yes. Four hours in. Four hours to go. Title to be decided. And again, that Toyota. Seven stopping. I think it'll be at the end of their first flying lap that the number eight comes in. Driver change at Hertz Team Jota, AFDC, uh, CD, DC, CD, DC. Dacos, is it AFC he has on his helmet? Arsenal Football Club, I don't think that's right, is it? Another uh, hard Porsche. tyres go on. Another Porsche sits in the, uh, the pits with steaming brakes. Not on fire this time. Mm -hmm. That's because they've been kind of. Yeah, that's all that lift and coasting that EFA has been doing, saving that energy. But still, Ferrari were able to save more. That's the problem. Now, how's this pit stop going? That looked a bit better, didn't it? From, from Joe to there over the Ferrari stop. So yeah. they needed it because Ferrari. Yeah, they were, they were pleased with that one. Uh, Ferraris was 126. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was. Let's have a look at what happens. 123 for Jota. That's three seconds gained on track. Sara Bovi out of the car for the final time in the background. There she is. She's done. 
And that car still where it needs to be. It's 125 for Jota uh, as he cleared the timing line. Okay. So he picked up a second on the Ferrari, but it's a plus. It's in the plus column at the moment. Michelle Gatting back in the car. And away she goes. Looks like everybody in the team has scribbled their best wishes on the car. There's Yiffy Yi. I think that was Rahel Fry. Was it Rahel? I think it was. I think you're right, actually. Michelle's got much more white on the helmet. In comes Collado from second. So he outlasted the 38 car on fuel. There's the white seat liner. This is the unique new cooled seat that they've got in the Ferraris. So it helps with driver cooling. So new, he can't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a problem. It is a problem. I'm being serious. When, yep. when you've done a new seat, you, you spend a long, long time not just getting it comfortable, but having to make sure you can get the seat insert in and out efficiently, and you've got to learn the technique for it as a driver as well. There's a special technique to try and get the seat in and out, and uh, and that was a classic example of not quite enough time has been spent with that new insert, and uh, falling foul of it almost, getting properly stuck. They go to work again. Yep. Time on the 51 car, also on pit lane, by the way, the lead the race leader, Brendan Hartley. So the car is in and out. So the regulations in sports car racing or in the World Endurance Championship is that you can only have two, two people over that white line changing the tyres. They're saying four people in total that are working on the car and you're allowed a driver helper at the same time. Try to change the Toyota as well. So that driver helper, getting the driver, that's the only dedicated job they're allowed to do on that car. They're not allowed to work on any other side of the mechanic. Interesting moment there. Oh, yeah. He's going, oh, this is the Ferrari fight. This is the 50 and uh, number 38. Yep. The overcut having worked. Uh, oh, look at that. Coming back out in the 51, struggling He's to got warm both up of them. the tyres. Fantastic stuff. Three cars battling for third place. 50 Ferrari with warm tyres takes the advantage. The 38 Jota car gets in front of the 51 car and the 38 car pitting a lap earlier. So the overcut actually hurt the 51 car that time. They benefited last time. This time their rivals on cleaner tyres. Big lockup from the Corvette. Nico Veroni has been passed and left by Casper Stevenson. He's been passed by Michael Wainwright in the GR race, or Stevenson's gone by Wainwright. And that looked like Julian Andlauer oh, dive bombing. This is how it happened. Oh. I wondered why suddenly he was under so much threat. He just absolutely locked up the Costa into that final corner. And the 51's problem, by the way, was a slow pit stop, slower pit stop. It's yeah. 129. Even Ferrari. slower? Wow, yeah. 129. Wow. That's cost them two places on track. They were third, they're now fifth. And Nick Nielsen, the car came in in fifth in the hands of Antonio Fuoco, now up to third. Now then, back with our AM um, battle. Here is Dempsey Proton's Julian Andlauer, factory pro driver from Porsche, very, very quick. Closing down Nico Veroni. Veroni has been passed by Casper Stevenson and Alex Ramirez and Northwest AMR Aston Martin has driven away from him as well. So the question is, has Nico Veroni forgotten how to drive or is he on a Ben style fuel economy? Are they trying to do what they did in Fuji, which was save an entire fuel stop? Don't forget, Ben did a short stop partway through the race. If they can save half a stint, they could have a big advantage at the end. Nick Nielsen, Antonio Felix da Costa, for third. Da Costa will be really pleased with having dropped the car off the road and given those spots away, won't he? He'll be kicking his own... Yeah, because, patting himself firmly on the back. Yeah. Because he would have finally found his way past the car 51. He is in front of the 51. Yeah. Unfortunately, the other Ferrari's overtaken him yeah. and he's staring at the back of another one. So, uh, yeah, that was such a uh, such a costly mistake at that point in the race for De Costa. It wasn't a massive lock-up, so the tyre will be OK in terms of vibration, but this Ferrari has proven so impossibly hard to overtake for the Jota car all race long. And on top of that, he's on on our graphics anyway at least, slightly older tyres. That, that looks like a qualifying yeah. set on the Jota car, whereas brand new on Nick Nielsen's car. The 
potentially, apart from the front right on the Yeah, that's a yeah. qualifier, you're right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so cut the cost of, right, what can you do here? A little bit of traffic might help you through 12, but uh, Nielsen's going to dive down the inside. Oh, a bit of contact. That's even. Mike Wainwright. He's going to be starting to get a bit of a complex about <laughs> yeah. hypercar drivers hitting him. After contact with Brendan Hartley in the number here eight. We go. So here comes Antonio Felix de Costa looking around the outside on the filthy part of the track. Does he get in part, Anthony? What a move. What a move. It's not over yet because on the exit, the Ferrari's going to get a clean one here. And it's not over because it's going to carry on down towards turn one. The Ferrari is a bit faster in straight line. De Costa's going to go to the inside to defend it. That pushes the Ferrari onto the racing line. The better braking zone for him is who dares break latest. It's Nielsen into turn one. Brilliant stuff oh, between these two. And he comes to an absolute grinding haul there. He had to rotate the car. And here comes Antonio Felix da Costa. Does he have a shout into turn four now? He does. But uh, as we saw, the Ferrari's quick in the straight line. That's where it's making its lap time up. And knew da Costa would be under a bit of threat. He had to try into the final corner. He might not get another chance. He's going to try turn eight again. Look how close he is as they come through four and five, six and seven down the hill. He did everything absolutely right there, De Costa, and kept his nose in there when he was almost pushed off the circuit. I was watching that, and the stewards would have been as well, but uh, Nielsen played it, he played it fair, but right to the edge. Nick Nielsen, never a hypercar champion yet. He has been an LMP2 champion. Sorry, Bobby, in the garage with Louise Beckett in the inset watching the action, waiting for a chat, but waiting for things to be just a fraction less mental <laughs> on track before we jump in there. But it's this kind of action we were looking forward to as this hypercar class exploded in numbers. Deep already, it's going to get chasm-like uh, next year with many, many more cars. So what can you do, Antonio Felix de Costa, on in a car that seems to have the speed, you're using a little bit more energy than Ferrari, but they've got the straight line advantage on a track where straight line speed is so crucially important when you're in a fighting situation. If you can just get in front, we'll see him pull away. But yeah, here's that moment as they headed down the main straight. Oh, no, sorry, this is down to the final. Oh, this is turn one. He had no choice, but I think, to take the line that he did. I think otherwise he would have been passed. He was close this time as well, yeah. but didn't quite think to do it. And he's focusing on the exit of turn closer. two. That's nice. Closer. He's got a good run this time. Actually, he's closer this lap than he was that before. And that forces Nielsen to the inside. That was a brilliant oh. move, but not quite. Not enough. Right, oh, it was, because yes. he broke too late. Nielsen. Forced him into the mistake. Makes the mistake. Breaks too late. Through goes Antonio Felix de Costa. Sara Bovi, go and have a shower. Louise will still be there when yep. you get back because no one's taken their eyes off this for a moment. And that was the part of the circuit he needed to overtake him because through all this twisty stuff, he can start to make progress now. Finally, we see Hertz Team Jota in front of Ferrari, both now, Ferraris in now, this race today. Hertz Team Jota up to third overall for the first time without it being pit stops. Okay, everybody breathe. Louise Beckett is in the Iron Dames garage with Sarah Bovey. There is a GTM race going on, as we have seen. Let's catch up with them. Sarah Bovey, we'll start with your race and then we'll talk about what else is going on. Uh, you, you just finished your stint now, you went back in the car, how was it? Uh, yeah, I need like uh, finish with my driving time now. Uh, everything went okay. Uh, it's, it's a bit tough on track. Uh, the, um, the traffic, the hypercar battle is really, really tense and we can feel it in the way they are coming at us. Uh, the start was uh, clearly a bit, uh, you know, messy. Um, I'm just happy that I managed to not get caught in it. And, um, you know, at the end, we are, we are doing the race we wanted to do at the moment so far. No mistakes, a good pace. Um, but uh, we are just in the middle of the race, so uh, we, we don't really know um, what to expect. We have had that situation in the past, so I don't want to, you know, uh, be happy too early. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we all did a great job. Rahel is just on track now for her first hint, and she, she looks like she has a good pace. So, uh, finger crossed that uh, we can push to the end. I'll let you go and cool down now. So the gap that they're defending with uh, the wrong side done for the Ardennes, or rather the gap they're attacking, 
is a minute and 26 seconds now uh, to the leader, but the 60 car has not had a second of bronze time yet. Yeah, yeah that, that, that is going to be less their drama than the fact that Alex Riberas in the Northwest AMR Aston Martin is bringing the gap down from third to that second place car. Carl Fry just being pinged for track limits as well, so she needs to keep that alive. Mika Veroni being passed now, finally, by Julian and Lauer. They've both gone by Mike Wainwright in the Gulf uh, GR, in the GR racing. Uh, Porsche, but Ann Lauer going by Nico Veroni. So is Veroni saving fuel? Comes back on the inside. Take that, you rotter. I'll have that place back. But it, he, we've seen some stellar stints from him this year. It seems unusual that so many cars are arriving behind the Corvette and going by, unless the wrong Nico Veroni and the other one is locked in a cupboard somewhere. See a replay of that one. I'm pretty sure he went all four wheels over the white line, right over that red and white curve that gave him the slingshot in yeah. towards turn eight. If they look back at that in the stewards' room, maybe they'll they'll see that as well. Was it gaining an advantage and a lasting advantage by going all four wheels over the white line? I don't know. It looked pretty aggressive to me. Team might be on the radio going, okay, just let him go on the straight. Just Ambotier being warned about track limits. Uh, well, no, under investigation for yeah, using yeah. track limits, that's the point at which a penalty could come. Likely to come. Here is the 28 Jota and the 41 WRT going by for third. Second. 41. OK, well, there are three blue lights on the 28 Jota and he's just passed him, so that was a pass for third. So when did somebody disappear that made that second? Either that or Jota's indicator lights aren't working properly. However, be that as it may, WRT are now 1-2 ahead of Jota and again <laughs> and Lauer having to park the car and bounce over the kerbs as a penalty has been awarded to the number four Look car. Look at this replay, the, the Costa, so he, he fooled him into thinking, I'm going to go outside, then went back to the inside and I don't think Nielsen for one moment knew where to look, braked a bit too late, halfway towards the inside of the corner and just ran out too wide, the Costa went for the cutback. It was all a bit P.K. Mansell, that wasn't it? it was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Better than that. It's, it's, it's the distraction. They're nicer characters. <laughs> for the driver in front, it's the drive, it's the distraction of the car moving in and out of your mirrors that just for one few hundredths of a second distracts you from where you've got to be braking your car. That was absolutely yeah. top class. Gunnar Jeanette in Rexy, the green AO Porsche, Project One car, and Esteban Masson, I said Etienne Masson, Esteban Masson in uh, the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Falcon on the balcony. Excellent. Falcon on the balcon. Uh, Lilo Wadu out of the Richard Mille Racing Team 83 Ferrari. That's Masson going by, Gunnar Jeanette. Yeah. Fantastic job, by the way, from the AO Racing team. But, uh, I'm afraid poor Rexy had a bit of a broken corner after a bit of a whoopsie in free practice. Rexy and was a bit wrecked. He was indeed. Yeah. Could have been extinct at that point. And uh, they did manage to perform archaeological surgery and back on track. Remember, we're battling here for history, battling here for the last ever, not WEC, a GT Am class win, but the last ever GT race. And is it possible that that might also be the first World Championship race won by an all female crew? That would be quite some story. Uh, they were <laughs> performing paleontological surgery. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you have to look that up. <laughs> no, I did. To criticize I, was, me. I, was, <laughs> I was looking it up and I suddenly remembered paleontology. Is the study of dinosaurs. Look at you, David Schwimmer. <laughs> uh, that's exactly, I was trying to remember exactly that. Exactly that. Paleontologists. There we go. Alpine on board with a 36 car. Not having a great race, Alpine. They're 8th and 10th. And this is not where we used to sit. They just haven't really quite had it 
that often this season, no. have they? They just haven't. There have been too many Alpine Valleys rather than Alpine Peaks. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good analogy. And it has been a bit like that. They did have, we know, earlier in the season, one of the two chefs that they realised did have an issue, and that was replaced for Le Mans. No further action, by the way, in that uh, incident that we heard Brendan Hartley commenting on. Uh, the, the first of many, I think I might have hit Mike Wainwright uh, investigations yeah. <laughs> going At the on. 8 and 36, no further action on that uh, on that count. 47. Yeah, yeah. Rio Hirakawa is uh, driving. He is, isn't he? Leading, uh, leading the way and continuing to extend that lead on the uh, Jose Maria Lopez charge behind. But not really coming to anything now. 47 seconds between the two Toyotas. And as of now, the points for the number eight car, it will make it look like a very one-sided battle. However, it will be their second win. Third win of the season. Yeah, because car number seven. To four already for the number seven car. Yeah. Number seven excluded in Portimao because they had a drive shaft sensor fail that is part of the mandatory monitoring system. Uh, for the FIA and WEC. That was absolutely no fault whatsoever for the drivers. Number eight car failed. Uh, it had it went red in Spa, and so they had to uh, abandon ship there. No, they were not disqualified in Portimao, but they were heavily delayed. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they finished two ninth. points yeah. that, that day yeah. in Portimao. The, the but, I mean, basically every time so far this season that car seven has finished a race unscathed, they've won. Yeah. Yeah, hence the four wins out of seven. But uh, it's looking very unlikely today that uh, they'll be able to catch and pass and win this race. Uh, catch and pass car number eight. The, the stumble, of course, was uh, for the, uh, the the Cowboy Kobayashi Lopez car at Le Mans in that yep. uh, multi-car shot that involved actually one of the Alpines yep. um, down towards Dunlop. That was a nasty one, wasn't it? It was horrible. It was Kobayashi driving at the time, wasn't it? Where there was a full course yellow, no, a slow zone, and he got completely smashed into the back of And there, there were two of those in the race between the Dunlop Bridge and the, and the end of the S's. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it is something clearly the ACO desperately need to look at before next year when we've got 68 hypercars and 112 others in the field. So, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely. Yeah. yeah, and again, absolutely out of their control. Yeah. The, the, dri the driver lineups are absolutely impeccable. The preparation of cars is exemplary, and the reliability of modern race cars is just well, something that nobody, when I started going to Le Mans, could ever have contemplated. A car could ever be as reliable as any of these are, never mind all of them. We're four hours, 20 minutes into this eight hour race. Oh, you're uh, going to say it now, aren't you? No, what I'm going to say is, i uh, just talking about that reliability side of things, every single car in this field is effectively in class position. 11 of the 12 hypercars are first to 11th. The only car in hypercar that's at slightly out of position, now two positions into the LMP2 field is recovering Van Wall, just by the way, we made a pit stop. Then it's all the LMP2s, and then it's all the GTMs, and all 36 cars are running. Amazingly, the only ones really out of position in their classes are because they've had drive-throughs for those penalties. The Van Wall, the Caddy, and uh, a couple of the others. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been a, not really being able to put your finger on too much of what's gone wrong with Alpine. They've been there or thereabouts, but well, not second really, on grid. Yeah. yeah, but not really on the, on the podium in, in, a, in, in much of a podium. Can, you just don't feel they, they've been contenders this year as often as you would have expected. But then sort of United went through that slump last year to a degree, didn't they? After the 22 car won, won everything, including the national lottery. You know, they they sort of had a bit of a slump. Hey, once a fan, always a fan. <laughs> if you're going to answer that phone, you're going to have to pull it the other side of the fence, Valley. <laughs> See, no, but he's just going to be putting this up on social media because he's just such a fan of motorsport. I can tell you from that camera angle, he's a much better GT driver than he is a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one bit of an update, by the way, on the number 60 car. 
uh, Matteo Cressoni now back aboard that car. Three hours, 38 minutes to go, and two hours, 20 of that has to be served by Claudio Schiavone. Uh, it's it's going to be tough, and, and they are. I think they're just going to have to put him in at the end. Pit stop now for the 36 Alpine. 35 has just cleared the garage, and the 33 Corvette being told to give the place back to the Dempsey Proton car. So Nico Veroni, who, as Anthony pointed out, there it passed. Is. Uh, over the white lines to go by the 77 car. I sort of thought the team would probably tell him, mate, you better give the place back on the next trade. I said as much. They obviously didn't, but the stewards have said, no, you actually do need to. So they've obviously had a bit of an argument about it and lost the argument. OK, now we'll give the place back. Yeah, fifth place, by the way, for the 77 was the 33. Now back to the Proton competition car. Two reasons for arguing it rather than immediately rolling over having your tummy tickled. One, you hold up the, quote, ostensibly faster car for longer while you're arguing the toss. And then even if you do have to give it back, you haven't lost anything. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if Veroni is on a long lift and coast fuel saving strategy, holding up a car that isn't by arguing is that we're arguing on track and in the stewards' room is a good strategy. There's number 10, Vector Sport car in. Their race hasn't gone the way they'd hoped, has it? That penalty early on uh, has really taken a bit of the wind out of air sails. Apart from that infringement, they've had a, a really strong race in terms of yep. race pace itself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, one that definitely got away from them today. Not in, maybe not quite the victory, but I think they were knocking on the door of a podium, certainly. Well, they uh, led very comfortably yeah. until the penalty. And that was for a pit lane infringement. It was not anything that the drivers had done. It was just tyres below the minimum tyre pressure required by Dunlop, uh, by Goodyear, uh, who supply the tyres. I mentioned this while we were watching the WRT pit stops. It's going to be plural mm. underway. Is the gap second to third? So Jose Maria Lopez to Felix da Costa is coming down, uh, not by a lot, but it is coming down. So uh, da Costa is absolutely flying right now. What is going on with car number seven? Yes, yeah, the gap's gone back up. It's gone up to 50 and a half. Yes. Well, there's, there's two things going on. Rear Hirokawa is absolutely storming. Storming. So is da Costa. Yes. And Pichita. Uh, what can the seven crew do? They can't catch on pace. They've got to do something else. Toyota 1-2 still in the Batco Energies. Eight hours of Bahrain, a season finale in the World Endurance Championship. Here is the 50 Ferrari. With the number six Proton Porsche closing in from behind. Closing closed he is almost within touching region so there's the 51 car all sorts of balances of power are swinging and swaying now some will be on more of the used tires some will be on less used tires don't forget toyota also still need to factor in four medium tires per car which have much less tire life than the, the hards that everybody else has because they qualified on mediums, they still haven't used any, they still have to use them. Did Jose Maria Lopez definitely have the hards when he jumped into the car? That's, that's a possibility. Have they staggered this? I, I, that's I, the I only thought, explanation for... I was talking about this to, to Will and, and Antonio Felix da Costa, and they were saying, I was saying, if it was me, I'd start on softs, they heat up faster, you'll be one, two, you'll hold up the other guys for as long as possible, minimise the damage, before you get into traffic. They said, no, 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 they'll, what they'll do is they'll use them as right side tires, as pairs, and, and that's entirely possible, but they're gonna have to start doing it soon, or they're gonna be committed to full sets of mediums. Yeah, it's 1.31, the last stop, so that was clearly a, a tire stop uh, in that uh, putting Pachita into the car, but what tires? Yeah, maybe, matter. I mean, uh, the car seven doesn't really have that luxury if it were to go wrong by putting all four mediums on. No. I, but I do think the, the Hirokawa car, car number eight, that does have enough of a gap now to, to 
try it. I think they can drive around slow enough to make the tyres last the distance they need. But they don't need to use all four in a, in a, in a, in a go. They can use yeah. them as right sides and then right sides. They can do that. The fact that it's done three or four laps on the left side doesn't make the tyre asymmetric. It's a symmetrical tyre. So you can, as long as it's rotating in the right direction, you have to remount it on the rim. But you can do that and keep them as right sides only. Coming back into this, by the way, uh, Andre Lotra and number six uh, Porsche catching Antonio Giovinazzi, who seems to be struggling this phase of the race a little. The only uh, yeah, nice. counter argument to that one, they are directional, the Michelin tyres. Yeah, but they're not asymmetric. So you, you don't just take the left no, tyre. They, they are, they are asymmetric. They are, you, oh, are yeah. they? So inside you can't, inside. You can't just you can't start swapping the, them, flipping them round on the rim. You can't and put the right you know, on the left. Exactly, they, they are. There well, there's the answer. Thank you very much in the truck for listening. <laughs> Everybody is still on hards. So it's a little bit like the 60 Iron Lynx car that leads in GTM. Their pain is yet to come if and when Claudio Schiavone is fit to start the race. And for Toyota, their pain is to come because they've got to work in some mediums. Proton have got one medium on the car at the moment. Antonio Giovinazzi, Andre Lotra. Obviously, somebody has poked the bear with a stick in the number six car. Not that Andre Lotra often needs much poking to be aggressive. Right now, he and Antonio Felix da Costa seem to be the two hypercar drivers with the most to prove. Uh, there is that. There's uh, no Roger Penske in this weekend, by the way. No, Nascar Kim this weekend. Kim is yep. here. Okay. Tim Sindrick here, Roger Penske. I mean, if, if this race was on, you see, the time zone is a bit of a killer, even for, for Super Roach to get back. Uh, is it the season finale of NASCAR? Phoenix. Phoenix this weekend. Okay, so not, not quite getting close. But yeah, this is interesting watching the, uh, the Porsche, the Penske Porsche catching now car 51 that ran in in second place and then third place for so long in this race today, now slipping back into the clutches of Lotterer. And it shows you how much the Penske team have learned about this car, racing it in WC and in IMSA, doubling their knowledge, more than doubling their knowledge, is that early in the season, they'd look great in the first stint and disappear out the back door in the second. Now, they've really got a handle of that. Esteban Guerrieri takes over from Tristan Potier in the van wall, and their target is to complete the entire race. They want to get this car to checkered flag. Ryan Briscoe saying it feels so totally different to what he's driven before um, in the hypercar, but he said it's got a good basis, stiff chassis, it's a good platform. It is down on power. Because uh, from the wear of the previous stint, we have to look after the rear right for a double stint. We finish with almost no tires remaining in the rear left, rear right, rear right. Okay, but that's what you, you don't want the tires to have any life at the end of the stint. It's the, you know, but it was always Colin Chapman used to say the perfect Formula One car falls apart at the finish line. Uh, to complete the point, uh, on NASCAR, it is indeed the NASCAR Sin Valley. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the Kobayashi, by the sounds of it, would have been losing. I wondered why the gap started to go up between himself and, uh, and the car number eight at the time is because he, he had just eaten through too much of that right rear tyre. And yes, OK, of course, in terms of structural rigidity and, and safety, it's fine. Yeah. But as soon as you go through the compound, which is actually quite a thin layer of rubber on top of the, the carcass of the tyre, as soon as you eat through that and you go to the, through the wear holes that they put in them, you really start to lose grip, hand over fist, and uh, that's that's what the information coming Jose's way was. Look, it's fine now, but really keep an eye because we're double stinting these tyres. The journey's long, and, and, and we can hear from the car number 38 coming up here with uh, De Costa driving. We are going to give you three tyres. We are going to give you three tyres next to so left hand side and the rear right. Okay, so right front will remain on, which is the least hard work. Um, wear holes. Now, when you think of a slick tie, think of it being a completely smooth rubber surface, and you're almost right. But if you get another shot in a garage of a brand new slick, there are 
you know where you've got your tread on a road tyre and they measure the depth to see that it's still legal? Well, we don't have those grooves on a tri tyre, but they do have little holes, half the width of your fingernail, dotted around regularly on the tread pattern. And that shows you how much wear there has been. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be able to tell. The resistance to slick tyres being introduced by Goodyear was that the drivers associated a bald tyre with no grip and a fatal crash. And they could not get their heads around for several years. A couple of years, Goodyear were trying to introduce a racing slick in the crossby era. Drivers wouldn't have it because it had no tread. And they couldn't gauge how cool they were until suddenly they blew. That's not a case anymore, but that's what a wear hole is. And you're only ever going to get slick tyres working on a racetrack when you're driving very quickly. Yeah. They're not very good, as you've seen uh, with this new rule of no tyre warmers. They're not very fast uh, when you come out with, with cold temperatures. So on a road car, that's why we don't have them. Uh, you, you need to have uh, cut tyres on a road car for them to work in all kinds of conditions. Uh, but because of the constant friction that you go through and, and loading that you go through in a race tyre, that's what you, that's where you get your grip from on a slick tyre. You need to heat them up, make them pliable, malleable to make them work. And the reason for it working in a race car is because a slick tyre has more contact patch. Think of it like if you put your if you put your fingers only just your fingers on on a table and you try to put pressure on them and move it forwards, actually your hand slides quite easily. That's a groove tyre. Put your whole palm of your hand on the table and try and put a lot of pressure down and then move it. That's a slick tyre. But it has to be warm to do its job. Yeah. Just looking at the classes as we watch the ebb and flow in hypercar. That really has been ebb and flow in this race. And the, the strangest thing has been that the ebb and flow for the Porsches has differed between the factory run Porsche Penske motorsport cars and both of the privateer run cars. In GTM, the interesting moment here is Rahel Fry still a minute and 29 seconds back from the Iron Links car that leads, but again, no bronze time yet burned, just over an hour before that has to start. Again, we're looking behind the Iron Dames at Northwest AMR's Alex Riberas in third, and he is now down to four seconds behind the pink Porsche. Behind him, another 25 seconds back, Casper Stevenson, the D Station Racing Aston Martins. Don't forget that Aston Martin very nearly locked out the front row. It was only the exceptional run of Sara Bovi in the Iron Dames Porsche that denied the D Station car its pole position. D Station are in fourth place with Casper Stevenson. Dempsey Potons, Julian Antlau are now up to fifth. Uh, he's not gold, is he? He's gold, isn't he? Uh, is he still gold? But either way, I mean, Ben Viscal going to move here. A talent. Position yep, that's on uh, Robin Frines. Yep. He's caught and passed Robin Frines here. So clearly, uh, different tyres, tyre age at play here. And uh, there was nothing that Robin Frines could do to uh, stop that attack from Ben Viscal. Yeah, so WRT were first and second before the last round of pit stops. United's 23 car, the pole sitters, now back at the top of the pile. Prema up into second. Ben Viscal uh, down to third is Robin Prines. Mirko Bortolotti, the second Prema car, is closing in in fourth place. And then the second WRT car in fifth position. Jota's 28 car in sixth ahead of interior pole vector and the 22 United car that had that drive-through penalty, stop and hold penalty after causing a contact at the first car. She then now that is a gold ranked by the body of Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now then, next year, we are going to have, very likely, a team, uh, two teams probably, possibly, of World Endurance Champions in hypercar, because we'll have number eight, number seven, both of whom have won titles, maybe not in the same year, but have won titles. Uh, very likely to have, at least somewhere on the grid, a nine-time motorcycle world champion. Very likely, it seems increasingly the case, to have at least one Formula One world champion, world champion rather than ex-driver. Um, where else can we find? We, do, we need a rally champion. Sebastian Lowe, answer the clarion call. Come on. He's not past it yet, as his uh, exploits occasionally 
in a in a rally car have shown. Yes, Sebastian Ogier struggled to get his head around the LMP2 car uh, from Sebring onwards last season and, and kind of went, nah, that's not You've got another. Working. You've missed one. What am I thinking of? What am I thinking? He's actually running second place at the moment in this race. Oh, yeah. Multiple World Touring Car Champion. <laughs> Well, we had Andy Prio as well in the Ford era, so he was a World Touring Car Champion. Well, so, other ones we... is, is Pachito still one of only two drivers to have won World FI World Championships in different disciplines? Oh, that's a very good shout. Solberg is the other, I think. In Rallying and Rallycross. Yes. I yes, think that's, right. that's a very good shout. Yeah, Pachito, bizarre story in World Touring Cars. He tested for the Citroen team when they were developing their car for touring cars, then heard nothing, went back to Argentina, nothing, nothing, nothing. Week of Christmas had a phone call saying, would you like to come and race the car? Uh, yes. So he was then the unexpected third member of Citroen's WTCCC team with uh, four-time world champion, Ivan Muller, nine-time world champion, uh, Sebastian Loeb, and he was never for one day headed in the points in three years. Amazing. He claimed pole in the very first race weekend, was never headed in the points. And, you know, we, it remains to be seen exactly what the plans are for Toyota Kazoo Racing in 2024. We'll say that Pachito was part of the pro driving team that was assembled to test uh, at Portimao for LMGT3 in the, in the Lexus that will be run by Akonis ASP yeah. uh, in the World Endurance Championship next year, should they be confirmed as being selected. Could he be part of that? Might really? that be another World Championship run? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite something, wouldn't it? Driver change here. Again, Julian Andlauer out. So there's... That was Mikkel Pedersen, stint, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, I think it might have been. I think he's Mikkel a Pedersen back in. Mikkel did the, the second stint in the race between those of Christian Reed. Yep, so Reed now uh, finished with his drive time, I believe. Yeah, I think so. And I'm sure Lou will be catching up with Christian. We will confirm, by the way, uh, that Christian has... He confirmed to me, he was, uh, I've been talking to Christian about this for quite some time, confirmed that this will be his final race. Um, he thought the right time to stop would be at the end of the GTE uh, era. Cars he has absolutely loved. His numbers are extremely impressive. 85 consecutive WEC races. Uh, Mr. Ever present to this point. Season after season after season in the European Le Mans series with two titles to his name there, a Le Mans win. And had there been a GTE AM Drivers' Championship in 2012, he would have won that as well, but there wasn't. So I think they won five races that season, but he did not take a title because there wasn't one. So thank unlike, you, Christian Reed. I the number seven Toyota team who could win five races <laughs> this year and not take the overall title. But, but I think worth, yeah. worth reflecting, we talked about, uh, didn't we, about Ben Keating, but the contribution that not just Christian, but his brother Michael, who is, looks after the technical side at uh, Proto Competition. His father, Geralt, who is still here yep. and in the garage, uh, more or less every race uh, I, I've been to and seen. And now we get to a third generation of uh, the Reed family. Jonas already in LMP2. Uh, Christian's younger son already karting, so he's got that pain to cut. Uh, but with the programs that uh, Proto Competition have got with Hypercar here, they hope to have a second car at some point next year at least for partial programme in WC. The same in GTP with another 963 and possibly two in IMSA for partial season. Uh, back here with the Ford Mustang, they hope, uh, in LMP2-3. Two LMP2 cars in uh, the European Le Mans series. They'll have two, by the way, in the Asian Le Mans series next month. Uh, and two, I believe, Porsches now in the European Le Mans series, plus two cars in Porsche Premier Cup Deutschland. So it's not like he's properly retiring. Um, but by the way, super guy, super focused, super enthusiastic. And I can tell you from having observed him with his crew at the MLS uh, end of season party, party boy as well. Well, it's, it is a proper family operation. It's great. When I first came to FIA GT Championship, Christian and Gerald Reed in the 
uh, Proton Racing cars, yep. and the two Feldmeyers, Horst Senior and Junior, are yep. now Horst the third is racing at yes. So it was Feldmeyer Proton, it's now Dempsey Proton, Patrick Dempsey, still very keen part of the team. And of course, one of the cars they ran in the European Le Mans series and at Le Mans was with uh, Irish actor Michael Doug Fassbender. Fassbender. Now, he's not here this weekend, but he is racing. He is. So, Michael Fassbender is racing this weekend, not in the Porsche Super Cup, not in a Carrera Cup. He's not in a Porsche of any kind. Michael Fassbender is racing in a six-hour endurance race with ex-Formula One driver Tommy Byrne and ex-Formula One driver David Kennedy. David Kennedy. So an all Irish lineup in a six hour race at Mondello Park in a fiesta. If it starts the race, I'll be surprised if it means <laughs> somebody has dragged them out of the pub. That sounds like the most fun you can have in motorsport. And who yeah, knew absolutely. That Fastbender knew either Tommy Byrne or DK. I mean, it's a small world after all. But fun. They're both fanboys. They're, uh, they're both massive Bunkito fans. Uh, absolutely. That is three legs of a fun stool. <laughs> it's just absolutely exceptional. Fabulous stuff. And uh, Michael, um, real entertainment in the European Le Mans series. That uh, program at an end. We wait to see. I believe he will be taking a sabbatical this coming year. Uh, but I hope you come back, Michael, if you're listening or watching. He, I think he said he is very, very keen to do more racing, but you know, he has got another career that does a little bit like Patrick Dempsey. You can only leave Hollywood so long before it thinks about leaving you. Riding with Richard Westbrook in the number two caddy. Westbrook, a race winner here back in 2005 in the Porsche Mobile One Super Cup, supporting the Bahrain Grand Prix. That car was run by Walter Lechner Racing. Walter Lechner Racing still here, running Porsches ever since in the Middle East, and now proudly running and supporting Porsche Carrera Cup Middle East, which had its first ever races yesterday evening and this morning. And they will be supporting uh, Formula One Grand Prix here in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia at the end of their season. But Westbrook, in yet another top flight international sports car drive. He's part of Ford's stellar program with the GT. And here he is in the caddy. All right, they haven't had the race they'd hoped for, having had their best ever qualifying run to third on the grid. But sometimes it comes for you and sometimes it treats you nicely. So today is just a tough day at the office. And Anthony Davidson, there are more than those and more of those than good days, I guess, when you're a racing driver, unless your name is Max or Lewis, probably. Well, yeah, you're always hard on yourself as a driver and until you're standing on the top step. You know, you're your own worst critic, really, in that respect. And you need to convince yourself that you're doing 100% the job you should be doing um, sometimes before you gain that, uh, the, uh, the confidence you, you really, that you really need to be super quick. Jumping into action, Graham. What are you? We got another 90 second stop and go penalty for another leading car in LMP2. Happened to the 10 Vector Sport car early in the race. The 23 car that's fought its way back to the lead of the race gets a 90 second stop and go penalty for a technical infringement. Is that the same thing? If it is the same thing, here is it, my theory. So you have the tyres fitted. Are you just bitten by a squirrel? <laughs> An elk. <laughs> eh, my theory. My an elk brackets misses. You pressurise the tyre with nitrogen. You have it fitted. You set the pressure. It sits in the shade and cools down. So they pressurised it when the day was warmer. Just... It's now cooler. What what differential below the bare minimum were we talking about with the number 10? And is it the same penalty, I shall ask again? I think we should ask the question. It, it's extraordinary. We've had two teams, if it is the same issue, making the same mistake. These are really experienced teams. Um, Fernando Alonso is also being pointed out to me as an FIA world champion in two different uh, types of motorsport. Okay. He was. He, he won in yeah, yeah. the one. Yeah, perfectly, yeah, perfectly yeah. right. Yeah, no, no, no. So, uh, so three. I, I was just trying to remember who he was, but uh, I think 
he's quite famous. This is a strange one, though, for uh, the United Water Sport team. I wonder if it is the, the same. I mean, it could be, it's a whole array of possibilities, isn't it? Technical infringement. Looking at the uh, number 23 United Auto Sport car, came in from first place out on track in LMP2. That's now been handed over to the Prema Racing team, car number nine, Ben Viscal, who's absolutely flying out there. They've had a great race this, this, this so far, haven't they? Really good one. But this uh, United Auto Sport car we've just been talking about is under investigation for. No, no, it's not under investigation. It's oh, got, sorry, it has got, got the 90 nice second, second penalty. penalty for a technical infringement. Now, that happened. It, uh, um, um, what has happened? Because is it the tire pressures again? Such a well-polished team that I can't believe that they think would make such an elementary mistake like that. And an area of the car that is controlled by by the tire. I think we're about to find out. Manufacturer anyway. Let's hear from Louise Beckett in the pit lane. It's just been confirmed by the team. It is tire pressures that the for the technical All right, thank you very much. That is bizarre, isn't it? And it is Vector and United, not the 22 wow. car that's in the battle here with the Vector car, but the 23 car. Well, you've got to say, <laughs> is it going to affect the 22 as well? Same team. I think they'll be double checking things. Drama, big drama for United Auto Sports, uh, as it was earlier for Vector Sport. Vector Sport, by the way, who were leading and leading very well, 40 seconds to the good after that 90 seconds. To give you an idea of what the effect that uh, that had on them, uh, down into eighth position and have not moved much from there. Uh, 23, by the way, has just come through what is its regular pit stop, but will need to stop again. That is going to drop them to the back of the field. Well, we said at the time it's a race, it's a race destroying Ending, it is. penalty, isn't yeah. it? 90 seconds, it's you're, you're lapped by the leaders in that time. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, you, you are playing with fire. If you do, if that's intentional, you're playing with fire because you have tire pressure monitoring system within the tire in, in these cars. You can see it when you're driving. You can see the pressures at all times. Let's all listen to what uh, Lou's got something for us down in pit lane. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that they worked so hard, didn't they, to get to the front of the field, and uh, Josh Pearson got out of the car and his dad was there, just gave him a big hug, his shoulders were down, you can just imagine, after all that hard work, how he felt. Is there any explanation from the team as to how that's gone on? I can't on? hear you very well, Graham, but no, all they've said to me is tyre pressures. Okie dokie. Right, we'll investigate a little further and, and see if they're monitored live in the FIA data bus. I should imagine it is. Um, you know, if the team if the team can see this information, I'm sure the FIA can as well. At the end of the day, that rule is in place because of safety, and uh, the tyre manufacturers set those pressures themselves. You know, the, the threshold of the pressure that you can run in the tyre themselves because they know their tyre better than anybody else and they set these barriers in place because if you run the tyre too too soft in its construction, it starts to wear the shoulder of the tyre and eventually that extra flexibility can break apart the tyre and you can have a, a, a catastrophic tyre failure just from running it too soft. So. They're serving their penalty here, just as uh, Jarvis gets back behind the wheel of the, of the number 23. Also on pit lane, Proton Competitions number 99, seventh place for the car that was right up at the sharp end, wasn't it, for a while? I said there's been ebb and flow in this race, and we're getting into a period of time here, Anthony, where the heat is going a little bit out of the day. Not, It's not a dramatic heat change here. It will, you'll see it more in the surface of the track than the oh, bit of a scruffy pit stop from the left rear of that Proton number 99 car. Wheel gun just not going on cleanly. And you know, it's hard work. It's, it's so frantic for these mechanics down there changing the tyres because they're running, they're having to run around the car, um, kind of NASCAR style. It's not like Formula One where you can just throw personnel at it. It's a very different rule set in, in sports car racing, in, in the World Endurance Championship at least. 
where you can only have four people across that white line at any one time. So you end up having people running around the car. And, uh, and it, you have to be very agile to, uh, to, to make a quick pit stop. And, and it's very well choreographed. Because Absolutely. You can't have a guy cleaning the screen then getting caught up in the hose and so on and so forth. So they have to work it out. I do understand, actually, that as well as being live monitored in the FIA data bus, the tyres are checked, obviously, by the time manufacturers they come off the cars to see what was the starting pressure, why is the, why is the finishing pressure so high or, conversely, so low, what about the wear and everything else. It's for the data for the tyre company, but the live monitoring is like in Formula 1. There's a minimum there's a minimum recommended pressure and there's a minimum mandated pressure below which you may not go. So I think that's what we're seeing here. So yeah. for whatever reason, the tyre pressures, while they've been on the car, either immediately they were fitted or somehow during the stint have dropped. This is a good fight here between uh, Fred Makowicki that we're riding on board with, car number five, and the Penske Porsche. And in front of him is the... Uh, the Peugeot of 93 of Paul de Resta gets him on pure traction by the exit of turn 10 on fresher tyres, no doubt, is number five. Got a lot of traffic ahead here, yeah. sexy car. De Resta has to yield that one and uh, let Makowiki through. So two GT cars on the van wall between the two still for Makowiki to deal with. And that yellow Porsche, the 60 car, Iron Links still leading in GT Yam. The pink Porsche, the Iron Dames, still in second place, still about a minute and a half behind, but opening up the gap now over the chasing Aston Martin of Alex Riveras. It was down to eight, just a fraction under eight seconds. Ralph Frey's now opened it up to 10 seconds, and a further 13 back is Casper Stevenson, and he's about a minute ahead of Mika Veroni, who's in fifth place in the Corvette. So Rahul Frey has dealt with that pressure from the closing Aston Martins, and now it's starting to ease the Iron Dave's nose just a little further out of the real danger zone uh, in second place, and still, no word on when we're going to see Claudio Schiavone, who is Mr. Iron Lynx. It's, it's his entire operation, basically. He, the, the team were allowed to change the starting driver, which was due to be Claudio. They claimed force majeure. He was not well enough to start the race. The question is, will he be well enough to compete at all? We haven't seen him in the car yet. We've got three hours and six minutes to go. He's got to drive two hours and 20 minutes 30, of in, that. In 34 minutes, we'll know whether or not they've got a chance. Yeah. Uh, and, and if not, they'll have to park the car at I, that moment. I sincerely basically. hope he's well enough to drive. I really hope so, that's the wrong too. way to finish a campaign and the era that they've contributed so much to. Yeah. Well, of course, it'll be just the end of this particular chapter. They will return. They will be running oh, yes. Lamborghini's hypercar yep. and its GTE car programme, so... Well, I, I can tell you, I mean, uh, talking to Christian Reed in the conversation where we talked about him stepping away from the driving seat, uh, we also talked about the astonishing array of Porsche 911 RSRs they have effectively <laughs> in the garage. They have 16 of them. Has uh, he just kept everyone he's raced? Well, yes, he has, and that includes championship winning cars, X Factory cars, Le Mans winning cars, IMSA championship winning cars, big race winning cars, cars that Michael Fassbender's driven, etc., etc. His Le Mans winning car, etc. So the, the original 2017 Screamers. So that is the dive bomb from the 28 on the 41, Anthony. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's he... been wearing him down over a, a couple of laps. And uh, I think you've got uh, Louis Delatraz just probably hanging on to that set of tyres. Whenever you see uh, quite a disparity in, in time, in lap times between the LMP2 cars, you know that they're out of sync with who's got the better tyres. So uh, in, in a way, it becomes a bit of a virtual race. And if you've got a, a driver behind you with the better tyres at that stage, your mission becomes just trying your best to stay in front for as long as you can to halt their progress. Well, that was the end of WRT's most recent run as first and second cars in LMP2. Don't forget, the last time we talked about them, they were fourth and sixth in LMP2. So there's all sorts of different tyre strategies and especially fuel strategies working at the moment. Nice slow-mo shot of, uh, of turn 10. It all happens so quickly. and. 
It's funny, when you're inside the car, though, that corner, nine into ten, it's such a delicate process. Oh, and that was a bit too close for comfort, wasn't it? Wally Jarvis on the curb, so the <laughs> inside, and barely a car's width away from him, Mirko Bortolotti. Bortolotti definitely trying to keep the door closed there on Jarvis. Jarvis, I think, trying to unlap at that point. Uh, is it? I think he's a lap down, isn't he, on that yeah, car? Yeah. Yeah, they're last in LMP2 now after that penalty. Yeah. Uh, the final point, by the way, about that uh, astonishing collection of Porsche 911 RSRs is the one car he is prepared to consider selling is indeed Claudio Schiavone's car because Claudio wants to buy it. Oh, OK, fair enough. <laughs> you can't argue with that, can you? Lila Wadu being warned about abuse of track limits, so she's had all her warnings, and a warning flag means if you do it again, it will be a drive through penalty. I'm sure I just saw Lilu getting out of the car. Uh, just that was moments yeah, ago. a stint to go. So she's there's somebody else has been in for a single, she's back in now for a single. So I think they're doing single, 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 single. Uh, was it Simon Mann doing his final stint in the car? I think it might possibly oh, be. Oh, is under attack though, just oh. as we went to the other camera angle. Louis Delatraz looked like he was about to be overtaken down the inside of 10 and because he is, uh, they had the traffic uh, in front. This is Matthias Kaiser being chased down by Freddy Lubin in the 22 United car. Here's another couple of cars that have had a tough time. Hearing off air from Louise that the likelihood of Claudio Schiavone driving the leading car in GTEM is receding. Yeah, that is dramatic news uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, one for the team themselves, it's heartbreaking for them, and for Claudio in particular. So we, we'll only be able to call that in about yeah. 42 minutes when the time has gone that he could get in the car. That leaves the de facto leader, if that occurs, as being the Iron Dames, with an increasing lead. You're quite right over the D-Station racing Aston Martin, but with their gold driver still to come. Nothing in any way approaching comfortable, even with no. 10 minutes to go, never mind three hours to go, but it is a lead and she has stemmed the tide. So that is all looking positive for them. D-Station in third, Corvette racing now up to fourth. 54A, of course, with Francesco Castellacci in the wheel in fifth. And Thomas Fall has done his entire time in that car. And ORT by TF are in the pit lane from sixth position, Michael Dynan. Oh, in fact, I think that car was fourth. Was, no, in fact, was third, ahead of D-Station. So Michael Dynan dropping down the order in the ORT by TF car as they make their most recent stop. And again, the vector car here, Matthias Kaiser, I think he's had a really good race he has so far. A hasn't really, he? really good race. Yeah. It's been very impressive. Um, it's uh, been a good end to the season for Matthias Kaiser in terms of his own personal performance. They'll be bitterly disappointed with the penalty that's uh, sent them from first to last, effectively. But they are beginning to fight their way back up this order. Yeah, so when you look uh, when you look where Oliver Jarvis has dropped back to, he's last. In, uh, in, in LMP2, yeah. and uh, seventh position for Vector Sport. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, pretty much mid pack at the moment. They've had the speed today, like we said. Uh, they could have been fighting definitely for a podium, um, but uh, I'd love to hear a bit more information on as to exactly what's going on here. It's hard, isn't it? It's very, uh, you do get more performance with lower tyre pressures. Yeah especially at the start of the race when you had all that hot surface of the circuit. You know, to run below the recommended tyre pressure is performance, and that's why you chase it. Well, you know, I don't understand why we're seeing so many te two teams now, two very accomplished teams, uh, dipping below that target. Well, the, the minimum mandated here is 1.75 bar which is low for a road car, so that's 25 PSI. Now, most road cars will run around 30, early 30s, maybe 28. And these are cars with significantly greater performance, obviously much shorter life and tyre, but nevertheless, that is the legal minimum. They are measured in real time on the car. The data goes back to the FIA monitoring bus that monitors all the cars in all the classes throughout the entire race, throughout the entire weekend, throughout the entire season. 
and they are also measured as they come off the car. So, you know, it, it, it's a belt and braces measuring. So it's a good stop again from Joe to Team Porsche. I mean, there's, they certainly didn't accidentally get a Porsche, did they, Joe, to by being first on the phone. They are a great team. They most certainly are, and have been just about everything they've run one. Would love to, to add hypercar victories to a stellar record in LMP2 in more than one era. And if any team was going to do what they did this year in going from top flight LMP2 to top flight hypercar runners, it was Jota. Absolutely. And, uh, but it hasn't been easy. No. You know, they've really had to work hard at this brand new car for this season uh, and, and to get delivery of that car halfway through the season as well on top of all of that to then start running it with what only a, a, a week or so to spare to turn up to their first race and, and be remotely competitive was a remarkable effort led Le Mans led a Monza uh, you know they've had the pace from the very start the driver selection was inspired it's painful when you watch them going around on cold time. It is, just, it is. Just to, uh, for anyone worrying uh, there, and we're just being all it's, nonchalant about it, that's fine. totally normal. It's fine. Yeah. It's no tyre warmers in, uh, for any of the, of the classes in the World Endurance Championship anymore. And uh, we, we do see that for the first couple of laps. Even with the, the heat that we have here in Bahrain, you, uh, it looks like they're, they're possibly tiptoeing around. It does, but they more or less are. Uh, meantime, the number seven Toyota on pit road. It's uh, full service there for that car. Also in, now the number eight, uh, which will pull into its stall just, I think, as the seven pulls away. Uh, number six, Porsche, currently fourth. That car on pit road and uh, 38 and 50 all away. Uh, more from Lou, I think, on tyre gate. So, I spoke to Gary Holland at Sport. What the situation was then. He couldn't give me exact numbers or anything, but he said they got caught out on one tyre that wasn't at the right temperature, um, at the right pressure, sorry. Uh, and they believe they were caught out from the uh, weather and the temperature on track. But it was just one tyre. That's a very expensive mistake indeed. That potentially, at Davidson, with the pace we've seen, both from uh, Gabby Obrey, and from, uh, um, from Matthias Kaiser, that was a race-winning package at that point. Could well be, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's easy to sit there and say, you should have taken more margin, but, you know, it's racing. This is competition. You're racing people in the same cars that Orica chassis have all got the, in LMP2, have all got the Gibson V8 engine. You know, you're looking for these marginal gains, so you do sail pretty close to the edge in, in terms of those numbers. There's a real slow stop there. Not that just. For the, is that the number seven? It's the eight. The number, number eight. Yeah, number yeah, they eight. They can afford to lose that gone. time. Yeah, unfortunately for the number seven drivers watching on, it did carry on. <laughs> it did carry on. <laughs> in the same way that Toyota would have watched with dismay as the Ferrari restarted twice in the pit lane when it had failed to restart at Le Mans when they were in danger of losing the race to Ferrari. To that wider point uh, about the margins involved, we have seen just in the last few days another part of motorsport with the fan base losing their minds over a decision to do with a marginal uh, technical infringement uh, post, post race. This is something that you as a driver, the teams here have lived with for years. It happens all the time. It, and drivers are guilty of it as well. Just look at track limits. Yep. Absolutely now we, right. we take it right to the edge, often over the edge, and we get warnings and penalties. It's a competition. Yep. It's not a charity race. It the uh, can, I, I, can I just point out, I've been in fun car races with Anthony. There's no charity in them either. <laughs> Is he a little bit press on? Uh, hunter killer mode engaged. <laughs> I, I paid, didn't I? I mean, go on. <laughs> when, when the visor drops, the BS stops. Here comes the 51 Ferrari. And where's the number seven car? Still a way back. He's gone back. He's gone through, has he? Yes, he has. Yeah, he's already down to turn six and seven. And there's the 50 Ferrari. Yeah, not for long, not for no. long, because they, you're, you're going to see the overcut working Nick, here on the number 50. That Nick warm Nielsen's going to go by, isn't he? He will. There's no chance. I mean, we saw Jose Maria Lopez when we were talking, riding on board with him. He got overtaken by the Prema LMP2 car, so watch this. 
Nielsen's going to have so much more grip around this corner. Yeah. See you later. I've got warm tyres, you haven't, and I'm back in front. So that's not an overcut, that is an undercut. Well, say he was, he was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but he was far down the road yeah. enough, wasn't he, that he could come in, get his tyres up to temperature, and then effectively repass. So yeah, 51 went for the went for the uh, uh, a bit of an overcut, but it's, he, he might have closed a bit of that gap by doing what he did, but he was never going to hang on to that actual track position. Now seeing something that I've not noticed before, the 50 Ferrari with the yellow highlights on the nose and so on, and the windscreen strip has got a yellow marker like yes, in the top pink of the roof. Yes, it's pink on the 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you didn't read the notes I did for you in the Mont, did you? No, well, I did, <laughs> but immediately forgot 99% of it. But I had not remembered That's or even noticed at the Mont that they had different roof lights. I'm going to point out the, uh, one other thing, Martin. Yeah, we were talking a little earlier about Dorian Pan and the comment that's been made by a couple of the teammates about the performance and being weight related, almost certainly. You know, the gaping chasm of your performance deficit to Anthony Davidson and the cart is down to weight. You're too kind on him. Yeah, you're too kind and, on him. and good looks. <laughs> and a withering lack of talent. <laughs> Fists of ham. <laughs> well, Anthony's. We, we had a conversation and suggested that uh, earlier in the week that being tall was an advantage in a go kart. I, I don't think that's true because you've got more weight further back and you overheat your rear tyres. You said this already. Particularly if you can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> Only up to a certain extent. It's, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. I'm not allowed to drive carts anymore. Never mind. <laughs> in the pits is the number 10 car. Matthias Kaiser stays in. He's hogging the driving today, isn't he? He's having a lovely time. Gabby Aubrey started the car, Ryan Cullen's been in as well, but the only driver from uh, Liechtenstein in the field is currently in the car. Matthias Kaiser started racing, I think I'm right in saying, with his brother in something like V de V or the Dutch speed car series, so he's sort of come up through uh, that's, quite a, that's quite a steep slope. <laughs> through, through, you know, the two-litre Honda-powered GN2 cars, Wolfs and things, uh, all the way up into LMP2. Drive a change here. Out gets the Swiss helmet flag, and in gets the Polish colours. And that means it's Louis Delatraz handing over to Robert Kubica. And you see how Kubica has to get into the car, you know, after his uh, pretty horrific crash he had many years ago now in, in, uh, in a rallying incident yep. and uh, left him with a, a severed arm and uh, still to this day really that's one of the big challenges for Robert getting in and out of these cars what's he searching for he's searching for something is he worried that he's not plugged in on the, on the radio that's where his hand keep going up but uh, it's one of the challenges that Robert has to live with now yeah he's not happy there no, is he, he's belts worried about the belts in. isn't he belts aren't plugged in he's opened the door he's beckoning the driver helper back yeah. he, they're going to lose a hell of a lot of time here yeah, driver helper's back out. in yeah the he's left lost the hand belt. he's lost the belt the belt wasn't on yeah the shoulder belt it's just not clicked in and away he goes all right no you know three or four seconds but wrt again came in first and second 31 ahead of 41 that's their plan. Now then, here's the gap for second in GTE Am. And that has come back down again, hasn't it? Look, it's come right down in a hurry. Uh, at the moment, so that's, that's the Iron Games. Third, because the Air Corsa car's not yet pitted. Yeah. But Daniel Mancinelli uh, is right with yeah. uh, Rahul Fry. And the Aston, as you can see, on the medium tyre. And that's going to be, that's going to live longer and longer as the temperature drops in the track. So Rahel, remember I told you a few minutes ago she'd gone out from eight to ten seconds ahead of the Northwest AMR car. Well, they've had a driver change there, and Daniel Mancinelli is back in. So he is closing that margin. And again, look at the speed. He's repassing the Alpine out of the corner because the Alpine's me. Mid, mid, minimum speed is lower than the GT cars. Well, especially when you go on the inside, it's uh, you, you're on the dirty part of the track. The minimum speed anyway isn't brilliant in the LMP2, as you pointed out, Martin, but it, we often see that. You actually don't gain anything. The net gain from having gone down the inside to the point 
your entry to exit of the corner is slower actually than just following the GT car through the yeah. corner itself. Yeah. But, but to tell yourself that, yeah, to go past. every yeah. grain of your body is telling you, overtake the slower car, overtake the slower car, any given opportunity. And yeah. you come out of the corner and you see them right by your side and you think, oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't have. Multi-class racing, multi-class battle. The Jota Porsche hypercar goes by the LMP2 car from Prema that leads number nine of Ben Fiscal in LMP2. And behind them is the battle for second in GTEM. Little lock up here from the number 38 yeah, yeah. Jota car. He's pushing very hard indeed. Uh, I think two laps ago we saw purple third sector from Felix da Costa. He is very fired up here. Oh, that was that, that. That was really costly. He'd been just chipping away at the car number seven. He had brought it down before the pit stops. He had brought it down to just 12 seconds. And we can hear from uh, Christian Reed now. Well, as we've been saying, it's an end of an era for the GTEs, but it's also, Christian Reed, an end of an era for you. You've been with WEC. We just let the Iron Links go. You've been with WEC since the start. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's everything is coming to an end. And unfortunately, now it's the end of the GTE, and I decided it's the right moment to stop. Uh, was, was, it was a great time, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, to be be part of this uh, nice journey it was unbelievable and yeah I'm just happy did you enjoy your stint today oh I, I was it was tough uh, track condition was not uh, great as compared to last year so it was really the car was really really hard to drive and and at the end it was still fun and yeah all good but with regards to your involvement and your family's involvement in motorsport in WEC what what, what will happen in the future now then uh, actually, my wife was asking for a nice holiday, but uh, as we have two uh, LMP2s in Asia Le Mans, I think it's no time. Um, so we keep racing and I still will be on the racetrack for sure. Well, thank you so much for all of the years of racing. We've loved you, having you with us. Thank you. Here, here. Absolutely here. And thanks so much, Chris Reed. Uh, he's a super guy. Uh, great little team, little team, massive team. Um, what dramatic moment while that was going, you heard it, uh, but what you were, uh, you were hearing was the exit from the pits of the number 60 car. Two hours, 46 minutes to go, and it's Alessio Picariello that's in the car. Goes next door and chats to uh, Andrea Puccini at Jack, Giant I Link. think it was Jack. Uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Puccini. Uh, yeah, Francesco Castellacci out of his Ferrari. So, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're not teammates. The, the, the Iron Lynx team and... and uh, Dempsey Proton, but their garage next door partners, you know, or, uh, or it's neighbors. More, it's more than that in this case because uh, the two Porsches that Iron Links and Iron Dames run are Proton cars right. and they do provide some technical support. Right. So I suspect he's just checking what is going on with the 60, yeah. is the straight answer. So let's see if Big is at the wheel. We are now 25 minutes from the no go point for this car to. Uh, be able to finish this race legally. So now suddenly it's Northwest AMR with Alessio Picariello right behind. Picariello is going to try and go by the Aston Martin and then try and park it and open up the margin as much as he can to the pink car in front. Five hours into the eight hours of Bahrain, seventh round of the FIA World Endurance Championship. The season finale, as so often has been the case here in Bahrain, and we will end the 2024 season as well. It's the end of an era. No more GTE AM cars after this race, and no more LMP2 either, apart from at Le Mans. World Endurance Championship will be Hypercar and GT3 for 2024. Toyota locking out the front row of the grid for the final race of the season. Sebastian Buemi on the inside. Further down the inside, Miguel Molina forcing a lock-up from Earl Bamba. 
in turn running into the back of Mike Conway's number seven Toyota, the second of the front row starters, turned around, rejoining last. Both United Autosport cars were involved. A 23 car ending up making contact with the Floyd Van Wall, a 22 rather making contact first, and then the 23 car, 36 from Alpine, was in there as well. It was Carnage in the midfield. Not qualifying at where they'd hoped, the 38 Hertz Team Joe to Porsche was moving up the order, and the 60 Iron Lynx Ferrari starting the race with its pro driver on board quickly took the lead from the Iron Dames. Penalty for causing the contact for Earl Bamber's Cadillac, dropped them to the tail of Hypercar, and Porsche's battling with the recovering Toyota and the Peugeot's in front. Peugeot's hopes soon faded. They did not have the length of life in their tyres required. And Mike Conway coming from last, sweeping through the field to be third by the first pit stop and second by the end of his first double stint. Nevertheless, it looked as though that first corner incident had robbed the number seven car of a chance for victory. Into the second stint, finally getting ahead of the 51 Ferrari, a Toyota 1-2, as it had been on the grid, and the Proton and Penske Porsches battling in the top six, a dice that seems destined to go all the way through to the end of the race. They are still locked together. In LMP2, both of the WRT cars have led. 28 from Jota has looked very strong as well as the two Prema cars and the 50 Ferrari and 38 Jota Porsche battling for third place as their different tyre strategies changed their performance. Prema and WRT look to be the cars in the battle for the lead after a penalty for the 23 car uh, from United Autosports and the number 10 car from Vector Sport for low tyre pressures. Corvette already champions, a stellar stint from Ben Keating to keep them in the frame. Will they be on the podium? Toyota lead the race. Prema leading in P2, Iron Lynx in GTM. That is the situation with two hours and 40 minutes to go. So an American Le Mans series race remaining. And uh, through past the Project One car of Gunnar Jeanette goes the third place car in LMP2. That's Ferdy Habsburg in the WRT number 41, the 31 machine. Oliver Rasmussen for Jota closing in from behind. And they were all over the back, or has he dropped behind? He's just dropped behind. It's a Prima 1 2 at the moment, by the way. Team WRT were yeah. uh, fourth and fifth, but it's Ferdy Habsburg has caught and passed Oliver Rasmussen with uh, Robert Kibitza uh, running in fifth in the second WRT car, uh, catching pretty quickly. Actually, yes, he is still fifth, yes. And this is where the move happened. No, no, that's, uh, that's the 38 coming up behind one of the Alpines. So, uh, different gold car. So in the Jota garage, watching the action. They've got one eye on the hypercar battle, one eye on the LMP2 battle. They don't have a dog in the GT fight, and that just looks like laziness to me. I, th th I think they didn't. They have a very. Uh, I'm trying to think where their GT2 effort, GTE effort, was uh, with Aston Martin in the early days of Jota. Yeah, they, with um, uh, Sam. Hancock. Hancock, indeed, yeah. And indeed, I think, won the GT4 class at the Spa 24 Hours at the GT4, Mr. Martin, some many years back. When so, we were young. When we were young, indeed. But it is now a IMSA WeatherTech Sports God Championship, two hours and 40 minutes remaining for one of their sprint races. It has been a sprint to this, uh, to, to, to this point. But a lot of rating, racing still to go. Uh, we've got the... Let's come back to GTM shortly. This is the battle for second, which is going to be the de facto lead battle. Before that, though, let's go and hear what Brendan Hartley's been up to this evening. Brendan Hartley, obviously the number eight, doing a great job uh, during this race. But as you're just saying, the Jotas are looking like they're close. Yeah, we're, we're trying to manage it smartly. We're obviously going for the championship. Um, we, look, we look like we had a bit of an advantage on the first couple of stints and the really high track team. But as it's come down, yeah, particularly the Joda's been, been flying. He's, he's been catching us on the first stints, 
maybe a bit more even on, on, on stint two. Maybe we're looking after the tyres better, but yeah, that's still all to play for. Particularly now that the track's gonna get cooler and cooler, and we're gonna have to use our medium tyres from qualifying as well, which no one else will have to do. So let's see if that's a good or bad thing. I, I don't know. All right, thank you. So Brendan Hartley uh, doing all he can do to lower the expectations of everybody around. <laughs> but well, you know, never take anything for granted. Max Verstappen's not going to win every race this season, despite everybody's predictions that he would. So it doesn't always happen. What's here? What's going on with the number eight Toyota? Rio Huracara is at the wheel. What's he being told? Oh my goodness! Oh, I don't know what this guy. Eighty-six. He broke eleven point thirty. Oh, I don't know what he's doing, you know. It's different stuff. Copy, Dio. Yeah, it's a, it's a really... Yeah, we understand. Uh, I'm very happy with car 86 by the sound of it. I think that would be the calm Seb, uh, radio message there. Driving your penalty for the 38 Toyota car. I think that's correct. Watch this. Rejoin. Watch this. Oh, and... Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is correct. Oh. I saw that before oh, and I was thinking that didn't look great and was not surprised when we saw that under investigation. So I think that's a correct well, call. And that's the end of their hopes of the podium, I'm afraid. That's that gone. Interestingly, with two and a quarter hours, uh, two and a half hours left to go, we still had six cars on the lead map. That will become five, I'm afraid, after that drive through. Neil Jani and the Proton Porsche team there in seventh place, in still in the sandwich between the Penske pair, Andre Lotra and Fred Makoviki. Fred Mako, 1.5 seconds behind the Proton car. So there's the Proton car with the WeatherTech white, red, and blue. And Makoviki is the set of headlights behind which you can't quite discern a car. So I don't know how long they can wait before they serve that penalty at Jota, but it's in their interest to wait, obviously, as long as three laps. Yeah, well, it'd be in their interest to wait as long as possible to try and extend that gap or re-extend that gap to the Ferrari because they've proven many times this race so far how hard the Ferrari is to overtake. Absolutely. And they're going to come out well behind them. They will catch them again, but they'll be stuck behind them and could even get stuck behind the, uh, the number six Porsche at that rate as well. Their own lead... Yeah, they will. They're 18, 19 seconds behind at this stage. They'll they'll drop probably just about into the Porsche, Porsche, Porsche battle. It's a 26. It'll be a, a Porsche, 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 Porsche battle. It's a 26 second run through pit lane, but remember, you're not losing 26 seconds because you're still moving. Yeah, but it's uh, an in lap and an out lap as well, so it's a slower lap in and a slower lap out. And as Brendan Hartley said. Unfortunately for the number seven team, they qualified on mediums as well. Now, the later it gets, the lower the track temperature, the less of a hardship those mediums are going to be, but it's never going to be easy. Harry Tinknell and Neil Jani just uh, assessing what's going on there and what the possibilities still are for the number 99 car. It's another car that came out of the box for Proton and led a race at Monza. That uh, original chassis is the car that uh, completed the remainder of the American uh, Championship, the IMSA Championship, uh, to be replaced by the car here, which was new for Fuji. It's a bit of a mistake there from uh, Fred McElwicky into turn 10, missed the apex, a little bit late on the brakes. We saw a lockup from Jimmy Bruni in the 99, who's just in front of him in uh, turn four. So they're pushing each other hard in uh, equal machinery. So right up. Closing up to put some, uh, another lap on the Peugeot in front. Which one is that? 93 or 94? I'm not sure. We found it on our tracker. Yeah, they're coming up. You just said they're coming up to lap it. Yeah, yeah. the 93 car. I think that uh, with be for Paul a second time, won't it? Paul DeResta at the wheel of that one. And they yeah. had, a, they had a, a, a pretty poor performance uh, race, haven't they? Peugeot the, and qualifying as well. They'll be looking to get their new car next year. We've learnt a lot from this one, and it hasn't all been good. Battle continues in hypercar. Lots of brake dust coming off the 99 car. Now, all the cars that are running in the class are homologated, which presumably means that Penske and Proton and Jota all use the same brake material. Now, I'm not sure if that's 
absolutely the case. Do you think friction material will be allowed to be different? Well, sorry, we're talking across the Porsches. Yeah. No, absolutely. They, yeah, they, are, they so all use the it's same. It's a homologated part. Okay. So the only difference so, would be the amount of brake blanking that you're using. You exactly, wouldn't be yeah. using any in, in these temperatures, that's for sure. So we saw the works car coming in with the brakes literally on fire. Yeah. And uh, lots of carbon dust coming out of the uh, the 99 Proton Porsche, so maybe that's what the chat was all about down maybe. at the garage with, with Janny and Harry Tinknell. They, they did look as if they were concerned about something, didn't they? Yes, that's a lot of brake dust to be coming out of that car with still two and a half hours remaining. Remember two or three years ago, the factory Aston Martin, a big, yeah. big lock up there. Right, Aston right. Martins had to change brakes they did, all before of them. the end of the race. They, if I'm right, I think, didn't that cost Paul Del Lama a, a championship? I think that sounds about right, because uh, they changed all the AM cars as well as, as a precaution. Yeah, I think that uh, Jimmy Bruni is running into a bit of trouble here with that car. And uh, he's got old tyres on the front. That might explain some of the lockups that we're seeing, say, Turn 4 and then Turn 11 just then. But look at that again, just the dust pouring off. You can see it in the headlamps, can't you, if they can't. Oh, the oh, spin there. That's, the, the, moment, that's, the, that's the leader. That's the leader. What has happened there down at Turn 1 for Ben Viscal? Has he been tagged from behind? He has. He has. He's been tagged by the car chasing for the lead in, uh, in GTE. Now, that could be massive, because if he's deemed at fault, there could be a penalty coming for a car that looks potentially a race winner in GTM. It, it, we needed to see a bit more of a longer Earlier. clip there, because if, it, if he had overtaken him, pulled back onto the racing line and stamped I on the anchors... Entirely agree. Yeah. Who's? It, but someone's at fault. Yes. It's either Ben Viscal pulling in and braking, too much, or it's just the GT car behind that's just missed the braking point and uh, and sent a car out of the race. But in a way, it's self-policing because Ben Viscal, if he did brake early and, and effectively spin himself around, then I don't see why you should then on top of that penalise him. But if you've been involved in an accident that's not your fault, there's lots of people that can help. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is... Show to number 38 serving its drive through penalty for that unsafe rejoin when Antonio Felix da Costa ran wide off the first turn and both Ferraris go by. So to wheel the number six Porsche. That might we'll be a stay bit closer, in front. yeah. We'll stay in front of the Penske Proton Penske Trio, but. It will be Toyota 1 2, Ferrari 3 4, and then all the Porsches in a big lump. Because nobody will knock their doors off each other at all. Such a shame for uh, for Jota, all that hard work undone in just one moment. And that's, you know, that's part and parcel of endurance racing. You're out there with lots of different cars that share the same racetrack as you. And I know you're desperate to get on track as quickly as possible after a skirmish like that one but um and your eyes are everywhere you're really confined in these cockpits as Bruni once again runs wide and this time Got that no could breaks. be for position Got exit this minutes. corner yeah it's a good exit for Makawiki's right in the slipstream now and this is going to be a run down towards turn four. And we know that Bruni hasn't got the brakes. This surely is going to be easy pickings for Makawiki. All he's got to do is lean on him. Jimmy hasn't got enough to break on in the normal place, never mind late. Well, that was all because of the turn one minor lockup. But uh, <laughs> in terms of where the uh, Estra likes the, the look of that. Yes, in terms of where the uh, Jota cars rejoined, 1.3 seconds back from the second of the Ferraris, from third to fifth. Uh, but uh, fourth is still up for grabs here. Let's just wait and see if this pans out. Back in our LMB2 battle for the lead, because although one Premier falls off the track and drops out of the lead, there's always another growing ahead. Here's the 63 car, the WRT right behind. Mirko Portolotti leading, Ferdi Habsburg in second place. So impressed with the progress that Habsburg has made in his driving career over the last few seasons. Absolutely in there swinging with any of the top pros. And he's got newer tyres on as well, at least a stint newer. 
Paul Cole. Oh, yellow coming for what Keats for no, what? No, it's it's debris at the turn one. Will be it will be where we do that's have a piece of debris on T1. We have a piece of debris on track at T1. Uh, be advised, it looks like a metallic part. So this is good news, therefore, for the cars running on older tyres. They say, yeah, I just saw one of the cars, I think it was the number 63 yeah. of uh, Mirko Bottolo. He ran right over that piece. Well, that's not good news. Ask my tyre fitter. Full course yellow, everybody down to 80 <laughs> kilometres an hour. <laughs> that came in the nick of time, didn't it, for Bottolo? <laughs> He's just yeah. about to get overtaken. And now, well, hang on, look at the is... way he was alongside the Aston. Look at how much of a gap he's left to the Aston. Now, you can't come in straight away, and it looks, oh, oh and that's the different no, well, part of the track. Yeah, yeah, that, this, uh, a little bit of housekeeping going on, I imagine. No safety cars yet. Second full course yellow, and for debris. Looks like a boomerang. Yeah, I thought maybe this should have been a safety car. Man. No. I don't like seeing people running around on the track with car, even though they're under full course yellow condition. It, it looks a bit frantic for me. Yeah, but they will have. They said, okay, you know, they, they've got a good view of the straight. Okay, you go now. It, uh, as I recall from a conversation around this, it quite often is about the line of sight. Yes. It's line of sight uh, from the marshal's post uh, for the racing line, for where the cars are coming from. Can you see? at uh, full course yellow speed. Full course yellow, yellow to, to be it. removed in 20 seconds. Yeah. I don't completely disagree. I think whenever you have people on track, I think you have a safety car to bunch all the cars full up. Full course yellow will be removed in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow removed, thank you. I, 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 to a degree, I agree with you, but again, on a long straight like that, you know, if there's a gap in traffic, the assessment, I mean, Eduardo will have asked the, the uh, commander on that post, can you get it without a safety car? Yes, we can get it without a safety car. Then it, it may take, we may have to wait two minutes until there's a suitable gap, but we can do it. Now, all, all it takes is a marshal to trip over yeah. in front of a car and then you're relying on drivers exactly. to take avoiding action and I would never, ever trust a racing driver. <laughs> now then, we're, we're having, a little, having a little conversation with me, Edward, but did that, Was it me, but did that sound just a little bit bitter? A little bitter. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, self-inflicted. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't get in the car with myself, as Jensen Button once said, to giving a passenger ride to somebody with a big beaming smile on their face. <laughs> Are you scared? No, they said. Well, I would be. I wouldn't get in the car with myself. <laughs> well, Eduardo's next race weekend will be in Macau. He said, I won't be having any problems with track limits there. No, he said, yes, he did. <laughs> they, they tend to be self-policing. Mind you, most track limits excursions cause a safety car, so there we go. Uh, driver change at uh, Prema. That's Mirko Bortolotti getting out. Didn't quite spot who was getting in. Uh, it didn't look like the most rushed of driver no. changes, though, did it? Well, really? You have to rush because you've got all the fueling going in. It does mean Fernie Hamsberg, by the way, uh, cycles back through to the lead yeah. in LMP2. The Prima Racing car, we saw that uh, bit of a whoopsie, is in second. Ben Fiscar, 1.5 seconds back. Oliver Rasmussen, by the way, just 4.3 seconds back in third now. Here comes the fired up Antonio Felix da Costa. For a bit He's of redemption. Got Antonio Giovinazzi right in front of him, and Nick Nielsen very much in his sights as well. Interesting, I thought, that Brendan was highlighting the Jota car as the fast car that's treating its tyres better. Now, obviously, it was in third, so it's the, the least unlikely challenger to, to Toyota's 1-2 domination, but, yeah, I think everybody's quite well aware that a fired-up Antonio Felix da Costa does have a way of getting things done. So uh, can he get it done into turn four? He's had a great run through turn one, turn two in the slipstream. We know the Ferrari's got the legs and the straight line, and he's done the same move that he did earlier on to car 50. Oh, Jovan, as he turns in, it gets very tight mid-corner. He took to the curbs to Costa to avoid contact. He doesn't want to get a penalty for that. That's great driving. And again, Giovinazzi really tried hard to just cut him out of the deal and Antonio was having none of that. Great stuff. 
But uh, yeah, De Costa clearly has the speed over the Ferraris at this stage in the race. Also, maybe just a little bit of a point to prove. Porsche, his employers, have decided that he will be a Formula E driver exclusively. And Sam Higner and Jota don't have an answer to that because they don't employ him for the full season. So he wants to finish here as the best of the rest. If he can't beat both the Toyotas or either of them, then third place is the very least that he wants. Norman Nato in the back of the garage there watching, was he? Yes, he's uh, driving for Jota at the test. Yeah. That was, uh, Giovinazzi did well there to see De Costa on the inside. Yeah. And, uh, Many a driver would have just turned in there and taken the full racing line and there would have been contact. That's good racing room for both guys. I mean, that's, that's what you need in these cars in the top flight. You need all of your awareness, not just spatially of where, who's where, but what it means to you. Especially when cars are darting around like that, it's, it's very easy to lose sight of them. Uh, relying on these tiny mirrors that you have and you know, in, these, in these closed cockpit cars. Two hours, 23 minutes and 20 seconds remaining. Minimum drive time for a bronze driver in GTEM is two hours and 20 minutes. Why does that matter? Because the number 60 Iron Lynx car that leads in GTEM has not had a bronze driver in it yet. And if Claudio Schiavone does not take over the car within the next two minutes, then they will not be able to finish the race in the lead or indeed in any other position. And what I don't know with that rule book, uh, Anlix have just pitted that car. Is Claudio going to get in the car? This is a very important moment. Yeah. What I don't know is if he doesn't get in the car. This is a very short stint, by the way, from Alessio Picariello, if he's not. Is this for Claudio to get in and see whether or not he feels fit enough to do it? Is this for them to pull the car? It, it, uh, either or, I don't know. If it, we need to get a camera down and have a look at the Iron Links or, or Louise to get eyes on it, because you're absolutely right. It is a pivotal moment. They have led since the first hour, and comfortably so. They were two minutes and 15 seconds, i.e. a lap ahead of the Iron Dames Porsche that is ready to go and everything else. But uh, we need to see what's going on with that. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's catch up with Ben Fiscal and Prema as they move up and down the LMP2 order. Ben Fiscal's brought the number nine back to Prema, but um, that wasn't what we wanted to see with that spin on track. Yeah, it was not what I was uh, expecting for the last half of the scene. It was very difficult to manage the tyres, uh, you know, at the end of the double stint. Um, but yeah, what happened there, I need to review on camera what happened, but I, I think I've got quite a good uh, idea what happened. But uh, yeah, hopefully we will get a penalty, but we will, you know, we don't gain anything from it. Uh, we can only keep our head down and, and just keep pushing for the uh, for P1 or at least a podium. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there is the answer that we were looking for. It's all over. Alessio Picariello has brought the Iron Lynx Porsche in and they have parked it. So, Claudio Schiavone, lovely, lovely chap, uh, a, a good, entertaining company, but unfortunately not well enough to race today. And so the car has been parked. That's the sporting thing to do, not interfere with the remainder of the race. And well done to Iron Lynx for doing that. We saw the car running at pace. It's a joy to see them run at pace. And the car is now no longer part of this finale for GTE. It is exactly what you expect from the team, actually. Everything about how they go about their racing says that that's what they would do. Lock up from Antonio Felix da Costa, chasing the 51 Ferrari. Where's, where's the 50? Don't oh, come back on. on in front of it too close. Yeah, don't get another drive through. Well, da Costa clearly throwing everything, including the kitchen sink into this. The 50 Ferrari of Nick Nielsen is in third overall and third in hypercar. What can you do? Uh, in the end, of course, there is nothing you can do. Louise Beckett is there, but there's not many words that you've got. Matteo Crisoni waiting to chat to Lou. So we'll hear 
if we can get any more information on Claudio Schiavone. We certainly wish him a speedy recovery. Mateus hugs all round in the team uh, that you've parked up the 60 Iron Links. Tell us what the situation is. Unfortunately, we try till the end. We change our strategy at the beginning and uh, we show the potential, but uh, unfortunately, we have to retire the car. But anyway, it has been a great season. Thanks uh, to all these guys, and uh, we will try next year uh, with the new cat category. All right, thank you. Thank you. There you go. That is our only retirement so far. It's not accident damage. It's not mechanical. Uh, it's been a long time. I can't, I can't remember. remember. I can't, I can't remember, remember time. But there must have been one, and somebody will be sending an answer on a postcard. Goodbye, my lovely RSR. I love you. I don't know who these were. The was, it, was, it was the team uh, members. Yes, but I don't know car. which particular Obviously. team member it was. But yeah, absolutely. The drivers have all enjoyed driving these cars, these yeah. GTEs. They are they're, they're prototypes that look like GT cars, basically. Um, absolutely phenomenal bits of kit. And uh, yeah, the drivers will definitely miss them. Although they'll be here in the World Endurance Championship, but albeit in the GT3 cars. And the action, we won't really see a difference in terms of the action, it's just the way they feel for the driver. So, new leader, dramatic new leader, and it's this car. It's the other Iron Lynx run car, the Iron Dames branded car. It's the all-female squad. We have two hours and 18 minutes remaining in this eight-hour race. Rahel Fry fending off a challenge at the moment from the Northwest AMR Aston Martin of Daniel Man uh, Mancinelli. And this would be historic. But it's going to be historic whatever happens. It's the final race of a class of cars that has served international motorsport, international endurance racing since 2011. The last time we'll see the Porsche 911 RSR, the Corvette C8R, the Aston Martin AMR Vantage GTE and the Ferrari 488 GT, uh, GTE uh, racing. And it, boy, oh boy, this could be a major headline. Yeah, Aston Martin currently second and third. And don't forget, that's where they qualified, only outpaced by Sarah Bovi on one lap pace in the Iron Dames Porsche. So they're on a medium tyre compared to a hard. 98 AMR though. Second place. A penalty, second place for an incident with the number nine Prema car. We just heard, didn't we, from Ben Biscal that if they get a penalty, it doesn't help us. But, you know, it's, it's the stewards' job. If you ruin somebody else's race by design or accident, it's down to them to ruin your race as well. It doesn't help the, the, the innocent party, but uh, there we go. So it's so, been decided it was the 98 car that ran into the back of the, of the uh, Prema car. Let's take a look again. No, it's a different move, isn't it? It's the uh, number 33 versus this has been a race long battle between these two. <laughs> the, uh, the Dempsey Pro Shop Career racing. long. <laughs> Career, Career long, long, battles. long battles. Fighting right to the end, the last dying minutes of the uh, GTE um, category. And for Ben and all his various teammates in all his various cars, the constant, one of the constants, will have been, a, of course, a Ferraris, and Dempsey Pros on Porsches will have been among his strongest rivals. So going back to that uh, that moment with the uh, with the 98 Northwest AMR car, uh, so it proves the point that we were trying to make that it was either more to the more the fault of the the number nine car, the Prema moving in and then breaking. That wasn't the case. It was our original thought that basically the 98 car has missed its breaking yeah. point. The the number nine. Ben Viscal had made the move way earlier on the straight and then pulled back in and carried on down the straight for a long enough time for uh, the 98 Northwest car, AMR car, to know where the braking point is going to be. So right. that, that's why there's more blame passed his way. Lighted on Proton in danger of being wheeled into the garage now. They're doing something in the cockpit, but we're getting to the stage where they need to put this in the garage. Louise Beckett, what do you know? Well, I'm just worried and concerned. It's a seatbelt issue again. That's what it looked like to me, but uh, Neil Jani is now just leaving the pit lane in the 99. And I'll see if I can... 
Antonio Felix da Costa in the 38, Jota Porsche all over the back of Nicolas Nielsen. The gap was down to eight tenths of a second. It's gone out a fraction as they worked their way past that Alpine P2 car and the GR Racing Porsche Yam car. But da Costa with a head of steam. He's come from 1.3 to nearly 0.3 seconds behind Nick Nielsen in a couple of laps. So it's not like he's crept up on him slowly. He's charging up behind with a big stick in his hand. And with much fresher tyres as well. Mm. So uh, this, well, is a, this is a better chance to, uh, to overtake the so 35 laps on, uh, on the tyre tire life for De Costa and over 50 laps for the Ferrari. No, but he's got split. It's 55 on the right of the Ferrari, 22. So he's got newer left side tyres, older right side tyres. Where's that going to benefit Antonio? Well, all round, Antonio's got more grip. Yes. So, uh, you know, in terms of all four tyres, and that's why we're seeing such a pace difference. And remember what I said earlier on, when it was the Jota on the older tyres and the Ferraris were putting them under pressure, it's now flipped back around. So he should, should be able to do this. Going to be very interesting battle for third place. Battle for the lead hasn't been a battle really since the very first corner of the race. Number seven Toyota has got back up to second place, which is a huge recovery in itself, but is still 47 seconds behind the number eight Toyota. So that's not going to change anytime soon unless and motorsport is full of unlesses. There's Yiffy Yi. He's had a pretty good run so far in that mighty 38 Jota. Now watching his teammate Antonio Felix da Costa. Um, remember, for Yiffy Yi, it wouldn't just be a uh, privateer hypercar uh, first in the FIWEC. It would be the first, I think, overall podium for a Chinese driver. Uh, what about the uh, Jackie Chan DC racing car? Open tongue. Uh, yes. But is he badged as Dutch? No, he was no, he was badged as Chinese. Okay. But apologies, Hoban. But in terms of overall, overall uh, classification. Uh, overall, he was second overall at Le Mans. At Le Mans, yeah. Yeah. First in LMP2. <laughs> came within half an hour of winning the race outright. What an, hour, what an extraordinary race that oh, thing is. Uh, well, because Le Mans is never extraordinary no. in any way, shape or form, is it? There was that race in 2016, that was extraordinary as well, but we, we, we don't mention that there. We try not to. No. It doesn't go down well. Here comes Antonio Felix Acosta, looking, looking, but can't get it done into turn one. This time around, you're going to need to be a little bit closer than that. I'm sure he can be. This is where he was strong. He's using that fresher right-hand side tires than the Ferrari through turn two and this is where he's at its strongest he's still not quite close enough there it's going to take another lap or maybe some traffic but he's certainly got the speed and uh, yeah more speed than he had before compared to this car that he overtook into that very corner needs to get it done because uh, da Costa is beginning to see Giovinazzi catching just a little again it is two and a half seconds but that gap is closing as he's bottled up behind the other Ferrari yeah, Nick Nielsen going to do everything he can this time around. Now he knows. The problem is when you come back to a drive, you know where the car is stronger or weaker. And I'm sure he won't get fooled by the same dummy that he was tricked by before as well. So De Costa's done it twice now. Once to Nick Nielsen, then the uh, unsuspecting second victim of uh, Antonio Giovinazzi into turn four. But Nielsen will know exactly how he plays that corner when he when he tries the same thing again. Or if he tries it, oh, a slip there. One of the uh, Alpine mechanics. This car last in LMP2. Andre de Grau takes it back out again. Not been a happy year for them, has it? Uh, just the car that needed uh, fresh boots. I think the mechanic does as well. It is pretty polished, that uh, concrete down there. Very slippy. Right, look at this. So, right, here's the chance. Yeah, Nielsen's had the traffic uh, from an LMP2 car, so lots of turbulence coming out the back of that thing through the final corner. But I still don't think Felix Acosta is quite close enough. The Ferrari so fast in the straight line in comparison, though, he's further back this time again. Picks up the toe from the P2 United car, then back into the slipstream of the Ferrari. The battle for third rage is on. Toyotas are still 1-2. Uh, we're just not watching them because they're nowhere near each other. Better run out there. Yep. Closes in once again. Ooh. Looking racy. 
<laughs> he thinks he's not. <laughs> he wasn't quite as not confident. So, so now then, so this is what happens now in Antonio Felix da Costa's head. I'm going to show him the same move. He's not going to go for it. So he's going to come in tighter, which then means I'm going to try and do him down the hill into turn eight. Reverse psychology. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Never play cards with these people. Look, they're going to pit on the same lap as well. They're on identical energy. Da Costa on newer tyres. But that presumably means the Ferrari will be on newer tyres at the next stop because one set have done 55 laps, so they're definitely coming off. So have they got a full set to go on? Or is it going to be right sides only? Closing in on two hours to go. Closing in on what would have been a regular WC race distance. But we've still got two hours to go. Yep. Six hours regular distance, although it's going to be less regular next season, Graham, because the uh, the season starts ten. in Qatar with a 10-hour race. We'll move on then to a couple of new venues during the season. We're going to Imola, uh, going to Spa, then uh, to Le Mans, back to Interlagos and to Cota before finishing the season as we have this year in Fuji and Bahrain. So. Uh, an eight-round championship, the Mon, of course, has ever been the centerpiece of it, but even more racing to enjoy, more chance to watch full access, more highlights, more live races to re-watch. So for Christmas Day, oh don't, boy. Don't, don't watch the afternoon movie. Chuck YouTube on and show your, uh, your close well, family and, full access. And the other thing is, actually, if you've got friends who are into their motor racing but aren't into endurance racing, if they haven't discovered Look at this. just how much of this goes on, then convince them that the app was $6.99 for this weekend. It's not fortunes to watch all this stuff live. You don't have to wait for the reruns and the highlights on YouTube. It's, it's a very, very affordable way of watching. 6.99, that's not even a euro an hour. No. Name me another entertainment where you can get as excited for less than a euro an hour. And you get to watch this man commit these kind of on-track outrages. All right, not next year, but right now you can. It's fantastic <laughs> stuff. Antonio Felix da Costa racing. I don't know, what, what would you say here, Anthony? He's clearly very fired up. Yeah. <laughs> He's very what, sorry? Fired up. Uh, yeah. Fired up, yeah. <laughs> so I had, uh, I had uh, Jimmy Bruni words. I, I know there's an interview coming up, yeah. so I couldn't quite hear That's you over right. the top of that. Here's Jimmy Bruni. Jimmy Bruni, we saw your teammates looking on when you were driving, and there seemed to be maybe tough on brakes. Is that the case? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it was quite OK the first stint, and then the second stint. Uh, because we were short on tires, we changed tires still with the hard compound, but it was not the, the best solution. Uh, but then it was okay, still okay, but then 20 laps to go on the second stint, uh, the heel rest broken. So they have to try to repair or try to tight, uh, because it was moving when you put the heel before going on the throttle or braking. Oh, so that's what the pit stop delay was? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Again, for all the complexity of these cars, sometimes, like a seatbelt mounting coming loose or something else, it's it's the the randomness of motorsports or any sport that catches you out. And again, Antonio Felix da Costa out of turn four, steaming down the hill on our GPS tracker, which this is on a very decent sized screen. They are not visible as separate entities. It is one car as are the WRT cars that are just leaving the pit lane first and second with two hours, five minutes to go. It's close here on the run up towards turn nine and 10. Is he gonna be cheeky and try and send it down the inside and send? No, gotta take that wider line. Very, very close now on the exit of this one, but he can't, I don't think he's quite got the speed in that car on the straight line. Nick Nielsen doesn't really a half-hearted attempt to defend. I thought that's how it was going to play out, but he runs a little bit wide, I think. And that gives De Costa a little bit of a chance to get the nose in. Compromises Nielsen's run through turn 12, but they all lift off through there anyway, and you're back into the dirty air. So uh, yeah, De Costa's wearing him down. A few chinks in the armor here or there for Nick Nielsen. And Will Stevens 
getting ready to jump back in. So, De Costa, you don't have to be a hero here. You can leave it to Stevens as well. There's still two hours and five minutes to go of this race. Yeah, they need that. Unfortunately, they're on the same fuel as the Ferrari. What they actually need to do, maybe, is try and undercut them. Because then giving Will the chance to have a run at either Giovanna, uh, uh, Nielsen or whoever takes over the car, Antonio Fuoco or whatever, uh, Miguel Molina, on hot tyres. They, they had 20% energy the last time we looked at it, so it's going to be another few laps. I don't know if they need a splash or anything in this race, but if you did, it might be an idea to get that one out of the way so that you can just run out of sequence with Ferrari for a bit. Because you have the speed in lap time, but you can't get past the car, you can't gain track position. You try and gain track position virtually by lapping in free air out of sequence to the car that you're trying to race against, but it doesn't look like they've got that no. in, in, as part of their armory. Uh, two or three points to raise. We've got car 63, which is the third place LMP2 Prima Racing car, the five Penske po uh, uh, Porsche Penske Motorsport car that's running eighth overall, uh, both under investigation for four core shiller infringements. One, I have to say, has to be a correction to something we heard uh, from the Vector Sport team. We heard that Gary Holland had fed back to Lou. It's a problem with one tyre. That's not what the stewards' bulletin says. It says all four tyres. Oh, OK. So two hours, three minutes to go. Still almost as one, this pair lapping. And Giovinazzi is closing this gap now. And that turn 12 is becoming a big saviour, isn't it, for uh, Nick Nielsen. Every time they get the run out of turn 11, De Costa looks so threatening. And then they get to 12, and that turbulence kicks in. De Costa's trying the old dummy once again, having a bit of a, a look, but uh, trying anything he can to try and unsettle Nick Nielsen. But Nielsen, so far, unflappable. Yeah, what part is the 35 car going to play in this drama, if any, as they come tearing down to turn one? Both pull out the slipstream there. A bit closer this time. Goes to the outside. So this is what you're looking for. Compromise the line from Nielsen through one. Switch back on the inside like De Costa does there. A better run through turn two. Now we're in business. Now we're talking. This is going to be the closest he's he's been since rejoining the circuit. He pushes him to the inside and he's going to switch the line on the exit of this corner. And Nielsen's going to have to slow right down to stop that from happening, which he does. Very well defended by Nielsen. Wasn't it just? It moved almost as one, but Giovinazzi is there. I told you Nielsen wouldn't be fooled twice by that one. Absolutely. He's too good for that. Nick Nielsen, four titles in four years in recent years. So what do we do now, Da Costa? You've, uh, you've showed your hand, that's the problem. And uh, now you're back behind the same car with the 51 catching, as you say, Graham. Right there, and they've got another LMP2 car involved here. And Giovinazzi, unlike Da Costa, knows he's got the straight line speed advantage. So Da Costa could be a bit of a sitting duck here, sandwiched between the two Ferraris. If he gets the poor exit out of the final corner, or at any moment onto a long straight, Giovinazzi might just sail on by. Good run through there, though, from De Costa. Let the LMP2 car take the corner, then got the launch through. Not quite as close as he was last time, but no traffic ahead this time between the two. Yeah, so De Costa's safe from the attack from Giovinazzi at this point. Uh, not he's a little bit further back from Nielsen, but he's, he's looking so fast, isn't he? Every corner he goes through, he's, he's just harassing that number 50 Ferrari in front of him, but gets onto this main straight once again, and uh, he's further behind this time. Oh, it's a bit of debris floating around in the air there. Piece of plastic. Uh, we've got the 98 car on pit lane, by the way. I've been second until that uh, penalty. So Nielsen can take the, the regular line, see how they all follow each other single file now this time around, so, uh, so he won't be under attack into turn four. You need to force the issue that we saw last time around, get him out of line, and then you can start to think about where you can place your car. Yeah, line of Stern, Ferrari, that's Team Jota and Ferrari battle for the final podium position here. We're about to tick through the end of the fourth hour, of the sixth hour, rather. 
in this eight-hour race, he reminds himself, 150% the usual points available here. Championships up, to, up for grabs at the moment look relatively secure. This, though, is a battle for pride, for position, for podiums and all the other Ps. We're hearing that car 50 is going to be pitting this lap. So what's Jota doing? We can head down to Lou in the pit lane. Jota are pitting as well, not just yet, but they've got a set of tyres out and we've seen Will Stevens getting ready. The team are ready for him to come in. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, so uh, as they've been for quite, well, the, the whole race really, haven't they? The car number 50 and, and the Jota number 38, they're on a very similar, if not exactly the same strategy, but where yeah, I mean, the, the Ferrari seems to be a little bit better on that energy management. But uh, when they exit the pit, the interesting thing here will be to see, I guess, with a full driver change, full service, it's going to be... It's going to be advantage yeah, to gonna, the number 50 car. Or at least yeah. no advantage for the Jota in Correct. terms of tyre life. So, conversation going on as well at Toyota. Few words from the boss, Kamui Kobayashi. Team it comes to 50. The J38 has stayed But maybe they've made that call late. Take the track uh, tra track position. Use the free air you've got ahead of you. He's got a clear track ahead of him now. Could this be a blinding in lap to try to actually do? And he ha I'm looking at the traffic as well for nothing. Felix Goss. There's nothing in front. There's That's, a, I think, why they've done it. If he's got the energy, if he's got the fuel, take the advantage of having a clear track ahead of you and try for an absolutely a monster in lap. This is going to be interesting. It's going to be very, very close, isn't it? When, uh, when the Jota comes out of the pits, very close between himself and the car 50, but he's going to be the one on the colder tyres. Yes. We can hear from Giovinazzi now. He's whispering. Yeah, playing his cards close to his chest. So, and there's the Ferrari strategy. The Ferrari strategy is don't tell him anything. Silence. Don't tell him anything, Pike. <laughs> so, yeah, all four tyres being changed as expected. The drive change there. Jose Maria Lopez on pit lane in the number seven car as Martin tries to explain something. Through a mouthful of chocolate. Um, did Antonio Felix da Costa not have tyres that were 20 laps newer than the Ferrari? He did. So but are I'm, they going to change, I'm or is it just going to be fuel? I'm suspecting when he comes in, they, well, Will Stevens is ready to jump in. So, so tires. Do, driver change, you'll do tyres in that time. Okay. Yeah. Seven car, here comes Lopez in. Uh, sorry, out rather. That assumes that Antonio Felix da Costa will allow Will Stevens into the car. Even though it's goodwill this weekend. Get out the car. No, get out the car. No. <laughs> <laughs> Door slammed shut. Louise Beckett, hello. Well, we saw a fresh set of tyres going on that Ferrari, but I think these are Jota's quali tyres going on next. I'm getting mixed messages from the team, so I'm going to try and find out for definite. There we go. It's oh, 51 of the 38. The mixed <laughs> message is, yes, you can have a cup of tea, but we haven't got English breakfast. And Antonio Felix da Costa pushing for all he's worth on the in-lap. Runs off track. Yeah. That's a mistake. Out gets da Costa. In gets, we hope, the focused. Don't care if he's smiling or not. 51 is in, 6 is in, 8 and 7 are in, seven. 7's just left. Well, yeah. we said that Felix da Costa needed an almighty in-lap, and he was going for that until the uh, the small mistake in turn 10, which put him off circuit. How much momentum did he lose? Because he ran out wide, he would have just hoofed it. He would have done, but it's still not as fast as sticking to the racing line I through would that say corner. That it was, however, still the fastest in-lap of any of that lead group of six. It was a 156.5 in the in lap. No one else did better than the 157.4. So, just watching on the circuit map where the car 50 is, it's just on the back straight towards the final couple of corners, 14 and 15. 38 rolling, has uh, lost the position to 51. Ah, so yeah, that, 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 would be the, uh, that would be that mistake probably on the in laps. Meantime, in the background, you can see both the lead two cars in uh, GTM are both on pit lane as well. Here comes. There is 50 in the background on warmer tyres. I know the gap looks big at the moment, but that's going to rapidly come down. This lap is almost a spin there for car 51, Pierre Guidi. Turn your mic on. I'm trying to. I keep pressing the button. It keeps rejecting me. Uh, unsurprisingly. Say nothing. Say nothing. 
Uh, they were three seconds quicker than Jota in the pits. But look at this, 50. Look at the warmer tyres, what they're yeah. going to do here. He's going to pick off Antonio Felix to well, cross. Will. Oh, Will Stevens well, going to get his elbows Stevens. out. No. No, it can't. Just can't. There's just nothing left to fight with. And go get the sister car down yep. into turn eight. Oh, they did near oh. touch. Unbelievable scenes there down into turn eight. Well, that went well. But still retains the positions. That that is not going to go down well. They're still side by side. Runs the car, the other car off the road. What is going on? Well, I'm sure words are going to be said after this one. You know, there, was, there was no, there was no way you could keep the car behind on those colder tyres. And uh, whew, that was a close one, wasn't it? Into right. turn eight. I can't believe they got, they got away with that. So uh, Antonio Fuoco has maintained a lasting advantage, but has gone off three times between corner four and corner 11 to do so. I mean, forced off circuit before turn eight, drove off circuit into drove turn off eight. Drove off circuit. Taken avoiding it. Yeah, he's letting him back past that. Yeah, there you go. He thought he had, yeah. Never Driven trust the track. stewards room to come down on your side. Give it away. It's looking relatively calm here. He's not happy. Antonella Coletta. Watch this again. Watch this again. So he had committed to the he inside. He was off track. He was off yeah. track. Yeah. He, he had committed so he long in advance. Yeah, overcommitted. But oh, look, is he back through again? Yeah, no, he's yeah. back through again now. He's taking it back down into turn one. Which carries on through maybe into turn two. No, he has to back out of it, Pierre Guidi. But vicious defending, however, down in towards turn nine. Yeah, it really turned in very hard, and uh, that's where I thought they were going to have their biggest moment, actually. Yeah. Antonella Coletta was just... Uh, wow. They had the look of a man that was about to say something like, deploy the lasers. Yeah. It's, uh, that, they did not look happy. No. Fuoco, a long time before, had committed. Yeah. He thought, I'm going to get... Like I said, I called, I said, he's going to go down the inside, and he had thought, yep, I'm going to go down the inside. It's under investigation. Of course Absolutely. Of course it is. Well, on the good side, uh, one of the stewards is Eve Bakalen, who generally regards contact between teammates as you're going to have to talk to your teammate in the garage afterwards. So Camera, camera's been told to uh, disappear. May not put a penalty in there. Yeah. Well, they, yep. they need to have a little bit of time to have a an F and a Jeff in Italian amongst each other and then calm down again. But that certainly aged everybody in that room by about a decade. I should tell you as well, I'm sure Will Stevens is massively frustrated that his cold tires, he couldn't respond. Yeah. Because there was, how many opportunities there? Had, he, had the tires up to, uh, to uh, temperature to respond here? Mm. Well, that was, that poor, was gloves off, wasn't it? That was pretty Absolutely. poor discipline, is what that was. It's interesting, despite this, Will is still two seconds behind them. And this is the pass on the straight. That was not exactly give him the place either, was it? It was a little bit uh, having to be very forceful and really dangerous because the 77 Porsche was right in the middle of where they needed to be rotating the car in turn one. That was... That was tooth and nail. That was Ferrari yeah. Formula One team friendliness, wasn't it? Uh, well, actually, more like Red Bull friendliness, to be honest. Um, regarding car 63 under full course yellow, no further action. So that's good news for Prema's second car, which is third in LMP2, Danny Kvyat. Uh, pretty convinced, by the way, the number four car is in uh, trouble. That car has been on pit lane for some time. Oh, no. Came in from nine laps down, is now 13 laps down, has dropped behind the whole of the LMP2 field. So I think the van wall uh, may be in trouble. So I wonder how the uh, Ferrari team debrief is going to go tonight after this race. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it may be they have the espresso without the biscotti tonight. And it's not over yet, because Pierre Guidi, <laughs> unfortunately, if you're a Ferrari team boss, looks to be the faster car at this point. So, uh... well, well, here's the thing. The net result of all of this shenanigans, as we see the fastest lap of the race fall uh, to Mike Conway, the 154-34. And Seb Boemi, by the way, goes quicker than that car has gone before, the number eight car. The two cars jetting away and are just about a minute clear of the civil war between the two 499Bs. 
great racing though for us to to, to behold. But uh, yeah, not so much if you're, like I say, a, in in the uh, a member of the of the Ferrari team. What's going on with Jota? They did this before. I think Will I think Will Stevens is building those tyres up as you do, taking them into a potential double stint. Let's hear some Ferrari team radio. Oh yes, About please. Time to. I'm quick up. Yeah, I can see that. Just be careful, man. He has no manners. <laughs> That's your own engineer. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Will Stevens reply on the radio has now been superseded. Message of the day is just be careful, man. He has no manners. I love it. It's genius. Absolutely love it. That's superb. Well, Justin Taylor. Du Justin Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> The voice you heard there. I'm going to go for just incredible, actually. <laughs> just, just brilliant. Yeah, brilliant uh, radio t team comms. He has no manners. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming down the inside, whether I'm off the track or not, he said, down into turn eight. He decided a long time before, hadn't he, that that's, yeah, basically that's what I'm going to do. And uh, if, you, if you drive on the white line, I'm still coming through on the inside. I think that was the problem. So Will Stevens is not catching, but he's not being dropped either. And I think you're absolutely right. This is building, building, building. This is the long game. The trouble is now he's got to overtake two of them. Well, uh, there's another problem behind Will Stevens in a 38 Jota car. That's the number six Porsche. Have you seen how close he is? Yep. 2.3 seconds behind. And Will is dropping back towards the first of Penske cars. So currently, in uh, team order, we've got the two Red Bull, two Toyota GR racing cars, two Ferraris, and then Porsche, 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 before we get the two Peugeots, and then the single Cadillac, and possibly for not too much longer, the single it, Ford it's, it's Kevin Astra in the number six car, and I think he's seen on the big screens what's going on between the Ferraris and thinking, I want some of that. I'm, I'm amazed he hasn't gone off track laughing if he's been watching that on the big screen. I mean, properly self-inflicted, I'm afraid, this on Ferrari. And I'm staggered they've kept both positions. What's the Italian for Harry Kiri? I'm staggered that the cars didn't get damaged and all of that as well. Well, it's certainly not going to have done the tire life any good. No, it was, either a, of them. it was a nice side-on slap. So it wasn't front to rear or corner to corner. It was just sidewall to sidewall. So and it was now. kind of OK, kind of. The Ferrari battle in traffic for third place. There's a Jota car in the middle, as there was a couple of laps ago, but it's not the 38, it's the 28. He pulls out of the way. Through goes 51, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, Will Stevens next up in the Jota hypercar. And now so, closing. Yeah. Uh, not just with traffic, definitely closed as we're approaching that traffic. So Will Stevens beginning to find the pace back underneath him. And Time for another yeah, baby, on the radio, I think. Uh, he's, he's just, like I said, he's just easing it in. He knows his way around this track. And like Antonio Felix da Costa said before, Will drove a brilliant first couple of stints in that car and, and uh, embedded himself in. And the tyres in beautifully well. Did exactly what was necessary. And the last car in the shot is the Penske Porsche. Yes. The number six car of, Michael, of Kevin Est. Michael Christensen's further back. So he's still dealing with Neil Charney. No, the 99 car has that long pit stop. They've lost a minute on the Penske cars. But that, not the first set of blinding lights, the last set of lights there, that is Christensen's car. So he's not out of this battle. The person that's going to have, yes, going to, have to be most careful of all here, not to just burn their tyres up in absolute frustration and desperation, is Pierre Guidi. Keeping behind as close as that from so early on in the stint, you know, pushing that car on their tyres for all it's worth, driving with, with the red mist. Uh, you could be really in trouble when it comes to that second stint. It's still an hour and 45 minutes to go of this race. Last lap, Kevin Estrin was the second fastest car on the track, second only to the race leader, Tuasio Buemi. So he is closing on this group in front. He lost a little bit of time in traffic last lap. A 59.5, though, that was... Uh, quicker than a 52-1 for Will Stevens, a 52-4 for Alessandro Pierre Guidi, a 52-3 and a 52-2. So he's still quick, even though he was getting by the Jota LMP2 car. In fact, he's 
Yeah, no, only uh, 13 or 1,400 slower than Sebastian Buemi. Yeah, definitely a threat here, yeah. Kevin Est. And closing. And a threat not just to Will Stevens, but to the Ferraris as well with this pace. The good news for, for Will Stevens, I think he's, he's, he's doing a good job here in that he's not, like I just described with the situation Pierre Greed is in, I think he's arguably a little bit too close to the car in front at this stage of the race, bringing these tyres in as you need to. And Will is purposely hanging back for that very reason. And he doesn't care so much if that Porsche behind him catches as well, to the point where he's in the dirty air yeah. and starts to ruin their tyres. So this is, he's got to play the long game here. They all have to. And now is not the time to get carried away by fighting too hard too early because you're going to really regret that when you come back out after filling the car up with fuel again. On the inset, we can see the number four Van Moor. Uh, yeah, Brian Briscoe is still in the car, yeah. and they are still working on it. So, uh, yeah, I, was, I was talking to Ryan and to Esteban uh, uh, Guerrieri a little earlier before the race, and they are saying that we just really, really want to make the car get to the end of the race, get all, as, as many laps under our belt as we can. So that's their target still. That top speed graphic presented by Mosul. Interesting that the hypercars have got 20 kilometers an hour over the LMP2 cars, 30 at top speed over the GTE cars. I'd love to see a minimum speed. The, so the apex, minimum yeah. corner speed, you know, apex turn 80, point, yeah. example, at 84 yeah. or 58 or whatever it is kilometers an hour, and how close all three of them would be because there'll be. I think the hypercars would be the slowest and the GTEs would have the highest minimum corner speed on the slowest curve. We've often said, particularly in racing that's not mixed class, where you do get to see that separation in pace, the most extraordinary thing about a, a racing car is not the top speed, is it? It is the way it breaks and the way it turns. And if you've had the privilege to sit next to a professional driver when they do that, it is mind warping. Absolutely mind warping. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, the, 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 the brakes, the brakes of a rally car on gravel yes. are so extreme that your road car experience tells you there's no possible way it could stop Absolutely without right. hitting the trees. Absolutely right. And, that, and, and then you get ground, I mean, you know, it, Aerodynamics and, and slick racing tyres, it just absolutely blows your tiny that, mind. That, the only thing I can equate it to is this. The first time I went in a proper downforce car with a proper professional driver, I thought I was going to die at every single corner. Yeah. Because you're programmed as if that's your car. It's, it's not even that you think. You absolutely know with no question <laughs> that he's going to kill you. Yes. Yeah. No, it's the same in a rally car. It takes three or four corners of watching his feet before you dare look out the yes. window because you know he's going to kill you. Yes, thanks, Matt Wilson. You did that to me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Toyota Gazoo Racing 1 2, Ferrari 3 4, Porsche 4 5 6 7 and 8. But this is definitely a, a switching balance of power. Just heard four or five minutes ago, Antonio, uh, not Antonio, Alessandro Pierre Guidi saying, I'm faster than him, Antonio Fuoco, that is. But again, look, you can hear lots of engineering backwards and forwards. Well, no, I don't have to let him by. Yes, you might have to. There's, there could be a bit of a move going on in Ferrari. And here is the danger man. Kevin Escher, back of the queue in the number six Penske Porsche. Now within shooting distance of Will Stevens, who is not close enough to challenge Alessandro Pierre Guidi, who is not close enough to challenge Antonio Fuoco. So the man with most to prove right now is in the number six Penske Porsche. And that could be very entertaining. Not sure how far into his tires he is. He seems to be roughly about the same fuel window or energy no further action of the contact between the two Ferraris. Van and Moore that's rejoins. why they told Antonio Fuoco to give Correct. the place back. Yeah, they did the right thing. Yeah, no, absolutely in they did. In retrospect, it was uh, yeah, as entertaining as it was for us. You know, they, the team read that situation well, and uh, I don't think Fuoco was going to come out of that 
on top. And had it not been a sister car, they would have had to have made that same pragmatic choice as, uh, as Will Stevens squeezes by the GR Racing Porsche of Ricardo Perra. And here comes Kevin Esch. Again, what was Esch's lap last time? 152.4, the leader did a 152.3. So they've dropped out of the 51s. Antonio Felix da Costa looking as deflated as a party balloon on Monday morning. There are quite a few of those around Bahrain on Monday morning. Yeah, because when it gets to a situation like this in the race, you know, where they were helpfully in front of the Ferrari and only had to consolidate that gap just to the end of the race, um, you're now in a position where you're asking the other drivers because of a few mistakes here and there that crept in through his stint, you're asking the other drivers in your car crew to, yeah, to put that right and you, you put that uh, request upon them, that pressure upon them. And there uh, could be further drama here for another second place car in GTM. It's a D station oh. racing car, a pit stop uh, under investigation. Scything around the outside of the. Uh, he, was four, he was all four wheels off. Yeah, he was off yeah. the track there. Yeah. Yeah. Going to have to be careful about that. Well, he, yeah, he took advantage. It's a bit flapping around here, isn't it? On the number 31. Uh, is yeah. that our race 31. leader it is? 31. Yeah. It's uh, LMP2 leader, Ferdy Habsburg. I don't know what Robert are in second. It's a WRT 1-2 at the moment. I don't know what part that is, but it looks like a bit of bodywork from yeah. what I can see. Is it a bit of tape? If it's a bit of tape, that's fine, but it's a bit more substantial than that, I thought. Well, Stevens down the inside of our LMP2 leader. And the WRT cars, 12th and 13th, with Jota's 28 car in third in LMP2 in 14th overall. But Kevin Estra still trying to close in to attack. Battle continues to rage for third place. Antonio Fuoco in a 50 Ferrari creeping away from Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the 51 car. And then Will Stevens about to come under pretty sustained assault, I think, from Kevin Esch. Esch has been lapping quicker ever since they left the pit lane together, or not quite together, but on the same lap. Their tyres are of the same vintage. Their fuel load is the same. If he and Antonio Felix da Costa watching in the Jota Garage. Your leaders in uh, hypercar, Sebastian Bremi, number eight Toyota. Ferdy Habsburg in WRT's number 31 car leads LMP2. And the Iron Dames, Michelle Gatting, now a quarter of a minute away, nearly half a minute away from D Station in second with a potential penalty for them. And then Northwest AMR in third place, about half a minute behind the Iron Dames Porsche. An hour and 36 minutes to go here in the eight hours of Dubai. Still no clue as to who's going to win anything apart from a hypercar. Indeed, it is uh, Porsche leading in GTM, and then it's three Aston Martins, D-Station, Northwest AMR, and ORT by TF. Then the Corvette, Nicky Katzberger bought that car and storming along. Don't seem to be very many happy faces in either the Porsche Penske Motorsports or the Hertz Team Jota uh, garages at the moment. Now, I think the Porsche Penske team are a little bit more focused on what might happen, and the Jota team a little bit ruining what might have happened. Or what could have been. What perhaps, could have been. Yeah. They were in a strong third place, and they rolled the dice, and it didn't come up sixes. On board with 51, as Sancho Pierre Guidi. Whoa, oh, and Estra runs out very wide in the background, doesn't he? And he was having a real close up lunch. We both saw the same thing there. Number eight Toyota's coming up behind this battle. This is the race leader in the background, just at the top of the shot. That's the number eight car coming down through seven to turn eight here. And this is gonna this is gonna really, really slow up Sebastian Puemi unless he does Mike Conway knife through butter passing like Conway did in the first couple of stints of the race. Well he'll have the blue flags on his side of course um, to, to make that Whoa. work. 
Ooh, as uh, Woko should have had in passing the Peugeot. Yeah, that's Loic Duval. Every time we've talked about 94, it seems to be Loic Duval. There's nobody else driven it today. And again, Loic being repassed by the 36 Alpine LMP2 car. So he's not fresh out of the pits. That car is struggling for grip. Uh, also to note, by the way, that car number five, seventh place, the second of the two Porsche Penske Motorsport cars, currently in the hands of Michael Christensen, must repair the left rear light at its next pit stop. Aha, OK. Well, that could be just as simple as the rear clip being changed. Not hitting it with a hammer. Kick, kick usually... it first, see if it yeah, works. Yeah, tap it a bit, usually fixes things. Well, there is the race leader, Sebastian Buemi, on his way with his teammates, it would seem, to a third FIA World Endurance Championship driver's title. Toyota already manufacturers champions. Well, Toyota debuting in this championship in its debut year, partway through the year, as uh, late additions planned to debut in 2013, came early after the withdrawal pre-season of Peugeot. What a run they've had yeah and uh, remember the dramas here in the first year the car that was designed as a test car rather than a race car side pods if I remember rightly the uh, electrics wilting in the heat yeah uh, the you missed out the word shock there the shock withdrawal of Peugeot so much of a shock that the team were actually in Sebring to test when they were told Oh, Anthony's giving me that look. Well, I was trying to get hold of my visa <laughs> and, and, and didn't understand why the team were yep. so slow in responding. Well, oh, well uh, yep. non-existent in the, in the response. And then it all came came to light in just a matter of days afterwards. Yeah. At least one um, driver I know arrived in Orlando to get the text message. Uh, terrible, but they're Turn back. Around, go home. They're back and there'll be a different looking version of this 9x8 next season. Yeah, and I, you know, I really, really hope that they find a performance that little, and it's not a massive slice of performance, it's a very small extra bit of performance that they need, because what we don't want in a brand new, sparkly, exciting category is any manufacturers really struggling seriously off the car. That's why they were looking sad, because the snacks hadn't arrived. Angry. Now Hang, no, Jonathan Dugan on the left and Thomas Lauderback on the right there for Porsche. Yeah, Thomas Lauderback handing out the trophies to the drivers in the Porsche Carrera Cup Middle East. So he's sort of on double duty here, not just for Porsche's hypercars, but also for their newest Carrera Cup series. That'll be the fatigue kicking in for all that trophy lifting. <laughs> yeah. um, we did notice, by the way, as we continue to watch this emerging battle, uh, the, the Van Wall having left the pits, nearly 20 minutes in the pits. Oh, has come back in. He came back in oh, and is yeah. back in the garage. Uh, Michelle Gatting, you just saw in the pink Porsche of the Iron Dames car, now 22.6 seconds ahead of Casper Stevenson. Daniel Mancinelli, 9.9 .9 further back. Then another 38 seconds further back is Charlie Eastwood. So, yes, Aston's a second, third, and fourth. 777 D station car in second in GTEM, potentially with a, po a, uh, a, po a problem. A, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What do you get after a problem? They give you a, I don't know, uh, with a uh, penalty. That's, That's the word. <laughs> so I've used so many P's. Used so many P's on Penske, Porsche, and. and, and, and Proton. Yeah, Proton. Yeah. I've run out of P words. This is unusual. Isn't it has it? been potentially problematic all night. It hasn't has, it? yeah. But penny potential, at least. Yeah. Uh, but it does look, though, as uh, again, at the moment, the Iron Dames Porsche has covered off what everybody else has got in terms well, of pace. The gaps are pretty static right now. Yes, and D Station has still got that potential, another P, uh, penalty hanging over them. So we'll, it is a bit of a hashtag wait and see. 90 minutes to go to the end of this season, the end of the era for LMP2, the end of the era for, not just for GTEM, but uh, GT looks to me like uh, our producer <laughs> Cedric is going to get the car. Yeah, exactly. Cedric wasn't aware that he was on, on television. Uh, everybody else was. <laughs> now he knows how it feels. Yeah, exactly. 
And that you can see Cedric on full accent. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's one of the many brains behind full accent. Well, he, when, um, we go, actually, when we go on yeah, about it, he's actually it's, it's, the executive producer of the whole thing. So, what, a, uh, yeah. what a great job he and the guys and oh. girls have done. Absolutely brilliant this season. A big step up. And by the way, I'll say it out loud the fans asked for a longer form version of that, and they were right. Yep. And, and they are getting it at Christmas. So we have lots of Christmas presents for you. Uh, lots more news about hypercar and new cars coming and teams will be confirmed for next year uh, after the FIA World Motorsport Council meeting in December. But in terms of actual physical Christmas or virtual physical presents, we will have a long form version of largely unseen full access footage as a Christmas special. I don't think there are sleigh bells, although I'm going to have a word with Cedric. And uh, we will also have a full season review of every race in the FIA World Endurance Championship. So those will also be available. A regular review of this race will be online uh, in about three weeks time, I think. And about 10 days from now, you will see full access coverage of the eight hours of Bahrain. So there will be a degree of bleeping, I imagine, in some of the shots, because there has not been many garages where things have been quiet and tranquil for the entire race so far. The thought occurs to me as we saw what was not a happy place, the Peugeot Sport Garage, of what we've seen in terms of the competition here taking a step forward. Spool back 12 months here, and Peugeot didn't have reliability, but they did have speed. Yep. And they have been absolutely nowhere this afternoon. Well, and that's what we saw with Glickenhaus as well. A car that was there or thereabouts as recently as last season and could finish on the podium at Le Mans because they were quick enough and reliable. This year, everybody else has just leapt away from them. And that's the speed of development, not just because the cars were newer, but because they're developing them faster. Oliver Rasmussen, ideal height for a single-seater driver, which is why he's in GTs and sports cars, in LMP2, rather. Uh, lanky figure, definitely not the Anthony Davidson uh, Formula One type stature that you require for a top-flight single-seater career. I think the days of your Gerhard Bergers and, and Alex Wurzes and Mark Webbers are probably long gone now. Well, no, although the, the F modern F1 cars are bigger because of that reason. The, the, general population is growing in size so yeah. the, the, the so latest f1 cars do accommodate drivers like uh, your alex albons and your george russells as, as tall as five foot seven <laughs> well, i mean no one's as tall as you but uh yeah freakishly tall I yeah, yeah. Say freakishly. <laughs> just, I, I was going to leave that for you to say yeah just a normal height i just did yeah. there you go thanks for uh, filling in fans of uh, austrian hypercar teams will be pleased to know that ryan briscoe's on the move again in the Floyd Van Walk Cup. Look at that move again. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's going to be an interesting moment. One of the talking race. points of the season. There were three points on this lap where both those cars could have been out of the race. Absolutely extraordinary. Yep. There's only one rule in racing, and that's don't hit the red car. Yes, that was Luca, who was a fine bloke, the uh, oh. RPR, doing his job. Do his job. And do, do you know what, actually, the thing that I've been singularly impressed with with the Ferrari team is their openness, and not, not just their openness, but actually their active engagement with Absolutely. everybody around them. If only and every team in motorsport was like that. If only every, every team in Ferrari was like that. But they've been, you know, they've been wonderful. They've taken the kind of open doors and, and warmth of, of the AF Corsa organisation and added to it and it's it's been great you know it could have been very jean -Tot era peugeot doors down arm guards lip sealed nothing going on but they've been the diametric opposite of what you sense that a formula one based operation might be well i, I said it before in one of our earlier broadcasts this week and i'll say it again now uh at uh, the finale Mon uh, mondiale we'll be watching here this is the Cadillac and the 93 car. Is this for position? Oh, this no, is for not. last. This is for uh, position. It is. Yeah. It's for last. So, or not last. No, it's not. He's unlapping himself. Right. I know, because he oh, is still right. behind. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, anyway. Two laps, in fact. Uh, there we saw two new cars uh, unveiled by Ferrari. One is their new challenge car for their, their successful one-make product worldwide. The other was the 499P 
modificata. That is not an Evo version of this car for next year. It is effectively a near identical sister to these cars, which you, Martin Haven, if you manage to win that lottery, could uh, actually buy one of those and run those at uh, Ferrari's exclusive track days alongside the F1 Cliente cars. That, for me, is a massive vote of confidence in this programme. That is Ferrari, a team imbued in the Formula One culture, saying that we value our most wealthy customers, if you like, that are interested in track day type activities with a product based on a race car, not a road car, that is going to come at a price point roughly equivalent to selling them one of our X factory Formula One cars. An amazing moment. And you're going to get to those days. You've got your 5.1 million euro 499 Modificato being run by factory mechanics. You're in your Ferrari overalls, having your espresso at, at Fiorano or Mugello, wherever you're going, and you're chatting to a colleague and you're going, uh, what are you driving? Oh, I've got an ex Michael Schumacher, this, that, and the other. Win Le Mans, did it? Right, see you out there. <laughs> 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 because, because there is, uh, you know, there is that cachet. I've got a faster version of the car that won Le Mans. Yes, uh, that what have you got? Uh, by the way, I should explain explain what those cars are. We'll do that very shortly if you've watched the Vector Sport car on pit lane in from eighth in class. That's what you call a speedy driver arrival. So Ryan Cullen out. Is that will be his last. We're getting to the stage now. Counting back. Yeah, where we might see drivers getting in for the final runs of the season. Quite a long run here. Uh, this is two stints, isn't it, to the end? At least. I think, I think it's more than two. An P2. hour and 20 is 80 minutes in P2. I think that's going to be three stints. So probably won't see... Yeah, we probably will see one more driver change. So it's Otto Fraschini on the tail fin and on the nose of this car. That is... Moribund 1930s supercar manufacturer that will return like a phoenix from the ashes with a hypercar race program before it is even released a road version of the car, indeed any road model since World War II. So there's Otto Fraschini returning. Although they did build trucks. Uh huh. Until I think the 50s. So as exotic as Bedford then. <laughs> Scammel. Daff. Scania. Into the pit lane comes the WRT car. And in fact, so in behind be them there. comes... Uh, no, it's not. It's number uh, number five Porsche. No, it's uh, number 31. Uh, in, uh, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, 31 should be in about 20 seconds ahead of 41. So this is uh, Michael Christensen five Porsche as out gets Ferdy Habsburg and gets Robin Freins. I think Sean Galeo may be done for the day. Yeah, I think he will be. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't long ago that actually that Robin Freins was uh, was driving the number 31. And out. there's the driver change yeah. behind them in the sister car 41. Kubica gets out. And uh, Louis Delatraz gets back in. So I wonder how, how much time Kubica lost in that moment with the seatbelt drama from the last time he, he, uh, when he got in the car. A, it was about 30 seconds. Yeah, so it was a really bad stop, wasn't it, because of that? And that's usually why you do the, the driver change in conjunction with the fuel yep. and the tyres, because it, it does take around 25 seconds all in to get a driver, well, one out, one back in. All Again, uh, really belted in. Double stacked from the WRT team in the correct order. Yep. 41 closing in with an hour and 21 minutes to go. Well, they weren't far apart. They were only 19 and 20 seconds apart when they came into the pit lane. So uh, I don't think he lost 30 seconds. I think maybe they might have lost 10 seconds or so. But either way, cars back on their way. Of course, they're no longer 1 2 in LMP2. 80 minutes remain in the 2023 FIA World Endurance Championship season. And in the finale here, the Babco Energies 
eight hours of Bahrain. Toyota Gazoo Racing remain 1-2. The gap between them, about a third of a lap, 48 seconds. Well, it's getting on for half a lap now between the two cars. And uh, they look cemented into a 1-2 result. The intrigue is if Ferrari or Porsche can snaffle the final podium spot. At the minute, the 50 Ferrari is ahead of 51. But look, closing in behind is the 28 Jota car, 38 Jota car, and the number six Proton, uh, Penske Porsche has dropped back just a fraction. So Will Stevens all over the back of the 51 car of Alessandro Pierre Guidi once more. And now Davidson, we've been here before, and then Will's star faded a little. Here's the problem in traffic for the Ferrari. Yeah, this is what allowed Will Stevens to close in. A bit of contact there between uh, number 51 and the Prema in towards turn 10. That's what allowed Will Stevens to, uh, to be a bit more of just a threat towards turn 11. But now there's a car separating them. It's another Prema car, the number nine car, who uh, currently leads the race. It's one Manuel Correa at the wheel. Yeah, the two Prema cars and the two WRT cars cycle in and out of the pits as a team, but at separate times. So it's either WRT 1-2 or Prema 1-2. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to pay out by the time we get to the chequered flag, because they can't both be right. It, exactly, it all depends on... I can't remember whose radio message it was much earlier on in the race. Basically, we're saying it's going to play out right at the end, and it depends on who's going to have the oh, splash right. to do or any splash or less of a splash but that's how it seems to be shaping up because there's only a couple of laps between the WRT's leading and then the Premier's leading. We've had no safety cars, touch wood, two full course yellow periods which have lasted less than a lap each, probably about half a lap per car so effectively no fuel saving whatsoever other than what the drivers have been able to do so it's... <sighs> Yeah, nobody's gained any advantage from something happening materially on the racetrack. It's just what you can do in terms of your strategy and how you've used your tyres and your fuel and your drivers. Looks like Will Stevens is starting to just push. We see the van wall getting pushed back oh. into the pits once again, get into the box again. And back in the garage, is that still uh, I think Ryan it's still Briscoe. Ryan Briscoe. Yeah. Yeah. Torrid afternoon they've had. But it does look, going back to this fight here, that Will Stevens is just starting to turn up the wick a little bit. I agree. And uh, he's starting to pull away from Estra now, who I think has burnt his tyres up way too early, throwing the car around off the track here and there in certain moments. And Will is, like I said, he's, I, I hoped he was playing the long game. And that looked like the reason why he was falling back from the Ferraris earlier on. And now I just feel like he's starting, he's starting to come his way again. We're watching the background because the leader is approaching this battle. The eight is about to lap this group. But he's been approaching them for ages. Well, the, 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 it, they're broadly the same sort of speed. But if yeah. we get into traffic and this battle's there, that gap is going to close. It's going to be interesting for Will because the... Uh, Pierre Guidi cars held up a little bit through turn two. Now he's not close enough to be any kind of a threat, but uh, is sort of shaping up with one hour, 17 minutes to go, shaping up that it's starting to come back towards the Jota Porsche at this yeah, point. Yeah, it, it does start to look that way. And, and we talked about this earlier in the race. Early in the season, all of the Porsches faded desperately in the second stint on tyres. They've really learned how to manage that. Well, Get back to Sebring. Do you remember Sebring? Oh. How disastrous it was in terms of Fell rear off. tire management or lack yeah. of. But yeah, so they've been learning this new car the whole way through the season. And for Jota, of course, they only picked it up at Spa. And uh, it's been a more than a vertical learning curve for them. Uh, but yeah, it's, been, it's, been, it's been quick out the box. And I do wonder if what's going on here, you described it beautifully at the start of this stint, Anne, is that he's. He's definitely managing this stint. There's no doubt about it. He, there is not the press on the star we'd expect from Will at this point in the in the stint. And if you had to put your money on one aspect of the way this car is going to be run to the end uh, in Jota's court, it would be strategy, without a doubt. They've always been good at strategy of Jota in LMP2. And they're going to uh, they're going to apply that here as well today. Just and, uh, they're going to wear down Ferrari quite literally in terms of tyre wear. I feel like they're going to wear them down over this, uh, maybe not both cars, but certainly this car they're right behind at the moment. Just saw Sebastian Wemmy in the background on the back straight going by the ORF by TF Sport, Aston Martin, the orange car 
been driven by Charlie Eastman. It's fourth in GTE Am, so he's now closing in on the number six Porsche. He's nibbling tenth per lap. That's the next couple yeah, of cars go. there. Tenth per lap, and now he's closer, oh, and now, now they've Will got Stevens, traffic. Now Will Stevens, they've get, gone on the radar. Okay, Vida's coming. Get stuck into the Ferrari, then we're not going to have to pull over for the Toyota. You know, there'll be blue flags, but he said, no, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pass for a top four position. Don't expect me to roll over and just allow the leader to come through and ruin my race. He's looking much more racing here as well. I see the whole body language of the car has changed. He's giving it a little bit more energy through each corner. Deeper on the braking zones. I even think that lift and coast, that big lift and coast he was doing at the start of the stint has come down as well. And I was surprised actually for how, what the distance was between the cars in the final corner to how it turned out into turn one. He was much, much closer that time around. I think Pierre Guidi might be getting into a bit of trouble with his tyres here. Pushing on into the back of the 22 United Autosports car. That's going to be very hard for the Ferrari to get by down into turn 11 or up the hill into 12 and 13. Now he's going to run. He's right there. Oh, oh, oh. Just got away from him there a little. And yeah, for the Ferrari as well, later in the turn. Look at that, exactly the same tyre age as we saw. Yeah. Brand new, all four went on at the pit stop. And uh, we know that they've got 10 more laps to go on these, uh, for the, uh, they, they pit only with 31 laps. So look, much faster in the straight line here. Is Pierre Guidi having to save fuel or something? Yeah, maybe. Toyota, He's definitely lost pace in the straight line. In the background, the Toyota flashing the headlights at the number six Porsche, get out of my way. I want to win a race and a championship. Right, here we go then. Closest Stevens has been so far since coming out the pits on brand new tyres. He had the speed on the straight last time round and down towards turn four. He's got it again this time. He looks to the inside, late on the brakes. You see the smoke pouring off. Inside, can he hold like, the line? Yes, he can. That's Beautifully like done. deploying DRS. He just went by him, used the toe superbly up to fourth place. And that's one place again that he won't have to worry about Kevin Estra taking off him, because Kevin Estra is now trying to avoid moving out of the way of the number eight Toyota. In fact, Estra is right behind the Ferrari. This could be very bad news for Alessandro Pierre Guidi. The Le Mans winning 51 Ferrari down to fourth, and the fifth place Porsche is right there. And not only that, uh, that fifth. Porsche has seen uh, exactly where an identical car managed to make that move. Yep. And so actually, for, for Estra, the Toyota getting in front of the Ferrari might be the might be the move that makes the difference. Here's Estra now attacking Alessandro Pierre Guidi as the second place car from Prema in the pit lane drops down to fourth or fifth. There's a problem with that Ferrari. It's some kind of the power unit. There's some kind of problem. It's either saving fuel, gone to a, a leaner engine mix or something again. that it's lost. It's lost that advantage it had in the straight line performance yep. all the way through this race. Just wondering if he, even if it sounds healthy or not. It's, uh, it's a bit of a sort of rough sounding engine anyway, is, is the Ferrari motor in the back of that. But this isn't him. Pick up from the camera on that, on Steve, that angle. Stephen has uh, driven away. Yeah, completely driven away. So let's see here as Estra exits the final corner. Has he got the same power advantage? It seemed that Will Stevens had last time around, because that will be the telltale sign that we're looking for. It's pretty even at the moment between the two of these. Rose is here, though. And again, Estra needs to get on with it because the Toyota's right there right there behind them now. What I have to do with it, So we had an issue coming out of turn 10, the last lap. We need to go up on TC. Spinning up the tires off turn 10, but uh, even so, now this is real problem time for Estra, trying to get by the Ferrari because the number eight Toyota, the race leader is right behind him. That's the end of the pass as Will Stevens moved up the order. Uh, 
that one resolution and it is a very interesting one we heard that there was an issue potentially for the pit stop for the triple seven car that is the second place car in gte am currently under 16 seconds back from the iron dames leading it is a reprimand for that car there is no further penalty so whatever happened in that pit stop it is not being punished with more than a reprimand at this stage Seb Buemi weaving around just to show Kevin Estra that he's there. He will have the blue flags helping him, but Estra's embroiled in this fight with the Ferrari of Pierre Guidi in front of him. And, but you do have to respect the blue flags at some point and then try and latch onto the back of Buemi. That's what I'd be thinking if I was in that number six Porsche to try then. Once Pierre Guidi gets the blue flags, you're right there behind the Toyota. So how is he going to play this? down towards the last corner, he doesn't let him through there, but at some point he's going to have to. Well, Bwemby's closer to the rear of the Porsche than the Porsche is to the Ferrari at this stage. I think he's going to have to let him go. The issue uh, for 777 was they stopped just slightly outside their pit stop box, so it wasn't a performance advantage or interfering with anybody else. So, OK, I, I wonder why the reprimand, because normally if you miss Q in the pits, you get pins. There goes the number eight car, dives in front, and... Yeah, Kevin Escher not really keen. Now he wants to really hang on to the coattails of the number eight Toyota of Sebastian Buemi, and he is. Is he trying to unlap himself? Or just make sure that he's so close behind the Toyota that when Toyota gets to Alessandro Pierre Guidi, Pierre Guidi cannot shut the door on him. Keeping an eye as well on Will Stevens and whether or not he's closing on Fuoco ahead in third. And the answer is yes, he is. He is. Yeah. He's taken a second and a half out of the Ferrari to the 50 Ferrari. Six seconds ahead now of Will Stevens in the Hertz Team Jota car. 153.7 for Fuoco, 154.0 for Pierre Guidi. So Fuoco barely quicker than Pierre Guidi. But 152.4 for for Stevens. And 154-0 for the race leader and 53-1 for the Toyota in second place. So Will Stevens again, the Jota Porsche, the fastest car on track. Let's hear from the race leader, Sebastian Buemi. The redistractor is should do something. It is not correct. It is not correct. It's a lot of talk. Copy, Seb, understood. This is something. They don't do anything. There will never be any respect. There will never be any respect. What is he doing? Seb. Now he needs to wake up and do something. Seb, they're battling for a top four position. Shut up. Right, and we did see there, there is the Porsche got by up yeah. the inside of the Ferrari. Uh, now having to defend as they come to the end of the lap. Now we'll see whether or not this Ferrari's got the ponies on the, on the, uh, the front straight. Well, he certainly did on the exit of turn 10, and that's where we heard he had the problem and having to go up on the traction control. And, uh, getting closer, but not close enough. Well, the Ferrari is definitely struggling compared to its Porsche rivals at the moment. Kevin Estra moves up, and now the lead Ferrari, Antonio Foco, remains in third, but going slower than Jota's Porsche in the hands of Will Stevens and Kevin Estra's Penske Porsche. And look, for the first time this race so far, on the, on the energy graphic there, Hertz Team Jota got more energy in the car than the Ferraris. And than Kevin Estra in yeah. the Porsche behind, who also had the same energy last time we saw look it. Look at this move from Estra down the inside. That's classic GT-style racing, isn't it? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no love lost between the two of them. Well, that's proper Estra win it or bin it, isn't it? But this is, this is Estra and Pierre Guidi. This is payback for last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, the year before. You know, in, in GT Pro, these two even. teams... The, the well, no, but these two teams have been at it for the title Absolutely for the right. last three straight years. And it's come down to here. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, any little thing you can put on these guys, they're going to lay it on the table right there, and that was cracking stuff. Absolutely. I, I have to say, I, do, I, I love Sebastian Buemi's uh, uh, aggression and his speed in the car, but he's leading unutterably comfortably a Toyota 1-2. He's cruising to another title after winning Le Mans yet again. Just let them race and stop whinging on about there's no respect. I'll ask Anthony this. It does seem to more or less every other driver on this track, if they were, that they had that in their head, I'd be saying that's a disadvantage. But it seems to fuel him. Oh, well, in terms of how stressed you get, I, 
I just think he he's a perfectionist, Wemmy. He likes things to be. He likes to. He likes to people to respect rules that are written down, and it is written down that if you've got a blue flag, you get out the way of the race leader or any car that's coming up to lap you. You have to respect the blue flags, otherwise, why have them? So you either have them or you don't. In this category, in this series, it's, like I said earlier on, it's an FIA World Championship. You have blue flags, it's written in the rules, when a faster car is coming up behind to lap you, you must get out of the way of that faster car. And then they don't. So that winds somebody like Sebastian Fair Wemmy up. I know. Is, now, that's the rule in Formula One. Is that actually the rule in the World Endurance Championship? Because we had this last year with, Sebastian, with uh, Juan Pablo Montoya saying, what's the deal with the blue flags? How many blue flags do we have? Is there a set number before we have to get out of the way? It's and, not and quite as draconian as it is in and, Formula and, One. And so there, there was there a, a degree of, yeah, yeah, no, you have to get out of the way. And, and Juan Pablo said, look, if you're in a faster car, just go by. The problem is today that in hypercar, you're all very much the same speed in the straight line. So it's, it's very difficult to overtake a slower car or a, a car on lap time that's slower than you because your straight line speed is exactly the same. Yep. And particularly because of the BOP, they all have such similar performances. So this is, you know, it, he's got it. Basically, I'm in full agreement with Boemi on this one. When you're coming up to lap a slower car, it's, they should get out of your way. Uh, behind well, you just pointed out they're hypercars, they're not slower, they're just on a lap time. back on the lap. Slower in lap time. They, they were quicker yeah. than him. He's, he's pulling away now. <laughs> the, and again, the problem is that you're in the turbulence, and these yeah. cars rely a lot on aerodynamics. People that don't understand and never driven a car that suffers with turbulence will find it really hard to understand that concept of how far back you start feeling it. And he's in a position, he doesn't want really to be taking risks, but he still doesn't want his sister car to be catching too much if he's stuck behind this gaggle with an hour and a bit to go for the race. He's going to sit there for an hour and a bit for the rest of the race, just watching their fight, where the gap comes down more and more and more behind him with with uh, Conway catching him. No thanks. So he's got to get. He's got to carry on with his with his own race. 64 minutes remain of this race and of this season. It is a 46 second gap. Sebastian Buemi uh, bringing the number eight crew towards a world championship. Mike Conway at the wheel of the number seven car seems to have no answer to that pace at the moment. So Tony Fuoco, the number 50 Ferrari, is almost a minute uh, a right from that with under six seconds back to Will Stevens in what is a developing battle for the final podium place, overall podium place of this season. Uh, Stevens has pulled away from Kevin Estra, that gap now almost seven seconds. And the second of the Ferrari is Alice, uh, sorry, Alessandro Pierguidi, almost three seconds back from that. In P2, it is the 31 Team WRT car in the hands of Robin Freins. 14 seconds ahead of Louis Delatraz, the 41 car on its way at the moment, seemingly to that title if things stay the same. Uh, third is the Jota number 28 car. Let's have a listen what's going on in the 41 car uh, with Louis Delatraz. Okay, Louis. Manage your tires as if it was double tip. We will copy paste what the Jota do, but I cannot guarantee we have enough gap. So manage for double tip. And then maybe you can push on the next one if we change the left hand side. Yeah, copy. All right, we're going to copy paste what you have to do. Cover them off. Why not? This is about. This is this is not about the the race here. It's about the title. Uh, to complete the picture, by the way, it is the Iron Dames. Michelle Gatting, the number 85 car, after the retirement of the number sister, number 60 car, with uh, Claudio Schiavone unable to drive today, uh, unwell. That car retired from the lead, has put the 85 car into the lead in the very last race in GTE racing history. She's currently 16 seconds ahead of the 777 D-Station racing Aston Martin. And then the number 98 uh, Northwest AMR car is a further 18 seconds back. We, I feel the same. It's been an amazing era of GT racing. Uh, Twitter and other social media littered with comments from people who've been involved as drivers, as team members, as fans of this uh, group of cars, this astonishing group of cars, uh, pure racing GT, uh, G GT race cars, and they are going to be missed. They definitely are. In, uh, and I think the drivers will probably miss them more than the fans, because the fans will still see a bumper field of cars, eight, nine different brands, maybe on track as opposed to 
four or five or sometimes six or seven that we've had in GTE Pro. So there'll be a lot of variety and the racing will be just as close as GC3 racing is globally. So yeah, they, they won't be as demanding, stroke involving for the drivers, but the racing will be just as tough. So actually sort of will. Ultra Goma, Ultima Goma, last tire. Oh, oh see that, I tell you what, my Italian's not just for pizza and beer. Well, I'll tell you what extraordinary this era in sports car racing is uh, for next year. There is zero doubt whatsoever that multiple major manufacturers will be turned away from LMGT3 next year because there isn't space for them. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I think we're going to get to the stage where circuits that would like to host the World Endurance Championship will not get that chance because they're going to look to expand the grid as we move forward to accommodate more. That's great times. Yeah. One other hour to great, go. Yeah, other great times. Will Stevens, now only 4.8 seconds behind Antonio Fuoco. It's relentless, isn't it? As we head into the final hour, Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2. Number eight, doing what they need to do, keeping themselves ahead in the race and in the points, looking to tie up a third world title for their two drivers and a second consecutive route for Rio Hirakawa. So the number seven crew, the only team that could beat them to the title, that turned around in the first corner has cost them a chance to win the race. Sebastian Wemmy leads for number eight Toyota Gazoo Racing. In LMP2, Robin Frines for the 31 WRT team, the team run 1-2. Michelle Gatti in the Iron Dames Porsche leading in GTE Am. 59 minutes in the season remain. I've had it, boys and girls. Number seven car chasing, 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 but it's a long, long gap. Uh, for the race leading, the championship leading car of Sebastian Buemi. But some stress in his voice because it matters. It still matters. It doesn't matter how many you win. Races, championship, Le Mans 24 hours, it still matters. These guys, these teams are driven by perfection and by success. And we heard that from Matt Davidson. If it didn't matter, they couldn't do it to the level that they do. Final stop, by the way, for the Corvette. Final stop for the 50 Ferrari, 58 minutes 33. Oh, I don't know, no, is it? I don't think it is. I don't think it can be, can it? There's gonna be some splashes there. There could be some real jeopardy. You know qualifying where all the purple laps came within a 90 second margin? 51 in as 51 well. 51 is in as well. I think they're gonna throw whatever they can at these cars at the end of this race. At the moment, they've not got the pace. Now, and Dame's in as well from the lead. Yeah. This is the final. This will be the final stop in GTE Am. Let's hear from the teams. It was already up there. Yes, Max Bush, Max Bush, let's go. Yeah. All right, yeah. And this is where it all went wrong for Antonio Felix da Costa, trying to produce an in-lap that would give him just enough to creep back out in front of the Ferraris. They are in third, Hertz Team Jota. They would love a podium here. Remember, 4.8 seconds was the gap before these pit stops. The Ferraris are rolling. The seven car is on pit lane in the hands of Mike Conway. It's all on the table here. The 51 car still up on the jacks. The 50 car squirms under load. It's the Cadillac involved in that first corner incident. Pits. Conway out. Kamui Kobayashi, the boss of the program, in for the final stint of the final bit of the race. I think it should be more than one stint. A stint and a splash. Is this significant in any way other than that's just the way in which they go? Conway Kobayashi Lopez. Pace and efficiency on pit lane. Pace and efficiency yeah. on track. In comes Will Stevens. What was his in lap like? Just looking to see now. 157 dead. That yeah. was just looking to see what Estra produces when he finally pits. Well, the in-lap for the race leader was a 157.4, so I'm saying it wasn't that slow, Will no, Stevens. 57.9 for Antonio Fuoco, 58.3 for Alessandro Pierre Guidi, so 
only, Kamui, uh, only Mike Conway coming in at 56.7 was quicker. Well, the point there is is that even on the in-lap, uh, Will Stevens has taken a second out of his target, which is uh, Antonio Fuoco. So Sebastian Buemi is out. And is that Rio Hirokawa getting in? I didn't think it was Brendan Hartley's helmet, so it's Rio Hirokawa. What so, a word for this young man, by the way. When he first came into this team, there were doubts about him. There were doubts about whether or not he would, he would be vulnerable. We had moments in the early races. And huge credit, by the way, to Sebastian Buemi and to Brendan Hartley for the way in which they've engaged with that talent. Yes. And now he's become absolutely top-ranked international sports car star. Out goes to Costa. Where are the Ferraris? 50 is on the pit straight. Look at 50 the is almost parallel with him. 50 Ferrari is going by. It does. Where's 51? 51 is coming out of the final corner. Antonio, uh, big pardon, Will Stevens is going to have to really work hard for this and almost runs out of track at the first corner. Got a tippy toe here. It is oh. 55 minutes to go. The gap we'll wait for the second lap before we start talking gaps. It was clearly a small gap as he emerged from the pits. Now, the car behind him is the number six Penske Porsche, not the 51 Ferrari. They've also got the race leading number eight car back behind them again. So uh, they will have to deal with that. He's got three new tyres and one stint old right front. This is the hardest time of all to try and warm up a set of hard tyres when the racetrack is getting colder and colder all the time. And uh, that Penske Porsche is probably going to overtake, but at some point those brand new tyres, three of them on that Jota are going to come good. It was five seconds quicker for the Penske run car in pit lane this time around. That's why they're so close on track here. This is going to be about a defensive drive for the moment from Will Stevens. Now, what about the Toyotas? This is when they need to use their medium tyres that they use for qualifying that have not been on the car. So they're going for a matched full set of mediums on both cars. This is so tight for Will Stevens. Yeah. He's going to be looking in the mirrors. He can see those bright white lights getting ever closer. Estra knows he's running out of time as well because if that heat starts to build and generate in three of those tyres for Will Stevens, he starts weaving around in desperation a race against time because if Will is behind him, yes, he will probably find his way by, but it's not going to be easy with Esther at the wheel, and they both know that, and I think he's just about got away with it. I think Esther he has. Known it, he knows it as well. That's why he went for that desperate move into yeah. turn 13, which didn't quite pay off. But he had to try and get him into turn one, and he wasn't yeah. quite close enough, and the gap's opened up now. And Will Stevens, Will is vulnerable under braking and under acceleration, and there's quite a lot of that here. But as soon as they get into a straight, Estra can't close the gap any further than he has done under braking. And even in a straight line, believe it or not, you build internal bulk temperature of the tyre yep. from just the centrifugal rotation going on, the force through the tyres. But uh, Will has done it just about. That was well planned from, yep. uh, from Jota there. So at the moment, Toyota 1-2, Ferrari number 50 in third into the final hour. Jota and Ferrari and Penske Porsche battling for the final podium spot of the season. Seven hours in to the eight hours of Bahrain. The Batco Energy's eight hours, the season finale for the 2023 World Endurance Championship. Onlookers, unknown and very famous, watching the action as we get ready to bid goodbye to GTE forever and to LMP2 at least for the meanwhile. At the start of the race, the Toyotas that are dominated qualifying by choosing soft and softer tyres to qualify on started one and two. They were determined to try and hold on. Antonio Foco down the inside of the Cadillac. Earl Bamba locking up in response, clattering into the number seven Toyota of championship challengers. Mike Conway and his crew. Conway facing the wrong way in the first corner must have felt then that the chances of taking the title from number eight were reduced to almost nil. Both United cars clattered into the number four van wall machine in a carnage strewn first lap. 
60, for our, uh, 60 Porsche moved in front for Iron Lynx. The 85 Iron Dames car had been on pole. A penalty for Cadillac for causing that collision. Dropped them to the tail of Hypercar. And Mike Conway began his comeback from last on the road, charging through the GTEM and LMP2 field, and eventually making his way back up to third by the first pit stop and to second before he got out of the car. Hertz Team Jota battling with the Ferraris for third place. They've been the pick of the Porsche bunch, and they had the speed on the Ferrari to move in front. In LMP2, Trouble for the number nine, Premacar, while leading, taken out by one of the Aston Martins that served a penalty for that. Into the darkness hours, Ferrari still battling with Porsche, and a retirement for the only car to retire from the race, number 60, because Claudio Schiavone was not well enough to drive the car. They couldn't continue without him. Off-track excursion, door banging, gravel trapping, the battle between the two Ferraris for third place on cold tyres was not exactly what the team had hoped for. Certainly kept the crowd on the edge of their seats. And the Van Wall has struggled as they try to make it through to the end of this race. Hertz Team Jota still in the attack. After the last set of pit stops, they are back in the battle for third place. Sebastian Buemi complaining that the battle for fourth was not allowing him to breeze through as quickly as he had hoped, but he still leads the race by over 40 seconds, comfortably heading towards another victory and another championship title. So it's Toyota Gazoo 1-2. The interest is in who will be third, Ferrari, Porsche Team Jota or Porsche Team Penske. So Hertz Team Jota pushing hard. It, it came out to eight seconds, the gap from uh, third to fourth after that pit stop. There is a theory emerging here, though, gentlemen, that that number 50 car might need a splash at the end of, of this, that the, the previous stint lengths seem to suggest that it's going to have to be fuel saving for that car. I think they're all going to need a splash. I don't think they can all go an hour. It was, it was over... 56 minutes, I don't think they can all do it. Uh, what about Iron Dames? Look, they're holding their, their yeah, more than 10 seconds over yeah. D Station, Northwest AMR, and ORT by TF. That gap has come down. A it was touch. 15, 15 yeah. 16 seconds. It's going to be really, really tight. Looking for whether or not there might be a challenge from behind, because if you look at the quality of drivers behind, yeah. well, behind Michelle Gatting, Casper Stevenson, Alex Ribeiro, Charlie Eastwood, Julian Andlauer, Davide Recon, Daniel Serra, Nikki Katzberg, that is some stellar group. Yeah, but can I point out she out-qualified, or, or Sarah Bovey out-qualified everybody else's car, but the two of the three Aston Martins behind that Iron Dames Porsche have just, on the last lap, set their fastest race laps. Fastest lap of the race of all, now not Mike Conway oh. lap four, or Mike Conway lap 190, it's now Kamui Kobayashi lap 221, last lap round for Kamui Kobayashi, fastest lap of the race. And it was a faster lap as well from the lead car, Brendan Hartley. Uh, well, they seem beyond something of a parade to the championship. Let's hear from Kazuka Nakajima down with Luke Beckett in pits. Kazuki Nakajima just uh, congratulating Mike Conway there. Another strong performance from both of the Toyotas. Well, yeah, the race has been good so far, but uh, it has been very challenging for us, especially for Car 7, had a difficult race start. And then since then, I mean, it looks smooth maybe from outside, but uh, we have been having uh, quite a few difficulties on both cars, so uh, it's not as easy as, as uh, it looks like. But uh, both drivers have been performing really well, and also, I mean, everybody in the team have been performing very, very well. So I really hope that it's going to continue like this until the end. Yeah, well, you can hear the pressure and the frustration when you hear Seb Wemi's radio back. I mean, yeah, this is maybe usual, and uh, maybe it's nice to have usual stuff, but, uh, I mean, everybody is pushing really hard, and, uh, yeah, it's good that it's obvious, you know, from the radio as well. Thank you. <laughs> that beautifully put there, Mikasa Takechiba, who, by the way, will have an additional role in preparation for next year's World Championship. He will be responsible for driver selection for the factory drivers coming to the LMGT3 Lexus cars coming next year. 
46 minutes to go. Where are the battles? Well, the battle most certainly is on for the final podium place overall. Will Stevens now five seconds back and pulling away a little more from Kevin Est in LMP2. It is WRT 1 2. 10 seconds between the top two and then 15 seconds back to Oliver Rasmussen in the Jota 28 car. And then here in GTE Am, the bright pink Porsche 911 RSR, the Iron Dames. Michelle Gatting, 11.2 seconds. The gap is coming down, not rapidly, but we've got 46 minutes to go. Last race of what's been, as we've said before, gentlemen, a magnificent ser servant to international endurance racing, not least here in the FI World Endurance Championship, some fabulous battles around the world. At Le Mans, it's been stunning. Across in North America, where it was called GTLM, it was no less stunning. And it all comes down to this, the final championship, the 2023 championship of the FIWC in GTE Am. And could it be a truly historic result? It's gonna be really, really tight. Whoever ends up winning this one, it is gonna be super close. And you're right, you know, as ever, the racing has been really intense and a, and a great way to end the season. And, and to end the story of GTE, not with a whimper, but with a bag. It's been huge, massive year this year for our drivers' champions and our team's champions. Ben Keating, Nicky Katzberg, Nico Veroni, they won the title back in Monza before we even went to, to Japan or came here. So with two and a half sets of points left in the season, they still had enough to put it out of harm's reach. And a, and a great, great end to that story for Keating and all of his teammates. And a truly appropriate driver squad for a world championship. Drivers from three continents. Yes, uh, exactly. A pro driver, an emerging uh, pro driver, established pro in Nicky Katzberg, it just wins everywhere, won the 24 hours of Nürburgring in a Ferrari earlier this year. An emerging star in Nico Veroni, who's been amazing, and the bronze to end all bronzes. Nicky Katzberg, by the way, also looking for a drive next year in GT3, he was telling me. I hope I'll be part of it. A little bit more fuel in the tank of Hurst Team Jota's Will Stevens. So can they maybe go the... It's going to be one lap more. Can they go the distance compared to Fuoco? And even on tyres as well, yeah. within one lap of each other. Well, but, they, they stopped yeah. a, a lap earlier, I think, a Ferrari. So, so. exactly the same scenario tyre-wise, so neither of them has that advantage. Eight tenths quicker this yeah. last time around for Will Stevens. No yes. doubt about it, he's on a tear and chasing down Antonio. Fuoco, who has had some traffic, but there is Woko. Here is Will Stevens, and he's going to catch him as he's catching this traffic. And with that extra energy that he's got that we saw there on the graphic, he will be able to elongate that uh, the braking distance and, and or, or the lift and coast distance, I mean, and narrow down in that area. Maybe even run a more aggressive engine mode, who knows? So uh, he's definitely on the attack and catching hand over fist at this stage in the race. But it looks like we're only looking four laps before he's right on him at this point. But can they all make it on fuel? It seemed very, very close to 60 minutes to go when everybody was in the, in the pits. Well, how long, how long does it take to do 31 laps? It's a one minute 53 Three. lap time on average. Graham gets the calculator. We should know this too to do off by heart. <laughs> one and one and fifty-three sixtieths times what? Thirteen. Uh, Thirty-one. I think they can 31. do it. I think they can do it. It's going to be because very an LMP, close. An LMP2 car, no, can do forty-five minutes, forty-three minutes around this track on a fuel on a fuel load. Very close. And they're nowhere near so 30, thirty-one laps. Thirty-one, 31 first in. laps. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's thirty-one minutes, and I think they can do it. Five six of thirty, which is twenty-five. That's fifty-six minutes. I think they go over an hour around this track on the. Do you know what? It might be something silly like coming down to 
where Hartley meets the chequered flag. And well, that's I, I why. Think it quite, quite, very it, easily could be. It, it might very be. Very easily could be. Are we going to get the Monaco race that nobody wanted to win when they all <laughs> ran out of fuel on the last lap? Well, here in Bahrain. If ever you were going to take the risk, it's here and it's now. Oh, yeah. Because here's the point. Ferrari want the podium to finish the season. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, to hurt Steam Joe to want the podium to finish the season. And you can be absolutely sure that uh, Porsche uh, Penske Motorsport want the podium to finish yeah. the season. And if you ever needed convincing why hybrid technology, doing my PR bit here, hey. is the necessary <laughs> power unit of choice for a racing car, it's because of that fact. It's caught all of you out. They can go over an hour on a tank of fuel, biofuel, 100%. There you go. And again, something that this champion... Oh, trouble for the Vector Sport car. Oh, no. Is that a, a car that promised or? so Gabby much. Obrey. It's Gabby Obrey. A car that promised so much is now going to let them down in the final stages. White flags wave for Gabby Aubrey, the Vector Sport car running very, very slowly in LMP2. He's pulling off to the side. We've seen the car stop and have to be recycled through the power a couple of times, or, and so too has uh, it, uh, Inter Europol did. The radio saying they, are, they think they're stuck in first gear. Gabby Aubrey, and you can't wrestle the gear lever, it's flappy paddles. Final stop for the 41 car from second place in LMB2. Perfect timing for a final stop, 40 minutes to go. And yeah, we said it's around 40 minutes for an LMP2 car on, they, a, on a tank of fuel. They better have calculated this right. They're very good at WRT. I wouldn't second guess them. Louis Delatraz has a top up with fluid. There are tires as well. This is going to be a race to the end, isn't it? Casper Stevenson has found pace. The gap for the lead in GTM all of a sudden under eight seconds. So this is what it boils down yeah. to. The WRT team were, sussing, were getting their strategy so that they could take it to the end so with 40 minutes to go. And what's this Prema team going to do? They're carrying, or at least that car's carrying on. What was that, the number 63 car that went past? Nine. The number nine car. So they're going to have less of a splash at the end than the WRT. Our WRT and that's how gonna they're going to make up. splash. No, they won't. So WRT have, they've had to put more fuel in the car. So yes. the, the pit stop of this car we're watching on the screen now will be a shorter pit stop because they've been out of sync for such a long time in this race. It'd better be because the WRT car that's going to win the championship will be coming up behind them with hot tyres. Oh, they'll be winning the championship anyway. The, the, I know, the but they want the 1-2. They want yeah. the 1-2. It's more about the number 31. Yeah. Will Stevens, by the way, that gap because of the traffic, pretty stable. Yellow at turn 13. What's that all about? It's Gabby Aubrey. Yeah, it is. And they'll finally, the car is stuck. Tried to get the car home. Now, could this be some drama? It's just recycled the power in that car. Will he get it moving? He did well, briefly. Don't forget, we saw this yes, a couple of times for Inter Europol. Have you tried turning it off and on again, sir? Bizarrely, in a racing car, that often works because it is so often the electronics that glitch on you. Robin Frein's final stop for the race leader in LMP2. Clearing out the debris, the muck, the bits of rubber that pick up in all the tunnels, making sure the wings are clear, nothing to destroy or distract the car. And you can do that while the fueler is there because you're allowed to have four men over the white line during fuel going in, it can be for safety reasons only, and that's clearing the muck out of the car and cleaning the windscreen and all of the other things you see men running up the front of the car for. So how long can Prema stretch this out for? Well... Question. So the, the more laps that they do, the they, less fuel they that they needs to go in the car. They gain time in the pit lane, basically, don't they? You're I, right. I think Michelle Gatting's got oh, a problem. I oh, think the oh, lead what's going on on the left front? It's not changing. 31's got a problem as well. This could be drama in the final lap. Michelle Gatting, Look at only the sector four times. seconds in front. Look at they the sector times, Michelle Gatting. Time. She's, she's a second and a half off. And the tyres dropped off a cliff for her, or 
is she just feeling the pressure or is she in traffic? She's had some P2 traffic, but yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a slow first sector, it's a slow second sector. What's the end of this lap going to be like? It's two minutes Here she three. comes into shot. Three seconds off. There, the third car in shot, that is the 85 Porsche. And behind is the 777 D station car. And there is about two and a half, three seconds, 3.8. Explaining to the boss down at WRT, Vincent Voss, exactly what was going on in that pit stop as the Vector Sport car gets wheeled back into the garage. That's so sad. It's going to need to be banged with a hammer. Uh, it looks like, and I'll say this just once, Gerda Miller's final press release is not going to be a happy one. Oh, so here's Prema. They're, okay. they're, they're in, so they've so only had that yet. Yeah. That's, that's not it. But the number 31 is Well, that's 63. That's not nine. No, exactly. But the number nine, yeah, when the number nine comes in, which yeah. probably be, will be this lap, I think seem to remember the two Prema's coming in one after the other, well, weren't they? they? they were both WRT and Prema yeah. have been those to tail in the pit lane so we expect, most of the race. We expect Ben Fiscal to come in this lap yep. and will probably it will be ahead of the number 31 yep. after that absolutely shockingly bad pit stop. I don't know what happened there, but Vincent Voss wanted to find out the answers as well. Just when they didn't need it. Absolutely. The last pit stop of the season. Right. I mean, come oh, on. the season. Never mind the race. Of oh, the been. season. 20 yeah. seconds. It dropped Was it? Oh, my goodness. Here he comes. Ben Viscal into the pit lane. They'll Sorry. be looking for the slickest of slick operations down there at Prema. No, the most relaxed of pit stops because you can't hurry it. So there's 41, they take the lead. Those are our championship leaders, very comfortable championship leaders as well. Well, it's been clockwork here so far, hasn't it? Absolute clockwork. Well, not early on. No, but in terms of the way they've run this conservatively yeah. to get themselves to this position, Listen, others have fa faltered around them. Everything we know about WRT, they are perfectionists. They didn't accidentally crush everybody beyond ob obliteration with their Audi GT programs. Uh, uh, Michelle Gatton and Sams have recovered free of that traffic, but still a second <laughs> off. Casper Stevenson is down to 2.7 seconds. The 31 car, by the way, was way ahead, way down the road, of course, they had a much bigger advantage in the 41 car versus the number nine, so they are still very much ahead of yeah. car number nine. Uh, 31, as you see, the number nine now coming down the pit lane. 31 is just, he's just entering uh, turn eight. So yeah, he's, he's, he's quite a way down the road, actually, despite that pit stop, but have lost out to their teammates. Either way, a one-two result in either order will do them nicely. Chojigazu racing 1-2 in hypercar, and the gap for third is closing right down, 2.29 seconds. This is our GT lead pair with the Jota Porsche between the two. So just about to go by Michelle Gatting, and there in the shot in the background, you can see the th fourth pair of headlights. That is Casper Stevenson in the D-Station Racing number 777. And yeah. he is a rapid pair of hands, isn't he, Casper Stevenson? And he will, once you can see the lead as well, he will be focused on that pink Porsche in front of him and giving it all he's got. A lot of the, the, the credit for where we are now with 33 minutes to go goes to two stellar drives, the bronze drivers of these cars, Sarah Bovey in the 85 and Liam Tolbert stepping yeah. in uh, for the 777 car. It's a one-off here, replacing Satoshi Yoshino. 2.4 seconds now, Will Stevens behind Antonio Fuoco. And the gap in GTE Am is under two seconds. Two silver graded drivers, Michelle Gatting and Casper Stevenson. So, pretty much like on like, you've not got a gold versus a bronze at this stage. Here comes Will Stevens. So many battles to watch. Toyota Gazoo Racing 1 2 in Hypercar, Team WRT 1 2 in LMP2, Iron Dames ahead of three Aston Martins in GTE Am. And still closing, Will Stevens. 32 minutes, he's got to make up three seconds on the Ferrari and get by him. What is the radio traffic in the Iron Dames team telling us about the pink Porsche? 
push to pass is available, so please, in every straight, go ahead, push to pass. I don't think the push to pass is working. Okay, that's not good news. That is not good news. Oh, running out very wide, the Jota car in third. I think he was keen to get out of the way of the yeah. third gate, but uh, maybe a little bit too keen. A little over keen. Uh, keeping an eye on this. The leader, by the way, is the next car in the shot, just coming out of turn 10. So Q more whinging about uh, hypercars not getting out of his way from uh, not Sebastian Buemi in the car now. So Brendan Hartley will probably be relatively sanguine about it. I liked how uh, Kazuki Nakajima just casually accepts it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. normal. 2.2 <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> seconds in GTE. The gap, 2.9 seconds. Will Stevens to Antonio Fuoco for the final podium place. And for those watching at home in the UK, it is, of course, fireworks night tonight. <laughs> hey, we've had a, an eight-hour display here, haven't we? There's been some particular particular sparklers and some real explosions. Well, I should on. tell you that uh, we did have, in my home, a letter from our near neighbours to suggest that there was going to be a spectacular firework display on Bonfire Night. My near neighbours are Toyota UK. <laughs> Well, let's get down to the 41 WRT garage. Louise Peckett is down there. They lead the race. They lead the standings. Let's hear from Rui Andrade. The 41 is looking good, but we, with these pit stops, we still don't quite know where we are. Well, for us, both cars right now are looking good because we've done all our pit stops. Uh, we just have to drive to the end with no mistakes. Uh, really unfortunate for the sister car. I mean, they had an amazing race. They led for so long. Uh, these things happen. Obviously, the team is gutted for them. This is not how we wanted to take the lead. So hopefully, we can make things right by the end because I think they deserve it today. Uh, obviously, it was a... Yeah. No, no words right now. On the positive, we've got to look at the championship points and where you guys are sitting. Yeah, uh, fingers crossed, half an hour to go, but looking really good. I mean, we had an incredible season. Uh, so far, six races, five podiums, uh, two wins, and today's looking good again. I mean, these guys have done an incredible job all, all year long. Since last year, I mean, the work we put together, I mean, such a family, the feeling into the team, the teamwork we put in, so it's such a perfect way to end our relationship and I hope for the team's sake that we put the championship in the back. Thank you. Thank you. That's Curves. a point where before we get to, to how the car's going to finish, point worth making, a couple of points actually, Rui Andrade, I, I'm not big on Angolan sports stars, I'm, I'm willing to lay a couple of quid on the fact that he will be Angola's first ever world champion, possibly in any sport, but certainly in motorsport, not the first world champion from Africa in motorsport. I can certainly think of one in Tony Schechter, but the other thing is, for the drivers in that team, it's the end of the road, it's the end of their relationship with WRT, unless WRT runs them in the European Le series because they're unlikely to be GT drivers, they're probably not going to be the hypercar drivers. So it is kind of an emotional end. The other element we picked out of that, and we all sort of looked at each other, raised our eyebrows, is we're going to try and make it right to the end. Now, the 31 car is only eight seconds clear of the Jota 28 in third place. So if they are going to swap positions, they've got to give away half a second to their, a half a minute, 12 seconds to their teammates, They've got to make sure that there are no fumbles. We'll see how that works out towards the end. Meanwhile, in a I'm definitely not letting the pass mode is Michelle Gassin, a 29-year-old Dane, leading this race. This is the final Porsche race, the final GTE race for this crew. They will be back, I'm sure, in the Lamborghini next year. They've already raced the Lamborghini in the US in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. But they feel, I think we all kind of feel, this championship owes them the win that they've been denied several times. And if they do it here after this kind of pressure, and it's still definitely possible, that will be even more epic. It's a major program. It's a, it's 
hockey, but it's a flagship program. It's so important for so many people. But what's most important to the girls themselves is that they do it competitively. They do it on the track. And there's no favours given, and there's no quarter being given now by young Casper Stevens, a 20-year-old 20 uh, 20 uh, driver for the D-Station Racing Crew. He's two seconds back, just dropped half a second of the traffic there coming through. It looks like he's on the go, and that's the 25 going <laughs> That's ORT by TM. Fourth, fourth place. Yeah, that's Charlie Eastwood. And that car looks to be done. Right, well, it's in a place of safety. They'll be able to pull it back behind the barriers and they'll start to do that immediately. And I don't think that that should result in a safety car. They'll wait for instruction as to whether when they can pull back on that car, but it should be pretty quick. Probably could do that on the local yellow, as I thought. I think double yeah. wave yellow in, yeah. that, in that corner should be sufficient. Uh, like you said, Graham is, is safely off the circuit. It's very close to the... Uh, he's done a good job there, actually. Good. Uh, has uh, Charlie Eastwood uh, in getting that car very close to the escape part of the barrier. When you're in the car, you look for the orange barriers, and that's your cue to see where the gap opens up in the barriers, and uh, yeah, in the uh, executed there by Eastwood. It's a shame to see them out of the race yeah. with only 25 minutes to and go. And it's real heads up savvy driving as well, because if you just dump it somewhere, then it's a safety car, it's going to ruin everybody's race. Yeah, no, nobody will be giving you a Christmas card for that one, and it is, in fact, at the moment anyway, the double yellow. Actually, that's at turn eight. Yeah, he's at turn eight, and the yellow pre preceding yellow is at turn seven. That's a tough end. I mean, it's a bit of a smoky end to the to the road for that TF Sport Aston Martin, the Oman Racing Team car. And obviously, that was pretty much immediate. Okay, to, you know, that's that's one of those. Everything lights up like a Christmas tree. Turn it off. Sarah Bovey can barely watch. And there's wow. someone that would have been crying out for a full course yellow. Yeah, but not a safety car. No, no, and, definitely and, not a safety car. Of careful course. what you wish for. Careful what you wish for. So, Michelle Gatting still leads. The gap is two seconds. There's Charlie. Uh, it, I mean, judging by the smoke coming up from under the bonnet, it's something fairly major in the engine. So, uh, hopefully, no real oil down, because that's the last thing you need coming downhill into turn eight is an oil slick. Casper Stevenson being passed by the Jota LMP2 car that lies in third, Oliver Rasmussen. That's and it was a nice United car, sorry, that's the light glinting off it. Oh, Did you think it was gold, not blue? Stress galore in the Iron Dames pit. Yep. More traffic for both these cars to deal with. 24 minutes now, ticking down. The gap over two seconds again, just by 100th. It's a dozen laps. That's a long time to be just two seconds in front and losing a fraction every lap. It's a long, long 25 minutes. Listen to what's going on with Michelle Gatting at board 85. He's not catching you anymore. Come on. 12 laps, 12 laps. Vamos. There you go, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I think she's got this covered. This, and even if he does creep up to the back, I don't think he's lapping fast enough to be able to overtake. Because in the words of old Murray Walker, catching is one thing, overtaking is another. Yeah, quite right too. But they, I mean, Anthony, you know all about the, the disappointments of racing as well as the jubilations. They know about it too. Uh, it took them two full seasons to win in the European Le Mans series. Can they do it here in the World Endurance Championship? Well, as was pointed out to one of our friends on the RWC Discord channel, um, the, they won that in the last race at the MLS with the Ferrari. Yep. So a win in this final race in GTE. The final race for the Porsche 911 RSR worldwide. An historic moment for any team. If it's this team, then that's a result that will go around the world. But that gap has closed again, and it's closed fairly dramatically. More than half a second on the last lap. There's got some traffic here as Will Stevens into turn 10, and the team eagerly watches on. Yeah, but he's got a two-second margin. There's only 12 laps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> again, I, I don't think he's 
catching quickly enough uh, to it, really it, make it a difference. It's kind of seems like scratching not, away, yeah. scratching away at it, but it's it's just not as drastic a difference as it was before when there was that tire difference. Now the other thing that is worth pointing out is we talked about the potential frailty of Toyota and their medium tire. They're on that at the moment, 151 for the leader, 154-1 uh, for the leader, 153-7 in second place, 153-7 in third place for the Ferrari on hards. So they are losing nothing at all to the hard, tired cars behind them because the track temperature has come down just enough to make those tires survivable on. I just going to say, when did you say that they should put those medium tyres on? First it when it was hotter than Hades. When did I say they should put those tyres on? Is that why I'm not a race controller and a, and a team <laughs> manager? <laughs> no, you're right. No, you're right. He you're was right. trying to shout me down something rotten, Graham. He wouldn't it's, believe it's, it. It doesn't come naturally to me. It's yeah. such a quiet code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still so. got yellows, by the way, so whatever, yeah, they just uh, flashed on and off there, but uh, still yellows for the recovery of that Aston Martin. Looking at these gaps, it is still three seconds. Will Stevens trying to close in on this car, the 50. There we are, clear of traffic now, so finally no cars between the two. Also, the gap back up over two seconds. How, Stevenson. how much energy have they got left? Is it going to get to the last lap? I mean, if you know you're in a hole, you go hell for leather and hope that they are too, or that something saves you. And if you lose a fuel race on the last lap, you lose a fuel race on the last lap. You don't give up 20 minutes from home. So if the Ferrari know they're, knows they're in a hole, they will still push and keep Stevens out of reach until the guillotine falls. So. If there is a fuel issue, then we will find out in the last lap or two. Uh, Marshall's on track at turn eight, intervention vehicle. I think they might have sent a vehicle across the, the track at turn eight. I Possibly. think they're probably going to tow it, uh, whether to, it's back or forwards. 20 minutes to go and still significant positions and championships up for grabs. Michelle Gatting leads in GTEM from the 777 D station Aston Martin. The Floyd Van Wall racing team car, Ryan Briscoe, is still back out on track. Throttle sensor issue, they think, for Vector Sport there in the garage. Charlie Eastwood's ORT by TF Aston Martin has blown up. That is only the first retirement on a mechanical reason. The Iron Lynx number 60 Porsche was withdrawn. 19 minutes to go in the race in the season in the championship. Iron Dames lead by two seconds and growing from D station in second place. Finally beginning to pull out a little bit more advantage. The stress is showing still in that garage. 19 minutes to go. We're back to full green flag running with the incident cleared for the recovery of Charlie Eastwood stricken ORT by TF Aston Martin. Well, no, nobody who's watched Formula One here and saw Roman Grosjean's accident has any question about the level of marshalling ability here in Bahrain. It's as good as any other track you will race at in Formula One. World Endurance or anything else. Great work again by the marshals. And we've had two partial laps behind full course yellow in seven hours and 40 minutes. 20, less than 20 minutes to go. And we are back at green. Uh, just for a moment here, that van wall is holding up. Uh, Michelle Gatting just briefly out of turn one. It's got much more straight line speed. But as we were saying earlier, that minute, that uh, low speed. Uh, through the turn there just wasn't working for Michelle Gatting. She couldn't put the car where she wanted to put it. 2.4 seconds is the gap is coming down again. 18 minutes to go. Yeah, but it is. some flows in traffic. Yeah. And, uh, I think now they're both in free air. It should be okay. She's going to Ryan Briscoe in the van. Come on, come on, get out the way, get out the way. She absolutely doesn't want anything to interrupt the flow at all. And, Antti, when, you, when you're in that situation, it's the rhythm of how the car flows around the track that must remain constant. Otherwise, your speed varies so dramatic. Well, also, it's the distraction of having a car there in front of you. So I, I said free air. It's, it's not entirely free air just yet. I did expect the uh, hypercar to be pulling away it's pretty not. comprehensively. 
and easily over, <laughs> over a well, any GTM of, car, but it is really not. Yeah, any of the others would be at the moment, but the, the, the van is a bit hobbled. It's spent yeah. a lot of time in the garage in the last couple of hours. Well, it's done at 159.5. She's doing two minutes dead. Um, so at the moment, it's not getting in the way, but you're right, it's the distraction and the concern, I guess, the stress factor of this. Looking at our race leader, Brendan Hartley, about to be a three-time World Endurance, four-time World Endurance champion? No, oh, three times. Who was the champion with Porsche? I can't remember. Um, look at the gap though in LMP2. WRT are bringing their cars together, and that's because the gap between the 31 car and the 28 Jota car, which was eight seconds, is now 24 seconds. So we heard Rui Antard say, it's a real shame our, our teammates lost the lead. It wasn't their fault. We're going to put that right before the end. That's what they're going to do. They are gradually easing themselves back towards their teammates. They will allow the 31 car to pass and win the race. I'm sure the Ferrari drivers would have done exactly the same thing for one another. <laughs> Well, we saw that they were close to doing the same thing They're for one so another. They're so close, they just, they, they love being that, extra close uh, on the track. Do you know what, I love that about that, that they just go at it hammer and tongs as hard against their teammates as they do against all the other cars. As a warning shot, as if a warning shot for other any others, don't you dare get close to us. Look what yeah. we do to each other, if, yeah, let yeah. you. <laughs> it's <laughs> the Duke of Wellington. I don't know what <laughs> they do to the enemy, but they scare the life out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer from Brendan Hartley is it would be indeed be his fourth championship, and I think a unique double-double, two for Porsche, two for Toyota. Oh, OK. Uh, so that would be quite something. Well, let's catch up with Team WRT. There's the race-leading 41 car. We, we are freezing positions with 31. We are freezing positions. Just bring it over. Just bring it over. No risk. All right, so that is from... Uh, Uber control. Uh, clearly, we heard from Rui Andrade, the feeling in the 41 team was they wanted to give their teammates victory, and WRT don't want to jeopardize anything. It's still a 1-2 for the team. 41 still wins the title. WRT will still be team champions. Them's the brakes. Well, the other thing, there are lots of things they can't control. You said it a little earlier. What if? The race leader splits those two cars. Yep. What if? Yep. I don't know. 100%. Uh, we Getting are. It, 1.6 uh, seconds it is now between Casper Stevenson. We are close to tears whichever way this goes. I don't mean the ladies in that garage. I mean everybody. It's this is going to be emotional in the extreme. 14 minutes, seven laps. End of an era, beginning of a new one. These three. Amazing drivers in the 85 car, already out testing on the new Goodyear tyres for LMGT3 and the Lamborghini for next season, but they won't care about that. It's all about this. It is under two seconds. It's getting down towards one and a half seconds. Casper Stevenson coming again and, uh, in this battle for the final GTE race ever. And this GTE AM class in the FI World Insurance Championship. How many more times around is she going to have to try to manage this gap, to force this gap forward? He found two tenths on the last lap, only two tenths. And at that rate of catching, you see 1.6 seconds back, that's a lot of laps at only two tenths a lap. This is going to be absolutely edge of the seat. I don't know quite whether they've got any special nail varnish. I doubt any of it remains. They look astonishingly calm. And to tell you how close this is, the, the first sector of the lap they're currently on, the difference between the two cars, five thousandths of a second. Yep. It's super close. In favour of Michelle Gattin. Yeah, she actually pulled away a little bit in that yep. part of the lap. Five thousandths. It, 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 it doesn't sound like anything. It isn't anything, but it means he didn't get closer. Bingo. And every, exactly that. And again, it's not, oh, I've got 12 laps or I've got six laps. It's this corner, next corner, corner by corner by corner, each single footstep has to be measured exactly as extreme as, as she can make it. The, the, when you think about motorsport past, whichever form of motorsport you love and you follow, it's about moments in history, it's about eras. The GT era is about to depart stage left. Who is going to be the final winner? 
if it's either of these squads, it's newsworthy. If it's this squad, it's a worldwide story. Yep. It certainly is. Two Aston Martins on the podium at the moment. D Station and Northwest AMR. And Dempsey Proton hovering behind. So it seems unlikely that it'll be a fairy tale. Won the first one, won the last one for Christian Reed. But again, 11 minutes 58 seconds, Anthony. But one of his cars could, because that, that, yeah. that's a Proton car. The one thing I'd say here is they are coming up on traffic, and it's a slower GTE car with an AM driver at the wheel. Right. And which got which cars one is up. it? Deserto. Okay. 21 car is just ahead of them on track at the moment. Yeah, uh, he, they've got to work their way past slower cars, but also the quicker cars like this one we're riding on board of now. Number 93 Peugeot with uh, Mikael Jensen at the wheel. Uh, he's going to be working his way through. And the Proton competition car number 99 as well yeah. behind him. So they're so in the fight. So he'll be taking no prisoners, will he, Mikael no. Jensen? He'll be diving into holes that are hopefully a Peugeot large, but that means that that minimum corner speed of the Aston is being blunted now because the faster car is slowing him down, which doesn't sound logical, but it is. And here comes Harry Tingle. Is it Tingle in the 99 as well? Yeah, uh, straight away that gap goes back up to 2.5 seconds. Yeah, but they're going that. to get to Michelle Gatting, and if they don't catch it's her about, on a straight... It's about that that's the point, it's where do they catch her. Yeah. While we're watching this, just to keep uh, uh, our listeners and viewers aware, uh, Will Stevens, 1.5 seconds now back from Antonio wow. Franco. Holy moly. There Ten are, minutes to go. There are no days I wish I was a cameraman because you're either burned or fried or boiled or drowned or frozen or blown off something. But being a race director in a TV truck is not easy either. There are two battles that we desperately want to see and you can only put one on screen at a time. There's the 93 Peugeot. It's got by Michelle Gatting. Harry Tingle could get by her before turn four. And then Fong de Zotto just in front. Here's a battle for the third final podium position. And Will Stevens keen to let the 86 car know that he's coming. Ten minutes to go in Bahrain, ten minutes to go in the season, ten minutes to go in the life of LMP2 and GTE in the World Endurance Championship and ten minutes to go for the podium. Will Stevens, 1.38 seconds behind the 50 Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco. Fuoco's done a really good job at keeping his pace up and trying to stay out of harm's reach of Will Stevens. He's doing exactly the same as Sara Bovi is in GTEM, just trying to stay out of attack range. Michelle Gatting, it's three uh, seconds second now. It's three seconds now with that traffic. So certainly Gatting got the better of the run with those two uh, hypercars. We saw where that happened, Anthony, back up the hill from alongside the drag strip where it absolutely held the Aston Martin up. Yeah, exactly, getting overtaken into this corner here, turn 11 is not ideal when you're in a GT car. He got a bit held up at this point in the corner and couldn't get his foot down when he wanted to. All of that happened in those fast-flowing corners, but for Gatting, it happened just in a straight line, the Peugeot, and then uh, the, the, the number 99 Proton competition car, both overtook them. And Gatting is going to get onto the front straight just as she's been caught by the number nine Prema car. And so that will go by her. And then the number two car will go by. That's the Cadillac as well. That shouldn't hold them up. That's, that's a novel bit of T-shirt right there, isn't it? Sean Galeo. Yeah, what, uh, he's probably thinking what could have been today. We led yeah. the race for so long. I know. And through no fault of their own, the car crew in 31, they lost the race to their teammates who win the championship as well. Yeah. But Louis Delatraz leads in LMP2 for WRT. Robin Fry in second. Third is still Oliver Rasmussen for Jota. Prema fourth and fifth with uh, Ben Viscal in fourth, Mirko Bortolotti in fifth. And Viscal could have been on the podium. That number nine car got knocked off by a GT car, so they could have been there as well. Rahul Frey, uh, Sarah Bovi, they're just watching. It's all in the hands of Michelle Gatting. Four seconds the gap now. Still, Casper Stevenson just now clears the 21. Yeah. Now Michelle Gatting's got to deal with the two prototypes that are about to pass uh, her for track position. Seven and a half minutes to go. The gap for the win, for the final win this season 
this era in GTE Am is four seconds. You just saw Ferdy Habsburg looking quite nervous. Ferdy was in the WRT garage at Le Mans as the ACO officials were telling them where the winners would need to go as they saw their car stop in the S's. He knows you cannot celebrate until you pass the flag. That's why he's not breathing right now. We say in these races, anything can happen, and it usually does. <laughs> what? It what certainly dramas has so the, far. What, what dramas can these final seven minutes oh, of the season... Uh, who knows? Well, here's Will Here comes Stevens. Will Stevens, Hertz Team Jota. He leapfrogs the GTE car, but so too does Antonio Fuoco. And the gap remains tantalizingly over a second. Still out of DRS range and still over a second, not they have DRS, but still over a second out of any remote chance of making even the wildest of last lap lunges. He's going to slow down the Aston, though he's not going to go by him there. That would, would have been really bad news for Casper Stevenson. Yeah, the two closest fights on, on track for position are uh, lapping. Here we go, the D station from Casper Stevenson. There goes Will Stevens. This might be a nice way to bookend the season for the Ferrari team, but especially for Antonio Fuoco. He started Ferrari's journey in hypercar with a stunning pole in Sebring. If he can hang on to this and take a final podium of the year, that's a nice bookend to the season for him personally. Don't forget a stunning pole position at Le Mans as well yes. in hyperpole. Uh, news from and the last five minutes of this season. And thank you for all you've done for everybody in the media uh, operation around world sports car racing in your long career, Fiona Miller. And it's sad news that they, it looks like they're done. It looks like it's a Gibson Throstle Center for Vector Sports. Yeah, that's, that's a tough break uh, for Vector Sports, but I'm sure they will turn their attention towards Isotta Fraschini, the test program, the homologation at the end of this month and then bringing a whole new brand that almost no fans will ever have heard of into Hypercar in the World Endurance Championship next year. That's going to be fascinating. It's a great looking car. Let's hope it's competitive. Five minutes to five, go. Five minutes and five seconds is the lead gap now. Uh, Michelle Gatting is drawing away. This traffic has been working with her over the last couple of laps. It's a little bit of fortune. But how many times have we seen this crew have the other side well, of the coin? And that's exactly it. You know, you can bring everything you want to a race, but if you don't pack luck, it's you're not going to win it. You just aren't going to win it. Ask the seven crew. It's like I always said in, in racing, you, you don't necessarily need good luck to win. You just definitely don't need bad luck. Yeah. And it really is such a thing for these at home saying, oh, you make your own luck in this one. Oh, big lock up in front of the race leader. There's the bad luck that he just avoided. That's exactly. a bullet dodge. How did you know that was going to happen when you're in the car eight with the cars you, about to spin? It just it's out of your control. You made it happen. Alan McNish, we go, oh, there's no such thing as luck. It's oh, all down to drive. Oh, but, okay, he was a believer in that as well. I mean, you know, each yeah. their own, but I've experienced firsthand not doing anything wrong myself as a driver <laughs> and being wrong. When wrong, was that? wrong. <laughs> it's not bitter. Um, this lap and two more for the championship, for the win, for the season, for the end of era after era, and for the start of an exciting new one in 2024. Three and a half minutes. Yeah. Well, you saw the WRT team there. As they always say, as one door closes, another slams. Oh, no, a window opens, <laughs> <laughs> another opens. They will be back. They'll be back in double. I mean, their recruitment drive is going to be enormous because they're running two hypercars and two GC3 cars. So, Van and Voss and the rest of the brains caps trust there. On. Caps back on. Yeah, well, yeah, Caps, he's got his on the right way around. <laughs> I don't think you can wear a snap back forwards. But, uh, yeah into the final three minutes of the year. And three seconds to five seconds now is the margin. Michelle Gatting could have crumbled under pressure. Anybody could have crumbled under this pressure. But Casper Stevenson has not been able to get quite close enough. The Astons have been on the medium tire all the way through. And is that now just giving up the ghost a little too much? She's going to have one more tough moment. Two and a half minutes to go. This will be the penultimate lap.
for this car. The tough moment is the leader is going to pass her. And that will mean no further, uh, no extra lap for the 85 to complete. They will complete the race in the almost in the wheel tracks of the overall race leader. There is the race leader behind Sarah, Bo uh, Sarah Bovey. Sorry, Michelle Gatting, I'm doing it now. 5.6 seconds to the good. And that looks pretty much done at this point in terms of the pace being able to make a difference. Will Stevens is still closing in. 1.7 seconds now, but running out of time to catch and pass for what would be a famous third. Can I just point out that despite there being absolutely no need to, Brendan Hart is still knocking the laps out of the park in almost every lap in the last hour he's been among the two or three fastest drivers on track Bloody Habsburg's gone full on Van Sam Voss there with the cap as well bit of a, a Baker boy look it's nervous times they know what can happen if you knew Ferdi Habsburg as well as we do know, it's probably he's stolen uh, the Voss's <laughs> cap. <laughs> Van Sam's got his own cap on, but they know what can happen. It happened at Le Mans, it can happen anywhere. There goes race leader. There's the leader gone through, In and front. so too is the 63 Prema car. That was the worry I actually had for Sarabovi, that the Prema car would catch her in a really bad position, because that could cost you a second and a half. And it's not, it's uh, much she's managed. She may have lost a tenth or two. Oh, the nurse, look at that, oh, that's the first Nice Come on, ladies, be careful, be careful. They know how hard it is to win races, not just in terms of competition, but in terms of having the, the dice stacked for you, if you like, or not against you. Sarah Bovey isn't breathing yet. Rahul Frey, she's starting to believe. One more lap. Starting to believe. We've had one female winner in this class with Lilu Wadu. It's not been her day today. This could make it four. Yep. The three ladies aboard the 85 car, Michelle First. Gatting, yep. Rahel Fry, an astonishing start from Sarah Bovey. We're it's a lap away from an all-female crew winning a world championship race, and that lap. will be a remarkable justification for Deborah and the entire programme bringing these crews together and bringing them up to world championship level. Last lap for Toyota. Brendan Hartley leads in the number eight car. They're on their way to the championship. The third for the number eight team and a fourth for Hartley. Sebastian Puemi still not quite believing. It's not a Toyota driver or former Toyota driver who does anything before the checkered flag comes out. Kamui Kobayashi in second. Antonio Fuoco safe from attack from Will Stevens unless he chips over his own shoelaces in the final lap for that last podium spot. Alex Wurz is ready with the flag, he believes. Sora Bovi is ready with the smile, but it's not there yet. The Five. tears will flow. Five corners for the Iron Dames. Three corners. Sebastian Buemi is walking to the pit wall. And Brendan Hartley is heading to the chequered flag. It is going to be race win number three for the number eight Toyota. They will take the championship. 41 WRT, Louis Delatraz leading LMP2 to a team 1-2. And Rexy there slowing down so they don't have to do an extra lap. That's good thinking by Matteo Cairoli. It is victory in Bahrain, and the championship goes to Toyota number eight as Brendan Hartley takes the checker. And behind him, across the line, it is done. It is victory in GTM. The last race win goes to the Iron Dames. They took their first win in the European Le Mans series in their last time in a Ferrari. And Sara Bovi finally smiles, laughs, cries, whatever. It is an all-female crude car that wins a world championship race for the very first time. And the 41 team add victory in LMP2 to the championship title as Louis Delatraz takes the checker. Two of our championship winners win the race here tonight. And the third is a history maker. Amazing stuff. Well done, WRT. They've always had a really fast car around this circuit. And well done to the Iron Dames as well. Finally. Better late than never, eh?
and Finally, the Hooter, race winners. The midday train Hooter that Corvette use every year. That's the last time we'll hear that. But it's also a note that they're the other championship winners. Absolutely stellar stuff. What a bunch of guys has yeah. been at Corvette Racing. They've been a great part of the entertainment here, on track and off. A 25-year history, and that is the 22nd win for the C8R. Let's hear from the Iron Dames team. Bravo, Michi, bravo, bravo. We are the last winners in the Bravo, great job. A stunning drive at the end there for Michelle Gatting. Finally, and you know what? It's like Christmas, isn't it? The waiting makes it all the sweeter. I mean, it's it's been tough, and they've had a lot of heartbreak on the way, but Anthony, you know, that's racing. Racing is a large amount of heartbreak and very occasional ecstasy. Absolutely, that's what makes the win so sweet, because most of the time, you don't win. And uh, you see the champions there, Toyota, Kazoo Racing, car number eight, Number seven had a difficult season. Uh, lots of bad luck came their way. And uh, lots of wins as well, though. Four wins out of the seven races for car seven. But today wasn't their day either. What could have been, though, because they were separated by around 45 seconds after that first lap incident at turn one with the, with the Cadillac involved, separated by 45 seconds pretty much the entire race after that. Their season is a summary of sports car racing and it's best and it's worst. Spectacular performances from the seven and someone else's accident uh, finished that uh, finished that the wrong and way for them. here's a crew that got things wrapped up <laughs> yeah. well before this race weekend. So they were just out there having fun today. They didn't quite have the speed, but they got really stuck in as well. And Corvette always enjoy themselves when they go racing along with that uh, car crew of 33. They have been the formidable force this year. I uh, wanted to just point out, by the way, before, lest we miss it, uh, that Will Stevens at the line under a second back. He was pushing and pushing hard. Yeah. That was a great race within the race between two great crews. Ferrari, of course, a Hertz team, Jota, uh, the 50 and the 38 car. Fuoco, actually a really good controlled final stint from him. Apart from the bit where he almost but, crashed into his teammate three times, but yeah, apart from that, apart bit, from that bit, really controlled in terms bit. of how he attacked uh, you, that last stint. So you've got to go. I'm going to go down to the podium now. Wanna, so it's been it's been a pleasure, guys, yeah. and uh, obviously thanks to Louise as well down in the pit lane all season long. And yeah, stunning analysis year. all year thanks from Anthony Davidson. It's been a great year for drawing crowds and drawing fans to this uh, to this part of the sport, which we all adore and actually just unlocking your insights into it have been a real big part of what's made this special. The last time we ever commentate on three categories out there at the same time in the yep. Le Mans next year. Absolutely. Exactly right. Absolutely. Right, go and have fun. Go and wrap things up for our audience on Eurosport here in Europe. And the Iron Dames, you know, there, there are always so many stories, but this will be universally greeted. All like the then. crews, all the crews yeah. out to greet them home. And it does mean something. It means something to them, of course, to the wider Premier and Lynx uh, family, yep. uh, to this group in this paddock, because we know we've got something special here, to sports car fans worldwide. I have zero doubt as being a brother to five sisters and a father to a daughter, that this means an awful lot to a lot of women and a lot of little girls all around the world. Well it's, done. It is the classic phrase, if you don't see it, you can't be it. There will be young girls all over the world who want to emulate these women. And there's no earthly reason why they can't. Great stuff. Yep. We are privileged, uh, Martin Haven, to work in a business uh, full of brilliant, brilliant people. People with vision, people with skill, people with <sighs> vigor and verve. Passion and passion. People with passion. Wherever you come from, and you're looking here at three drivers from different backgrounds, from different countries, in a team run by a whole bunch of different people from another different country, and, and, and followed by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other people who'll be wearing their merch from a whole bunch of other different countries. Wherever we come from, you and I from whatever backgrounds, same as Anthony, we all have one thing in common. When we come here, we are home because 
we are surrounded by people who love the stuff we love oh, and get it. And when we go to our actual homes, everybody goes, you're not watching motor racing again, are you? Well, for me, what is this program talking about? What is the Toto program talking about? It's something that sport and society is looking for. There's one word, it's relevance. Yep. It's relevance of the technology. It's re relevance in the case of the Iron Dames of the message here, which is, yes, you can. And, and I and, think it's wonderful. And, and sport isn't always relevant. Sport is always relevant because it's human emotion. Yes. But tennis doesn't teach us much about how the world is going to go forward. Cricket and golf don't teach us much about the way the world is going forward. Swimming won't. But motorsport is odd because so much of the world relies on motorised transport. And it's the old cliche that, that racing improves the breed. It really really improves not just racing cars but all transport developing electronics developing more fuel efficient engines developing green fuels developing hybrid energy developing all of these elements that 20 years ago nobody had ever heard of they're in every car park in almost every town on the planet and this is the the development lab par excellence Yes, it's the human emotion. Yes, it's the passion. But of the, all the sports I watch and enjoy, motor racing has more to do with normal life than a fabulous Ashes Test match between England and Australia. It's got the passion and the emotion, cricket, but it doesn't have the everyday driving influence, maybe, that motorsport does. So we're, we're privileged to see these things that are going to change our lives and lives of our children and our grandchildren. We've got skilled athletes and sportsmen and women that are going to be on these podiums, but behind that, there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of amazing professionals uh, doing everything from the physical to the absolutely cerebral, and it's all about problem solving. It's all about, here's your rule book, here's your kit of parts, go and do with that what you can. Yeah. And the difference between the people with exactly the same kit of parts are that the number eight crew finished that race with 249 laps, and the number four crew finished with 217. And look That's at these the guys. First Swiss world champion in the class, first Polish world champion in the class, first Angolan world champion in history. Amazing. And again here, you know, we've got Japan, Switzerland, New Zealand, drivers from the most wide-ranging, disparate backgrounds brought together by one love, making things go faster than they were designed to go. That's what motor racing is all about. It's what horse racing is all about. It's what all sport is about. Pushing the limit, pushing yourself every single time you do it. Sport, sport should be about excellence, and this is excellence. And you know, when we talk about it's Toto, Toto won again. That's because everybody else knows you've got to reach that level. That's the bar. If you can't get there, you're not going to win. Bahrain, the traditional venue for the season finale of the FIA World Endurance Championship. And titles as ever on the line. Valentino Rossi among those coming to watch the action as the GTE AM category came to an end. And LMP2 also ends its association with the World Endurance Championship. At the top of a burgeoning hypercar field, Toyota 1-2 in qualifying, gambling on the soft tyre, softer tyre strategy that they'd have to use later in the race. Into the first corner, though, championship challenging number seven, turned around by a loose run into the first corner from the Cadillac. Earl Bamber losing control under braking and tagging Mike Conway into a spin. From there on, the championship looked like it was coming the way of number eight. 22 United car turned around the van wall and then got collected by its own sister car as more and more cars got involved in the first corner melee. The Iron Dames started on pole in their pink Porsche, the sister 60 car moving up the order early on to take the lead in GTE Am. A penalty for the number two Cadillac set them right to the back of the hypercar field. But Conway, after his early delay with that spin, tagged into a spin, moved up through the field very quickly. Battle on between 
the Will Stevens driven Hertz team Jota Porsche and the number 50 Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco. Some great close racing in the hypercar field. Trouble for Premier's number nine car leading in NMP3, tagged into a spin. Jota battling for the third place with two Ferraris, the number 50 and 51 car. Claudio Schiavone not fit to race, the 60 Porsche which was retired, leaving the 85 car in the lead. The Ferraris battling for supremacy in the tussle for third, coming to blows and running off track, not what the team wanted to see. They were just ahead of Hertz team Jota. It looked as though the red cars might have the upper hand. Van Wall struggled with reliability, but did make the flag. Jota on fresher tyres getting by the Ferraris as the positions change with the pit stops. 41 from WRT moving into the lead of the race. WRT with lead and Iron Dames with a slender advantage at the front of the GTE Amfield as the number eight Toyota raced away to victory, claiming the final win of the season and the championship title as well. WRT's 41 car won in LMP2 and took the title. And it was the 65 car, the 85 car from the Iron Dames who claimed victory in the very last GTE race. Seb's just recording this moment. A fantastic run from the number eight Toyota. You've got the win here, you've got the championship, but you were still pushing all the way to the end. Yeah, we were. Um, no, it's, it's such a nice feeling with Rio, Seb. I think we've worked really hard for this all year. Le Mans was, was tough to take, but it's been a pretty faultless year. Other than that, the, the team's been setting the benchmarks. Um, but yeah, actually, the, the other cars were, were very quick at the end. We, we took a bit of a risky strategy yesterday by putting those medium tyres, and actually we put them at the end and we weren't very quick. So I'm very happy there wasn't a safety car. Otherwise, I don't think we could have held on to some of the other cars. But we did the job, and I'm um, very happy. Congratulations, well deserved, well done. Would have been interesting if there had been a safety car. There are the teams. There's the number seven team on the left-hand side, Kamu Kobayashi, uh, Jose Maria Lopez, and Mike Conway, and Antonio Fuoco. <laughs> Having a, a bit of a pensive moment, yeah. isn't he? They finish in third, though, you know, behind a Toyota 1-2. Toyota really had to go 1-2 here. They're now three years into their hypercar program. They've raced the car here before on these tyres. If they didn't finish 1-2, then they needed to have a good hard look at themselves. But that 50 Ferrari taking third place, Nick Nielsen and Miguel Molina look pretty happy with that. Uh, Pierre Fionn having a word with the unlucky number seven crew. Uh, overall, by the way, uh, they are the, the number eight crew, the first champions in the World Endurance Championship overall to win the title, but not Le Mans, Le Mans since 2019-2020 for the seven car. It is indeed, as we said earlier, uh, four titles apiece for Brendan Hartley and Seb Boemi, all four for Seb, of course with Tota, two apiece for Porsche and Tota for Brendan. And it is a double win now for Rio Hirakawa and a 100% World Championship winning record for him. That's quite astonishing. Richard Mill with his back to us. Mark Thomas there in the blazer, the group CEO of Batco Energies, the sponsors of the race. So confirmation of the result then, Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2, the 50 Ferrari in third from Hertz Team Jota, the number six Porsche Penske Motorsport car and the 51 Ferrari. 41 and 31, it's a 1-2 in LMP2, the final race for ahead of Jota for WRT. Iron Dames claim the last GTE win ahead of the Aston Martin of D-Station and Northwest AMR. And it's Bob Constantius who introduces our winning crews to the podium. In third place, the number 50 Ferrari of Antonio, Antonio Fuoco, Miguel Mardini, Marina, and Nicholas Nielsen. Congratulations, gentlemen, and in honor of Toyota Gazoo Racing, the National Anthem of Japan. Well done to the first three, the trophies are presented by Mr. Mark Thomas, Batco.
Electric Energy's Group Chief Executive Officer, who presents first of all the trophies to the third place crew on the 50 Ferrari AF Corsa. So what emotions for Toyota Gazoo Racing at the end of this season. They come back with most of the race wins, the vast majority of the race wins, with the World Championship for drivers, for teams and for manufacturers, but they did not win them all. So that will be a big hole in the trophy cabinet. Well, and on the other foot, for Ferrari, they've shown pace. They've certainly shown the ability to learn fast how to run the car, how to run strategies in a championship with which they were not familiar with a brand new car. And they won them on. Yeah. But and, and, you know, out of everything, there's only two things in the end that count. Did you win a title? Did you win Le Mans? So between Toyota and, and Ferrari, honours even. Uh, I would suggest that's probably right. And at the end of this season, and remember, an eight-hour race, a race that is you know, a third longer than most of the races we have in this season. Four cars in the lead lap, minute and 37 seconds, one to four. It's about a minute on eight over eight hours that the chasing pack have got to find to trouble the freight train that has been Toyota Gazoo Racing. Well, it's not pace that this is the issue. It's understanding how to get the best out of the car and how to get the best out of the car on the tyre. And Toyota have a two-year head start on Ferrari, on Porsche, on Cadillac. They'll have a three-year head start on BMW and on Lamborghini when they arrive as well. So, I mean, in the end, 27 points in it, the end. It looks like a big margin. It could have gone either way. Bar the first corner incident for number seven car, I think it could have been a different story. And if the number seven had put number eight under real pressure, then suddenly that brings the Ferraris and the Porsches into play. And next year, don't expect it to be as cut and dried as it's looked for Toyota Gazoo Racing. It, it, it will and it should only get closer from this point forward. Yeah. And there will be more. There'll be others that come with better ideas, with a better preparation for this. We've got BMW coming. They've already had a full season in the North American Championship with all the, the, uh, all the, the testing that that's actually at Poles. We've got all sorts of firsts in LMP2 and Lou Beckett gets first shot. The crew of the number 41 WRT, you have taken the final LMP2 victory ever in the WEC. That was such a great season for you, and this was a tough race. Yeah, it was tough. Um, I mean, we struggled the whole week a bit for, for pace. I think we were struggling more than we hoped, but the whole team did a great job. We, we bounced back, and I mean, those two here were fantastic today, giving the kind of great position, and yeah, double for WRT, so I'm super happy for the team and the championship. It's amazing. To sum up how, what this means to you, Rui. Hi, it's massive. You know, last year we took the step to WEC and we had a win and three podiums. And I knew this year I had a big company in the car with me and I didn't want to let these guys down. And I think three wins out of seven races, six podiums and the World Championship speak by itself. So really happy. That is the way to close off LMP2, isn't it? Well, uh, we couldn't dream uh, of better uh, end of season, uh, especially 1-2 for WRT. and. Uh, the whole team uh, deserves big respect and congratulations. They, since they joined in 2021, uh, and runs with LMP2, they have done a really amazing job. So congratulations to them, to all the team. And yeah, we are, of course, very happy. Well done. Thank you. Well, listen, we know the standard Robert Kubica. Uh, Louis Delatraz is writing his own story. I think this has brought Rui Andrade completely out of the shadows. He's been absolutely on a par with those guys. Excellent from all three men. Robert Kubica of Poland and Louis Delatraz of Switzerland, the team were represented by... Well, that is consecutive race wins for the 41. It's 10 wins in LMP2 from 19 starts for the WRT. And it's four from four for the Belgian team here in Bahrain. Louis Delatraz, the first Swiss LMP2 champion. Robert Kubica, the first Polish champion in any class. And of course, Rui Andrade is the first Angola champion. Africa, the sixth continent. So whilst no podium overall for 
Jota after that chase to the flag from Will Stevens for the Hertz Team Jota 38. It is a podium uh, in the final race for the team in LMP2 and they've been worthy champions here before, a worthy podium. So it's been a good uh, season for that 28 crew. Yeah, another good line of isn't it, Pietro Filippaldi, David Heinemeyer, Hansen. I mean, you know, again, from such disparate backgrounds, we talk about this all the time, and they've come together. Just a, a really good lineup in the 28 car. And both WRT crews, again, have, have shown great pace. 31, the winners at Le Mans in LMP2 last year. Robin Fryne's on that crew. And yeah, it's, a, it's been a, a, a big, big season for the 41 team, a richly deserved championship title. A word as well for the unlucky crew in the 31 second tonight after uh, some of the other <laughs> errands bottle on the podium. Robin Primes, Sean Galeo, Ferdy Habsburg. Uh, well, they've been right there all the way through. In fact, the whole of this squad of LMP2 all 11 cars we've had for the whole season. If you look down the order through the Premier Racing squad into Europol with their Le Mans win, the Alpine team, probably the team that flattered to see the most, did not quite get there at the United Autosports. Either had good days or bad days, uh, but they didn't tend to come uh, from one car or the other. It seemed to be the same kind of fortune for uh, for each of the cars in that race of luckless vector sport this time. Oliver Rasmussen, the tallest of the three Jota guys. I think, again, he's really shone this season in good company in that car. But here are our in. winners. Oh, my goodness. I am so, so proud of you. Finally, an all-female crew taking the win in the WEC. Amazing achievement. Yeah. Well, it was a tough last two hours. Uh, I suddenly felt the pressure from the Aston behind, but as the support from the whole team. Yeah, exactly. That's what I felt too. Everybody did amazing today, Sarah, Rahel. Uh, today, finally, we got what we've been fighting for the whole year. This season has just been so tough for you. You've been so close so many times. We've all been urging for you to win, and now it's come together. Yeah, actually, it's very much the, let's say, the, the sand of the car deserves what we deserve. We will take the momentum for 2024 to come back even stronger. Congratulations. Well done. Go celebrate. Thank you. Well, Sarah Bovey, what a qualifying queen. She's been in GTE Am. Some stellar performances, not least here, to really just leave the field breathless in her wake. And they did it. They came and they managed to wrap up the GTE Am final race win, an all-female crew, an absolutely exceptional performance. Louis Delis, Robert Kubica, the champions with Rui Andrade, and Albert Costa, Fabio Scherer, Jakob Schmilhovsky second. They hang on to that, and of course, they have the Le Mans win as well. A Polish winner for the title, and a Polish team that came second. They'll yep. be proud tonight. And won Le Mans, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. you can't argue with that. That's team's title, 173 yeah. points. It's a convincing win for Team WRT, ahead of Inter Europol and United Autosports. Well, look for Inter Europol. Look, they're sandwiched between WRT and United, Goliaths of sports absolutely. car racing. For a team that started in V de V, just for fun, they've ended up in the World Championship Winning Le Mans. What a history. Martin, Martin, we have 13 cars in this stacked class. Three drivers apiece in those cars. There's 39 drivers. Of those, four are female and all have won this year. Yeah. Well, I know there are tens of thousands of fans who will be going to the Iron Dames Collection website when it's online on Monday and clicking for merch and probably another. Another 10,000 more after today's performance. Fantastic result for them. An all-female crew wins an FIA World Nation crew in the centre there, Casper Stevens. And probably the only person who's just slightly miffed that the Iron Dames managed to get through at the end. And Ian James and his crew in the Harter Racing 
Northwest AMR, Aston Martin. Two Astons, second and third on the grid. Two Astons, second and third on the podium. That's actually how they qualify. I've realised I've at least twice said Roman Dianges. Of course it's not Roman Dianges, it's Alex Ribéris here yeah. this weekend. Uh, shout out, by the way, to Liam Talbot. Stellar stuff from him in the early yep. part of that race. Amazing final stint from Michelle Gatting. If you'd have asked me with half an hour to go, I'd have said she was toast. Well, the, it, it, it ebbed and flowed, it came and went, it came and went, and, you know, in the end, stickability is a greatly underrated driving talent, sporting talent, sticking to it and just refusing to give up, refusing to accept the inevitable. And sometimes then, it's not inevitable. And it is, you know, again, it's, it's a fantastic end to this little chapter of their story. They won with the Ferrari in the ELMS in its final race, or their final race with it. They won here in the World Championship in their final race in the Porsche. They open another chapter as they return in GT3 with a Lamborghini, which they've already raced in the States. So a car they know. And they'll be among few team lineups who are intimate with their GT3 car when we start in Qatar next year. There's our champions, Ben Keating, Nicky Katzberg, Nico Veroni. Don't appear on the podium this evening, but fought well all through the season, tied it up with a race to go ahead of the Iron Dames that finished this season second in the championship, 118 points. Uh, cracking stuff from them. Air Course's 54 crew came on strong at the end of the season, Martin. The Ferrari really struggled strong. at the start of the season, but the 54 came on stronger than the 77 car, uh, which features, of course, the now retiring uh, Christian Reed finishes fourth. There's Dorian Pat, the other of the Iron Dames on the grid here. What stories are coming for 2024 yeah. for the Iron Dames project? Watch this space because it's a cracker coming. And what it says on the back of their overalls, that's all part of it as well. Can't see it, can't be it. And that is it. Just the season-ending awards remain those week tomorrow evening here in Bahrain when the trophies are handed out to our winners. But from everybody here in the entire WC TV crew, from Sebring through to here in Bahrain, thank you for being with us. Thank you for enjoying the story. There's more to come in the future as GT3 arrives and Hypercar continues to grow. But for now, 2023 is done. So for our entire production crew on site here, on behalf of Louise Beckett, Graham Goodwin and Anthony Davidson, Martin Haven saying thank you and goodbye.